Web novel fanfiction TG the good. The latest of the latest. Chapter 142 Edgar was a member of the original Rehabilitation Brothers. Those were the enjoyable days. In reality, he was a youth soccer team manager who taught young talents, leading early footballers into leadership positions. In Elder Lord, he enjoyed a world of fantastic adventures. He became a member of the Rehabilitation Brothers, met Rabina, and became lovers. However, those good days didn't last. I never have good eyes for people. Isn't that right? Rabina's arrow flew past his cheek. Edgar touched his cheek and took a step back as his past memories resurfaced. Misfortune came without warning. The students he taught were forced to leave the squad because of violence. Edgar had no backing so all of the responsibility was placed on him. He hadn't succeeded as a player, and his dream of becoming a world-class manager was cancelled. To make matters worse, the business of his parents failed and his immediate livelihood was at risk. He didn't have time to play the game. He had to face reality. He started work as a laborer. He also reduced the amount of time he met Rabina in the game and in reality. He tried not to but he became more sensitive. Edgar started to gradually lose himself. He was conscious of his shabby self as well as Rabina who could fly away like a free-spirited bird at any time. He tried to ignore the cracks but the struggle cut at Edgar's heart. As his lover, she quickly noticed the changes in Edgar. His anxiety, his longing for her affection, and his occasional lack of confidence weren't part of the man that she once loved. That's why Edgar confessed everything. He talked about losing everything and the economic threat in front of him. Once the story ended, Rabina replied. What, you became like this because of money? She was born in a rich house so she couldn't understand Edgar's desperation. Well, it is like this. It doesn't really matter anymore. We're finished now. The words stabbed his heart. I don't love Appa anymore. If she had shown him the same smile and comforted him, he would have been able to stand up again for a short while. No, if she hadn't broken up with him, she would have been a reason for him to fight reality. But there was no such thing. Edgar collapsed. The one who gave him a chance was the Heaven and Earth Clan. The Heaven and Earth Clan looked at Edgar, who was active in the Rehabilitation Brothers, and suggested he join them. Heaven and Earth was a large clan. The clan as a whole relied on economic logic. Heaven and Earth clan members were paid and those in executive positions would be able to earn far more than before. So he joined the Heaven and Earth clan. Thanks to his excellent performance, he was promoted to head of the Maillard branch. At that time, I tried to die but I didn't die. Edgar muttered as he jumped forward. Rabina stepped back quickly. But he had no intention of a one-on-one -on -one fight with her. He turned right away and headed towards a member of the Rehabilitation Brothers. I didn't die and the pain made me stronger. He was Edgard, Maillard's heaven and earth leader. The confused Rabina fired an arrow, but the shield warriors were already blocking her arrows. They persisted pursued Rabina. They had already heard all about her strength from Edgar, and used specialist techniques against her. Once Rabina was blocked, the rest was easy. When looking objectively, the Heaven and Earth members were far superior. Don't as many as possible. Edgar shouted, use the Concrete OD. The Concrete OD, the act of imprisonment that users feared the most in Elder Lord, was declared. While originally prohibited for users, it was occasionally done in warfare between opposing clans. People protested to Elder Saga Corporation but their answer was the same as always user freedom. Ha, you're going to use the concrete OD against us. Are you insane? Rabina shouted. Edgar didn't care. We are the Heaven and Earth Clan. The Heaven and Earth members shouted. The Rehabilitation Brothers started to be pushed. The Heaven and Earth members were strong because they didn't act individually. It was a virtue that Edgar taught them. Now the members of the Rehabilitation Brothers were captured one by one. The battle seemed like it would end with the Heaven and Earth Clan's victory. I will rise up. He would toss of the illusion of the old lover haunting him and rise to a place much higher than Rabina. 
he would succeed through Elder Lord. If he kept rising in the Heaven and Earth clan, he would someday become a ranker. At that moment, a voice could be heard in the distance, I guess I should come out. It was a somewhat familiar voice. Edgar turned his head. A huge orc was hiding awkwardly behind a rock. Next to him were two figures, a small gnome and a dark elf, who were watching the fight. Crocta and two unidentified people. As Edgar made eye contact, the dark elf dropped the fried corn he was eating. Yua, our eyes met cough. Don't worry. Crocta whispered to the dark elf. Raise your head proudly as Crocta's friend. Crocta glanced at Tio. Tio was already a proud person, so his neck was automatically stiff. How wonderful. It was enough if they stood shoulder to shoulder. Crocta nodded and raised his body. It was the appearance of the superstar orc, who drove people to join an orc fan club. Are you Crocta? Indeed really manly. The heaven and earth members stopped moving. The faces of the rehabilitation brothers being tied up by them brightened. The story that crocked a rehabilitation the three founders of the rehabilitation brothers had been passed down like a legend. He hadn't been seen since leaving the north, but now he showed up in my yard. He was truly like the rumors. A red headband that seemed to represent his strong will. Wild eyes and a large body covered in tattoos. In addition, the great sword that was almost too big to be a sword, Ogre Slayer. The appearance of an orc warrior who would make people shrink back just looking at him. This was the founder of the Rehabilitation Brothers. I really get to meet him. Get ready to be hit by Crocta. The atmosphere reversed once Crocta placed Ogre Slayer on his shoulders. The same was true for the Heaven and Earth members. They only saw Crocta in captivity, so they never faced him with his full pressure unleashed. Now overwhelming pressure was pouring out from him. That crocta. But Edgar didn't back down. He took one step forward and said, You were once whining behind the steel bars, but act so brave now that you are outside. Edgar mocked him in order to diminish crocta's influence. I will let you know the truth of this world, along with your rehabilitation friends. The Heaven and Earth clan is unbeatable. Crocta grinned. He was an enemy, but Crocta liked this type of man. Crocta was focused on him but Edgar desperately endured the pressure. An average person legs would have already collapsed. Edgar, Crocta called out to him in a soft voice. You told me over a drink. A leader is a castle. Edgar's eyes trembled. Crocta was convinced. Edgar remembered what happened when he went on the drinking binge with Crocta. I remember all the words you said when drunk. At that time, we were friends. So I am warning you in advance. Crocta raised his great sword. It was a big sword. The amount of blood that had covered it would be enough to make a sea. The Heaven and Earth clan will soon perish. It was close to a declaration of war. I will get rid of it. Crocta remembered many of the ruins he saw on the broadcasted videos. The Heaven and Earth Clan. They spread war and famine in Elder Lord. They were multiplying the pain in this room without knowing what they were doing. Edgar shook his head. You alone. Don't make me laugh. At his signal, the Heaven and Earth members surrounded Crocta. The members of the Rehabilitation Brothers couldn't fight anymore so they just watched the confrontation. You should discover yourself if it is funny or not. Crocta raised his great sword. His opponents had moderately large numbers. But he was the warrior who slaughtered a large army in the north. In addition, he had reached the hero realm beyond the pinnacle. This much. Heaven and earth. It was laughable. War. The heaven and earth members rushed forward while shouting. Crocta stood still and faced their assault. They weren't a group of ragtag fighters. They were well-trained soldiers in a formation that suited individuals as well as group roles. Indeed, it was understandable why the Rehabilitation Brothers had suffered one-sidedly. There weren't many groups of users with such SS. He saw Edgar heading towards him in the lead. All I needed when I fell into hell was for her to hold my hand. His drunk face was overlaid on top. But she kicked me out. I was too weak. It doesn't matter. 
I will no longer care. He swung his sword. The woman called Rabina didn't know how valuable she had been to Edgar. There was no need to know. The past didn't matter, only the fact that swords were pointed towards Crocta. In any case, Edgar was a man desperately living in the present. In order to rise to the top. Great momentum. Crocta shouted. He didn't know why this guy was struggling against the world, but he liked it nevertheless. But it is still lacking. Bolter. Crocta shouted and ran forward. There were dozens of materials. Crocta was like a chariot as he wielded his great sword. No one could stop him. Every time he waved his sword, users would be torn apart as their blood scattered every which way and as their bodies turned into white particles. He looked beautiful. This is Crocta. The members of the Rehabilitation Brothers watched him blankly. Crocta was surrounded by numerous enemies. Every time he wielded his great sword, blood poured out and white particles filled the air. Red and white scattered in every direction around him. They started thinking. He really might end the Heaven and Earth clan with his own hands. How is it? Now Crocta and Edgar were the only ones left. The rest had turned into white particles. Edgar couldn't say anything. Now matter how great the NPC was, he hadn't expected them to be so overwhelmed. There wasn't a drop of blood flowing from Crocta's body. He was fine, while Edgar's companions had been turned into white particles. I admit defeat. Edgar sighed. The end. After this, he would be demoted. Gaining another opportunity wouldn't be easy. He wanted to execute Crocta, but everything was ruined by the dumb guard Lee Youngmin. No, maybe they couldn't afford to go against Crocta in the first place. No. Edgar had a hunch. The heaven and earth would disappear in the near future. He watched Crocta and couldn't think of a way to stop this orc. Would the top rankers and Choi Hansung of the Heaven and Earth clan be able to stop this person? It was in vain. Edgar had barely grabbed the rope to climb up, only for it to be cut. Crocta called out to him, Edgar. I declared that I will destroy the Heaven and Earth clan. Then what will you do? He looked at Crocta. If this man really took down the Heaven and Earth clan, the world of Elder Lord would be upset. No one thought that Crocta could eliminate the Heaven and Earth clan alone, but he spoke like he knew the future. Crocta grinned. Edgar. On that day, you said that you'd treat me as a brother. I just. My brother. Crocta came closer and whispered in his ears, I will never turn away when you fall. I will reach out to you. Edgar's eyes trembled. Crocta had listened when Edgar said what he wanted. Someone who would stand with him even if he fell into hell. He wanted to hear that the person wouldn't turn away. If someone had said that to him, it wouldn't have been so painful. If someone had just held his hand. Then he wouldn't have accepted the Heaven and Earth clan's proposal. If I had met you sooner. Edgar closed his eyes. He didn't regret it then, but he was regretting it now. Edgar said to Crocta, Crocta. Um. At that moment, Edgar pierced his own neck with his sword. What? Blood flowed down his neck and he soon turned into a flurry of white particles. Edgar muttered sewing towards Crocta just before the connection was terminated. Crocta watched carefully. It was a great victory Crocta dot. Tio said from behind him. But Crocta didn't move. He thought about Edgar's last words. Edgar had spoken without any sound. Beware the Heaven and Earth Clan, Brother. Chapter, 143 Ian sat in a cafe and stared out the window. People were passing by. It was summer. People's clothing had become lighter. He was staring absent-mindedly when he realized that someone was sitting across from him. Ian spoke, You came. What are you looking at? You didn't even know I was here. Just looking. He shook his head and smiled at Ji Heian. She had a beauty that was hard to find, even in Elder Lord which had a wide range of customization options. So it was a good view. Is the lighting here okay? She pointed to her face and grinned as the sunlight coming through the window made her face shine brightly. This cafe is good. Oh my, what is this? 
Do you like mint chocolate? It tastes disgusting, really. You even operate a cafe. So don't have any. Still, mint chocolate. Eek. Do you usually drink this? Ian used a straw to suck up the mint chocolate frappuccino and said, By the way, did you do what I asked? Your change in topic is too blatant. But well, I understand. She pulled out some doings from her handbag. There wasn't a lot. Ian's expression became subtle as he looked through the contents. There wasn't much information. It was about albino. There was an attempt to identify it. The Myung Song group tried an internal scan on albino, but the surface was an unknown material and the insides didn't seem to have any connections, making it impossible to guess how it was assembled. It was like sewing that fell from outer space. There was no success so the Myung Song left the research of albino to Park Jujin. Apart from albino, there was also the personal information of those involved. The key was Yu Jae Han. Yu Jae Han is the creator of albino. Originally, his interest wasn't in this direction. Interest. He didn't have an interest in games or computers. He was originally a physicist. A physicist made the game. Physicists are involved in game production, but it is rare for them to plan and produce their own game. No, there is no one who has done that. He was a genius so it didn't seem strange. Ian looked at the photo on the piece of paper. A familiar face. There was a type of loneliness hidden in the eyes. It was a familiar look he had seen before. There were also personal details such as his personality and life. Ian glanced at Ji Hae Eun. She made eye contact with Ian and smiled. The attempt to look beautiful was successful, but Ian felt a strange sense of goosebumps. A misanthropic personality. He was religious as a youth, but devoted himself to the study of physics omitted. Thus far, it was okay. Despite this, he had a lot of relationships with women. At the age of 23, he dated Kim Yana 22. They parted after seven months. Yu Jae Han was nonchalant. By the, the end of the year, he started dating Yoko Yanagisawa, 33, a university professor. The relationship was good for a while during a one year leave, he met the blonde Cabrina in San Francisco omitted. His eating habits vary greatly. He preferred a vegetarian style diet when religious, but after showing misanthropic tendencies, he didn't care about his health and ate meat. Smoking and drinking as well. Fried eggs every morning omitted. He always has a habit of drinking apple juice when waking up in the morning. Thanks to that, he has good bowel habits. There is no constipation and minor diarrhea if he drinks caffeinated beverages omitted. It was at the level of a stalker. How did you investigate all of this? My core talent is in management. I have my ways. There was a time when excessive control of employees in the Myung Song group had become an issue. Ian said casually. You don't have to investigate further. Yes, it is already enough huh? Ji Hei Ian's eyes opened wide at his words. You've clearly done enough so stop. Ah, that. I don't like people who lie. That Ji Hei Ian dropped her head. Yes. Ji Hei Ian twisted her fingers as she watched Ian. Ian smiled and turned to the next duant. Gordon. Who is that? There was nothing unusual about him. The only thing recorded was that he used to be a follower of Yu Jae Han and disappeared as well. Of course, Ian was familiar with the name, Gordon. It was the man he met at Chesswood. The man who seemed to know the truth of Elder Lord. Ian headed to the Temple of the Fallen God and met the Grey God because of him. Ian seemed to be related to him somehow, but he couldn't infer anything from the information. Well, it is a common name. In the end, there were no results. However, there was a phrase at the end of the investigation into Yu Jae Han. Due to his sharpened senses, this can't proceed any further. What does that mean? Exactly what it says. The investigator was hiding, but Yu Jae Han kept on looking back while walking as if he was seeing a ghost. He found the follower and threatened him. Since when? Well, since he envisioned Albino and submitted the Elder Lord project. Really? 
Ian knew the truth about Elder Lord so he found it hard to say anything else. In particular, the expression sharpened senses grabbed his attention. The being that made this game was a mysterious existence called a god. After passing into the world of Elder Lord, the players could strengthen their SS and physical abilities. Ian was able to detect a falling leaf in the distance when he was Crocta. As a being that affected reality, maybe that power was given to Yu Jehan. At that time, was Yu Jehan seeing the Grey God? Are you going to keep sitting here? Then? Let's go to eat. You've already finished your mint chocolate. All right, is it tasty? Ji Hei Ian quickly spoke again before Ian could decline. I'll tell you one more thing if you eat with me. It is really confidential but I can tell Appa. It is okay if you don't want to. It is a real secret. Ian nodded. It is better if you originally gave me the confidential information. Ah, uh, wait a minute. Let's go. Really? You will dine with me? You don't want to? No. They got up from their seats, with Ji Hei Ian following behind Ian as they both disappeared out of the cafe. The secretary watching Ji Hei Ian from afar smiled as he stood with the bodyguards. Young lady, that expression hoo hoo, it is refreshing. He had been by her side for a long time, but she was never the same as other young people. In the first place, there was no opportunity to form close relationships due to the reputation of the Myongsong group. She always looked sad. But now he finally witnessed her youth. However his eyes twitched. The other person is that young man. When Ji Hei Eon had been kidnapped in the past, a bloody wind had blown through the Myongsong group. At that time, anybody involved had been demoted or fired. Just as they thought there were no more ODs, a confidential special forces unit from the United States ended the situation. They contacted Chairman Ji Yunchul first. The United States demanded various interests and investments in return for saving Ji Hei Eon. Ji Yunchul accepted the conditions on the premise that his beloved daughter Ji Hei Eon was saved, and the situation ended in less than a day. The special forces unit trained soldiers from different countries and sent them to the most dangerous places. It was a secret unit hidden under the highest level of security, where the failure of a mission wouldn't even be acknowledged. It was them. Among this group, there was a notorious young man known as Raven. His every action would be like a gore movie. How interesting. The secretary already obtained enough information about Raven, no, Young Ian. Young Ian was plunged into a firing line for his sister and his heart wasn't bad. An interesting young man. The secretary spoke into his phone, yes. It's me. Deliver the instructions. Of course, his work was to protect Ji Hei Eon. He must not allow anything risky around her. The secretary's eyes shone fiercely. Young Ian. The young lady is going to eat. It seems like a normal Korean restaurant. You know that she doesn't like fish, right? Warn the chef about all the usual things and if he interrupts even a little bit, he will die. Prepare all the dishes with the utmost care. Book out all the rooms next to them so that they are empty. Add mint chocolate to the desserts. It seems like the other person's favorite. Young lady, good luck. Ian aimed the muzzle. He adjusted the scale. He slowed down his breathing. His whole body stilled as he pulled the trigger lightly like a drop of water falling on a lake. Just like ripples on a tranquil lake, it pierced the center of the goal. His fingertips shook. Tongue. The BB bullet flew and hit the doll. Vital. But it wasn't strong enough as the doll sprang back up. This was the magic goblin doll that attracted the attention of the people. It was featured in Elder Lord broadcasts and received attention because of its unique actions. Ian continued to fail to hunt it. I thought you were good at shooting guns. Eu said from beside him. It is very disappointing. Ian wanted to plead that the doll's actions were abnormal, but he remained silent. He didn't like excuses. He would just attack until he succeeded. He aimed the BB gun at the lower body of the doll, where it was in contact with the floor. He continued shooting the same area. The magic goblin doll shook with every BB bullet until it eventually crashed to the ground. 
the look of the owner of the magic goblin doll changed. This is pretty good. Ian said with a grin. The owner looked between Ian and the doll before handing them the doll. His expression was still disbelieving as he asked, how did you do it? He didn't try to hide it now. Ian replied. One point shooting. A strategy that focused on one point. The owner nodded with admiration. Indeed. Ian laughed. Then they leisurely left the firing range with the magic goblin doll. They blended into the crowds on the street. What, aren't you going to give it to me? Eu asked. Why should I give it? Didn't you play to give it to me? No. Wow. Eu hit Ian's arm. Ian laughed and gave up the magic goblin doll. It was moderately large so Eu had to widen her arms to hug it. She took pleasure in pulling the ear of the goblin doll. What did you talk about earlier? Eu asked. What? Didn't you eat with that pretty uni? Ah. Ian recalled it. The information she gave him at the dinner table was truly unexpected. It wasn't about albino or UJ Han. It was a rumor about drugs and illegal capsules. The SS and Elder Lord were basically determined by assimilation rate. Therefore, various ODs of increasing the assimilation had been studied, as well as ways of immersing the user directly into the game. One of them was drugs. Using drugs, the user's body was put into a dormant state while the consciousness remained. Their minds left their flesh and they could connect more strongly to the world of Elder Lord. In other words, the assimilation rate was much higher than ordinary users. But understandably, it was illegal. There were side effects and risks. However, Elder Saga Corporation reported that some users were taking advantage of the drug to benefit from Elder Lord. In order to do this, the capsules were illegally modified to provide nutrients so that the user's body wouldn't die. The users would live in Elder Lord without having to break free. The assimilation rate naturally increased and they could become high-level users, but it wasn't known what side effects would occur from the continuous medication. Why would they go so far? Ian asked, causing Ji Hei Ian to reply with a smile. Money is at stake. Ian was forced to shut his mouth. He also plunged onto the battlefield for the sake of money. No exact evidence had been found, but the Myongsong group was working directly with the government to investigate. In particular, it was said that there were bad people who forced users to sign a loan contract, with the user's mind being stuck in Elder Lord until the loan was collected. Appa, don't you play Elder Lord as well? Please be careful. Don't fall too far. Appa? Eu called out to him. Ha! Huh. What are you thinking about? Are you thinking about that Uni? That's right, but why does Eu care? HRM. Ian shook my head. It wasn't the time to be thinking about this. It had been a while since he spent time with his sister, so he should focus on her. Look. Eu grabbed Ian's hand and pointed to the screen. Ah, uh, that? What do you think? Of course. A recent Hot Topic video was being played. Ian was familiar and unfamiliar with the star. White Knight Andre. As a defender of justice, I would like to make an important announcement today. He looked into the screen and laughed. I declare that Crocta is an enemy using the mask of justice to disturb the world of Elder Lord. There were dead bandits behind Andre. He pointed behind him. From today onwards, I will immediately begin hunting him. He lifted his long sword. This sword will make the decision. I will no longer let ladies shake because of the scary orc. It was the video Andre recently uploaded where he declared war against Crocta. Due to this, the Elder Lord community was once again divided. A man passing by Ian and Eu muttered, crazy. Then the girl following him exclaimed, so cool. There were conflicting reactions. Ian suddenly met Eu's eyes. They shrugged and turned around simultaneously. Then they said at the same time. Crazy. So cool. Chapter, 144. Crocta gave a warm farewell to Maillard and the Rehabilitation Brothers. Edgar had committed and disconnected, but there was no news about him showing up in Maillard again. 
Other Heaven and Earth members gradually reappeared but Edgar never showed up. According to Rabina, while he hadn't been an excellent user, his SS grew quickly after he entered the Heaven and Earth clan. The words that Ji Heian said to him earlier popped into his head. There were people who used illegally modified capsules and drugs to increase the assimilation rate and gain profits. The awakening of the drugged person would also usually depend on the contract. Edgar might be in such a situation. But Krokta had no way to get in touch with him and had to leave my yard. It was the true South now. Thanks to Krokta, I was treated well. Aner laughed. You are quite good. Dot. You are so popular in my yard, of course, I am very popular in Quant's. Dot. Krokta was an icon for the users, so the accompanying Aner and Tio were treated very well. I miss the Karex. When the time comes, we will see them again. Dot. It was possible to move faster by taking horses instead of Karex. The Karex were left to the Rehabilitation Brothers. The Karex, who had great advantages in the desert area, weren't useful in the continent. In the Rehabilitation Brothers, they were taken care of as Crocta's mount. This is the first time I am going to the south. Dot. How come? It is the land of humans. There are many humans in the south. The northwest of the continent was a harsh place where orcs and creatures lived, while the northeast was the land of the elves, dark elves and gnomes. The south of the continent was where humans lived together. It was the most populated, fiercest and disruptive land, the south. In particular, the center of the continent contained many species due to its geographic location, meaning there were occasional fights among species. They had to pass through it to arrive in the south. Tia wanted to meet his father Heder while Krokta was trying to completely eliminate the remnants of the thawing Balhi clan, who had joined the Heaven and Earth clan. And Aner had no thoughts. What does the food in the south taste like? Won't there be an abundance of hot and fat foods? Many fruits as well. Ha ha ha. He chuckled from aboard his horse. Look. There are many new creatures on the continent. Aner stretched out his hand and bones started to rise. It was a strange bipedal creature. Lay it down again. Dot. Why? The bones are fresh as it just died. It is unsightly. Dot. This is discrimination. Tio will be like this when you die. Tio fired general at the bones. The bones were smashed to pieces. Ah. My bones. The dead have no words. Too much. Crocta smiled as he watched them but he soon fixed his expression. He started to feel sowing from the forest they were riding through. There were presences moving here and there simultaneously. The movements were too sudden for them to be people passing by. As they rode along the path, the video of White Knight Andre, Nobeck Hanho, popped into his head. He annihilated all the bandits and declared war against Krokta. That's right. Bandits. It is started once again. Kulko. Krokta laughed as he turned to Tio and Aner. Shall we take a break? That's right. IT has been a while. I want to rest. Isn't it hard? Aner replied while patting his horse's mane. Tio smiled at Krokta. I don't think I should sweat before resting. Dot. If you sweat from this, then you are weak. I want sweat. Dot. At that moment, Tio twisted his body and fired General. A bandit hiding behind a tree was hit by General and flew in the air. He bumped into another tree and fell to the ground with a groan. Bandits can only make me sweat a little around my eyes. Tio had already noticed the approach of the bandits. Cover everything. At Tio's attack, the bandits jumped out and rushed towards them. Aner, who had no idea what was going on, screamed and hit behind Krokta and Tio. They are Nats. Krokta got off his horse while Tio showed brilliant marksmanship while holding the reins of his horse. Ayat. Ayat. Kiyo. Chong. 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 Tio's magic bullets accurately knocked down the bandits approaching. Krokta also wielded his great sword. However, he hesitated and didn't attack anymore. The enemy's weapons were terrible. Some of them were stepping awkwardly while holding farm equipment. 
Some held swords or spears, but their eyes were terrified. The man in the front exclaimed. I I if you leave what you have, W we won't you. It was a pathetic voice. He realized they weren't a match after seeing their companions knocked up because of Tio, but he spoke the threat because there was no room to back off. I only have this. Crocta pointed his greatsword. There was no need to fight. Tio also stopped firing general. What dot? Sorry I hit you dot. These bandits have no ing intent. They are bandits but. As the clouds moved, bright sunshine fell in the forest. The shadows of the forest were removed, revealing Crocta's form. The bandits were stunned. A huge size and rugged face. The fearsome greatsword. The opponent was much more vicious than they imagined. Crocta looked at them without saying anything. The bandit stepped back at his gaze. The tattoos covering the body and the terrible belt at his waist made him seem like a demon. The person in the lead bowed first. W were really sorry. The other bandits identified the situation and also bowed while begging for mercy. We're sorry. Spare us. It is hard to eat and live. Bowing to the overwhelming enemy. Tio hit Crocta's waist. Smile a bit. Dot. Tio had a point. He didn't look so scary when smiling. A nasty person wouldn't smile. Crocta smiled at them and said. Stand up. The reaction was explosive. Hike. We're sorry. Spare us. My wife and children are waiting for me. Sir Orc. Mercy. Crocta glanced at Tio. He shrugged and immediately changed his words. You should have left it as before. Look the way you want. Dot. Aner came forward and helped them up. Phew. Stand up. This person looks like a serial or, but he isn't bad. Stand up. It's okay. He was wearing a dark robe, but as soon as the dark elf Aner appeared, they started to recover. PFF. Anyway, life is unfair. Dot. Pft. Tio giggled. Crocta muttered, kid. W what did you say dot? Say it to me. I didn't say anything. Don't lie dot. You called me a kid dot. You heard wrong. Eek. Tio jumped and clung to Crocta. He tried to place Crocta in a headlock, but he just looked like a child hanging on. What are you doing now? These kids. Aner muttered as he stared at them. Is this the right time? T then. Listen to these people's stories. Go and talk to them. Um. There weren't many bandits in this area, which was the north of the continent. It was so peaceful that people hardly ever turned to the criminal path. But this happened as soon as they headed south. The south might be different from the continent that they had experienced. It'll do that. Crocta completely recognized Elder Lord as a real world. In the world of Elder Lord, he had power. In other words, a hero. With great power comes great responsibility, so he wanted to help people who were in need. He should find out their substances. The bandit's eyes widened. They were residents of a small village in the forest. They didn't have much, but it was still a life of freedom. Then one day, an existence appeared that took all of that away from them. Knights. They told us to follow the emperor. Emperor? Yes. One bandit said. He was their leader called Hans. As you know, there is no emperor on the continent. It is an unwritten rule. The advent of an emperor had always led to the persecution of other species. But someone is calling himself an emperor? Yes. The knights are gathering villagers and farmers like us under the emperor's name. They speak nice words but we will be serfs. It is no different from slavery. So we refused. Once they refused, the knights turned like they had been waiting and devastated the village. Anyone who rebelled was Ed. In the end, they had nothing left and become bandits attacking adventurers and merchants in order to survive. However, their combat power was weak so they were often defeated. It is our fault but our children are starving sorry. You don't need to apologize. 
Krokta's group reached their home. The elderly, women, and children poked their heads out from tents in the forest. They looked frightened at the sudden appearance of a heinous orc. Um. All of them were starving and their ribs poked out from underneath their skin. In particular, the children's conditions were serious. Han sighed, we are eating fruit in the forest and hunting, but... Tio clicked his tongue. What are these knights doing? Dot? The emperor of where? The king of Esperanza. The king had a change of heart. In the case of orcs, each city was operated independently. The elves were similar to orcs, but they were weakly connected by the world tree. Gnomes regularly voted for their representative. In the case of humans, there were royalty and nobles. However, the king's power wasn't strong and he was mainly regarded as a symbolic entity representing the nobles. Sewing seemed to have changed. The advent of an emperor would shake the entire continent. It is unknown if the other species know about this. If he does this, they will probably find out. Dot. But this is serious. Dot. Aner's ears pricked, the emperor is he like the orc's great chieftain? Yes. Dot. Then do we have to worry? Don't we have the great chieftain here? Ah. That's right. Dot. The great chieftain of. Tio and Aner tried to tease Krokta again. Krokta quickly blocked their mouths and said, Anyway, this is a pitiful situation I want to help. How dot? This much. Krokta looked at the residents. There weren't many of them because they were originally a village. The Rehabilitation Brothers could afford this number. Besides, the Rehabilitation Brothers were formed for the purpose of helping others. They would also listen if Krokta asked them to do it. Krokta told them, go to my yard. Ha. Huh. My yard? Hans questioned. He became even more polite after hearing the name Krokta. There are people in my yard who will help you out. Do you mean us? Who? My friends are known as the Rehabilitation Brothers. Rehabilitation Brothers? Hans was dubious. But my yard isn't close. It won't be easy to reach there. They had to worry about the daily meals. Krokta shook his head as if telling them not to worry. Here. Krokta pulled out some gold coins. He had become a top-ranked player while playing the game and could afford at least this much. This. Han's eyes widened. For ordinary people, gold coins were worth a huge amount of money. Krokta pulled out several, not just one, and placed them in Han's hands. Why is this? He didn't put away the gold coins on his palm as he stared blankly at Krokta. Krokta scratched his nose and shrugged. A warrior shouldn't turn a blind eye to those in distress. Just take it. The gold coins are just shining stones to me. I can spare a few stones if it saves you from starving. Hans was thrilled. Ah please forgive me for taking this. Krokta. Don't do that. I wouldn't be willing if it wasn't for the children. Thank you. Krokta raised him up. As the two were talking, the villagers started to falter. Tio was the first one to notice. Tio suddenly felt horseshoes approaching. The village residents were terrified when they looked to one side. He followed their gaze to see a group of humans. The humans were mounted and in full body armor. They held lances and swords. Now, are you willing to follow the Emperor? Chapter, 145 The appearance of the knights in the iron armor was imposing. It was hard to see so many fully armed people in the land of other tribes. They never bowed their heads. They were arrogant people who looked down at the villagers like they were dirty from their horses. His Majesty is merciful. You have another chance. The villagers recalled the past and shivered with fear. As nobody answered, a knight came forward and pulled out his sword. The sunlight falling through the dense trees reflected off the blade, causing a dazzling flash. All you dumb people. Answer. The villagers were hesitant and resigned. Their eyes were focused on the blades of the knights. These swords. Their homes had been trampled and the family was ed by these swords. They would be forced by those swords to follow the emperor. The obvious way was to follow the emperor. In the end, they would become serfs and sacrifice their lives. 
No, the emperor would recruit them for a war that they didn't want to participate in. The emperor was such a person. Hans shook from behind Krakta's back. He took deep breaths. He held the gold coins he received from Krakta, hesitated for a moment before grasping Krakta's hand. Krakta accepted his hasty gesture. Hans whispered. Run away. He headed towards the knights without looking back. He was the representative of this place. I will be happy to answer. Sir Knight. He bowed his head in front of the knights. The knight's blade descended towards Hans' head. Go ahead. We are. Before you say it the knight interrupted Hans' words and laughed. Look at the people around you and think about it. Hans closed his mouth and looked back. The eyes of all the villagers were facing him. The wrinkled eyes of the elderly, the nervous faces of the youths, the frightened women and the infants sleeping without knowing anything. Hans closed his eyes, took a deep breath and spoke again. I live in a small village and don't know anything about the world, like you knights. The blade fell to the top of his head. Hans stopped breathing. After the knights came, we moved to the forest to become bandits. We tried to hunt and fight, but were often defeated. You speak too much. We are just normal people. If the knights point swords at us then we can only follow. It is better than dying. But that is what I'm saying. Hans raised his head. The sun reflected off the helmet but he stared directly at Knight's face. It was the face of a young man. Hans spoke. We also know what the Emperor is like. We aren't people who fit your world. Can't you just let us go? There was an earnest appeal in Hans's eyes. The Knight nodded. I see. I heard it well. Hans bowed his head again. The knights glanced at each other. After a short exchange of opinions, the knight opened his mouth. People not from his majesty's world the knights pulled out their swords. Then you should go to a world that suits you. The village residents shrieked. The first target was Hans. The sword descended towards him. Kakang. Then there was the sound of weapons hitting each other. The knight was stunned. Sewing was blocking him. It was a gigantic greatsword that couldn't be lifted even if he tried. Bolter. You don't deserve the name of a knight. The ferocious orc moved the greatsword and the knight staggered. He was strangely covered in tattoos. His body emitted a terrifying ing intent. Who are you? The knights were hesitant. They instinctively felt that this orc wasn't easy. Krokta pushed the puzzled Hans back before firmly replying, My name is Krokta. Krokta, a name they had heard somewhere before. It was a name that all the gods whispered in the temples. A northern hero who conquered the north and stopped the great chieftain. Northern conqueror. But the only thing known about him was the name Krokta and that he was an orc. It was hard to believe that he was Krokta. The knight snorted, Where did you hear that? They thought that he was just borrowing the name of Krokta. Krokta placed the great sword on his shoulder and declared, If you are really a knight, there should be oaths that you made when you became one. Chivalry wasn't that different in the world of Elder Lord. They pledged to defend the knight's oath. It wasn't that different from the warrior's law that Krokta received. Do you remember? The knight's faces distorted. What Krokta nonsense? Garbage orc. Everyone attack. Yes. They shouted as the horses started running. At that moment, Krokta roared and kicked off from the ground. Bolter. A shout like thunder. At the same time, Krokta's energy exploded. The horses were shocked and turned like sewing was blocking the front. Whoa. Whoa. What is going on? The knight in the lead called out. The orc looked like a giant, no huge monster in front of the horses. He was actually like that. His ing intent shot into the sky. The knight started sweating. The horse's eye level was much higher, but it seemed like the orc was looking down at them from a huge height. The great sword seemed like it could break a mountain. The pressure was huge. Was this orc really that person? The orc Krokta, who ed the great chieftain and conquered the north alone. Did he come to the south after leaving the north? Tell me. 
Crocta gazed at them with fierce eyes. What was your oath? The illusion of a giant orc crushed them. Did you swear to persecute the weak? Is that the type of knight you are? Sewing like this. Or did you want to swear an oath now? Crocta's ing intent tied up their bodies. A knight feared the crisis and aimed his sword at Crocta. Shut up. His body filled with strength. He wasn't an ordinary soldier. At the end of hard training, he was a man who received the title of a knight. The knight who was after Crocta's life laughed wildly and got off his horse. Chivalry. Puha hat, what nonsense. He realized that he shouldn't rely on horses to deal with this orc. The horse was unable to charge because of the opponent's fierce ing intent. He could feel that his horse was shivering. Everyone get off your horses and deal with this orc. He is someone who can't be ignored. Crocta was calm. He was familiar with one too many fights. The knight started to surround Crocta. Chivalry. An orc shouldn't say sewing so funny. But I will give an answer. The knight talking to Crocta laughed. They were knights. No matter how strong this orc was, he would never be able to win against so many knights. He shouted, I said to protect the weak, fight injustice and do justice. But what good is that? Anyway, strength is the only thing that matters in this world. You will die today. Kuhahat. The blades of many knights headed to Krakta. The emperor is more important to us than the oath. For his majesty. For his majesty. The knights aimed for Krakta. It was a forest of swords with no place to avoid. Ogre Slayer moved. You forgot your shame and are speaking so unabashedly. Kong. Kong 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 Kong. Kang. At that moment, Ogre Slayer hit dozens of blades at the same time. The swords of the knights bounced back. The knights retreated from the tremendous shock. They couldn't comprehend the situation. What just happened? Only one sword had blocked their swords at the same time. The attacks were all from different angles. But the sword had met dozens of blades at once. Crocta opened his mouth. Destroy the covenant. What? The burden on your back. Crocta lowered his posture. His lower body contracted. It will be the cause of your death. Crocta exploded forward. The knights raised their swords but Ogre Slayer penetrated through the gap. The broken bodies and blades flew through the air. A fountain of blood followed. Crocta laughed as his sword pierced a stomach. If you wonder why the Emperor will die, this is your answer. The knight's morale was broken after suffering from his explosive strikes. The formation was broken. Crocta didn't miss this chance as he dug into the knight's encirclement and broke it further. Quiak. Ah. Terrible screams were heard. The horses were watching their masters be slaughtered with frightened eyes. The sight of blood spouting and the greatsword separating the body was reflected in their big eyes. Ogre Slayer sank into the belly of a knight who resisted. The situation was over. The knights were scattered all over the place, making it impossible to tell which body and head went together. Crocta kicked ahead at his feet while walking towards the one remaining knight. The knight fell to the ground and shivered while moving backward. A monster. Monster. Crocta kicked him. The knight fell back on the ground. You are the monster. It isn't just here. How many villages did you destroy? When he didn't answer, Crocta placed the great sword against his neck. The knight hurriedly opened his mouth. W. We didn't everything. According to orders, we didn't. So how many did you? The knight moved his mouth but couldn't speak. Oh he suddenly fell face down in the dirt. P please spare me. He spoke as his forehead touched the floor. It was a subservient appearance. It can't be helped since I just followed the emperor. Please spare me. I worked my whole life to become a knight. My dream just barely came true so I can't die like this please forgive me once. Crocta couldn't answer. The knight became still but slowly looked up when there was no answer. Ah. But the great sword was right before his nose. The great sword moved. Quajik. Quayak. 
the knight's right hand was severed. The severed limb rolled across the ground. The bleeding continued. Crocta tore clothing from a dead knight's body and threw it at him. Tell the one you call the emperor. The knight covered his wrist with the cloth before wriggling to retrieve the hand that had been cut off. If he went quickly then he could reattach it. Crocta kicked the severed hand away. The knight felt despair. I am Crocta, the one who ed the crazy chieftain. He who has ed innocence and cast the world into darkness for his own sake. Crocta grabbed the knight's neck and raised him. Then he placed the knight on top of a horse. The horse trembled lightly. Crocta whispered in the ear of the knight. Let the emperor know that his fate can be the same. Crocta's party left Han's village. After witnessing Crocta's ruthlessness, Hans and the villagers worshipped Crocta like he was a god. Crocta gave them money and sent them to the rehabilitation brothers in Maillard. He wrote a letter asking them to be looked after. Hans and the villagers bowed in thanks before leaving immediately. It was because the emperor might dispatch more men if they stayed there. Maillard, the area of the elves, was beyond the emperor's touch. The south is a little strange dot. Tio said. They were now riding the horses that used to belong to the knights. After seeing their masters die because of Crocta, the horses started following them in earnest. The rest of the horses were given to the villagers. Humans are the strange ones. It seemed like hierarchy still remained in the southern part of the continent. Even so. Look, isn't that strange? Tio pointed in front of him. Crocta looked forward. Then he slowly opened his mouth. What is that? I don't know. Dot. Isn't it a knight? What are you saying? Dot. As Aner said, it was a knight. But it was different from the knights they met before. Help me. I am a knight. Save me. Someone was running on all fours. And there were bandits chasing him. You can't run away. Give us everything you have, knight. No. -oh. The knight's eyes shone as he saw Crocta. Then he started to run towards them. Orc brother. Hey, orc brother. I am a knight so can you help me? Orc brother. Crazy. Chapter, 146. The questionable knight headed towards Crocta. The bandits and Crocta's party faced each other with the knight in the middle. The south is truly strange. Dot. Knights attacking bandits, and this time the knight is being chased. Dot. Gnome brother. Save me. Who is your brother? Dot. The bandits flinched as they saw Crocta's ugly face. The leader looked behind him. Bandits were still rushing over. Once there were enough of them, the bandits looked at Crocta with confidence. Orc and gnome. Give that knight to us. They raised their weapons as the leader spoke with a threatening manner and voice. They were different from the villagers, as they looked like real bandits. Tell me what is your relationship to each other? Tell you. The bandits burst out laughing. The orc isn't scared. He dares to speak to me, the mountain king Noden. The bandits behind him also laughed. Hey. Knight. Both that orc and gnome are going to die because of you. You aren't a knight but a grim reaper. Kelkokel. Get along well. Kakik. The bandits taunted the knights as tears welled up in his eyes. Orc brother, you have a big sword so please lend me your strength. However, the knights seemed to become desperate as he saw that the number of bandits kept on increasing. The number of followers of the self-proclaimed mountain king Noden continued to grow, and there now seemed to be several dozens. Unlike the other bandits, they were equipped with proper weapons and armor. Archers were aiming bows at them from the rear. Real bandits. While Crocta could easily handle them, they were at a level that couldn't be matched by an ordinary warrior. The knight frowned before bowing his head and sighing. Who? It is only up to here. It is a shame. The knight raised his head. He grabbed the long sword hanging from his waist. He placed the handle and guard section in front of his forehead and whispered. The last knights live without regrets and die while laughing. The trembling voice slowly calmed down. He looked at Crocta and said, Orc brother, I'm sorry. Run away. 
What about you? Out of fear for my life, I have shamefully placed you in danger. I will endure as long as possible. I apologize for the inconvenience. He stepped forward and took a stance. Mountain King Noden laughed and raised his axe in response. Now you want to come out and pretend to be a hero? Do I look like a hero? The knight rushed forward. I am an ordinary knight, s. It wasn't seen when he was running away, but his movements when charging into battle were quite good. There was no contest if he was fighting Noden one on one. The knight pierced through any gaps with brilliant movements and predictions as he aimed at Noden. Noden faced the knight with his axe but he eventually retreated. The difference in S was remarkable. Noden immediately called for his fellow bandits. Guys! Catch this guy! Yes! Let's go! The bandit stampeded forward. The knight stepped back as if he expected it and cut the person who approached him first before shouting, I am Knight Vigo of Alast. The knight was remarkably brave when dealing with the bandits alone. He gave Crocta a good impression. That guy is different from the fake knights. Suddenly, the axe of a bandit aimed towards Vigo's back. A crisis situation. At that moment, a light flashed. Pwong. Tio's magic bullet pierced through the air and hit the bandit. The bandit flew in the air. Tio's artifact, General, was gradually becoming more destructive. Go Crocta, Dot. Bolter. Crocta got off his horse and joined the battlefield. He grabbed Vigo's collar and threw him back, dealing with the bandits alone. Every time his greatsword swung, the enemies would be broken down. It was an overwhelming force, like a lion among sheep. No one could stop Crocta. W. What is this guy? Noden stepped back and ordered the archers to shoot. Oh, our companions are there. Shut up. Just shoot. Yes, yep. The arrows fired without caring about the bandits hit as well. Crocta stopped the arrows with his greatsword. Ack. Cough. Kiuk. The arrows just ended up reducing the people on the same side. The bandits hit by the arrows stared incredulously before dying. The pupils filled with grudges stared at Noden. Ah. Noden gritted his teeth and shouted, Monster. Run away. Retreat. The bandits started to run away. The speed at which they escaped was fast. Crocta watched them and shrugged. It isn't worth chasing them. He smiled and turned around. Oh my god. Vigo's eyes were shaken after witnessing the dance. It was a short fight but it was enough to guess the orc's level. Only a few knights were able to overcome such a huge difference in numbers. A one-sided slaughter was even rarer. Only a handful of knights, called masters, were capable of it. The master knights all led a unit and were coveted talents in every city, the most important power. In addition, the orcs SS seemed to be beyond a master. Maybe he was a grandmaster. Grandmaster. A true legend that transcended a master. There was only one grandmaster in Alast, where he came from. Vigo was thrilled as he rushed up to Crocta. Orc brother. He hugged Crocta and shook his body to the left and right. It seemed like he was trying to lift Crocta, but Crocta was too heavy. I'm so lucky to meet brother. Orc brother. What is your name? It'll be your brother from now on. I love you. Crocta couldn't tell if this knight was good or shameless. Then the watching Tio came over. Kiak. Kiak. What crocta brother dot? I am the one who saved your life, Tio from Quants dot. Ah, gnome brother. Ha ha ha. Brother. Vigo greets you. He smiled and bowed deeply. I am Knight Vigo of Alast. It's an honor to meet you today. Ha 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 ha. We didn't allow you to. Crocta brother. Tio brother. Ha ha ha. Then Vigo discovered the hiding Aner. Hey. Are you their follower? Ha. Huh. I'm asking if you are their follower. A thin fellow like you. Why is a like you trying to convert me to a follower? W what? You Fukuf. 
Don't stop met his basufuf. Krokta blocked his mouth. This is Aner, a companion. Vigo nodded as he ignored Aner who kept trying to curse. A high Zainer brother? Be careful of his swearing. I, I will be careful. What type of scavenge roof? Thus, they defeated the bandits and met a knight of Alast. Vigo stood up and shouted. Brothers. Be Alastair's strength. Vigo's drunk voice resounded loudly in the pub. The eyes of those drinking gathered on him. Vigo noticed and carefully sat down. The eyes of the drunkards weren't good. What, an Alast? Get out of our neighborhood. They will be crushed and will fall. The men occupying another table cried out. This was a kingdom of humans. After going south from Maillard, there was a wide forest and after that, they would see a human city. Other species were about to enter, but like Orcrox and Maillard, the humans were dominant and the rulers were also human. This was the first checkpoint city, Reynolds. What is a from Alast doing in Reynolds? Be patient, patient. Hey, my mood is bad now. They stared at Vigo with threatening eyes. Beat up that Alast. Vigo's eyebrows twitched. He couldn't endure the insults. At that moment, the door opened. Everyone's breathing stopped. An orc. As soon as the door opened and the horrible face entered the pub, all drunkards regained their spirits. It wasn't a hangover remover. The pub became quiet as the large body with menacing tattoos and a great sword entered the room. Orcs rarely appeared in the south. In addition, it was rare to see such a vicious looking orc among the orcs. The orc looked around the pub with fierce eyes before sitting down at a table. It was the table with the person from Alast. Crocta, you came. Dot. Um. You are late. Crocta had stopped by the blacksmith to repair Ogre Slayer. A lot of blood covered it so it needed to be checked. But why do they call you a from Alast? They use that phrase for you. Dot. Alast? Crocta looked around the eerily quiet pub. It is quiet. There were no more voices mocking Alast. Those who made the threatening remarks were now quietly sipping alcohol while staring at their table. After the silence caused by Crocta, Vigo shouted, Hooray, Alast. Alast was unique in the human territory because it was a city that declared itself completely neutral. In other words, it wasn't under the reign of the king. It hadn't been a problem when the king's existence was just a symbol, but now it was a huge problem when the king declared himself an emperor. He demanded Alastair's submission. The king's policy had changed. The kingdom will soon become an empire. This isn't just our problem. It is a continent-wide problem. HRMM. The great chieftain in the north, and an emperor in the south. Crazy people kept appearing. The world is becoming ridiculous. That's right. It is ridiculous. Vigo lowered his voice as he said, in fact, I think the guy called the Mountain King was chasing after me because of the Emperor. What do you mean? He and his men suddenly appeared and occupied the area. They only attack people traveling to Alast. So I was dispatched for reconnaissance, but my companion was caught. Your companion? My companion Vigo paused. My companion is a brave Alast knight who is now gone. I'm sorry. It is a shame. No. Anyway, those bandits use axes but their movements are definitely trained. In particular, they use the swordsmanship of the kingdom. It is obvious. It doesn't make sense that those guys are just bandits. They must be soldiers assigned here. Vigo thought that the kingdom deliberately created bandits in order to harass Alast. Alastair's future is dark, but I saw hope today, brother. Help Alast. Crocta looked at Tio, who just shrugged. Let's listen a bit more. Dot. Aner didn't speak as he quietly sipped his drink. His hood was down so the females in the pub were also looking at him with strange eyes. He was too handsome. How can we help? Do we have to spend our whole lives in Alast? That is impossible. That's not it. Vigo took another gulp of his beer before thumping the glass against the body. Then he said. Compared to the kingdom, Alast is weak. It is obvious. 
Everyone knows this. So the king calling himself the emperor took mercy on us and made a proposal. A one-on-one -on -one fight between the most powerful person in Alast and the kingdom. A proxy war with the best knights. If Alast won, the kingdom would leave them alone. If the kingdom won, Alast would join the kingdom. Once the king places Alast and other cities under his control, he will change his title to emperor and start earnestly creating an empire. Most places have already joined and among the few remaining cities, our Alast is especially symbolic. It is the biggest situation. Um. You might have guessed already. The kingdom is full of tremendous knights. In particular, Grandmaster Packlinch is an unbeatable knight who has never been defeated. Packlinch? Yes. He is a Dandator Packlinch. Does he have a relationship with Lieutenant Packlinch? Off Trader. You know him. Crocta's eyebrows twitched. Vigo raised both hands. I don't mean anything by it. Please understand. Lieutenant Packlinch. The great warrior in the Hall of Fame, Master of the Great Sword. He was why Crocta used the Great Sword. A human who hated the false hypocrisy of humans and fought with the orcs against his fellow countrymen. Liteno is a distant ancestor of a Dandator Packlinch. A master of the family. I see. In any case, it is expected that he will come out in the proxy war. If he comes out, there is no knight in Alast who can fight against Haima. Vigo's eyes lit up. I have brother today. Please come out in the duel for Alast. Chapter 147 The Emperor one of them. Tio muttered. Crocta who had been sleeping, listened to him. Either the king is crazy or the humans are dot. Why? A person can't call himself an emperor unless he is crazy. If humans weren't crazy, they would stop their king from calling himself an emperor dot. I see. The status of emperor seemed to have special meaning in the world of Elder Lord. An emperor always appeared just before a great war between species would occur on the continent. The past war between humans and orcs that Liteno Packlinch took part in also occurred because the humans had an emperor, and it stopped when the emperor died. Crocta. Hmm. Do you intend to fight in the proxy war? Tio asked. He thought about the words that Vigo, Knight of Alast, had said. It was a bit much to demand that Crocta help in a dangerous fight after they just met, but it was a sign of his urgency. I don't know. I want to refuse but it seems to be that it will affect not only Alast, but all of us. Indeed. Dot. The dynamics of humans will cause the continent to fall into confusion. The emperor stood for a military rule. Maybe the continent would be drawn into a species war after a long period of peace. Othir isn't a single day of quiet on our trip. Dot. The great chieftain in the north and the emperor on the continent. There was trouble wherever they went. Crocta, there is a reason for everything that happens to us. Dot. What a religious remark. Bah. Meaning is an attribute that all species with intelligence have. Dot. Crocta chuckled in a low voice, anyway, the great chieftain in the north and now this place. It is better to think of it as a given mission. Dot. Mission. Crocta closed his eyes. He was a soldier who once had people. He ed people but he didn't know whether the world's suffering was reduced, or whether he only increased the pain. The scale of reality was complicated and difficult to measure. Compared to that, the missions given to him in Elder Lord were simple. It was so simple that he couldn't afford to not do it. I should do the mission. Ho. You will do it yourself. Dot. I can't ignore it. A dandator? Isn't he famous in the South? Dot. Can you win? Aren't you shaking? Dot. Tio started to subtly mock him. Crocta snorted and replied, Not at all. The moon shining through the open window cast a soft light on the bedside. Reynolds was quiet at night. The sound of footsteps could occasionally be heard, but it was mostly calm with only the sound of the wind entering their ears. Aner's breathing was heard from close by as Tio and Crocta whispered to each other. The spirit of sleep was entering their brains, making them feel drowsy. If you go further down from Alast, the sea will appear and there is a beautiful resort village. The name Crocta whispered. Tio's voice gradually softened. 
Gridori. Yes. Gridori. You want to go there. After the work in Alast it would be nice to go there. Okay. The sea, it has been a long time. Do you know how to swim? I am the seal of Quants. That is an exaggeration. Ho ho I will show you. My butterfly. Both their voices gradually subsided. Maybe my father is resting there. That would be nice. Then the two of them fell asleep. In his dream, Crocta was in the ocean. He was standing on white sand and turned around when someone touched him from behind. Next to him were Han Yori and Yusuyan. Then a beach ball flew at his head. There was a sound and he saw Tion Aner laughing while pointing at him. He entered the sea with them. It was a pleasant dream. Crocta, Tio, and Aner woke up early. Tio forced his eyes open as they headed to the dining room on the first floor. Vigo was sleepily eating breakfast with matted hair. Oh, good morning brother. He smiled and raised his hand. He was still in a state where his eyes couldn't open properly. Breakfast is important in a last. Brothers should eat as well. Ill bye. Ho. Really dot. Yes. The food here isn't bad. Landlord. The inn owner was dozing off at the counter. Crocta, Tio, and Aner ordered breakfast according to what they liked. Crocta ate a steak in the morning, Aner had a salad, and Tio ate a sandwich. Now, eat a lot since we have a long way to go. Isn't that right? Let's go to a last. They were planning to go, but Vigo's remark was so brazen that they didn't feel like it. It was like there was no middle ground. Tio shook his head. Rather than a last, we are going to the kingdom. I have the same thought. The kingdom is a place where we can see many things. Dot. Then let's go quickly. Brothers. Go. Aner frowned as he chewed on his salad. Phew, so noisy. Be quiet in the morning. Yes. Vigo sat down at Aner's scolding started to eat his breakfast again. The guests staying at the inn gradually started trickling downstairs. The dining room became filled with guests again. Those who were leaving this morning exited the door with their baggage. Isn't there any knight in Alast that can deal with a dandator? Dot? There is one person, a grandmaster like a dandator. Then why isn't he? Dot? He is old. Alastair's grandmaster was an old, white haired knight. His experience and SS were excellent, but he was old, so many thought it was impossible for him to deal with a dandator. He was also hard at work training pupils. If you go to a last, you can see him once. Not only is his swordsmanship famous, he is known as the master of knights who trains other knights in the right way. Ho! I am a knight because of him. Ha ha ha! He laughed loudly. Crocta is already strong enough, but I'm sure you can get stronger if you meet him. It is the same for the others as well. Even if Aner is a necromancer. Dot. That doesn't matter. As I said, he is a special person. Magicians also learn from him. Vigo spoke enthusiastically. Then when are we leaving? Dot? Tio asked. Oh. You've decided. Vigo jumped up. Crocta laughed as he said, I will go there and decide if I will fight or not. I want to look at the situation. Haha, <laughs> that is enough. You'll know when you come to a last. The reason why I want to protect the last. Vigo shouted, a drink over here. Give me a drink. It is too early in the morning. Dot. We have to go a long way and riding while drunk is the best. We have to celebrate you going to a last. Ha ha ha. The owner brought Vigo a beer as he requested. Crocta eventually followed him by drinking a glass. The other guests became enthusiastic once they saw Crocta's group drinking in the daylight. It was a rampage in the daytime. Thus, they left the inn smelling of alcohol. Ha! 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 Hut! The yells regularly rang out, Bolter. A gigantic roar shook the training grounds. How are the warriors these days? Not enough. It is like talking to Lennox. This was the cradle of orc warriors, orcrocs. 
orcs were training to become warriors. After the death of the great warrior Lennox, another warrior became the new instructor. Hoyt, Lennox's disciple and the one who mastered the hammer, undergoing many fights. He had spent a long time recovering from his injury but after he recovered, he started enthusiastically teaching the orcs. Now the orcs who came to Orcrox learn from Hoyt, not Lennox. Do your best. Yes. Don't just shout. Wield your weapon. One more time. Think of it as the best strike of your life. Understood. This is your greatest attack. Do you want to bet your life? No. Then swing again. Bolter. Every time Hoyt shouted, the orc's momentum changed. They squeezed out more strength, surpassing their limits. Although he was originally a warrior, Hoyt wasn't any less stringent than Lennox as an instructor. What brings you here? Tashaquil. The one who came to see him was the great shaman Tashaquil, the orc shaman instructor at Basque Village. I had a dream. A dream. If any other orc had talked about their dream, Hoyt would have ignored it. But the other person was Tashaquil. The dream of a powerful shaman was like a prophecy in itself, as it contained a clue to the future. He wouldn't come here because of an ordinary dream. What was the dream? I saw a warrior. Tashiquil smiled. He is fighting to become a great warrior. Who? I won't reveal it to others. It is unfair. I can guess who. Really? Well, I wonder he chuckled in a low voice. Fighting to become a great warrior Hoyt looked at his hammer on the ground. A masterpiece from Golden Anvil. The name of the hammer was Mountain Slasher. As the name suggested, anyone hit by this hammer would die. It is very dangerous. That is a warrior's life. Die or become great. Tashiquil chuckled. So I came here. Give me that. He pointed to one side. Hoyt's expression changed. This wasn't sewing he could give to Tashiquil. An old helmet. It was Lennox's legacy, the steel helmet he had used. It was hanging from a bar on one side of the training grounds and watching the orcs, just like Lennox during his life. I can't do that. It is Lennox's. He is gone. I will give it to someone who deserves it. But that it can't be anything else. Yes. I'm reluctant to give the moment that Hoyt was about to refuse. A blast of wind shot through Orcrox. It was strong enough to cause the sand scattered on the ground to rise. Hoyt and Tashiquil covered their faces with their hands. An incredible thing happened. Lennox's helmet was caught by the wind and fell off the bar to the ground. The steel helmet tumbled towards them. It was rare for heavy steel helmets to fly in the wind. Tashiquil laughed. Lennox seems to think he needs it. Hoyt didn't answer. It felt like Lennox's response. Hoyt. Can I send it to the warrior who needs it? Are you going to bring it directly to him? I need to stay in Basque village. Then. Tashiquil whistled. Sewing emerged. A huge shadow appeared. Hoyt laughed at the sight. King of the forest. Yes. This guy will bring the helmet. Now I know for sure who the other person is. A giant tiger. He was one. Five times bigger than a normal tiger. The ruler of Orcrox Forest, the one who created fear in the creatures of the forest. The tiger who was the king of the forest, Simba. The tiger Simba, who defeated the mutant wolf with Crocta, had now matured and reigned as king of the forest. He became a friend of the orcs due to his relationship with Crocta, and came here following Tashiquil's call. Simba. Grung. Give him this. Tashiquil placed the helmet into a sack and tied it around Simba's neck. Simba shook his head and stretched lightly. Can you go? Grung. Yes. Now go. There is no time. Kwong. Simba roared before turning around and running out of the training grounds. The orcs were aghast at the sudden emergence of a tiger. Hoyt spoke in a despondent manner. The tiger and Lennox's helmet. I wonder what type of dream you had. Tashiquil grinned. 
he shook his staff and blessed the warriors in the training ground. Some of them would give up and others would continue to walk this path until they eventually became warriors. Maybe one or two might become great warriors. The king of the humans is calling himself the emperor. Yes. Humans always make the same mistakes. Tashiko looked at the distant sky and said. He will soon meet a warrior. Chapter, 148 They arrived at a last after two days. Outer walls surrounded the white city. This is a last. Isn't it beautiful? The walls were gray while a last shone white like marble. Krokta nodded. Beautiful. It is sowing a last has long been proud of. It is said that the white dragon Ariadne built it with magic. A legend. Thanks to Knight Vigo, they were smoothly granted access. The guard saluted Vigo. Vigo shook his head and pointed to Krokta. Not this way. This brother will save Alast so salute him. He will help Alast. He is an incredible, strong orc warrior. I will recommend him for the kingdom duel. Oh. It is nice to meet you. Alast. Alast. Their eyes lit up and they saluted Krokta. Normally people were afraid of orcs, but they actually felt admiration as they looked at Krokta's scary face. Krokta brother will scold a dandator. Krokta. We believe in you. That a dandator will be overthrown just looking at Krokta's face. He didn't know if it was praise or gossip but Krokta nodded. Vigo exchanged more well wishes with the guards before entering Alast with Krokta. Then the landscape of Alast was revealed. Aina responded first, Whoa! Tio, who rarely admired the culture of other species, cried out in a small voice. This is quite good. Dot. Krokta smiled and remarked, How great! The inside of Alast was a beautiful white. Although Arnon, the city of elves was white, Alast was a pleasing blend of white and blue colors. It was just like a Mediterranean city. Vigo puffed out his chest and proudly proclaimed, we designed the last to be aesthetically pleasing. Ha ha ha. The urban landscape department and the citizens cooperated to avoid harming the beauty of this city. I've never seen a person who hasn't admired it. He was filled with pride for the city's appearance. As Vigo appeared with three people of varied species, the citizens stared in wonder. However, unlike other cities, Krokta couldn't feel any fear towards orcs. Krokta realized it was because of Vigo being next to him. Hello, Mr. Knight. Who is the orc uncle next to you? He has come to help Alast. Wow. Thank you. The children smiled brightly and greeted Vigo. Everywhere Vigo went, citizens would greet and thank Vigo. Some citizens, who had never seen anyone from another species, even asked for a handshake from Krokta. Alast was filled with respect for their knights. There might be an unfamiliar orc but they thought there was no harm because a knight was beside him. Aner smiled and said, this is a good place. That's right. The streets of Alast was filled with vigor. The back alleys didn't seem visible as they walked through the city. The Lord of Alast doesn't charge a high tax. Alast has quality marble and big silver mines, so there is plenty of money around. It is a gift from the gods. As they looked around the surroundings, they eventually arrived at the Lord's residence in the center of the city. Knights were guarding it, but they knew Vigo and welcomed his return. Vigo. They looked between Vigo and Krokta's group. Who are they? Where is Marensen? Vigo explained the whole story. First of all, he announced the death of his colleague who went to scout with him. The faces of the knights changed. He explained Krokta's actions and his suggestion to have Krokta do the duel instead, causing the guards to stare strangely. Krokta understood the look in their eyes. A competitive spirit. They wanted to directly verify if he had the SS. Krokta grinned. He didn't hate that attitude. A knight needed such a mindset. Let's go inside first. Speak to the Lord. They opened the way. A woman who seemed to be a staff member guided them upstairs. The Lord was more frugal than he thought. The distinct architectural style of Alast was reflected but there were no luxurious decorations. They climbed the stairs and entered a room. 
the employee who guided them knocked on the door. Lord! Knight Vigo is here. Come in. The voice of the Lord was heard. Crocta's group and Vigo thanked the employee before entering the room. The Lord was a sturdy middle-aged man with red hair and beard. He was talking with someone and his eyes widened as he saw the orc that appeared. Hmm. I greet the Lord. Hey Vigo. Who is your orc friend standing there? As Vigo communicated with the Lord, Crocta gazed at the man sitting with him. He was an elderly man who was going bald. The weight of the years showed on his face, but his posture was straight without any signs of weakness. He wore a sword alone with his comfortable clothes. Crocta instinctively knew who he was. This man was the old grandmaster that Vigo had mentioned. Once they reached a certain level, they could see many things just by looking at each other. An image was drawn. Crocta wielded his sword at the man. In a world where speed converged, the man didn't dodge but moved forward. He narrowly avoided the great sword and swung his sword at Crocta's abdomen. Crocta twisted his body and the two swords met. Sword, sword, a blow. Evasion and changing of offense and defense. Their internal struggle continued for a while before a remark ended it. Isn't that right? Crocta didn't know what the question was. The white haired knight smiled. He also woke up from his fight against Crocta. What did you say? Is Crocta brother the northern conqueror Crocta? Vigo asked again. At first, I wasn't sure but now I am quite confident. Vigo also knew Crocta's identity. His reputation had spread widely. Crocta nodded. That is what they sometimes call me. Indeed. The Lord's eyes grew bigger at Crocta's reply. He exchanged looks with the knight he was sitting with. The Lord rose from his seat and approached Crocta. His body was conditioned from steady training. Thank you for the difficult decision. Alast will never forget the help of Northern Conqueror Crocta. It seemed like Vigo had spoken like Crocta already agreed to do the proxy duel. Vigo was frowning from behind the Lord. Crocta just laughed. No. I was impressed by Vigo's sincerity when he said that he would dedicate three months of his own salary. Oh Vigo, really? Huh, yes. How impressive. Ah, that. Crocta noticed that the Lord was also joking, but Vigo mumbled hesitantly. At that moment, don't make fun of the young knight. A hoarse voice was heard. It was a low, rough, yet resonate voice. It was an unusual tone that was attractive. The knight got up from his spot. He had a lean body and was a similar height to Crocta. Truly a great warrior. The knight reached Crocta and looked him up and down. The Grand Master's instinct was warning him about Crocta. The orc's solid body meant they usually fought with strength, but this orc warrior seemed more sophisticated than a human or elf. He had fast and accurate greatsword SS. You are stronger than me. He admitted it. The Lord and Vigo were shocked as soon as Alastair's living legend recognized his opponent's superiority. To that extent. Yes, it seems like he can overthrow a Dandator. It is clear at first glance. Oh. I can now understand how you conquered the North alone. The gods are taking care of Alast. He smiled and reached out to Crocta, who held his hand. Crocta. I am an old knight of Alast, Galadin. I am the orc warrior from Orcrox, Crocta. It was the meeting of Grandmaster Galadin, the guardian of Alast, and Crocta, the conqueror of the North. Vigo and the Lord laughed heartily at the sight. Lord, Alastair's future is bright. Galadin is old and Crocta is an outsider. Alastair's future relies on young knights like you. Um. Is it still bright? It is a little cloudy. That's why I'm so old. I'm sorry. The knights arranged to retrieve the corpse of the knight Ed by the mountain king. Galadin looked at the knights arranged in a polite manner. His words were short. Our friend has come. The funeral will be held later. Yes. The leader of the knights raised a hand to his chest and bowed. I will start now. I'll allow it. To battle. The knights turned around. 
then they headed outside alast. The voices of the citizens cheering for the knights could be heard. Tia watched them and asked. You will be fighting the kingdom soon. Can you really send the knights away? There is no chance of victory if we fight properly. The other side proposed the duel first so they will stick to it. They have to fear the eyes of the gods and the citizens. Crocta touched his chin. He pondered on sewing before asking Vigo. Vigo. Yes, brother. Alas. He remembered why the name Alast was familiar. In the early days, he searched for tips on Elder Lord and saw a user advertising that Alast was a good place to live. The person who posted the message was called Alastepra. At the time, the user had aspirations to become a senior official in Alast and to develop it. Do you have anybody who is cursed by the stars? We do. There are a lot of them in the city. What about a person in a high position? Ah, uh, are you talking about Yellow? Yellow? Yes. You would have met her before. Vigo pointed to a young lady. The woman who guided us. Ah, uh, her. Crocta nodded. When they entered the Lord's residence, a woman had guided them. She had banged so he hadn't seen her forehead, but she was also a user. Over time, as the level of users rose and strategies came into play, there were those who took an active role in different walks of life. In the past, there was the militia member Kim Dokwang, but other users had built their own domains in Elder Lord. She has a quick mind and her work is good, so the Lord trusts her. Why are you asking about those cursed by the stars? I am asking because there are those cursed by the stars on the side of the kingdom. Ha, huh, there are those guys. The person called Rommel is famous. He is favored by the king, so you might see him at the duel. Rommel was the name for Choi Hansung. The duel was in a week. The entire South knew that this was a fight between a Dandator and Galadin, despite the names of the knights being concealed. They were the most famous knights on both sides. It was also agreed that the kingdom would win. A Dandator was a young and powerful supernova, while Galadin was too old. Unfortunately, the one who would duel for a last was Crocta, not Galadin. It was a variable that no one expected. Crocta. Galadin's distinctive low voice called out to him. Crocta turned his head. Galadin was dressed in a knight's equipment, making him seem young again. Previously he looked like an old man, but now he was a thriving warrior. Crocta smiled and pulled out Ogre Slayer. Galadin. The two of them walked towards the knight's training ground. Both of them wanted to test the other. Their spar would be calm and at the same time, very dangerous. The atmosphere around you is good but I have to see it directly. As I grow older, I become more suyous, Galadin said. Crocta realized sewing. Due to the wrinkles on his face, Crocta hadn't seen his true expression. Galadin wasn't a gentlemanly knight. I will do it softly. Crocta shrugged and said, I don't want to hear the sound of an old man's bones breaking. Kukuku. Galadin was an aggressive fighter. It is good to be young. Before Crocta could take a stance, his strike hit Crocta's body. Chapter, 149. Yellow lived in a last and realized that someone had visited her bedside last night. There was a letter on the desk next to her bed. She got goosebumps as she checked the letter. This. She wondered who sent it. The author didn't state their identity, as only a few things were mentioned. However, it contained sewing shocking that she had never considered at all. No way, she murmured. Perhaps. But it made sense. She read the letter once again before exiting Elder Lord. Crocta sat in front of a fireplace with Vigo. I didn't see Yellow today. Was she dragged by the call of the stars? I truly feel sorry for that friend. The NPCs understood the concept of disconnection as the users being summoned to the abyss. In a way, it wasn't wrong. Going back and forth between Elder Lord and Earth. This situation often happened so users found it hard to have a close relationship with NPCs. It was hard to trust those who suddenly disappeared ahead of important things. Therefore, users who couldn't connect for long tended to only socialize with other users. 
This was because NPCs didn't trust them. Yellow is normally good so this is surprising. Of course, Yellow was excellent in Elder Lord. She had been living like an NPC for nearly a year. This allowed her to move up to the position of working for the Lord. I guess she has sewing to do. Crocta smiled strangely. She probably ended the connection after reading the letter that Crocta sent her at night. He wasn't sure if it would work, but he needed to do what he could. The kingdom's path involved the Heaven and Earth clan. It was already a public fact and there was a precedent where they devastated any areas in the name of the kingdom. In particular, the southeast region with no clear system was brutally destroyed and the ruins broadcasted several times. The Heaven and Earth clan didn't keep faith with NPCs. As long as they considered Elder Lord a game, Crocta needed to extend this dual agreement not only to NPCs but users as well. By the way, what are they doing? Vigo turned his head at Crocta's words. In the meantime, Grandmaster Galadin and Aynar were staring at each other. Oh. Aynar, who was very timid and not good with eye contact, desperately tried to turn his head away with red cheeks. It looked so funny that Tio joined Galadin in staring at Aynar. As the eyes of the two people focused on him, Aynar turned his eyes towards his hands. I got it. Stop. Stop. Galadin and Tio chuckled. You will be stronger if you don't avoid the eyes of others. Tio approached, in other words, don't act like this forever. Kahahat. Ahiu. Aynar seemed like he was about to cry. It is strange when you keep staring. You are very shy. Don't avoid other people's eyes. It is a shame. Hahat. <laughs> Galadin was famous for identifying people's characteristics and leading them to the right path. Crocta seemed to know the secret after exchanging blows with him. Galadin had the ability to read inner thoughts, like he was telepathic. During the spar, he predicted all of Crocta's moves. There was the feeling that he knew in advance every move Crocta was going to do and could cope with it. Crocta won, but he wasn't sure the results would be the same if they really tried to each other. He is a mysterious person. Crocta stated. That is correct. A mysterious person. He looks inside people. If he could really see into a person's heart, he would be able to find out their problems. His teachings were about inner matters, rather than technical ones. Crocta also received advice from him. What did he say to brother? If you don't mind, please let me know. I am curious. Is a warrior like you lacking anything? Um, Crocta recalled Galadin's words. Just. Vigo was right. Galadin wasn't just a person who strengthened knights. When wielding a sword, he was an aggressive knight. But after putting it away, he looked at the other person with warm eyes. He was someone who caused the other person to grow as a human. He told me not to shoulder everything alone. Oh, indeed. Brother has sewing. Vigo raised his thumb. Doesn't he feel like a father when he says that? Crocta laughed. His father passed away but memories from his childhood still remained. He never resented his parents. In life, how many people had the strength to look straight at themselves? That's right. Now it was Tio's turn to receive advice from Galadin. However, Tio disliked this and refused his advice. An angry Galadian wielded his sword. Tio ran away. Stop. Dot. I understand. I understand. Dot. This guy. Listen to the adults. I am an adult. Dot. If you are an adult, listen to a real adult. I am a gnome. General, general. General. Shoot it once. Kiak. Tio screamed as he ran away from Galadin's wooden sword. Crocta and Vigo burst out laughing as they saw it. Phew. Truly. The still embarrassed Aynar was fanning himself as he walked towards Crocta. We have to watch you for you to grow. Isn't it? Excuse me. Vigo and Crocta stared at Aynar, mimicking Galadin and Tio from earlier. Aynar blushed. No, now. They diligently gazed at Aynar's face. Aynar was embarrassed and covered his face. Don't do it. Ah. 
Aner's face turned bright red as he ran somewhere else. Aner brother is both handsome and cute. The females will like him. Kokokol. It was enjoyable. Alast was a vibrant city filled with laughter. Whether it was the nature of the people or the richness of the natural environment, they seemed to enjoy each moment. Of course, it wasn't just due to material reasons that laughter was gradually disappearing from the prosperous modern age compared to Elder Lord. Vigo. You were right. What do you mean? Alast is a wonderful place. Of course. I don't lie. Ha ha ha. Viva Alast. Kokoko. In a matter of days, Crocta had explored all over Alast. Every time he walked through a city, Crocta felt fear towards him, whether it was because he was an orc or his frightening appearance. In fact, he wasn't a real orc but a human being wearing the shell of an orc. However, there were still negative prejudices towards his shell. But Alast was different. The children came to play with Crocta while merchants added orc goods. He felt like a welcomed guest. Brother. Now you know. Why I kept hanging on to you, despite it being the first time we met. Vigo placed a hand on Crocta's shoulder and gazed into the distance. The kingdom and a dandator is trying to destroy such a beautiful place. Once incorporated into the kingdom, this landscape would disappear. The citizens would suffer under heavy taxes and young people would be conscripted for war. The lands under the kingdom's reign were already going through this process. Crocta nodded. I heard that a dandator is a handsome, young man. Yes. His face is famous. Then he'll beat him up and make him look worse than me. Crocta shouted. It was Crocta's declaration that he would protect Alast with his best efforts. But Vigo wasn't very impressed by the remark. No matter how much you hit him, it will be difficult. Crocta's face stiffened. Vigo hurriedly changed his words. Ah, uh, no. I believe in brother. It is okay. Ill fight in the duel. What are you talking about? Brother's face is better than his. Really? I'm not lying. The Elder Lord community had recently heated up because of a new topic. And the one at the heart of the topic was the Heaven and Earth Clan. Author Yellow Alast. Title announcing the negotiations between those who love Alast and the Heaven and Earth Clan. Hello. I am a native of Alast, Yellow who loves Alast. The human kingdom is expanding its forces in recent years. The Alast that I love is in crisis but most users don't know exactly what is happening. The kingdom and Alast have decided to settle their fighting in a one-on-one -on -one duel through their respective representatives. We can settle this without having to fight against each other. If the kingdom wins, Alast will be incorporated into the kingdom. If Alast wins, it will remain independent as a neutral city and the kingdom won't invade Alast in the future. In fact, the possibility of us winning is low. Even though we have Grandmaster Galadin, the kingdom has the famous Adandator. However, the users who love Alast are eager for a miracle to happen. Anyway, the reason I am writing this is to plead with the Heaven and Earth clan. There are users who regard NPCs as consumables, mere artificial intelligence and doesn't feel any remorse. The Heaven and Earth clan especially has such tendencies. So we are worried that even if Galadin and Alast wins, the Heaven and Earth clan will ignore the existing negotiations and hit Alast. Users often do this, not just the Heaven and Earth clan. People will know this. But we are users who love Alast, and we hope that the users, including the Heaven and Earth clan, will accept the result. Therefore, we have asked the Heaven and Earth clan to sign a memorandum stating that they will comply with the agreement between Alast and the Kingdom. Heaven and Earth's clan master Choi Hansung has agreed. This is the actual memorandum. Screenshot. I am posting this here because I hope that all users who enjoy Elder Lord will be the notaries of this memorandum. We don't want Elder Lord to be ruined by a reckless war. If there are hundreds of users, there are hundreds of ways to play. I fell in love with Alast from the first moment I saw it. Alast is a really beautiful place. I used to always brag about it and I am still proud. If Alast is defeated, I will probably disappear from this forum. I will also delete my character. 
There is no reason to play. If there are people who want to continue seeing it like me, please pray with us. I hope for a miracle. A last lover, Yellow. Yellow posted on a famous community board. This article immediately became a hot topic. The first reason was that the greatest knights in Elder Lord, two grandmasters were having a confrontation. Another reason was that the author was Yellow, a user who managed to become a senior official. Yellow was the user whose name became famous with an Elder Lord strategy guide. Users who wanted to become civil servants in Elder Lord would regard her guide as a textbook. In addition, she introduced users to the calm lifestyle of Alast and made many users turn to Alast. Her article became a hot topic and thousands of comments had already been posted. The Heaven and Earth clan also confirmed her post. Is it okay? Hyunchul, Luin in Elder Lord said. After helping to lure and Lennox, he was now an executive in the Heaven and Earth clan. In addition, using his friendship with the NPCs and Choi Hansung, Keynes went from being the clan master of Thawing Balhi to the vice clan master of Heaven and Earth. The clan master was Rommel but most of the clan's actions came from Kane's head. There's nothing to worry about. Rommel smiled and drank his wine. This was the clan dwelling in the capital, Esperanza. It was a land they had received directly after gaining the favor of the king. The room they were talking in was luxurious and wasn't lacking when compared to a noble's house. All of this was due to the members of Thawing Balhi who joined heaven and earth. Do you really think a dandator can be beaten? Indeed. He is a monster. I've talked to a dandator and he is confident that he can beat Galadin. Galadin is old and a dandator has already reached a new level. I'm glad that monster isn't our enemy. I completely agree. So don't worry. The woman thinks it will work, but it will end without a problem. Rommel handed the wine glass to Keynes who was sitting silently. Kane smiled and received it. Why aren't you saying anything? There is sewing that bothers me. Kane's nerves were sharp after the Maillard branch of the clan collapsed. All of Maillard's members mentioned the NPC called Crocta. Everyone knew that the thawing Balhi had been destroyed by the righteous orc. A coincidence? Or maybe he was chasing after them in the Heaven and Earth clan. Don't worry about it. You are here now. Yes. Keynes nodded. Even so, he couldn't help being worried. Rommel laughed. Keynes, you are always worrying. Lewin suddenly said, speaking of worrying, what will happen if a dandator is beaten? Um well, it can't be helped. I actually thought about ignoring it but then that girl made the post. Yellow's head is quite good. It's a last hurrah. Anyway, a dandator will win. Now, drink. Rommel, Lewin, Keynes, and the other high-ranking members of the Heaven and Earth clan nodded. They raised their cups at the same time and shouted, Heaven and Earth. War. A few days later on a sunny day, both the Lord of Alast and the King of the Kingdom led their knights out on the Gabriel Plains located not too far from Alast. It was for the Great Duel. Chapter, 150. The two sides confronted each other on the plains. The kingdoms and Alastair's flags danced in the wind. The king and the lord of Alast headed towards each other on horseback. It is great to see you. It has been a while, Earl Alast. The king was a young man, the epitome of a noble with blonde hair and observant, blue eyes. Of course, he was more than a mere noble. He was the king who would soon stand at the top. It's a good day. I will cleanly accept the result today. In the name of the gods. Yes. I will as well. I hope your highness keeps the words you said beforehand. The king's eyes narrowed. Earl Alastair's expression didn't change. The king asked, you seem to have confidence. How is Galadin? He's as upright as always. Do you want to see him? It's okay. It is enough to see you instead of that old man's face. Both of them didn't avoid the other's eyes. Okay. The king's lips twisted before he smiled and said, Once the sun comes up to the middle, the duel will start. He'll tell a dandator to control his strength in consideration for Galadin's old age. Thank you for your words. Just. Just. 
Galadin won't be fighting today. What? The king gazed at the lord with a suyous expression. Then who will come out? You will see when the sun rises to the middle. The king's face twisted at the lord's relaxed attitude. He was dissatisfied with the lord's relaxed attitude and confused about the unknown warrior. He spat out in a rough voice, yes, you'll see soon. They turned around and returned to their camps. Lord Alast immediately sought out Crocta who was in a tent at the rear of the camp. His face was stiff with tension. However, he couldn't help smiling at the sight within the tent. Crocta was lying on a bed and humming, while Vigo was sitting next to the bed and fanning Crocta. Are you cool? Harder. Haya. Do it properly. You will be responsible if my condition isn't good. No. Brother. A knight should have a better wrist snap. He didn't seem like a warrior who had the fate of the city on his shoulders. That made him seem more reliable. This was none other than Northern Conqueror Crocta. He would clearly be able to cope with a dandator. Even Galadin acknowledged that Crocta was stronger than him. The Lord decided to give up worrying. It had already left his hands. He had dealt the best hand he could. Vigo. Yes, Lord. Fan him properly. The future of a last hangs on your fan. Cough. Yes. Tio and Aner came together and weren't worried at all. They were dozing in a corner of the tent. They had drunk alcohol all night. They were friends who had no tension at all. Crocta, I want to thank you once again. Thank you for your willingness to go to such a dangerous place. Kokoko. There is no need for thanks, I am just doing the work of a warrior. Crocta leisurely stretched while enjoying the breeze from the fan. So when is the duel? Noon. Crocta looked at the sky through the open gap in the tent. It was pretty soon. Trumpets sounded. Both sides were nervous. The sun had risen above their heads. Now the duel would begin. It was a fight to determine the future of each side. So many things were involved. A dandator appeared first. The king placed a hand on his shoulder and spoke to him. A dandator answered in a short manner. It is lively. A dandator was a beautiful young man. His body was well balanced. He was still young, but he was a seasoned knight who had gone through many battles. Then it was time for Alastair's representative to come out. Crocta walked forward. The kingdom's side was shaken and murmurs gradually spread. They all expected the warrior for Alast to be Galadin. It was common knowledge that the best knight in Alast was Galadin, and there was no stronger knight. The kingdom was convinced of their victory because Galadin was too old compared to a dandator. However, a surprising figure appeared. An orc. A warrior with a heinous face and tattoos all over his body. His enormous mass and greatsword could be seen clearly from afar. A dandator looked at him curiously. It wasn't a tense face. He thought it would be a tragic comedy. I am a dandator Packlinch. Who are you? He was curious about the orc standing in front of him. Are you really the representative of Alast? Crocta nodded. The planes gradually became quiet. Crocta smiled and looked at a dandator. My name is Crocta. I came from Orcrox and stand here to guard Alast. A dandator's eyes widened. Crocta. He knew that name. It was the unidentified orc who ed the great chieftain and blocked them before the call for the northern war began in earnest. On that day, all the gods whispered to his name. Alast has prepared a hidden card. His expression recovered and he lifted his sword. A dandator didn't use a great sword like Crocta. It was a thin and long sword that looked elegant. Both of them used Packlinch's swordsmanship, but they had different attitudes and atmosphere. Crocta asked, Do you know Liteno Packlinch? Ho. A dandator laughed. The traitor Liteno. Orcs should know him. Yes, I know Liteno. He is a coward on the side of the orcs. The traitor who turned his sword against us. That is why he is a blot to the rest of the Packlinch family. In the end, he died miserably. A coward. A traitor. A blot. 
Crocta laughed out loud. The Liteno that Crocta heard about was absolutely not a coward. He wasn't a traitor or a blot, but a shining star. The hero who followed the path of his sword. Everyone would have blamed him. If Liteno just closed his eyes and aimed his sword at the orcs, he could gain wealth and honor. However, he gritted his teeth and did what he believed was right. He wasn't a slave but his own master. If he followed the same direction that all the other fingers were pointing, he was just a slave. However, Liteno shook his head and pointed to the other side alone. He straightened up, pointed to his own beliefs and moved. That was why he would stand forever in the Hall of Fame. Liteno Paklinch would never die. None of the warriors in the Hall of Fame would die. Right now, I will connect to Liteno Paklinch's will. Crocta raised his greatsword. As Crocta reached a higher ground, he had gone beyond Latino's swordsmanship but it was still alive in Ogre Slayer. Feel it yourself. Paklinch. Show me your blade, orc. A dandator grinned. You are ignorant. I can see an echo of the traitor. Okay, just once. At this moment, everyone on the plains was watching Crocta and a dandator. Let's do it. A dandator plunged in first. Crocta watched him. The world slowed. A dandator's handsome face was shining with a mixture of arrogance and self confidence. Crocta's greatsword swung towards his shining face. Kang! A dandator was a genius and was waiting for Crocta in the realm of the pinnacle. The two blades met several times. It was a battle that ordinary eyes couldn't follow. They exchanged blows for a long time. As explosive sounds were heard from both sounds, small wounds appeared on their bodies. Blood splattered on both their faces. There would be cheers from both sides whenever dust rose as a result of the collision between swords. It was a fight of absolute power that could rarely be seen. At that moment, Crocta's battle cry shook the plains. Bolter. It was like an earthquake occurred as the audience members' legs shook from the roar. A dandator, who faced it directly, felt like his heart was going to stop. Crocta's overwhelming presence was pouring toward him. As his eyes flicked, the trajectory of the great sword flying towards him changed in a subtle way. A dandator tried to block it but was thrown back by a huge power. Kuhik. The moment of the attack, Crocta's fist struck a dandator's abdomen. A dandator flew through the air and landed on the ground. Crocta's powerful blow. Wah! Alastair's side cheered. On the other hand, the side of the kingdom became completely quiet. A dandator stood up. He shuddered from the impact as blood poured from his nose. Crocta laughed and raised his finger, signaling his opponent to quickly come at him. Coco, are you okay? You aren't a mere child. I understand. A dandator laughed. He spat out the blood in his mouth. Then he took a serious posture with his sword. His body started to enter the pinnacle. Over and over, he once again reached a high ground. The world was still. He jumped and brandished his sword at Crocta. Crocta blocked it with Ogre Slayer. However, his skin was torn and blood poured out. Crocta hurriedly stepped back. This time, it was the kingdom's side that cheered. A dandator smiled and repeated Crocta's words, are you okay? Crocta responded with a smile, you also aren't a mere child. Kill kill kill. Crocta calmly raised Ogre Slayer. A dandator was a genius. He could believe that. A dandator had surpassed the realm of the pinnacle. It was the realm of the hero that Crocta had learned while crossing life and death. If so, Crocta should do the same thing. The cheers and boos became mixed together. The sun was shining above their heads. Sweat was pouring down their cheeks as they recognized the weight of the weapons they held. A formidable opponent. A high level of swordsmanship where anyone could win was implemented. An interesting opponent. They moved their bodies while thinking the same thing. The strands of causality started to converge on both of them. The strands of causality stretched out like tentacles towards each other. One step, one stroke, a stepping motion, every time the blades moved, they aimed to create a life or death injury. Indeed, Paklinch's blood was very deep. 
I never thought you would follow this far. A dandator was inwardly impatient. He was convinced that he could win without fail if Galadin was his opponent. But then this orc appeared instead of Galadin. His instinct sent a warning. They were both on the same ground. This orc had also surpassed the pinnacle. Maybe he would die today. The chains of causality stretching from Crocta sought to swallow a dandator. The sun was blazing above his head. It was hot. A dandator's eyes were dazzled. If he was careless, the orc would cause him to die under this sun. In the infinitely slow world, Crocta and the dandator met each other. Sweat trickled down a dandator's face. But he never looked away. Now the planes were still. They felt that the fight had reached a realm that they didn't dare to evaluate. The first one to move was a dandator. He exploded his power in order to win the battle before it lengthened even further. Pressure rose from his body. His power reversed causation and rushed towards Crocta's death. It was like a tsunami was heading towards Crocta. Numerous blades were aiming at his neck. Causality sped towards Crocta's death. Crocta aimed for a dandator's death and cancelled out the attack. Blood poured from wounds on his limbs. The blades from a dandator inevitably fell towards Crocta from all angles. They pierced his shoulders, sides, and thighs at the same time. Ugh. Crocta fell down. Walk. A dandator didn't miss this gap and rushed forward. He wanted to finish this in one blow. A huge wave pushed towards Crocta. Death seemed unstoppable. The handful of wind, bubbles, nail-sized mass and every other trivial thing could cause death. Compared to that, the tool called a sword, which was made to others, was like a large army advancing towards death. Dozens then hundreds of swords poured towards Crocta. The probability of survival and probability of death were reversed. Life itself led to death. However. Bolter. Crocta whispered. As a dandator's tsunami of death flew towards him, he started weaving together the causation of the world. It was risky. This was the first time Crocta thought about death since the battle against the great chieftain. He needed to risk everything to overcome a dandator's blow. Crocta held Ogre Slayer. He would fight back with his life on the line. However, at that moment, Crocta suddenly saw sewing. I am alive. He didn't know what it was. However, Crocta instinctively leaned towards the line that was passing through the world. It was a color that was hard to describe. It was a color that didn't exist in the world. That line penetrated both the visible world that people could see, the world of the pinnacle and the world of the hero that reversed causality. Even death couldn't bear it. Honor. What was that line? In addition, the color as well. Why was it so radiant? The moment that his body touched that line. The whole world pushed Crocta's back. It was a helping hand to raise all the sinking things. Crocta rushed towards the infinitely unfolding tsunami of death. He flew towards the infinite expanse of the abyss. Bolter. There was light. It was a long fight. Crocta and the Dandator gradually entered a state of fighting that couldn't be understood. Only a few senior ranking knights could feel the level. The two repeated the gains and losses as they kept attacking each other. Blood sporadically splattered but they didn't back down. The king stared blankly and inadvertently dropped his wine glass. However, the king and his knights were conscious of the pieces of glass. It might be a fight that they could never see again in their lives. I can't believe it. At that moment, a dandator rushed like crazy. It was an attack on everything. As if a storm was taking place around his body, countless attacks were launched. Crocta blocked with his great sword but fell down to one knee. A dandator didn't miss this and chased him. Everyone sensed that it was the final blow. There was a black wave. In that instance, the kingdom was convinced that a dandator had won. It was a blow containing everything. No one could survive that hit. Then. A bolt of light. It was a very short moment. Light enveloped the planes. It was a color that had never been seen before. They didn't know what color it was. It destroyed a dandator's black wave. 
the light disappeared and dust rose up. They could only see that a Dandator's sword was broken and Krokta's ogre slayer was pointed at his neck. Silence fell over the plains. The winner and loser didn't move. There was silence. The clouds moving through the sky stopped. Then a gnome standing on Alastair's side broke the silence. Kahahaha. Victory dot. There was no tension in the voice. Then Alastair's side understood the situation and started cheering. They threw their weapons and helmets and yelled. Everyone embraced each other as they shouted. Wah! We won! Hooray alas! Alas! Hooray Crocta! Alas! Alas! The kingdom side was silent. The faces of the young king, his knights and the heaven and earth executive stiffened. They hadn't expected a dandator to be defeated. However, the orc Crocta had ruined their ambitions. Damn it, that person I knew it. The former master of thawing Balhi and current vice master of heaven and earth, Keynes muttered. That Crocta kept continuing to disturb him. The guy who got rid of thawing Balhi. Now he was chasing the heaven and earth clan and hindering their work. He gritted his teeth. Somehow, he had to get rid of that orc. Rommel kept silent with a stiff face. A Dandator dropped his weapon and declared his surrender, causing the duel to completely end. The Lord of Alast approached the king. Now that victory had been decided, the Alast Lord descended from his horse and bowed towards the king in a polite manner. Please accept the result. Your Highness. Instead of answering, the king quietly turned his head away. The Lord of Alast smiled and stepped back. He felt very uncomfortable. But it didn't matter now. It was time to go back to Alast and celebrate. Alast scheduled a city-wide festival. The protagonist was Crocta. Everyone praised him as the hero who saved Alast. Crocta's group traveled through the streets and shared food and alcohol with the citizens. To the children, he wasn't an orc but an orc knight. The children gathered every time he appeared. They were all calling Crocta's name. There was a proposal to build a statue of Crocta in commemoration of today. All the sculptors in Alast volunteered. Crocta shook his head but was forced to accept their will. His appearance, made of marble, was to remain in Alast forever. There were women confessing to Aenor. Aenor didn't avoid them, staring straight into their eyes as he politely refused. They smiled and expressed their thanks for Aenor's gentlemanly attitude. Teo hit Aenor's ass. Yellow appeared and hugged Crocta before giving him a kiss on the cheek. Crocta couldn't stop her actions. She loved the last and praised Crocta, stating that she would be his fan in the future. People were surprised since this was the first time they saw her drunkenness. Teo eventually accepted Galadin's advice. Crocta didn't know the specifics, but Galadin laughed heartily while Teo remained patient. His expression was rotten but his attitude was so polite that Crocta and Aina ridiculed him. Teo closed his eyes and endured it. Crocta's group enjoyed the atmosphere but eventually had to leave Alast. As Alast has heroes, Alast promised that they would always receive a warm welcome. All the citizens blessed their way as Crocta's group left the gate. Crocta's group was heading towards the resort city Gridori. After Crocta's group left, the kingdom broke their agreement and invaded Alast. Alast was devastated. The kingdom became an empire, and the king became an emperor. Chapter 151. The rain fell down in droves, relentlessly striking the umbrellas. Ian tilted his umbrella and looked up at the sky. A steady stream of water poured out from the grey sky. Suddenly, the sound of music was heard from a store. It had a catchy melody. He didn't know whose song it was, but it was sung by a familiar voice he heard often. The singer was singing about a goodbye in a melancholy tone. Students ran splashing through the water. Ian's feet were wet. He looked down at his wet feet. The neon signs were reflected on the surface of the puddles and the sound of laughter from distant children overlapped with the rain. Ian shook his head. Gloomy thoughts filled his head. This wasn't good. Ian tried to clear his mind. What are you doing? You look miserable. A voice broke through Ian's thoughts. 
he looked back and saw you. She was smiling at him from under her colorful umbrella. Hello. Eiyu was with Yunbora. Yunbora bowed awkwardly as Ian greeted her lightly. Was Appa waiting long? Yes. I waited a long time. Well, that might be the case. Bora was the one who made me late. Isn't that right? No, you. Right. Hey. Appa, Eiyu is falsely blaming me. Be quiet. Ian smiled as he glanced at the two of them and asked, Okay, what do you want to eat? I was thinking about it. I got over 900 points, so shouldn't it be 90,000 won per person? Didn't you say don't worry about the price? Yoon Bora poked Eiyu's side, who shrugged. Today was the day when Eiyu received her TOEIC score. On the day of the exam, Eiyu had suggested this if she got the score that she was aiming for, and Ian had accepted without thinking. Her target score was quite high so he internally thought it would be difficult. But she was quite good at languages and eventually got the score she was aiming for. Yoon Bora, who took the test with her, decided to accompany her. Ian smiled and said, yes, then let's go somewhere expensive. At least 90,000 won. Yuum. She didn't know a place that was so expensive. How could a student living off pocket money suddenly think about expensive food? At best, only the tuna that Han Yori liked came to mind. However, Eiyu didn't like eating raw fish when it was raining. So Eiyu looked at Yun Bora, as if urging her to say sewing. But Yun Bora shook her head. She didn't know anything about expensive food. Eiyu struggled for a moment before opening her mouth, be beef. Ian looked at her with raised eyebrows. W what? Just follow me. Bora SSI, do you have anywhere you want to go? No. Everything is good. Oh, if you just. Is that so? Ah, uh, where are we going? Eu cried out impatiently. You just have to follow me. Ian led them as he headed to the restaurant that he ate at with Ji Heian. He hadn't driven his car so they took a taxi. The employees remembered him from when he came with Ji Heian and treated him deferentially. Ian refused to be served directly by the manager. An employee escorted him to a private room. Ian naturally ordered the coarse dishes. Various dishes came out as Eu nagged at him. Ian and Eu tasted the food, talked and laughed at jokes. Then a voice popped into Ian's head. Viva Alast. The lively laughter of Alast was overlaid over Eu and Yunbora's voices. He recalled the shrimp dish that had been served to him by Alast's best chef. The sweet and sour taste of the shrimp made him constantly eat it, leaving him with a bucket of shrimp shells. Appa? Ha! Huh. Are you okay? You don't look good. I'm just a little tired. He smiled. Eu turned from Ian towards Yunbora. During their conversation, Ian frowned. It was rare for him. He rarely looked back on the past. It was because the weight of the things he had done was so heavy it was difficult for him to raise his head. Therefore, he decided to look ahead instead of dwelling on it. However, today his thoughts turned towards the past. Why? Vigo's face as he laughed and bragged about a last entered Ian's mind. When he closed his eyes to shake it off, he could see the barbecue ribs cooked at the festival. The people shared the barbecue with him and praised him as a hero. Now they were no longer there. Everyone he knew in Alast had died. That fact weighed on him. He knew that it wasn't a game, but living beings from a real world. Ian suppressed his emotions. Death was one-sided and couldn't be reversed. Ian closed his eyes, feeling both grief and regret. He had been too naive. If he had stayed a little longer in Alast, he could have stopped them. He shouldn't have thought about anything else until he pulled out the seed of the Heaven and Earth clan. Regret led to a more distant past. A memory from a previous battlefield came to mind. The faces of those he couldn't see anymore. Wait. Ian stood up. His face was pale. I need to quickly go to the bathroom. Ah. Ian opened the door and left. The manager was surprised at Ian's complexion. Ian just smiled and left the restaurant. It was still raining. 
Ian leaned his head against the wall of the building. The landscape of the world melted into the rain. Why? Even if he closed his eyes, he couldn't erase their faces in the darkness. Ian stared at the street through blurry eyes. He remembered his deceased comrades. He felt enough sadness at their funerals, so there was no reason to be shaken now. Nevertheless, their faces were so scary because they eventually led him to one face in the darkness. He had to see her. Ian bit his lips and opened his eyes. Crazy. Yes, Elder Lord was a real world. The knowledge of that fact might break him. He was tired of seeing people die. No one knew that he was fighting for them as they kept swinging their weapons without a sense of guilt. It was a meaningless resistance. Just. Raven, I was wrong. Ian's eyelids drooped. Go. It was her last gesture to him. What type of expression was he making at that time? He wondered if he was looking at her with a resolute face, determined to never abandon her. He didn't think so. Maybe there was some hypocrisy mixed in with regret and sorrow, or a condescending expression as he retreated. He didn't know. Shortly after she gestured, a shell flew into her body and Ian was staring stiffly at flesh and guts. Her laughing face as she held an assault rifle could no longer be seen. Her death was no different from the other deaths. Ian instinctively reached into his pocket, an old habit. He had no cigarettes. He removed his hand from his pocket and raised it to his face. He desperately tried to block the memories, but they kept clinging to him. Maybe, if he had moved a little faster. If only he performed the operation properly. Perhaps he did. He built meaningless assumptions and talked nonsense. The memories of that day repeated against his will. Go, go, go. Explosion, explosion, explosion. His expression, expression, expression. Ian slammed his fist against the wall. Alas, alas, alas. Pain spread. He took a deep breath. Ian grabbed one of his injured hands before heading back to the restaurant and handing over his card. Sewing happened please tell my companions that I am leaving first. Han Yori switched off the last light. The sound of a broadcast was heard from her phone that she had unknowingly left on. The Heaven and Earth clan had issued a statement about the broken agreement. They defended themselves by saying it couldn't be helped because they were ordered by the Emperor. They are playing as the Emperor's vassals and it is a game, so the users of the Alast Love Club should understand since they are also role-playing. She suddenly turned her head. She felt a haunting feeling. The cafe was clearly empty. She tilted her head. Then she was shocked to see sewing moving in the darkness. Ha! She froze before frowning, as she realized that the silhouette belonged to a familiar person. Then she looked again. He must have a reason for doing this. Boss Nim. Ian didn't answer. Han Yori pouted. He had the ability to move without any sound. It was a strange talent from his old days as a soldier. Boss Nim. He raised his head. It was dark but the lights from the street outside leaked in, revealing his bloodshot eyes. Are you okay? Ian looked at her and blinked before smiling. Have you finished? Yes. Can I have just one cup of coffee? Han Yori didn't complain. She looked at Ian's face and nodded. She walked into the preparation room and turned on the light. She hesitated in front of the espresso machine before making a drink and setting it down in front of Ian. Ian looked down at it quietly. Is this coffee? Just drink it. Mint chocolate frappe. Ian quietly put the straw in his mouth. Han Yuri asked, Are you okay? Ian laughed. She noticed that his laugh sounded a little unusual. Yes, I'm fine. He drank the mint chocolate frappe for a while as the chill faded. Han Yori sat next to Ian. Why are you acting like a man who had his heart broken? How did you know? I have to leave work, so regain your spirit. She tapped Ian's head. Ian chuckled in a low voice. His voice rang through the empty cafe. Suddenly, Ian leaned against her. Han Yori complained, heavy. Just for a moment. Ian said with a sigh, let me do this for a moment. 
As he closed his eyes, Han Yori looked at his face leaning against her shoulder, at the still remaining mint chocolate frappe and then up at the ceiling. Ian's breath tickled her ears. The second hand of the clock touched her nerves. Time passed. Han Yori whispered towards the silent Ian, you don't have to worry. As Ian's breathing evened out, she added, I won't report you for UAL harassment. She reached out a hand towards Ian's bangs. There was still sweat on his forehead. She wiped it with her fingers and then smiled as she wiped it on Ian's clothes. Why is my boss like this? Ian's heartbeat was transmitted from where he was leaning against her. Han Yori felt his pulse and then got up. She carefully laid the sleeping Ian on the body and placed a cushion under his head. Ian was now asleep. Han Yori looked at his sleeping self before taking a coat from the counter and covering his body. It was summer. He shouldn't get a cold. It was still raining outside the store. Cars passed through water. The procession of umbrellas could be seen. Um. Han Yori slung her bag over her shoulder and looked at Ian one last time. People with quick senses. Rain poured down as soon as she opened the door and opened her umbrella. The rain striking the umbrella was heavy. Han Yori stood at the doorway of Cafe Reason. As her ears became familiar with the sound of the rain, she began to move. Rain was coming. So it was like this. She steadily moved away from the cafe as her silhouette gradually melted into the rain. Chapter 152 Krokta got up and said, Let's go. Tio and Aina were waiting. Gridori was a beautiful resort. However, they couldn't enjoy it properly as they weren't in the mood to enjoy a resort. As soon as they arrived in Gridori and prepared to sleep, they heard the news that the kingdom had attacked the last and devastated it. They were angry about the defeat in the duel and destroyed everything. Then it became a territory of the empire. At the forefront were a Dandator and those cursed by the stars, the Heaven and Earth clan. Alastair's knights fought to the end but were wiped out. Galadin, Vigo, they all died. Therefore, Krokta's group decided to leave Gridori. We must fight. There was a disturbance on the street. Krokta's group looked over and saw a man standing on top of a box, emphasizing his thoughts to the gathered people. Every time he yelled, people nodded. We have no king. He can't oppress us. Gridori is a free city. Fight against the kingdom, no, the empire. When he shouted, people applauded. However, those who didn't agree with him shook their heads. How are we going to fight the empire? Someone yelled back. The mood sank. It was like the person said. Everyone agreed. The empire's military power was overwhelming. The moment they declared their resistance, the empire would dispatch troops to destroy them. Many cities had already been trampled and ruined by them, just like Alast was. They didn't even follow the agreement. We must risk our lives to fight. The man on the box yelled through clenched teeth. His voice was choked from all his emotions. He shouted with a red face. This isn't freedom. Fight for it. You fight alone. The empire will conscript you for war. Don't talk nonsense. His remarks were countered one by one. He shouted again but his remarks were gradually buried, with no one caring. Gridori would belong to the empire. There was such an atmosphere. Everyone changed after the empire trampled Alast. They didn't want to end up like Alast. The empire's power was overwhelming. It would be difficult to defeat their military power, even if several cities combined their forces. Making up the vanguard was the Heaven and Earth clan, the ones cursed by the stars. They swung the weapons without fear of death. Monster soldiers who lived again after dying. Rommel, their leader, was called the Ghost of War. It was a fight without any chance of victory. Krokta, Tio, and Aenor smiled bitterly as they saw it. After a last was lost, they became aware of the true nature of the Empire. However, they had yet to feel the actual Empire. An evil existence that treated human beings as consumables, without caring about the gods watching. Krokta's group left Gridori. Those who knew Krokta started to murmur, but the group ignored it. The users who grasped Krokta's activities followed them, 
but Crocta didn't respond. Several users followed Crocta's party. They only knew that Crocta was a named NPC. Crocta knew this and left them alone. Where are we going? Dot. Um. They still didn't have a destination. They wanted to stop the Empire, but how could they do it? They were already enemies of the Empire. Entering the territory of the Empire was risky and reckless. However, they didn't plan to leave the Empire to its own pace. Crocta thought for a moment before saying. It seems like the Empire is aiming for the Espada area. Espada was a plains area that stretched from the beginning of Alistair and several cities were built there. They were free cities who would never follow a king. In particular, they would never recognize the position of an emperor. Numerous species suffered whenever a human emperor appeared. Those who remembered the past continued the tradition of thinking that a human emperor was the enemy. The Espada area. Let's go. Dot. The Espada area wasn't far from Gridori. An ambassador of the Empire had already reached Gridori. They demanded thorough obedience from Gridori. Gridori would become a bigger city under the Empire, but the citizens would become soldiers and be sent to war. The Emperor's laws were no different from the Northern Chieftain. Was the king originally like this? He was originally a wise boy people change. Crocta thought that maybe a divine presence like the Tribulation interfered with him. The South was in an uproar due to the Emperor. Crocta's party decided to go to the Espada area. As they moved away from Gridori, their followers signaled to each other. Crocta is leaving Gridori. What do we do? Keep following. Determine the location first. They were Crocta's fans who tracked his movements as soon as news of Crocta appearing in the south spread, members of he's an orc, yet still praiseworthy. Now that Crocta was famous and due to his actions as an NPC, people started to track his movements like he was a celebrity. People were looking forward to his adventures. On the fan club's forum, there were constant reports of Crocta's location. Fan club members from all over the world listened to news of him and posted it, allowing people to directly follow Crocta. Crocta was in a one-on-one -on -one duel with the Empire and won. I want to see it. As the rumor spread that Crocta became Elastez's representative and had a duel with the Empire, all the members of he's an orc, yet still praiseworthy were disappointed. No one knew that Crocta was involved in the battle due to the uproar from Yellow and the Heaven and Earth clans agreement. Crocta had been spotted nearby but nobody guessed that he would be at the center of the situation. But won't he continue to fight in the future? Yes. Don't miss it from now on. The Empire had broken the agreement with Crocta and Elast. Crocta would be burning with anger. He implemented justice all over the continent and went to the north alone to the great chieftain. Now his sword was aimed at the southern emperor. It wasn't a drama. If this world was reality, Crocta was truly a hero. They followed Crocta because they wanted to see this. They saw that Crocta was heading to Espada and knew that he was going to challenge the Emperor in earnest. It was exciting to imagine how Crocta would resist the Empire. I don't like the Heaven and Earth clan, so I hope that Crocta will implement justice. Indeed. That is a good idea. The Heaven and Earth clan had signed a memorandum with the Elast Love users. However, they broke it. The memorandum was just a promise, so it had no effect. However, since they were all users, they had trust in each other. The Heaven and Earth clan had betrayed that trust. Then they said, it couldn't be helped since the Emperor ordered the attack. However, the Emperor also said, those who are cursed by the stars were the ones who attacked. They laughed as they handed responsibility for a last over to each other. Everyone could see that they had plotted together. Now the Heaven and Earth clan were the Emperor's hounds. It was a tremendous achievement for users to be in that position, but they were turning that sword towards fellow users. The Heaven and Earth clan will receive any complaints. If you have the power then bring it on. We are the Heaven and Earth clan. There was already a precedent where they defeated the large American-dominated clan, Metatron. Metatron's leaders lost their achievements they had accumulated in Elder Lord and quit the game. The Heaven and Earth had begun walking the path of destruction, using their strength. Let's watch. Yes. Believe in Crocta. The moment that they were about to follow Crocta's path. 
someone suddenly appeared. Did Crocta go this way? The users looked around. It was a woman who wore clothes that clung to her body. Her appearance was familiar, as if they had seen it many times. The he's an orc, yet still praiseworthy members thought for a moment as they looked at her. She said, I heard your conversation. You are members of he's an orc, yet still praiseworthy. Yes. I'm also a member. Are you perhaps a famous person? I think I saw you somewhere before. She smiled. I'm famous because of Crocta. Yuvit Serlani. She was the one who got a chance to shoot Crocta's fight with the user hunters in the early days. The users were shocked to see the orc's wild fighting style and his talk about honor after ing the user hunters. Later, she had taken the video of Crocta's desperate fight against the clans in Cheswood, breaking the Yuvit's record. The members of He's an Orc, yet still praiseworthy, greeted her after realizing her identity. Laney was their most famous member. She was the first person that people told about Crocta's location. Don't miss it this time. Crocta seems like he is going to fight properly against the Emperor. If you shot the video of his duel with one of the Empire's knights, it would have been a huge jackpot. It's too bad. Laney shrugged, it isn't too bad. The member's eyes shone at her words. Perhaps. That's right. Laney struck her chest and declared, the duel scene, I filmed it. Wow. I have been following Crocta since he returned from the north. It is a type of project. I knew Crocta would definitely do sewing nice. Photographers said that they would wait all day for a great photo. But Laney didn't have to do that. There was always a wonderful scene when she followed Crocta. Crocta's very existence was a scoop. Show me. Hu hu hu, wait a bit. Laney looked in the direction that Crocta had disappeared in and said, I will be making a movie. Crocta met with travelers and inhabitants of the south as he left Gridori. All of them were concerned about the emperor's invasion. They were also a group who decided to leave the south. We don't have an emperor. We will never follow the emperor. A middle-aged man said to Crocta. It is the same for Crocta. Yes. Orcs have no king or emperor. There used to be an emperor in the past, but that position disappeared after the war was over. We know that if we follow such a person, we will lose our freedom and have to shed blood. The emperor is such an existence. Now an emperor has shown up again. He has failed to learn anything from the past. They were leaving the south and moving to the area of the elves. Those who met the orc Crocta, who fought against the emperor's knight, spewed their resentment towards the emperor. Many regions had already become colonies of the empire and suffered from all kinds of tyranny. If their departure was a little late, their area would be incorporated into the empire and they wouldn't be able to leave. I don't know how the situation will end. I just want my family to be safe. Behind him were his wife and children. The middle-aged man had convinced his friends and relatives and was moving towards the north. Tio was playing with the bright children who didn't know anything. Crocta, are you going back home? Or are you going to fight against the emperor? I will fight. I just don't know what to do yet. Great. There should be more warriors like you. Not the fakes who shake their tails towards the emperor. I am asking you to help the south. It is shameful that I am saying this when I am leaving. Everyone has their own path. They walked down the road together. At that moment, the sound of horse hooves was heard and knights appeared, blocking the road in front of them. The residents were shaken. The mark of the empire. Where are you going? The middle-aged man talking with Crocta came forward. We are leaving. Leaving Ga. The knights discovered Crocta standing next to the middle-aged man. Crocta. Crocta matched the description going around. The leader turned around and talked to the other knights before approaching Crocta. There is no need for us to fight. His Majesty is eager to meet you. He made a last into a ruin and now he wanted to see Crocta. Crocta's face became dark. Crocta replied, I have no intention of doing that. Why did you stop them? That. The knight looked at Crocta. If Crocta wanted to fight, they couldn't stop him. 
The knight declared, His Majesty has issued a decree that all inhabitants of the South can't leave the South without permission. Chapter, 153. Crocta laughed, There is no need to hear any more. Leave. The knights immediately glanced at each other. They knew that they couldn't stop Crocta if he attacked them. Crocta had defeated a dandator. They couldn't beat him unless they dragged an army over. Crocta. I saw the duel. The knight with the highest status told Crocta. I respect your SS. In that sense, I want to tell you. He looked at the residents. He understood the hearts of those who wanted to leave the south. But he couldn't go against the emperor's will. Don't try to go against his majesty. The best judgment is for Crocta to join the empire and be with us. His majesty promises wealth and honor. Crocta looked at him. The knight was serious. Crocta smiled bitterly. People judged the world based on their own viewpoints. His concern was appreciated but he could never be together with the knight. One day, they would meet on the battlefield and those on the other side. But that time wasn't now. Crocta felt a strange sense of sadness of irony about the world as he spoke. My honor is different from your honor. It was turned down. The knight nodded. He looked at the residents and said, Don't think that you will be safe afterwards just because you're currently with Crocta. The southern residents can't leave without his majesty's permission. The residents were agitated. They didn't think that the empire would take such direct control. The freedom to go anywhere they liked on the continent, the empire had cast the shade of oppression over it. It all began with the emperor's emergence. Damn emperor! The residents cursed as they watched the backs of the retreating knights. Then they expressed their thanks to Crocta. Thank you. It is all thanks to Crocta. No. Sigh. It is very concerning. I wonder if we can go north. Their first goal was the elf city called Riznari. It was a free city located a little away from my yard where all types of species gathered. But based on the appearance of the knights, the empire had started to control all roads leading out of the south. It was questionable if they could reach their destination. They started to exchange opinions among themselves. I would rather go to Espada. I am the opposite. If we go to Espada, we will definitely have to fight the empire. If I had to choose one of them it is better to fight the emperor. Maybe we should just go and see. You just saw it. We will just get caught. Tio shook his head. Crocta. Looking at the south it might be better to leave this area first. Dot. Yes, but I don't want to do that. In order to fight the emperor, we must have troops. But you don't have that much power in the south. Dot. It was possible to defeat the great chieftain in the north because they had the force called the Dark Elves. In order to get rid of the emperor, forces hostile to the emperor were needed. The emperor would reveal his ambition soon, so it might be wiser to wait for the clash with forces from the elves, gnomes, and orcs. But Crocta didn't want to do that. I will go to Espada and think about it. Understood. Dot. Once he figured out Espada's situation, he would be able to make a decision about any future actions. Maybe we can get some rest. Dot. The discussion is getting longer. The residents in the south were having a discussion after meeting the knights to decide whether they should go north or go to Espada with Crocta. I'll keep going. I won't be intimidated. Then are you planning to take on the knights? I will go quietly. It can't be helped if I end up conscripted. Do you think they will be so accepting? I would rather fight in Espada than be conscripted by the Empire. Ha, huh, truly. As they talked, Crocta's group took out tools from their bags and started cooking. It was lunch time. The residents sat down and prepared to eat. Among the residents, there were those who continued discussing the future while the rest ate lunch. Crocta chewed on beef jerky and looked at the distant horizon. If this was a normal trip, he would have sung a song. However, the emperor had emerged and shattered this. He couldn't rest easily until he removed those who destroyed a last. After fighting the emperor it was a similar story when he fought the great chieftain. Crocta looked up and spoke to Tio and Nainer. Let's go back to Gridori and enjoy some rest. Tio grinned. The emperor after the great chieftain. 
am afraid that if we stop the emperor, a god will appear. If a god blocks us, we should get rid of the god. Kahahat. The meal ended and Krokta's group rose. Then they looked at the residents. If their argument was prolonged, Krokta planned to leave for Espada first. But they seemed to have come to a conclusion. We will go to Espada. I wish you good luck. The residents decided to split into two groups. There were those who would continue to Riznari, while the others would go to Espada. On the way to Riznari, there was a high probability of meeting the emperor's knights, but they couldn't think about fighting the emperor. It will be dangerous. They want us. At most, we will be punished before being conscripted by the emperor. I hope to see you again. Then. The group said farewell and split in two. They said, goodbye. I didn't know we would be breaking apart like this. Life is about choices. It would be good if I could know the future. Crocta listened to their conversation and thought of A.S. If he used the Grey God's eyes, he could see the other person's lifespan. However, he was reluctant to use this S. It was a great S but knowing the lifespan of someone else gave off a feeling of taboo. In particular, after finding out that Elder Lord was another dimension, he became more reluctant to use it. He didn't want to steal the intimate knowledge of another person's death. In addition, he didn't want to be forced to do sewing by this ability. Just like the name, this S was the domain of the gods. But at this moment, he felt like he had to confirm their remaining lifespan. If he used this, he could guess if they were ed by knights or if they would make it safely to another city. Krokta hesitated before using the S on the villagers in the distance. Then sewing emerged on top of their heads. Krokta felt dismayed. They would die in the near future. The same number was written above the heads of those continuing to the north. They would meet death on the same day. Stop. Ha. Huh. They Krokta turned his head. The numbers showed once again. The numbers above their head were no different from those heading to the north. Krokta dropped his gaze, unable to look at the fate of those heading to their deaths. There was a procession of ants at his feet. There was sowing faint around them as well. The inevitably overwhelming marks of death were stamped all over this world. Death was equal, stamping the heads of both humans and ants. Not just humans and ants, but the land he stood on would be destroyed someday. Krokta once again regretted using the Grey God's eyes. The power became stronger every time he used it. It was hard to breath when seeing the world of death through the Grey God's eyes. Krokta, why are you so slow? Tio approached him and asked. Krokta didn't want to see the mark of death above Tio's head. So he tried to stop the Grey God's eyes. At that moment, the Grey God's eyes was originally a passive S. A system message. No, it was a message from the Grey God. Once you use it once, you will see them forever. Krokta shook his head. It wasn't supposed to be like this. But since it is a God's vision, I have changed the Grey God's eyes into AS that you can activate and deactivate. Now you see that the world is full of death. They will meet death in the near future. Do you want to save them? What choice will you make? She asked Krokta. Krokta opened his eyes. The Heaven and Earth clan operated on the logic of economic returns. The members of Heaven and Earth were full-time users making a living in Elder Lord. Therefore, they rushed to generate revenue. And they were successful in making money. They launched a program called Heaven and Earth TV. There was an exclusive person filming the various wars and events of the Heaven and Earth clan in the world of Elder Lord in real time. As Heaven and Earth TV became increasingly popular, it cooperated with broadcasters and became a national program. The broadcast chat window was the battlefield. Those who liked the Heaven and Earth clan praised their actions, anticipating more wars and massacres. They didn't blame them for violating the agreement between users. They have to maintain their influence. Betrayal is nothing. Become strong or self-destruct. That is Elder Lord. There were others who questioned the Heaven and Earth clan's excessive warfare, the gameplay that didn't care about other users and the arrogant attitude that mocked weak users. Thanks to them, people are quitting Elder Lord. 
how many villages are lost because of them. The contents and fun are disappearing, what are the publishers doing? Despite such controversies, the Heaven and Earth clan was proud of their greatness. People liked watching the best. The ratings were the best for the Heaven and Earth battles. In particular, Rommel's orchestrated tactical commands enthralled people. Today, in the middle of a small Heaven and Earth battle, all of a sudden, system messages popped up. This is an entire server system message. Thank you to all the users who love Elder Lord. Elder Lord has become more abundant thanks to your participation. Eh, what? BJ Heaven and Earth, the person dedicated to shooting the Heaven and Earth TV broadcast, murmured in confusion. It's been a while since there was a server-wide system message. How strange. Wait while I check this out. Is El Sako finally acting? El Sako stood for Elder Saga Corporation. El Sako was mocked as a company that didn't work due to its unique way of handling the game. The viewers also focused on the message. BJ Heaven and Earth muttered. Achievement Points Event Your hard work in Elder Lord is measured using achievement points. Thanks to all the users, the total sum of achievement points has exceeded the target value. The target? Thus, there will be an achievement points event. Special rewards will be given whenever you earn achievement points. Each user will receive different rewards, so don't be disappointed if you get an unwanted reward and continue to build your achievements. There are some wonderful rewards. The battle scene was still visible on the screen. As BJ Heaven and Earth continued to dwell on the system messages, the members fighting turned them off and focused on the battle. Then the battle ended. BJ Heaven and Earth regained his spirit. Ah, the battle finished. Then. You have earned achievement points. Due to the achievement points event, you have learned a new S. Eh. BJ Heaven and Earth was in charge of shooting, but as a member of the Heaven and Earth party, he also gained a share of the experience and achievement points. As soon as the battle ended, he received the achievement points, followed by the reward. He confirmed the reward. Rare Grade S, Flying Heaven Sword Style Rare has been acquired. Ah. Uh. BJ Heaven and Earth groaned. The Flying Heaven Sword Style was a well-known sword S. If you learn the Flying Heaven Sword style and satisfy certain conditions, you can change to the Hidden Class Sword Emperor. The Flying Heaven Sword style was the representative S of the Ranker with the Hidden Class Sword Emperor. He revealed that he could become a Sword Emperor by acquiring the Flying Heaven Sword style, but he didn't tell how he acquired the S. So it was a famous S that no one else managed to obtain. Sword Emperor was a fraudulent class that everyone wanted. Along with Rommel's War Maestro, it was recognized as a hidden class that represented Elder Lord. That Flying Heaven Sword style had fallen into the hands of BJ Heaven and Earth. Ah uh ah. -uh. BJ Heaven and Earth's confused voice trailed away. He was dazed. In contrast to his silence, the chat window had become noisy. This was the start of Elder Lord's Cataclysm. Chapter 154 not everyone received AS like the Flying Heaven Sword style, but it was obvious that users were starting to become stronger than before. After hearing this news, users who left Elder Lord came back. People speculated that this was Elder Saga Corporation's attempt at marketing to increase the dominance of Elder Lord. The event seemed to be an extraordinary success. Elder Lord became boisterous as people played more aggressively in order to gain achievement points. Should I play again? Eu muttered. However, her friends all shook their heads. It is too late to start now, and the result would be the same. You are already doing what you want to do, so there is no need to play the game again. I see. Now you need to prepare for the certification. Graduation is soon. Hell. She was chatting with her friends in a cafe in front of the school. They wanted to get off the hot streets and into the air-conditioned cafe, hanging out while eating bingsu. TL shaved ice. Is your brother well? It seemed like the matter was urgent. Yes, it wasn't a big deal. He said to apologize to you. There is no need to be sorry, as I got to eat thanks to him. It is the first time I ate such food. Yung Yu, isn't your brother a gold spoon? Hey, 
That was also the first time I had a meal like that. Ban Taehoon was with them, but he was dozing off in the corner. Apparently, the boys had gathered together and played until extremely early in the morning. Yoon Bora clicked her tongue at his appearance. Pathetic guy. I can hear you. Ban Taehoon replied. Your sisters are working so hard while you drink all night. I'm graduating so let it go this once. You shouldn't live like this. I don't like your tone. You sound like a real mother. It is creepy. Ban Taehoon got up. His eyes were hollow. He had washed up so he didn't smell like alcohol, but his movements were uncomfortable. What is Crocta doing these days? How should I know? You're a member of He's an Orc, yet still praiseworthy. I was so busy that I couldn't let see. Eu held out the bowl of bingsu to Ban Taehoon and said, Eat some. That's okay I will die. Tsk tsk. It is better than drinking alcohol. Is it up to you? They smiled, enjoying the first leisure time they had in a while. Yoon Bora was manipulating her phone and mounted it on an LCD holder. Both Eu and Ban Taehoon looked at it. What is it? Bora? It was a live channel. As soon as she hit the button, the video was played. In Elder Lord, there were a lot of users in a region, so big battles and issues were usually broadcasted in real time. This was one such relay channel. However, this time there was the name, Crocta in the title. On the screen, Crocta was fighting against knights. Recently, an emperor had emerged in the south and was conducting a war. At the forefront was the Heaven and Earth clan. The video didn't contain the Heaven and Earth clan, but it might be an extension of that battle. It was a fierce fight. Crocta alone wielded his great sword against dozens of knights. He defeated the knights, but he couldn't protect all the residents. ING innocent people, how shameful. Shut up. It is in the emperor's name. Crocta and the knights wielded their weapons against each other. Unlike the users who had ambiguous positions in Elder Lord, the NPCs sincerely wielded their weapons at their enemies. Is this real? Yes. In a corner of the screen, the chat history of the viewers was continuously updating. The people who supported Crocta and those who wanted him to die were fighting. Crocta won't die, right? He is a monster. He can't die. It is the other people that are the problem, Ban Taehoon said. His words were correct. While Crocta was stronger than the knights, he couldn't protect the entire area alone. The knights continued to capture and the rebellious residents. Crocta tried to save the residents, but he was surrounded by knights. You aren't worthy to be called knights. We are the emperor's knights. The knights didn't care. Crocta's sincerity in wanting to save people was passed through the screen towards the viewers. He broke through the encirclement, regardless of any injuries to himself. However, the other knights came back together, forming a thicker encirclement. The angry Crocta fought against them. It is strange. These people are fighting seriously. I guess it is because they're artificial intelligence. The users filming the situation suddenly hid themselves. The screen darkened. He seemed to be running from a knight who found his traces. His rough breathing was heard. Then he spoke from the black screen. Heek, heek. Since a few days ago, Crocta has been helping residents all over the south. He also hit the Heaven and Earth clan once. Instead of wasting troops trying to catch Crocta, the Emperor is spreading the knights in various directions to stop residents from leaving the Empire. He suddenly became quiet as he hid his body somewhere. He whispered to the viewers watching his broadcast. Knights are nearby. What should I do? His voice paused before continuing. This is a junction. If you donate to me now, I will do as you please. Brothers. Sisters. If you go a donation, I will react however you want. Please support me. It was common for BJs to receive donations that would decide their actions. As the user declared this, the chat window became noisy as sewing appeared on the screen. It was an amount. Someone watching the broadcast had spent money. His command was simple. Run out to the knights and chant I am hard five times. 
The chat was filled with laughter. The BJ groaned as he received the command, but his determination was firm. In the end, the BJ was forced to do it. The entire chat window was filled with laughter and emoticons. In the end, the video started showing again. The user had turned on the relay. The point of view was changed to third person, showing the user. As the donor instructed, he ran through the bushes towards the knight. The knights raised their swords at his sudden emergence. He shouted. I am hard. I am hard. However, before his words could continue, a knight's sword quickly cut off his head. The video ended. The chat window was a sea of laughter. This is funny. It isn't funny. Kukuku. Iyu couldn't help laughing. Ban Taehoon chuckled. People earn a living in their own way. Yoon Bora turned off the video and grabbed her phone. Then she started eating the bingsu again. A lot of the ice had already melted. Crocta is living a hard life. Isn't it dangerous? Perhaps. A named NPC won't die easily. The knights will be Ed. Crocta was acknowledged as the strongest warrior right now in Elder Lord. It was why BJs chased after him. He was so important they would risk danger to film him. There are Crocta's videos and the Heaven and Earth Clan videos, so I don't need to connect to play the game. What about the Heaven and Earth Clan? They are just burning everything. The Heaven and Earth Clan also wasn't idle. The cursed army received the Emperor's favor and carried out his orders. The biggest advantage was that soldiers didn't die permanently and Rommel's amazing commanding ability. Rommel's tactical ability meant that the Emperor even gave him troops. A user leading an army of NPCs was a tremendous achievement in Elder Lord. He used it to carry out the Emperor's commands. The achievement points were huge and the rewards would be bigger. The Heaven and Earth clan were gradually rushing towards a monopoly. Are you going? I am busy. I'll call you later. No matter what happened in Elder Lord, the group was having a leisurely afternoon. Crocta was having a busy time without any breaks. He started helping the residents leave the south. Thanks to the S. Grey God's eyes, he could see people's death. The south was a land where death prevailed. When he rescued a group of villagers, the alarm was shifted to a village in another area. After saving them, another village was given a day or two. There were passing travelers also destined to die. He just wanted to close his eyes, but the fate of death caught his tail and led him to another fight. Thank you. Go to a safe place. Crocta once again listened to the gratitude of the farmers that he saved. It wasn't a large group so Crocta could save all of them alone. Yes. We will act as if we are dead for the time being. Thank you Crocta. If they followed the Emperor's coercion, Crocta might have passed them by. However, none of the humans outside the kingdom were willing to follow the Emperor. They were already familiar with the fact that they would be war consumables when dragged into the Empire. The inhabitants of Elder Lord held a deep-rooted reluctance towards Emperors. Their judgment wasn't wrong. There were rumors that those conscripted by the Emperor were dying from harsh training. Then I will. At that moment, Crocta flinched. The Grey God's eyes opened and a new fate caught up with the residents. It was pointing to the foreseeable future. He saved the residents who were destined to die tomorrow. But despite Crocta's actions, death would find them again a week later. He didn't know if the Emperor's knights would come back or if it was some other reason, but Crocta only added a few days to their lifespan. Be careful. It was the only thing Crocta could say. He couldn't become attached to them. He barely stepped away from the farmers who continued to express gratitude. His heart was heavy. The ability that the Grey God gave him was pushing him to the edge. Those who were destined to die were everywhere. The Emperor was turning the South into a land of death. But even this agony was a luxury. As long as he fought, he would struggle to do his best. No matter what the results were. This way. The people of the South, who decided not to follow the Emperor, was forming a coalition. They were weak compared to the Empire, but they were determined to fight. The coalition reached out to other species. Tio and Aner headed to Espada, 
the center of the coalition, while Crocta moved quickly on his own. Crocta once again found signs of death in a young man who was searching for help for his village. Crocta heard that the situation was urgent and was told the location. Let's go see. Crocta kicked his horse. The horse started galloping. It had accompanied him on this hard journey. As if it felt Crocta's nervousness, the horse ran at the fastest speed. He soon encountered a group of users. Crocta stopped. The Heaven and Earth Clan. He moved his hand to the handle of his great sword. The number was enough to take on his own. But their reaction was unexpected. Ah, Crocta. He really is here. Amazing, amazing. Crocta noticed quickly. It was an astute insight that grasped the situation in an instant. This was how he became the best agent on the battlefield when he used to be a soldier. They were obviously members of his fan club, he's an orc, yet still praiseworthy. What do we do? Get a signature. An NPC doesn't even know what that is. Crocta got down from his horse. They panicked as Crocta suddenly approached them. The legendary Crocta was staring at them with deep eyes. Who are you? It was the voice that they always listened to in videos. None of them could open their mouths. They only saw him in videos, but the Crocta in front of them seemed bigger and fiercer. Then one person replied, F fan. I really admire Crocta. I came here because I wanted to see you once. Admire. Crocta shook his head. I don't believe in that admiration. It is true. If you really admire me Crocta pointed behind them. Go with me. Chapter, 155 They were baffled by Crocta's suggestion to accompany him. Go with you, what? They didn't know whether they liked it or not. Crocta was waging war in the south against the Heaven and Earth clan. He was busy running off to save another place. Crocta looked at them before climbing back on his horse. Then he started to move past them. Ah! The back view of the increasingly distant Crocta seemed somewhat desolate. Suddenly, the words he spoke seemed meaningful. I don't believe in that admiration. He was a hero to both users and NPCs. But whether it was the North or South, he was fighting alone. There were countless people who said they admired him, but Crocta was always alone when fighting against enemies. A silent person grinned. Looking at that back view I have no choice but to go. Shack. I am going. But it is dangerous. What if the Heaven and Earth clan are there? You will die. Hey, didn't you fill out the application form when you joined? To those who were trying to dissuade him, the man called Shack asked. What was your answer to the last question? The he's an orc, yet still praiseworthy fan club operated on a membership system, but not everyone was qualified to join. When filling out the application form, there was a minimum of personal information as well as one question at the end. Do you respect the actions of Righteous or Crocta? Of course, the answer was yes. Those who didn't answer correctly wouldn't be admitted. That's right. They all respected Crocta. Crocta says that he can't believe us, so I have no choice but to show him directly. Shack. Shack started walking after Crocta. The members of He's an Orc, yet still praiseworthy had come because they had an intense desire to meet Crocta. They never expected a battle. Yar Yar Gilgamesh, who was in love with Japanese anime culture, shook his head. Looking at that back doesn't it make you tired? Kukuk. He wasn't playing a role now. It was his usual self. He never broke his distinctive tone even when other members criticized him. In other words, he was a man of perseverance. Well, those who follow will follow. Today, the military power will we be able to see it? Kuhu. He started walking after Shaq. The remaining members looked at each other and sighed. It can't be helped. Really? We are going. Then Gilgamesh suddenly turned around. Hey. Think well. He laughed and continued. Right now, this is hell. You rookies. The other users, listening quietly, started to walk forward. Today I will that otaku. Put up with it. Ah. 
ill him. Hey, you. In no time, they had caught up with Gilgamesh. Thus, the members of he's an orc, yet still praiseworthy plunged into the southern battlefield to help Crocta. Camelot was once a knight, but he had retired and settled in a small town to become a farmer. He was satisfied with his current peaceful life. He had a wise wife and beautiful daughter. Despite not being rich, they had good neighbors. In addition, the rich southern land repaid his sincerity with a lot of crops. He imagined living here for the rest of his life and thought there would be no happier life if he closed his eyes with his grandchildren around him. But he had to abandon the farm equipment and pick up a weapon. It was because the emperor appeared. I think it would be good to join Espada. It is too far. Knights are everywhere. It is the same here. The village was holding a meeting to discuss the future. They had been discussing for a few days about whether they should incorporate into the empire or not. Why don't we just join the empire? If we are going to die on the battlefield anyway, let's not die as slaves and resist the emperor. I. Camelot looked at the meeting that had come to a standstill and recalled the long sword he had left at home. Perhaps the villagers would fail to reach a conclusion until the end and this discussion would continue. Eventually, the imperial forces would come here. Fortunately, the imperial army couldn't move in an orderly fashion due to the orc called Crocta. They might be able to stop it if a reasonable number of troops came. Camelot, you don't have an opinion. You were once a knight. I don't know. He was serious. He didn't know what the right thing to do was. It didn't seem like any path would resolve it well. The emperor and empire were enemies that were too big. The moment that the discussion was going to start again. An alarm started ringing. Ding. 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 The urgent ringing lifted people to their feet. The village chief instructed a young man to find out what happened. But it was obvious what was happening before he even came out. Armed forces. Knights are coming. Get ready everyone. The Knights of the Empire. There were many rumors about knights on horses appearing to occupy villages and drag villagers to become serfs of the empire. But when it came to reality, no one could react properly. Camelot shouted. Steady yourself. At his words, the residents started to move. They talked about what they should do next. Grab your weapons at him then bring the women, children, and seniors back to this place. They had to gather. If they were separate, they would be ed by the knights. Quickly. Camelot shouted before moving first. His house was on the outskirts of the village. It would be one of the knights' first goal. He was worried about his wife and daughter waiting at home, and couldn't stay any longer. Damn it. The closer he came to his home, the more his uneasy feelings became true. Not far from his house was the flag of the empire. As he crazily ran past them, the horrible scenery was revealed. The knights were carelessly dragging his wife and daughter. They resisted but the knights didn't care, throwing them on the ground. Flames surged in Camelot's eyes. Son of A. He rushed with all his power and kicked the knight, who fell from the weighted blow. He was wearing heavy armor so he couldn't get up. Camelot grabbed the knight's sword on the ground and pointed it at the enemy. Who? This fellow. The knights also threatened Camelot with their swords. Camelot hid his wife behind him and warily looked at the enemies. His daughter was still in the hands of a knight, staring at him with a terrified expression. Knights who have no shame. We hear that a lot. The knights laughed. Camelot was desperate. The knights he knew weren't like this, but the South had gone crazy after the Emperor's inauguration. There were no knights left who honored the weak and helped those in crises. Rather, they had become dogs of the emperor, with only the savage, ignorant orc left helping. Camelot gritted his teeth. Return my daughter and I will join the empire. I was a knight of the Dietrich family, so I will be more helpful than ordinary farmers. You. Camelot looked at his family and shook his head. Camelot was desperate. However, the knights mocked him, don't make me laugh. One man is more helpful than two women. I don't think so. Their attitude made them seem more like bandits than knights. 
One knight asked another knight, Hey, is he to your taste? No. He said that he would be more helpful. Maybe that is his taste. Kohu. Puha hat. Camelot gripped the sword tightly. After hearing the knight's words, he was determined to die. He would die today. However, he would take out at least one of them with him. He cursed the emperor and prepared to run. However, his strong mind didn't last long. Hey, drop the sword. A knight was holding a sword to his daughter. I can tell what you're intending from the look in your eyes, but don't even think about it. Otherwise, I can't guarantee the lives of your daughter and wife behind you. I want them if you surrender. Do you understand? Even if it is miserable, isn't it better than your wife and child being ed here? Camelot thought about it and the tip of his sword slowly dropped. He dropped the sword. At the same time, a fist hit him. Cough. Honey. It was a punch from a knight wearing thick steel gauntlets. A few teeth flew in an instant. Camelot fell to the ground and spat out blood. This dared to kick me. It was the knight that he had first attacked. He kept kicking Camelot. Hold this tightly. He commanded another knight to grab Camelot. Then he grabbed his sword and walked towards Camelot's daughter. Your daughter will suffer because of your kick. What are you doing? Look at what you have done. Ill apologize so stop. Stop. The sword was pointed towards his daughter's face. Camelot shook like crazy. However, he was held by the knight and couldn't stop it. The knight kicked Camelot and forced him on his knees. The nauseous Camelot lay on the ground. His blurry vision could see the sword heading towards his daughter's ear. The knight was going to cut off her ear. Camelot used all his strength to try and get up and attack the knight. However, another knight knocked him down again. The moment that he felt total despair. There was a huge roar. Kwong. A black object jumped from the bushes and struck the knight's face. The knight's neck was torn and his head flew through the air. It happened so abruptly that no one could respond. The body of the headless knight collapsed as blood splattered everywhere. Camelot's daughter closed her eyes and screamed as blood covered her. Kayak. However, no one else in this place opened their mouths. The huge thing was standing in the middle of them. This. Gur. It was a great tiger the size of a house. The teeth were big and sharp, as if they could chew through an ogre's skin, and the eyes were fierce. There was a package tied to its neck, but no one thought it looked ridiculous. W what? This. The tiger's pressure pushed at them. Every time the tiger growled, the low frequency would overwhelm their bodies. But it didn't end with just the tiger. What, tiger? Why are you so fast? The tiger was accompanied by someone. What is this? Grung. There was an orc that was just as big as the tiger. He scratched his head and nodded as he found the girl trapped by the knights. TSK TSK. Humans can't help themselves. Grung. A knight recoiled at his appearance and stammered out. See Crocta. Crocta. Don't compare me to such a baby. Bah. Crocta was the only fearsome orc in the south. Then who was this orc? The orc struck his chest and declared, My name is Kumarak. Grung. He was Mountain Smasher Kumarak. Chapter, 156. Mountain Smasher Kumarak was a legendary orc with many stories about him. The most famous story was that he smashed a whole mountain into a flat land in order to hunt a great worm. The great worm was a creature who emerged from the ground when it vibrated and freely swallowed its prey. It had an earthworm-like appearance, but scholars considered it powerful enough to be treated as a dragon. On the western side of the continent, there was an old and infamous great worm that had long been mentioned in the history books. Kumarak, who had been exploring the west, was very angry when the infamous great worm swallowed his companions and he figured out that its home was a vast mountain nearby. He smashed at the mountain frantically, trying to destroy it. Then the great worm appeared from within. The two engaged in a bloody battle. The great worm fled in front of Kumarak's immense strength and endurance, and Kumarak kept digging at the mountain. 
Then the great worm appeared again and again, with the two of them struggling in this manner for several months. Mountain Smasher was certainly an exaggeration, but Kumarak eventually turned a big mountain into a hill in the period of a year and ate the great worm. He pulled the remains of his companions out of the great worm's stomach and buried them. Thus, he ate the hundreds of years old great worm, which had been written down in history, and turned the mountain into a flat land where it was buried. Since then, Kumarak became someone who should never be touched. That Kumarak was here. Indeed, it was a fearsome appearance. He seemed much bigger than Krokta, whose name was widely spread. They were Suyas if he was even an orc. Kumarak stared at the knights and said, Grung, go. I said it clearly. I will count to five. One, Grung, two. Kumarak grabbed the axe he carried on his back. The axe was much bigger than usual. They could feel how much of a monster Kumarak was just seeing him hold that weapon. In the end, all the knights retreated before Kumarak counted to five. Camelot bowed his head and said, Thank you. He couldn't pronounce the words properly after being hit by the knight. His weeping wife approached Camelot and examined his wounds. His daughter also ran towards her mother and father. Gur. Kumarak's expression was awkward as he looked at the scene. The tiger came up to Kumarak and stood next to him. Both of them were huge, so they looked like an ordinary orc and tiger when standing side by side. Tiger. Good job, suddenly running here. Grung. Kwong. I don't understand what you are saying. Kwong. Well, it is also the same for you. Grung. Kumarak touched the sack tied to the tiger's neck. By the way, where is he? Kwong. He isn't here. The tiger shrugged. Kumarak smiled at the human gesture and patted the tiger. Let's handle these s first, tiger. Grung. Kumarak turned around. There were still knights in the village. He could hear the screams of people in the distance. It was a strange sight for Kumarak. Human knights were attacking the same humans that they were made to protect. There were also humans attacking the knights. The humans were fighting among themselves. While there was the occasional dispute between the orcs, this was the first time Kumarak had ever seen the strong tormenting the weak. Let's go, tiger. Kumarak instantly ran out. As they moved away from Camelot into the village, humans who gave up resistance were being dragged. They were like slaves as they were tied together with ropes. Slaves. Flames surged in Kumarak's eyes. A scene without honor. He lifted his axe. Bolter. The roar shook the village. The knights covered their ears and looked around. They soon discovered the fierce face of a giant orc looking at them. He was holding an axe that was as big as an adult body. What are you doing, Grung? I asked, what are you doing in front of me? As Kumarak glared at his opponents with bloodthirsty eyes, the knights couldn't help stepping back. The knights couldn't move. Even the residents trembled under his pressure. The leader of the knights stepped forward and asked, Who are you? We are acting in the name of the emperor. This orc wasn't Krokta. Krokta used a great sword and wore a red headband. This orc wielded an axe that was bigger than his head. Kumarak ed his head. Emperor? Yes. The knight gained confidence. This was the south, the land of the kingdom, and now the land of the empire. Even though there were some people like Krokta, people generally listened to the name of the emperor. The other species weren't united like the present empire. Compared to their loosely connected systems, the empire trained its army in a systematic manner. In other words, the empire was now the single strongest force on the continent and the emperor was at the height of this power. And they were knights of the emperor. The knight raised his chin and said, don't meddle in our task. Once again, it is per the emperor's orders. Kumarak asked, the emperor. That's right. The emperor. The knight answered firmly. Kumarak's axe lowered. The knight grinned. This orc still had common sense. No matter how strong he was, he couldn't fight against the empire. Maybe he would become their ally. The emperor was gathering talent for a future plan. 
The orc was ugly but his combat power was excellent, so if the knight could persuade him and take him to the emperor. Before he could finish the thought, Kumarak stomped his feet. The earth shook. I am. Kumarak moved forward, his big shadow covering the knight. Kumarak's eyes were burning. Kumarak. Kumarak reached out and grabbed the knight's neck. The knight struggled and grabbed his wrist, but Kumarak's strength was overwhelming. He raised the body of the knight. The other knights drew their swords and pointed them at Kumarak, but he didn't care. Say it again. Whose name? Iekof Emperor. I am Kumarak. Kumarak threw the knight. He hit a group of knights. I don't have an emperor. Grung. Kumarak strode forward. His overwhelming atmosphere crushed the knights. His shoulders shook. Kang. With the sound of steel colliding, one knight flew into the air. He had been hit by the axe. Emperor. Every time his arms shook, the knights fell one by one. The huge axe was moving at an unbelievable speed that they couldn't see. The terrified knights stepped back as Kumarak approached. You might call him the emperor but Kumarak pushed his face right up against a knight. The knight was terrified and kept shaking. For me, he is just a human. Kumarak kicked him. The knights didn't dare go against Kumarak. He looked at those who had fallen and said, If you don't disappear right now, I will you. Grung. The scared knights hurriedly grabbed their weapons and withdrew. No hesitation was seen. They knew that if they stayed here further, they would die in Kumarak's hands. There was the sound of horseshoes as the knights ran away. Kumarak and the tiger released the bound residents. They expressed their thanks to Kumarak. Kumarak looked terrifying, but he coughed awkwardly at the thanks from the residents. Grung. I was just passing by. Grung. There is no need for thanks. Thank you very much. Kumarak. Hooray Kumarak. Grung. As they were celebrating the defeat of the knights, a new group was seen in the distance. The boisterous sounds subsided. The residents became tense again. Dust was rising in the distance. Maybe the knights had called for more troops as reinforcements. Kumarak placed his axe on his shoulder. They came back despite being scared, maybe they brought a decent opponent this time. Kiyu. The one who appeared was a small gnome on horseback. I am Tio. Dot. Where are those guys from the Empire? Dot. A group of humans were riding towards the village, with Tio in the lead. They were the resistance formed in Espada. Tio and Aner had separated from Krokta, joining the resistance and fighting against the Empire. Tio's ability to freely change general to an array of weapons was overwhelming, causing him to quickly rise from a soldier to a leader. Hmm. Dismay appeared in Tio's eyes as he saw an orc and tiger instead of knights. What? I thought only Krokta was this ugly dot. Kumarak became furious. What did you say? Grung. Oh, you heard it very clearly dot. This little kid gnome. Grung. Ugly dot. The two of them growled at each other as soon as they met. Tio shouted. Why do you keep going grung dot? Are you imitating the tiger? T this. So you can speak without sounding like a beast dot. Then stop grung. Kumarak glanced away, while the tip of his nose turned red. It was unexpectedly a complex. I have sinusitis grung. It isn't on purpose. Grung. Oh, I see TSK TSK, you should maintain your health. Eat a lot of fruits and vegetables. Dot. Have you eaten today? Not yet. That's great. Dot. Residents. We have a lot of food. The fight seems to have been taken care of by this orc, so come eat. Kahat. Tio already grasped the situation. The residents had just been released from their ropes and this orc was like Krokta. Furthermore, there was a huge tiger. This orc must have defeated the knights and saved the village. I understand. We will prepare it. The residents decided to serve the orc Kumarak, who saved them. While they prepared the food, the tiger went and hunted two big bisons. Phew, now I can rest. Dot. 
I can finally sit for a bit. Phew. It is hard. The resistance members rested in their seats. They had rushed here after saving another village. Hey Orc. My name is Kumarak. Grung. Yes, Kumarak. Tio approached and patted the tiger sitting beside him. The tiger was quiet. Do you know Krokta? Krokta. We came to meet him. Grung. Ah. I am the man who ventured north with Krokta. We fought together against the crazy chieftain. Where is he? Right now we have separated. Why are you looking for Krokta? Not me, this guy. Kumarak pointed to the tiger. The tiger had been dozing due to Tio's nice touch, and opened his eyes as he was abruptly mentioned. Kwong. The tiger looked around in amazement. He looked somewhat dazed. The tiger seems a little lacking. Dot. That's right. Grung. The tiger didn't see anything and started to doze off again. Tio climbed on top of it and rolled on the fluffy fur. Then he bumped into the bundle tied to the tiger's neck. Ouch. What is this dot? It needs to be given to Krokta. Where is Krokta? Krokta right now. Krokta was currently excited. He wielded his great sword towards the knights. The body was split apart. Bolter. Yar yar my body is an infinite sword. Kukuk. The he's an orc, yet still praiseworthy members joined him. Among them was a moderately cool person. My power for attacking stop it. Kukuk come, eat despair. This person was passionate. He ignored Krokta and said to the enemies, I am the the punishment of the black death god I will make you mortal men pay for these deaths Kukuk. The knights and Krokta were stunned. Krokta met Gilgamesh's eyes. They raised their thumbs towards each other. The members of he's an orc, yet still praiseworthy were horrified. Chapter, 157 Let's just fight. Yes. The he's an orc, yet still praiseworthy members decided to stop listening. The battle continued. Those who headed to the south to meet Krokta, their battle power was above the average users. All of them were high-level users. Be careful. I understand. In the past it was almost impossible for users to fight against NPCs, but now they had surpassed them. Furthermore, their SS and abilities were growing quickly due to the achievement points event. The knights outnumbered them, but the he's an orc, yet still praiseworthy members didn't step back. In particular, the actions of Gilgamesh were dazzling. He both mentally and physically attacked the enemies. Open your hearts. Death is only an uninvited guest for those who don't understand it. Since we were born, we have already received notice of its visit. Kukuk. You there. What is your name? The confused knight replied, T. Tager. Gilgamesh used magic power, as he was a magic swordsman who gave up efficiency for power. He used his magic to produce dozens of magic swords in the air behind the enemy. The combination of paired sword technique and psychokinesis. As his accomplishments reached an essence beyond the limit, he gained a hidden class that no one had obtained before. The Blade Shadow Match Tager Tomorrow, your friends will be having a conversation. What conversation? He moved his hand and dozens of swords shot towards the enemy. Gilgamesh exclaimed, Tager. Kakak. He is dead. His swords pierced the body of Knight Tager. Tager looked like a hedgehog as he was penetrated by numerous swords. Gilgamesh closed his eyes. Freedom doesn't come back, but revenge does. Blame it on your reckless sword and your misplaced loyalty, Tager. It was a class that couldn't fight for a long time due to the consumption of strength, but his brilliant technique was effective in lowering enemy morale. One knight spoke fearfully, there isn't just one monster. The man who was always persecuted because of his excessive speech, Gilgamesh. He was now called a monster by the NPC knights. The members of he's an orc, yet still praiseworthy felt unknown emotions as they watched Gilgamesh knock down the knights. One member of he's an orc, yet still praiseworthy who hated Gilgamesh in particular, Shaq closed his eyes as he recalled the past. He was a user who condemned Gilgamesh more than anyone else. 
He spoke harshly about Gilgamesh being an otaku, but Gilgamesh wasn't shaken at all as he said confidently. Otaku. Otaku? It simply means a mania that focuses on one thing. Shack. It is dirty. Kukuk, okay. Coming to see me at twilight while shedding tears. If you want to fight then I'll willingly oblige. Then what about now? Shack suddenly looked at the sky. It was just before the curtain of night covered the sky, as it shone red from the sun setting. As the glow from the western clouds grew, the clouds in the east were dark, as if night had already arrived. It was a beautiful twilight. Gilgamesh, you were right. Shaq muttered as he aimed a spear towards a knight behind him. The knight bounced back from the blow. He barely managed to get up while raising his sword. Shaq kicked him. The knight's helmet flew away and his face was revealed. Shaq's spear aimed for his head. Knight. Tell this to the king. H his majesty. Tell him what? Shaq laughed and replied, to the great king, the grim reaper will perform his job brilliantly. Kukuk. Then the spear struck. It was the end of the night. Thanks to Krokta's overwhelming dance and the he's an orc, yet still praiseworthy members, the battle was now completely one-sided. My great sword is a guillotine that separates the godless ones. Stick out your necks, prisoners. Come on, sword dance. Swallow the blood of the wicked. Do you like this spear? It is a gift. Due to the attacks and damage to their spirits, the knights lost their fighting spirit and started to flee. Krokta and his fan club members finished as the sun went down. Shaq looked at the backs of the retreating knights and asked Krokta. Krokta. How is it? Krokta looked at them. The he's an orc, yet still praiseworthy members were laughing while covered in blood. They had won but they weren't in a perfect state. It was an appearance where the wounds kept increasing. Only the eyes gazing at Krokta were shining. Do you still not believe in our respect? Kukuk. Shaq said with a smile. Gilgamesh scoffed from beside him and looked up at the distant sky. Krokta replied, of course. Even though we fought so hard together. I am disappointed. I believe. Krokta extended his fist and said, I believe in my companions. Companions. They were recognized as Krokta's companions. Krokta had first appeared in the video against the user hunters. He showed great s in breaking through many enemies with his bold attacks. His words about honor caused many viewers to be thrilled. Then he was active in Arnon and Chesswood. He always fought for the weak, and eventually became a hero who handled the northern invasion alone. But this man didn't get tired and was fighting again for peace in the south. At first, he was a weak orc struggling against three users. When the video with the user hunters first appeared, the members of he's an orc, yet still praiseworthy would have been more powerful. However, now Krokta had become a man who could face an army alone. The same amount of time had passed, but he had become completely different to them. It was an indomitable will. An act of faithfulness. Krokta was truly deserving of respect. Now they were recognized as companions of such a man. See companion. Gilgamesh was startled. His expression was touched. It was rare for him to let go of his concept. He soon restored his expression and looked at the distant sky. I have found a fellow reaper of death you are truly a brave man, Kukuk. Ill accept it for today. Then he reached out and bumped fists with Krokta. Hulhut. This is true. Shaq and the other members of the fan club bumped fists with Krokta in turn. Shaq, a member of he's an orc, yet still praiseworthy, ended his connection. Shin Jahu was lost in the afterglow for a while after exiting the capsule. He closed his eyes on the couch and recalled the adventure he had last night. He had gone to the south to meet Krokta and actually met him. He was much bigger and fiercer than he seemed in videos. He was riding a horse that looked pitiful. Just like Krokta's appearance, his actions were more than imagined. He was more than someone from a video. Despite the users in the south refusing to get involved, he was fighting against the emperor with an indomitable will. If it wasn't for work. Anyway, he asked for understanding and ended the connection. 
It was because day was breaking. Koreans or people living in a similar country stopped their adventures for a while. There are many guests today but the salary is the same but it can't be ruined. Shin Jahu sang a strange song while putting on his clothes. He felt unusually good because he had a wonderful experience. Jajangmian sweet bean paste bruises tiger balm ointment. Shin Jahu was the chef at a Chinese restaurant. He left home. His clothing revealed his burly body. Due to his hard work, his biceps and triceps were like a muscular bodybuilder. I wonder what that brat Gilgamesh is doing. Shin Jahu presumed Gilgamesh was Japanese or Korean because he was so influenced by Japanese culture. They weren't friends in reality, but he was suddenly concerned about Gilgamesh's social life. It was the first time he worried about Gilgamesh. Is this the influence of Krokta? While Krokta was an NPC, he felt more like a person. Through Elder Lord, Shin Jahu started to change. He didn't think about Gilgamesh with his usual disdain. I should make him a bowl of Jajangmian if we ever meet. Shin Jahu headed for the bus stop. There was a stack of windows on the sidewalk, with more piled up on the street truck. He used it to check his face. Ah, he forgot to shave his beard was growing. However, he didn't care. I am a real man. He sang while passing by the truck. This was no time to worry about it. There was a group book today so he needed to hurry to work. At that moment, a passenger car slightly twisted and hit the side of the truck. Kung. It was a mild hit. The uncle in the car opened the door and ran out. His expression was troubled. Damn. Why is this parked here? The uncle scratched his head and examined the truck. There wasn't a big scratch. Rather, his car bumper was more damaged. The truck's driver was absent, so the uncle tried to see if there was a phone number. Geez, I can see you. Shin Jahu chuckled at the sight. Then he suddenly discovered sewing strange. Due to the aftermath of the conflict, the straps securing the window weren't tied properly and they came loose. Oh my. He blocked his ears and prepared for it. The windows would soon break. Uncle, be careful. Sometimes when coincidences overlapped, they ran towards an inevitable tragedy. Ah. Uh. A little boy was walking past the truck. At that moment, the stacked windows were tilting. The kid moved without knowing anything. The yellow hat indicated that he was from a kindergarten near Shin Jahu's apartment. The yellow bag across his shoulder was also from there. The name was Green Pine Kindergarten. If the boy's eyes were any larger, then he could be mistaken for a girl. Many thoughts crossed Shin Jahu's mind as he saw the child. Was this a kaleidoscope? He could clearly see that the child had brown eyes and brown hair, while his legs were plump and at the awkward boundary between a toddler and a child. The kid was staring at Shin Jahu with an innocent face mixed with laughter, not knowing the fate awaiting him. The kid's body gradually got closer. Shin Jahu realized that he was running. Why was he doing this? He saw the child's surprised face. It was a face frightened by the adult rushing towards him, without being aware of the windows pouring towards him from above. There should at least be someone who praised his action. At that moment, someone's face popped up. Shin Jahu smiled while covering the boy's body. People normally recalled their past, their family or their loved ones during a moment of crisis. So why did he think about the orc raising his thumb in the game at this moment? Chapter, 158 There was the sound of shattering glass. People shouted with surprise as they gazed at the source of the sound. Very quickly, a crowd began to gather around. It was bloody. T that. Idiot. Kim Hyunchul looked down at it from the coffee shop on the second floor and clicked his tongue. Why is he an idiot? The face of Park Hansik, who was sitting across from Kim Hyunchul, hardened as he asked. Despite the gruesome scene which had occurred before his eyes, Kim Hyunchul seemed to be emotionless. What has been achieved? The child is hurt, and he isn't the only one. There's also another person who is hurt. Hey. Why? It's true. The Hyunchul that Hansik knew wasn't such a person. 
Hyuncho was very timid but warm-hearted to his friends. However, he had started to change since playing the game. What are you saying? He was trying to save the child. Can't I be honest? After all, if that person dies, he would be the only one losing sewing. This jerk your sins will be returned to you. Is this a mental victory? Encouraging good and punishing evil. It is just a concept that people use to comfort themselves. Don't say that. Okay, is your job going well? It is hard. Park Hansik took a sip of his Americano and looked out the window again. People were surrounding the scene of the accident. A woman was hugging a child in her arms, regardless of the dirt on her clothes. Meanwhile, the other people tried to do first aid on the man who protected the child, but his body was bloody and pierced with glass. Fortunately, the man was moving, so he wasn't dead. He could hear the sound of ambulance sirens in the distance. Suddenly, Kim Hyunchul asked, Work is hard. Park Hansik looked at him. What? Can you help me? Of course. Friends should help each other. Okay. I understand. If you are having a really hard time, tell me, and don't hide it. They'll let you rake in money. Rake in money? Yes, rake in money. Kim Hyunchul grinned slyly. You can make a few years worth of money at once. It was the same face, but he now gave off a different impression. Park Hansik looked at Kim Hyunchul and drank his Americano silently. Then he asked, You said you played the game? Yes. If you are interested. Are you role playing? Role play? I don't do such things. I see. Hyunchul instantly stopped laughing. Park Hansik smiled at his expression. Then Kim Hyunchul adjusted his posture. Why are you smiling? What? Why are you smiling? I feel bad, like you are laughing at me. I'm not just playing a game. It's business. At the end of Kim Hyunchul's words, Park Hansik stopped smiling and narrowed his eyes, causing Kim Hyunchul to tense up slightly. Park Hansik shook his head with a smile. I'm not saying anything, you brat. Calm down. Hansik just wanted to tease Hyunchul, but Hyunchul's pride was hurt for a trivial reason and he stiffened. Hyunchul had been like this since their school days. However, they were now adults and couldn't maintain the same relationship as before. They were no longer boys, and as adults, they had facial expressions that never existed before. Park Hansik's head shake meant he was resigned about sewing. Every time he did that, he erased someone he thought of as a friend. An old song played on the radio. Even though seasons come again. Where has my love gone? I didn't send you away. I didn't leave you either. The song is ING My Mood. Park Hansik rose from his seat. I'm busy, so I should be going. It was good to see you. Already? I told you, work is hard. I have to work without any breaks. Yes, I understand. Don't overdo it. If it is difficult, contact me. Kim Hyunchul handed Park Hansik a card. It is the same as going on a deep sea fishing boat. Of course, it is much more comfortable, and there is more income. You just need to lay down for a few months or a year, as if you are sleeping. I'm telling you specifically. Park Hansik received the business card. It had Lewin, Elder Lord Clan written on it. Park Hansik looked at Kim Hyunchul. Kim Hyunchul was wearing expensive clothes and an expensive watch, and he carried himself in an arrogant manner. Unpleasant emotions could be read in Hyunchuk's eyes. Park Hansik smiled again. Yes. Stay well. Park Hansik said goodbye before turning around. Maybe he wouldn't meet Kim Hyunchul in the future. You too. Kim Hyunchul looked at the leaving Park Hansik and leaned back. He smiled at Park Hansik. Then his nose twitched as he muttered to himself, that child still acts as if he is in high school too bad. He grumbled and took a sip of coffee. Then he glanced out the window. The man from earlier was being carried into an ambulance. He was talking to the paramedics while lying down, so he didn't seem to be in any danger of dying. Then the ambulance closed its doors and departed. 
There was blood left on the ground where the man had been lying. There was no feeling of exhilaration. Hyunchul had seen this kind of sight many times in Elder Lord. These days, the blood in Elder Lord seemed more familiar than that of this world. Seeing the blood splattered on the ground was like meeting a familiar face in a strange place. Then he suddenly heard the lyrics. It is gradually forgotten. I thought it was a love that would stay. Another day goes by. We live apart every day. Yes, this song is depressing. Kim Hyunchul closed his eyes. As he listened to Kim Kwang Sik's song, memories of his young Nim talking to him popped up. The world is all about trying to survive. Those words. The past Hyunchul had been considerate, but that person had died. Now, he was someone who mocked a man who had jumped to save a child, wore expensive clothes and drove a foreign car. Park Hansik, who sympathized with the man, ran a small bar and struggled to pay the monthly rent. Anyway, the world was unfair. Those who truly realized it also discovered that they had to be unfair. If he was more unfair to those who were unfair, that unfairness would work for him. A good life. Don't make me laugh. Look at me. I am successful. Look at you. Because I live like this, I drive a foreign car. Don't worry about the excuses of a loser and just follow me. Hyung Nim was right. Kim Hyunchul checked his phone. There was a message. It was from Keynes who had made him like this. It was time to work again. Kim Hyunchul got up from his seat. Outside the cafe, a woman was sweeping up the blood stained glass pieces. The broom was dyed red. Based on her apron, she seemed to work in a small restaurant next to the cafe. Kim Hyunchul looked at the scene quietly and asked, It isn't your store, so why are you cleaning it? She replied back, This is important. It is the same neighborhood that is my home. It is ugly. I don't want to wait for someone else to clean it up. Don't you think? Yes. Kim Hyunchul lit up a cigarette. There were so many good people in the world. So, he and his young Nim were bound to be successful. Good work. Kim Hyunchul spat on the floor and walked away while blowing cigarette smoke. The emperor, a cantor, looked down at them from the throne. Luin was always nervous meeting him, but Keynes and Rommel seemed to be fine. Keynes always said it was a game, while Rommel wasn't the type of person to be shaken by this. Rommel had to learn all types of courtesies when a cantor had still been the king. Now that a cantor was the emperor, Rommel had to be more formal. He was accustomed to it now, but it still wasn't easy kneeling down. Lewin was a modern man and unfamiliar with the class system. Of course, while playing Elder Lord, he learned about the class system which wasn't visible in modern times. Can I trust you? When a cantor had been a king instead of an emperor, he had been a quiet man. He had always smiled, and he had looked more like a nobleman than a king. However, he now looked down with an arrogant face and didn't hide his feelings. It was the right of the strong. If it fails, it is the end. I will prevent you from escaping to the abyss for eternity. Lewin's nose twitched nervously at the words. It meant a cantor would use the concrete OD. The fact that NPCs understood the weakness of those cursed by the stars gave Lewin a strangely fearful feeling. It was no different to what he felt when watching movies about robots conquering mankind. However, by walking this tightrope, they earned wealth and honor. We will make certain of it. Kane said. He excelled in gaining favor with NPCs. Please remember the role we have played to allow your majesty to sit on this precious throne. We will always devote our loyalty to your majesty. Of course. I'm well aware. However, this is the empire. We can never fail. How can your majesty talk about failure? Keynes bowed his head. The trend in the world is heading towards the empire, your majesty. A pebble can't stop a river. Espada will be decimated. That isn't the failure I'm talking about. The emperor leaned against his armrest. You have to that orc. Cain spoke with a serious face. Crocta. Yes. That ugly orc needs to be ed and hung at the gates. No, it would be nice to capture him alive and pour maggots and worms over him to gnaw on his body. 
the emperor's anger had reached its peak. Everything flowed according to his will. No, it followed the blueprints presented to the emperor by Keynes and Rommel. Crocta was the exception. The emperor wasn't the only one who wanted to him. It was the same for Keynes. Crocta was an unpredictable variable for him. He wanted to get rid of Crocta and eliminate all possibilities of failure. However. Your Majesty. Don't waste our forces on him. He is an individual. An individual can never beat an army. We should look at the bigger context, and he will eventually be trampled on by the army. To Keynes, Crocta was a stumbling block. However, he knew how stupid it was to consume energy to catch a bug. Lewin nodded as he listened to the conversation. Keynes used to say this to Lewin. He is a strong person, but he will lost the moment he goes against an army. He is alone. He is strong and difficult to catch, but not fatal. He is tricky like a mosquito. It is better for us to ignore him than worry about him. When winter comes, the mosquito will freeze and die. Looking back at how much Crocta had interfered with them, Lewin came to admire Kane's sober judgment. Lewin thought about using the full force of the army to Crocta. However, Keynes was right. Crocta was a monster who beat a dandator. He would somehow manage to run away. They just needed to do their jobs. Then one day, Crocta would be found as a corpse on the battlefield. The emperor said, I want his head. Keynes bowed his head. If your majesty. But you always speak the right words. If it were someone else, I would set up a trap to Crocta. It was a gentle tone toward a faithful servant. Lewin laughed inwardly. Keynes would also be smiling. Everything went as Keynes said. The young emperor was merely a child who wanted to play a game. Sometimes he wanted to be dignified, while other times he wanted to be impulsive. There were also times when he wanted to be praised as a king. He had flimsy ambitions. Then at that moment. Your Majesty, an Imperial Guard is waiting to see you. The guard shouted from outside the throne room. Then the Emperor replied, send him in. The door opened. A servant entered and knelt down before the Emperor. Your Majesty, I am an officer on the west side, Gospel. Yes. What is going on? I saw this and thought your majesty should know. He held out a piece of paper. It was a letter. This is being sent out randomly all over the empire. What is this? The emperor accepted it. The guard closed his eyes and fell face down. His choice was right. Kuang. The emperor threw an ornament decorating his throne. Rommel. Keynes. Yes, your majesty. I want that garbage orc called Crocta on his knees before me. I will give you a dandator and the white lion knights. Go right now. The emperor's face distorted into a scowl. Catch Crocta. Chapter, 159. He is either stupid or clever, Keynes muttered. He was currently talking about Crocta. He isn't stupid, so why would he do such a stupid act? In my opinion. I'm not asking you. Keynes glared at Lewin, who fell silent. It was rare for Keynes to show such a temper tantrum. Instead, the silent Rommel opened his mouth, he is a beast. Keynes nodded and said, a beast, a plausible yet strange analogy. He is smart, but only in comparison to other stupid beasts. And humans are people. Keynes said with a laugh. He appreciated Rommel. He respected the parts of Rommel that couldn't be controlled, and that he had high abilities. Don't you know that humans sacrifice themselves for others? But in the end, their instincts are to survive and reproduce. I saw it in a book. Sacrifice is an emotional thing. Follow the calculations of reasoning, not emotions. That is what a human is. Monkeys are those who follow emotions. Of course, it is funny when speaking about NPCs who have an artificial intelligence. It is interesting. Keynes nodded. The answer was interesting. He learned a bit more about the person called Rommel. Keynes was a person who controlled others, but sometimes he needed people like Rommel. A partner who could think along the same lines as him. Lewin. 
Yes, brother. Are the clan kids arriving soon? Ha. Huh. Yes. I am speaking of the fortunate kids Keynes touched his chin. If you think about it, you should do it properly. Then you can achieve your lifelong dream here. Ha. Huh. You don't understand. One person are you saying you sent it? Keynes laughed, hey, it is a joke. Threaten them. Intimidate them. Do it well. Be a bad person. A bad person who properly manages those fortunate kids. Ah Luin nodded. Yes. That is my specialty. I will manage the kids. Luin grinned and left the room. He was in such a hurry that he didn't even close the door. Keynes looked at his back and clicked his tongue. TSK TSK. Rommel suddenly asked. What are you playing at in regards to Lewin? Playing. Don't you consider controlling people a game? You play with Emperor Akanter. Duke Christian was just a game. Keynes laughed. That's right. He steered people. It was possible because he gave them what they wanted. He made them think it was what they intended to do. People were engrossed in Kane's sweet words and played like he wanted. Lewin wants to play a bad guy. Play a bad guy. As a child, he was ignored while growing up. What could he do, when he didn't have any power? So he just pretended to live a good life. Then once he got money and a nice car, he did bad things and spit in God's face. A truly clumsy. But I thought you regarded him as a brother. Slightly. But this is this and that is that. I like him. His thoughts are transparent. Keynes chuckled. Rommel also smiled and examined the map of the southern continent on the wall. The class war maestro wasn't just a name. He was always working. How about me? Rommel asked. You. What type of play are you doing with me? Rommel looked at Keynes. Keynes laughed and opened the bottle placed on the table, you are playing next to me. It is interesting. Keynes acknowledged Rommel in his own way. Rommel received a cup. What about you? Me. Keynes and Rommel made a toast. Soon they would lead the Emperor's army. It was the best accomplishment they could enjoy as a user. The message window to celebrate their achievements kept flashing. I'm not playing. This is just me. Keynes drank the alcohol and laughed. Crocta lifted a pen. The world of Elder Lord was really mysterious. He wrote a letter while thinking in Korean, but the words that appeared were in the continent's language instead of Korean. Nevertheless, he could understand the meaning. We, what are we doing now? A member of He's an Orc, yet still praiseworthy asked miserably while moving his pen. Unlike his facial expression, his hand was dazzling. I don't know, we. Gilgamesh listened to their conversation and said, perhaps it is fear. Kukuk, im NVSI lost such emotional nuances a long time ago Kukukuk. Few Shaq should have been. Every time Gilgamesh said such things, Shaq would promptly attack him. Now there was no one restraining him. One person sighed. What is going on with Shaq? He posted on the forum. It seemed like sewing happened. Shaq wrote on the forum that he wouldn't be able to connect to Elder Lord for a while. Everybody accepted it because they had their own lives. But due to his writing, the five members with Crocta became known. Shaq was lost so there were now only four, but they started to be called Crocta's five apostles in the community. There is no one else coming. They can't come to the south. There were people who wanted to join. But when Crocta had been fighting the empire, they withdrew from the south. The type of users who could fight against the knights of the south wasn't common. It looks like we really will die one of Crocta's five apostles muttered. They were currently writing letters of propaganda that provoked the emperor. Each of them would show their talent at mocking the emperor, drawing cartoons that would be sent to him. The letters would target everywhere, from the nobles to commoners, scholars, mages and even the imperial palace. A person with the stealth S would infiltrate the empire and sneak it into the post office. The goal was to provoke the emperor. Just send this amount and then stop. They will begin to start tracking it. Yes. 
Unlike her worries, she started to show off her artistic talents. Everyone did their best. Gilgamesh even drew a picture of the emperor being whipped. Krakta scratched his head. It is a bit. Kukit Krakta, perhaps Gilgamesh lowered his voice. Are you afraid of the emperor? What are you talking about? Then it doesn't matter what the level of this letter is. That is true. So Krakta, take this pen and add things. More irritating. Make the emperor so angry that he loses his hair. Yes. Krakta lifted the pen. Then he began to add his own style to Gilgamesh's work. An arrow was placed above the head of the stripped and whipped emperor, then words added. This is a wig. The emperor is bald. It was propaganda stating that the emperor was bald. Ha! Gilgamesh covered his mouth with his hands. It was hard to believe his eyes. No blood, no tears, no slander. Any adults looking at this will shake in anger, not just the emperor. This is truly. Kukuk. This is the scale of Krakta. Indeed, your sense of justice is unlike anyone else at Kukukuk. Everyone finished their work. A member of the thief class grabbed the packet of letters. He would go into the empire and send letters. There would even be a letter sent directly to the emperor. Will the emperor truly move? Those with power are surprisingly simple. Krakta intended to bring the enemy's attack to himself. Using a common word, it was to attract aggro. The imperial troops were spread out over the entire south. Villagers who surrendered were already provided labor for the empire's convenience. If this happened, it would be hard to save the people. It was better to anger the emperor and gather the army. However, once the emperor has gathered his troops. But the others were worried. Are you sure about this? Krakta's point was true, but for this strategy to be successful, they needed to be able to deal with the enemy. There was no point gathering the enemy only to die. And they believed that Krakta had a clear way. Maybe an army of orcs would appear. Or maybe the cities of the continent will help. But Krakta just shrugged his shoulders. I don't know. I have no thoughts. Krakta told them. I will think about if after the enemies gather. It was a shocking answer. He had no thoughts. However, they strangely weren't worried. As long as they were with Krakta, it felt like they could succeed in anything. Let's think about it later. Kulkulkul, Bolter. Huhu. Kukuk. They nodded. If they worried about the future, they wouldn't have succeeded in the many fights they experienced. In the video of the fight at Cheswood, Krakta had said. That is the calculations of a human. He had different calculations than humans. His formula didn't consider things like the size and strength of the enemy. Even though it changed from a village to the empire, this person's calculations hadn't changed at all. How far could this man go? The users exchanged glances. Everyone, are you going to do it all the way? Of course. Kukuk. They would die. From the viewpoint of the users, this was a reckless quest. It was an impossible mission with a hell difficulty, where the odds was close to zero. But it didn't matter. They were now with Krakta. This was the most fun they had in Elder Lord. Krakta told them. If the Emperor's eyes turn away from other villages and come to catch us, that is enough. The he's an orc, yet still praiseworthy decided to just follow Krakta and see what would happen. Anyway, he was a man impervious to calculations. Their plan was successful. There was news that the Imperial Army was converging. Guys! Everybody listen, Kane said. Those in front of him were the elites of the Heaven and Earth clan. At this time, Rommel and I have become nobles. The members of the Heaven and Earth clan applauded. It hadn't been possible for a user to become a noble since the launch of Elder Lord, so this was an unimaginable accomplishment. Guys! Is Elder Lord fun? Kane smiled. Where else could you people and pillage villages? This is why Elder Lord is fun. We can do things we've always wanted to do, but never could. The Heaven and Earth members laughed. In the past, they had won wars, trampled the rebels under the Emperor's name, 
and enjoyed all sorts of looting. They carried out the actions without any hesitation because it was a game. They finally understood why there were endless wars in human history. The winners who were given rights coveted it again, just like drugs. Die Elf, no, Park Quanchel. He called a clan member. The clan members focused their attention. Keynes only called their real name when sewing important happened. Weren't you praised because you worked well before? I sent money to your account. You'll die if you use it for sewing else. Keynes approached him and touched his shoulder. Use it for a car, a foreign car. Understood. The clan members all understood his will. Prior to any important work, Keynes would raise morale by giving out rewards. It was a message that all of them could get a reward like Die Elf. In addition, the prize was enormous. After buying it, send me a picture to prove it. Keynes laughed and Die Elf bowed with a thrilled face. Brother, thank you. You should thank your parents for giving birth to such a wonderful son. I just showed my appreciation. Thank you, brother. This brat. Come on everyone. I don't want him to be the only hard worker. Keynes tapped his shoulder before going to stand next to Lewin. Lewin grinned as he raised his shoulders. When the war begins, listen to Rommel. Rommel is the best. Of course, there was no need to ask. Rommel's war maestro was a fraudulent class that forced soldiers on the battlefield to obey him. Let's play a fun game today. Heaven and Earth. War. Chapter 160. The territory of the kingdom, which had occupied a corner of the south, was now greatly expanded. The separated lands of humans were merged together by the emperor. The size of it was equal to the land of the remaining species combined. Everything has gone as I envisioned. That is the plan. Yes. I can't say that everything obtained was just through luck. Keynes recalled the past as he looked at the map of the continent. He borrowed the power of a human earl and succeeded in ing the legendary orc Lennox. Thanks to that, he was able to establish a relationship with the nobles. The plan sped up because he joined forces with Rommel, who had already been recognized by the nobles. And thus, he met the king. The young king had merely been a symbol. At the time, he was just a link that weaved the humans together under the name of the kingdom. But Keynes was able to see the ambition in the king's eyes. Eureka! It was a strange feeling. It felt like he developed a meaning. He manipulated the people around him. However, he wasn't an instructor who raised those who had stopped running he was quite the opposite. He whispered at the side of those who were already running and lured them down the path he wanted. Then how did you think about making the king an emperor? A cantor was originally someone with the ambition, and I had the strength to bring it out. I was lucky. My plan worked. You are too modest. Rommel whistled. Keynes grinned. Rommel was one of the few people he could truly converse with. Rommel's class was a war maestro, and he was talented in many ways. Even his mind was good. Before the launch of Elder Lord, when PC games were still popular, Rommel was a professional gamer. Then, what type of idea do you have? Here. Keynes pointed to sewing on the map. Ha Rommel saw it and smiled. There weren't many cases where Rommel smiled like this. This is a big idea. Ha 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 ha. You recognize it. Keynes was a thorough realist. He enjoyed Elder Lord in order to build wealth in reality. He and Rommel had already made huge sums of money as the leaders of heaven and earth. Now he wasn't satisfied with just that. A species war. Keynes would use the genius of war, Rommel, to make the empire trample on the other species. When considering how achievement points were gained by affecting the world of Elder Lord. The achievement points and wealth that would pour down on them would be several times higher than what they currently accumulated. It was at the scale of Elder Lord's devastation. Maybe it would be devastated to a point where it was impossible to play the game. At that time, the publishers would either break their rules of non-intervention or reset the server. Anyway, by the time he would have quit Elder Lord. Let's burn down the world. Good. The two looked at each other and grinned. 
You intend to create a cataclysm to gain marvelous achievement points. That's right. Keynes confirmed his status window and saw that his achievement points were constantly being updated. Even though he was still, his achievement points were accumulating due to the activities of his clan members. But he didn't receive any compensation that was of great use to him right now. I think so as well. People thought Keynes had an ordinary magician class. He made them believe that. He professed himself as the magician class. However, he had a hidden class that no one except for Rommel could reach. Evil Whisperer. It was a class that specialized not just in magic, but also SS that affected the other person's mind. His words and deeds exercised control over people. People trusted him and followed his commands. With just a few words, he could turn an opponent into a loyal subordinate. It was the ability that best suited him. He would now whisper evil words into the ears of the emperor and the nobles, and the continent would fall into the flames of war. We've already obtained many good things. Oh, brother is also a hidden. Yes. Only Rommel knew that he had a hidden class. However, he didn't tell Rommel the information about it. Keynes, he was able to get the hidden class because maybe someone wanted him to. The system messages. In the early days, the system messages were a mechanical system that transmitted elements of the game. As he fought bigger battles and earned more achievements, the messages came closer to his personal feelings. When he first started a war and slaughtered people, he gained achievement points and the system said. Great slaughter. While it is a malicious act, at the same time, it is a tremendous achievement. I look forward to the bigger wars that you will cause. Then Keynes felt sowing. He had a vague feeling. The world of Elder Lord was helping him. At that time, he heard sewing outside the door. Keynes. Rommel. Can I come in? Uh, come in. The door opened and a clan member entered. There is a letter. A letter? From who? He tilted my head to the side. Isn't it that thing? Ah, that. They were talking about the random letters sent out by Crocta. It was the latest topic in the Empire. Crocta wanted all the attention to be focused on him and he was successful. He was a moderately clever guy. Right now, the Empire was seething with anger towards Crocta. The Empire's public enemy, Crocta. He is creative so I wonder what is written here. Keynes chuckled and opened the letter. He checked the contents. Then his face stiffened. Keynes' stiff expression melted away. He laughed and stated. Clever. Keynes handed the letter to Rommel. Rommel read it. He is smart. This guy is for real. If this was what he intended, it is successful. Rommel nodded. Keynes banged the table. Above everything else, we have to this guy. That would be better. It doesn't matter since this guy intends to draw the aggro. So I feel relieved. I can him. The NPCs of Elder Lord were realistic. They were amazingly realistic and had their own logic and philosophies. Keynes and Rommel had grown through their cooperation with NPCs, so they knew this better than anyone else. NPCs were clever. Enough to catch up with users. I know this, you jerk. We are tied together. In the letter Croc sent, he had only written a single line. Remember Lennox. Lennox was Ed a long time ago and became a foothold for him to reach this position. But due to that, the thawing Balhi clan died. He thought that was the end. But the old revenge he believed was over had come back for them. Crocta hadn't just accidentally tangled with the Empire. His two eyes were always staring straight at them. Until one of the two of them were gone, it would be a fight to the end. You will never be able to bear what you have done today. Lennox's voice that he heard on that day washed over him again. A dandator raised his sword. He was defeated by Crocta. Since then, every time he lifted his sword, Crocta's illusion was staring at him. His spirit became chaotic. He couldn't hold the sword anymore and dropped it. He threw the sword towards the fireplace. The sword rolled across the floor a few times before becoming quiet. The blade would be damaged. A swordsman should think of the blade as his lover. 
His father always said so. His father saw the blade as his lover, yet he was a third-rate knight who never reached the pinnacle. It was a time when the Packlinch's family's sword had disappeared. The family declined and no one remembered them. Look. They were the family that produced the most famous traitor in history. Lieutenant Packlinch, the worst knight who sided with orcs and ed humans. People supported the Packlinch family when they were strong, but once they lost strength and fell, the people hit them in the face. Those were the hard days. A dandator never forgot those insults. So he crazily swung his sword. From the moment he closed his eyes to the time he opened them, he only thought about the sword. It was a near crazy obsession. He was able to become the best knight in the kingdom. Hell beat me again. He knew how convenient the word talent was. People said that a dandator was a genius. He was called the best talent of the empire. However, he lived every moment with the blade. His head was calculating the sword's trajectory, even when he was eating or sleeping. He looked at the full bloom of a rose and saw a sword in the structure of the stamen and pistol. He didn't believe that was talent. Humans had no limitations. It was obvious whenever he was knocked down to the ground. He would come back stronger and beat the faces of those laughing at him. But now he couldn't swing his sword. This was the first time. Why? He muttered as he closed his eyes. He imagined an invisible sword in his hand and thought about the formula. An image formed in the darkness. The countless enemies and knights he faced in his life passed by. Now they were easy opponents. He recalled the sword of Earl Bendiker, a powerhouse. His sword was flexible and couldn't be caught. The Earl seemed to be pushed back, but then he used a soft sword that reversed the attack and slashed at the opponent's neck. It wasn't easy when he thought about it again. A dandator concentrated. In his imagination, he gradually got used to Earl Bendiker's technique. A dandator received a lot of damage from the tricky S, but a dandator's sword eventually stabbed his heart. At least his sword could be wielded if a certain strong person was in front of him. But Crocta was different. At the time of the duel, a dandator clearly had the advantage until he faced an unknown light. But now he couldn't remember how he pushed Crocta. A dead wall. He couldn't defeat Crocta, no matter how many times he repeated it in his head. He couldn't even imagine it. This was the first time. Don't make me laugh he raised a new sword. Then he swung it in the air. A wave of energy ripped through the air. The orc who follows Liteno. He learned all the swordsmanship techniques of the Packlinch family. Therefore, he was able to recognize Crocta's swordsmanship. The orc's great sword style was clearly taken from Liteno. Now it had developed into his own technique, but the base was definitely from Liteno. And the root of Latino's swordsmanship was the Packlinch family. In the end, it was a swordsmanship associated with a Dandator's family. He shouted and the sword hit the ground again. Kang! Kang! He relentless threw the sword against the ground. There was no sword capable of enduring the abuse of the Empire's strongest knight. The blade was broken. He kicked the fragments and threw the handle. Complete despair. It sank down on him. It was a terrible feeling he had never felt before. He couldn't understand Crocta and the light that was produced. Trying to understand the unknown concept caused an obsession that was close to madness. He flopped down. He took deep breaths and tried to calm down. He barely managed to calm himself. Then he asked, what's going on? His butler was approaching. He stood where the sword had been broken. There is a letter. That thing. Crocta's letters were a hot topic in the empire. Each letter insulted the emperor in a novel way. Some nobles of the empire were secretly collecting them. The butler approached and handed it over. A dandator opened the letter. Then he started laughing. The emperor's features were surprisingly alive. The emperor was in wet bedclothes and speaking insulting remarks. There was no context so he couldn't help laughing. This is like a child's game. A dandator burst out laughing. I lost to a child like this. He got up from his seat. The butler said, the imperial empire has got in contact. 
What is it? There is an army forming to deal with Krakta. The commander is Rommel. The White Lion Knights have also been called. The Knights he was the leader of the White Lions and they were the best power in the Empire. This letter has angered his majesty. A dandator laughed. Emperor Akantar was still young. He didn't have the qualities of an emperor yet. Krokta. According to reports, he was recently sighted near Natalia Forest. Not Espada. I see. A dandator closed his eyes. The feeling simmering in his chest constantly tormented him. It was making one demand. If he followed it, this crazy feeling would disappear. He couldn't lift his sword on his own. He couldn't see the answer. An unreachable enemy. All of these things were making him breathless. An answer was needed. Listen carefully. I'm going somewhere now. Ha! Huh. The butler's eyes widened. I told you that the White Lion Knights are convening. I am sick. His Majesty. If he comes to find me, tell him that I am sick and I can't move. It was the truth. He couldn't concentrate on anything. At this rate, he might go crazy with frustration. He had already ruined two swords. There was no other way. He needed to resolve this. For the time being, a dandator Packlinch is ill. I went to see a famous healer in the land of the elves. Do you understand? I want change my decision. Who, I understand. His faithful butler nodded. He absolutely followed Adandator Packlinch. Adandator was the one who brought the family back from the brink of ruin. Then prepare my baggage. Where are you heading? Natalia Forest. Surely you aren't going to Krokta. That place is dangerous. I'm not going to fight. Adandator grabbed his head. I need an answer. He was going to ask Krokta. The shape of Krokta that blocked a dandator every time he lifted a sword. The despair that made him unable to swing the sword. He had to ask that person for the answer. Krokta is the Empire's public enemy. If you get in touch with him without fighting. That is why I need to meet him even more. Of course, that isn't the only reason. It wasn't just to help a dandator. The Emperor is currently mistaken. Krokta had shown that light. A dandator experienced it directly so he could tell. If Krokta could use it freely, the empire might collapse. The White Lion Knights, the Blue Dragon Lancers and any other elites, they couldn't endure that light. It is also for the empire. The butler bowed. Chapter, 161 Krokta was waiting for the emperor's army in the vicinity of Natalia Forest. He couldn't deal with a large army alone, so he chose the forest. He would do guerrilla warfare. If the field of view was limited and wild beasts were present, he was confident that he could face the enemies. Of course, it was on the premise that there weren't any people like a dandator present. Krokta held his greatsword as he recalled the duel with a dandator. It was a good test. Krokta was able to see that a dandator's swordsmanship was the result of patience and hard work. All the movements were repeated and his swords worn out. It was an extreme obsession. Krokta was reminded of Hoyt when he saw a dandator. He had some resemblance to Hoyt, who repeated the movements hundreds of thousands of times. If there were more knights like a dandator, this fight would be dangerous. Bolter. A blow to the air. There was a shallow scratch on the tree. Krokta wielded his sword like crazy. Every time he wielded it, the blade tore at the tree. But despite his violent movements, the trees only received a few minor injuries. It was extreme control. He only touched the tree with the tip of his sword before releasing it. He dropped the sword. Krokta took a deep breath. He looked up at the sky. In the thick forest that covered the sky, a few crows looked down at him and cried out. A crow is oyas, but it is also a disaster. In South Korea, the crying of a crow was a bad omen, but it was oyas in the West. If so, what about the guest who had just come? Krokta turned around. It was a guest he hadn't expected. Krokta raised his hand towards the person riding towards him. It has been a while. A man holding a sword. A dandator. 
He wasn't dressed as a knight. Have you been well? Orc. I am Crocta. Human. Crocta laughed. Although he won, a dandator was certainly powerful. They knew each other's level, so there was an unknown bond between them. There was respect, despite the fact that they might each other. Why did you come? I thought you just followed the emperor. The emperor doesn't have anything to do with me. A dandator dragged the baggage he was carrying on his back. I came because I have a request. A request? Yes. A request. He approached Crocta. Tell me about your sword. Crocta looked at a dandator. It was an intense gaze. A dandator came here because of the light that appeared when he was defeated. Crocta formed a fist. Kiak. A dandator flew a short distance before hitting a tree and falling to the ground. He was stunned by the impact. Crocta approached. Kook. I don't believe those who break their oaths. Crocta placed his foot on a dandator's body. Then he used his strength. Cough. Get lost. Crocta spat out. Their duel was definitely a fight for Alastair's freedom. Crocta won. However, Alast was devastated. Then Crocta decided to destroy the empire. Crocta gradually increased his weight. A dandator was unable to withstand it and started trembling. However, he looked up at Crocta and smiled. I guess, cough, you are angry. Of course. I will let you know. All the nobles opposed the invasion of Alast. Crocta's eyes narrowed. So. I did as well. Then why didn't you stop it? The emperor arbitrarily sent his troops. Those who were cursed by the stars. Then I came to realize. The empire is galloping. It is a horse that can no longer be stopped. I can't stop the emperor's decisions. Crocta removed his foot from a dandator. He barely managed to get up. Cough, the empire and the emperor have nothing to do with why I am here. I want to know about your sword. Crocta turned around. I don't believe you. I will give you information. A dandator shouted. It'll tell you about the empire. It is necessary if you want to fight the emperor. Crocta turned to him. Are you interested now? Why are you going so far? Didn't I already say it? I want to know about your sword. That's it. That's it. A dandator took out a sword. That is all. Since you and I fought, I can barely hold my sword. When I raise the sword, you appear and block me. I'm going crazy. Give me the answer. That is your reason. What other reason is needed? I am sincere right now. Crocta laughed. He was a stupid guy. Crocta was sometimes curious about the person called the Empire's best talent. He wanted to know how a dandator became so strong. Crocta realized sewing. A dandator wasn't that mysterious or great. He was just obsessed. If he didn't get what he wanted, he wouldn't be able to breathe until he got it. And this guy only wanted the sword. Are there any knights in the empire as strong as you? No. Earl Bendiker is retired. The rest aren't at my standard. Some knight leaders have reached the pinnacle but not beyond that. Crocta raised his greatsword. What does the emperor want? A species war? I don't know. There isn't enough interview. The bushes would constrain his movements. It was an unfavorable battlefield for Crocta since he used a greatsword. However, he didn't care. Those who failed to the opponent were dead warriors. They wouldn't always fight in an open environment that was favorable to them. Crocta swung his greatsword first. A dandator promptly responded. The two blades hit each other. What is the Heaven and Earth clan's position in the Empire? Those who were cursed by the stars. Their swords collided. Gradually, their attacks reached the area of the pinnacle. In the tranquil forest, the two of them moved quickly. Crocta's sword smashed the forest while aiming at a dandator's body. A dandator desperately defended. Are you going to just defend? A dandator was unable to attack. It was the same as when he was handling a sword alone. 
Crockett kept blocking him. He couldn't attack. They came up under the sponsorship of Duke Christian and now they are by the Emperor's side. Rommel is excellent at commanding in battle. I have to admit it. How so? He turns fools into trained soldiers. I have never seen such a commander. While he did go through a few wars in the past, his abilities are still amazing nonetheless. Crockta nodded. It was thanks to the War Maestro class. As far as he knew from the broadcasts and media, Choi Hansung had the SS to strengthen the soldiers, control them and eliminate any fear of war. This time, the Emperor even gave him a troop of knights. Be careful. I see. Well-trained knights would bring tremendous synergy to Rommel. Crocta once again pushed a Dandator back. A Dandator was perplexed. He thought he would be okay if he met Crocta in person and swung the sword. However, it wasn't the case. He could only act passively. He didn't dare swing his sword at Crocta, as it felt like he was facing a dead-end wall. A Dandator laughed. Have you become stronger? A little. After beating a Dandator, Crocta had more experience with the hero realm. His overall abilities had increased since then, so he was able to deal with a Dandator much easier. A Dandator grit his teeth. It would be the same in the future. Show me. A Dandator raised his sword and declared, Crocta, I can wield my sword after facing you. Even now I can't swing my sword. That light, what on earth is it? That Crocta puffed up his chest and shamelessly stated, I don't know. It just happened. I can't do it again. That's right. Since then, Crocta couldn't use that power again. It was a realm that he only glimpsed for a moment. What? A Dandator was dumbfounded. Really? Really? A Dandator's face distorted. Only I was defeated by a technique you accidentally used. That's right. Defeated. That. His first official defeat in front of everyone. He had lost when it was a significant battle for the Empire. However, it was just a coincidence. It wasn't Crocta's real ability. Huhuhu a Dandator laughed and raised his sword before suddenly rushing forward. This ing orc. Opportunist, you reveal your true nature. Crocta raised his sword and declared, I tested you once in order to understand you. I can actually use it. A Dandator stopped his sword. Ah really? That's right. A Dandator coughed, I reacted too early. I will apologize. It was only once. At that moment, Crocta's fist hit his abdomen. Cough. Trying to cheat again. You are naive. Why you jerk? I was lying. But even without it, you are below me, a Dandator. A Dandator threw down his sword and ran at Crocta, who also abandoned his weapon. A Dandator threw his body at Crocta. The two opponents dumped their swords and continued to struggle for a while. Their fists hit each other's faces. It was an unsightly dog fight between the Empire's strongest knight and the orc warrior who defeated him. Wait a minute, wait a minute. Crocta was on top of him and a Dandator shook his head. Wait a minute. What? Crocta paused his fist and looked down. A Dandator was holding both hands together. I lost. Don't hit my face. I surrender. Crocta grinned. It is good that you can admit it. He got up. At that moment, a Dandator grabbed some dirt on the ground and threw it into Crocta's face. You were tricked. Crocta rubbed his eyes as a Dandator threw his battered body forward. It was a big size difference, but a Dandator was able to build up a lot of strength over the past few years. His fists relentlessly hit Crocta. Cough. See coward. It isn't like that. These types of techniques were also required in night training. A Dandator was good in boxing techniques. He threw out a jab and once Crocta protected his face, he hit Crocta's forehead with a wind hook fist. Papak. Crocta's body shook. It is the end. The moment he was going to kick Crocta's chin. Crocta disappeared. What? His body had bent down. Then Crocta picked up a Dandator's body. Wait a minute, 
wait a minute, that is cheating. Were there any rules in this fight? It is supposed to be bare fists. I will die. That is a rock. Crocta's body shook. He was laughing. Hu 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 Crocta told him. Then die. He leaned forward. A dandator screamed as he headed towards the ground. Kayak. His head was about to hit the ground. Just before his skull collapsed, his body stopped moving. Crocta had stopped just before a dandator would be Ed. Crocta lifted him again and placed him safely on the floor. A dandator was speechless. Hey, is it that scary? Did you pee? Hey. Crocta called out to him. A dandator. He was teary eyed. You orc. A dandator swung his fist. Of course, the target was Crocta. That isn't true, you. Are you a crybaby? Ha <laughs> ha. I will you. Yes yes, a crybaby. You son of a. A dandator grabbed his sword on the ground and swung it at Crocta. Ah. He reached the realm of hero in an instant and attacked Crocta. Crocta also used the hero realm to deal with the attack. The tentacles of causality tangled together. But in the end, a dandator was pushed back. Crocta was more experienced with the hero realm and a dandator, who had fallen into a slump, was unable to narrow that gap. Crocta looked down at him and said, Hey. This. How is it? Can you now wield the sword against me? A dandator's eyes widened. Crocta grinned. That light, you will know what it is if you keep training. You were just afraid. Nonsense. We are creatures who like using our fists and stumble when the temple is hit. Don't choke. Talking nonsense a dandator covered his eyes and laughed. Orc who is good at lying, talking nonsense. This is the end. Crocta sprinkled dirt from the floor on a dandator's face. A dandator spat out the dirt and cursed. Crocta burst out laughing. The he's an orc, yet still praiseworthy members returned to the forest. They found a laughing Crocta and a man lying on the floor. Chapter, 162 By the way, it is incredible, said one of the he's an orc, yet still praiseworthy members as he moved a ladle through a big pot of stew. His name was Alex. Leaving your country for the sake of the sword. A dandator's eyes flashed as he opened them. It is because I am willing to leave the country that am so good at the sword. Ha <laughs> ha. A dandator was a named NPC. He was called the strongest knight in the south, a land with the largest number of human users. Another named NPC, Northern Conqueror Crocta had beaten a dandator in a duel. Crocta and a dandator were now sitting in front of them. This was the best place as a user of Elder Lord. I guess you grew up with a spoon in your mouth, Crocta suddenly said. Ha! Huh. Look at you abandoning your country because your sword is blocked. You are a noble, yet you grew up into such a selfish person. The members of He's an Orc, yet still praiseworthy looked at a dandator after Crocta's words. A dandator sat there pretending to be unconcerned, but his hands were shaking. Besides, aren't I stronger because I work hard and have talent? Then this prideful guy appeared. You. A dandator couldn't bear it any more and jumped up. Do you want to play again? Crocta laughed while tapping his greatsword. A dandator took deep breaths and closed his eyes, before slowing sinking back into his seat. Well done. Crocta explained to the he's an orc, yet still praiseworthy members. This is what I call resocialization. The process of regaining anger control and sociability. Not true. A dandator pulled out his sword and pointed it at Crocta. Let's do it again. Crocta shrugged and said, You still need some lessons in socialization. Crocta got up from his spot. It didn't take long this time. Crocta dragged a dandator, who was now limp, and placed him next to the pot. Kokokol. A dandator raised his head as he slowly regained his spirit. Kwong. He held his head and groaned as if it were in pain. It smells good. Crocta didn't care and examined the contents of the pot. The stew meat that Crocta had hunted and the forest's es and herbs. The meat wasn't spared and rose to the surface, revealing all of the fat. 
It might be hard later so enjoy this meal. The he's an orc, yet still praiseworthy members grew nervous at Crocta's words. Crocta's letters had brought the emperor's wrath upon them, and now the empire's great army would come. Crocta made his enemies come to him, meaning that while the other areas would be safe, they were in a more deadly crisis. You can escape at any time. No, they replied. Crocta nodded. The Heaven and Earth clan was among the enemies. There were only a few he's an orc, yet still praiseworthy users here, but they would try their best. They followed Crocta despite knowing this risk. The silent Adandator suddenly asked, Do you really believe you can win? He knew the Empire well. Then he told Crocta what he knew. The Empire was too big to break down with this power. Apart from the well-trained troops, the abundant crops were endlessly harvested. Furthermore, the knights and magicians were trained with an organized system. Crocta might be strong but he couldn't deal with all those people. It might be possible with that flash of light, but it wasn't enough because Crocta couldn't fully use it yet. Winning or losing isn't important. Crocta grinned. He hit the shoulder of a dandator, a knight who still hadn't learned anything. I'm a warrior. A warrior pays back any favor or vengeance. The troops gathered. Rommel looked at them and smiled. It was the greatest number of soldiers he had ever commanded. The well-trained soldiers, knights and the heaven and earth members who always moved like his limbs, they were all in his grasp. He rode his horse to the forefront of the formation. The rider flying the flag of the empire was close behind him. Kane spoke up from next to him, Rommel. Yes. Did you receive the quest? Rommel nodded. Now is the real start. Kane's face was excited. As soon as the Emperor gave them a command, a quest had been received. It was a large-scale linked quest that had never appeared in Elder Lord. This is a large-scale linked quest on the continent. Raise the fires of the species war. Deal with the rebels in the south and remove all impure molecules. The completion conditions are as follows. Get rid of the Empire's public enemy, Crocta. Occupy Espada, which has rejected the Empire. Unite the South under the name of the Empire. There are three conditions. Adequate compensation will be given upon completion. Good luck. All members of the Heaven and Earth clan received the quest. It was the largest scale ever, so all the clan members were excited. Looking at the momentum of the Empire, it was enough to complete the quest. We will resolve it in order, said Rommel. He was staring at the quest window in the air. Get rid of Crocta and then go to Espada. After that, the South will be won. HRMM Keynes smiled and asked, Should we really do that? He is trying to bring us into his domain, so we should show him how silly that idea is. Rommel thought about it and nodded. I understand. We will let that white orc know the gap between us. Will the NPCs follow? We have this. It was an edict delegating full authority to them. If he wants to draw aggro, we should draw the aggro back. After listening to Keynes, Rommel raised his hand and the rider raised the flag. A horn sound was transmitted towards all the troops. Rommel and Keynes started moving. The army was one step behind them. The troops began to move forward. The knights escorted the formation in the wings, while the soldiers walked towards the battlefield with their spears. The scouts moved ahead of the procession. The army was spread out in rows and columns. Rommel asked as he looked at the backs of the scouts, will he come? He will come. Kane smiled. It is obvious when looking at his track record. We don't need to go looking for him. I understand. Rommel and Kane's turned. The army followed them. They headed towards the other side of Natalia Forest. One of the knights from the White Lion Knights approached them. He was the deputy leader who led the knights, as a dandator was currently ill. He was an experienced knight. Natalia Forest isn't in this direction. Keynes replied with a smile, we aren't going to Natalia. Crocta is at Natalia. Sir Betring doesn't know him well Crocta isn't a normal person. He is a shameless guy, so we can't allow things to go as he wants. Then. It is a lesson I taught before. 
Don't go into the enemy's trap lure the enemy into your own. I remember. This is the same thing. Crocta tried to lure us, but we won't fall for it. Instead, we will bring him to us. Betring nodded at the words. His face was convinced. I understand what you want to do. But are you sure he will come? The direction they were heading wasn't towards Natalia. It was Espada. Of course. He is a righteous person. Ha Betrain looked up at the sky. If he was born a human, he would have been a knight. It is a pity. Instead, we have you and Sir Adandator. I still can't be compared to Sir Adandator. He laughed. I do like those words. Anyway, I understand. Betring returned to the White Lion Knights. Keynes looked at his back and chuckled. Disgusting. We know that we are bad guys, but they are just deluding themselves. They aren't knights, just ironclad contractors. Your words are correct. Rommel thought about Crocta and declared, Crocta is the best knight. Yes, that's right. Keynes shrugged. An orc is the one who acts more like a knight than anyone else. How funny. That is how he became the Empire's public enemy and our stumbling block. This is why life is funny. A public enemy was closer to a knight than the actual knights. Those knights were now under Keynes and Rommel's leadership, who were villains. It means there is no god. Rommel turned and waved his hand. It was towards a member of the Heaven and Earth clan. Other than Rommel, he was the most well-known member of Heaven and Earth. The one responsible for Heaven and Earth's public relations. BJ Heaven and Earth. Hey, BJ. Yes. Start the broadcast. A large-scale quest is in progress and the goal is to unite the South. We should show people why we are the Heaven and Earth clan. Ah, uh, yes. You take good care of the ratings. Well done. Thank you. BJ Heaven and Earth laughed. Then he'll do it properly. I'm bored. He was lying on the sofa in the manager's office and watching his tablet. There is no one funny. He had a taste for internet broadcasting these days. When he was bored, he would watch broadcasters play games or communicate with people in real time. It was the best way of ing time. He searched for the famous female BJ, Elizabeth. Due to her beautiful appearance, she was a popular Elder Lord player. Not here. Beck Hanho rolled his body. Um. It was the recent no. One ranked BJ. The BJ from Heaven and Earth TV. His broadcast was marked as online. In an instant, viewers gathered. Beck Hanho frowned. These s. He clicked on Heaven and Earth TV. The degree of these guys when they start broadcasting I should give it a try. As he watched the internet broadcasts, Beck Hanho started to develop a dream of becoming a BJ. Women cheered whenever Andre appeared. Ho! Beck Hanho whistled as the screen was displayed. The scale was truly enough to be ranked first. A large number of troops filled the field of view. They were marching on the plains. The appearance of the knights and the army was enough to heat up the hearts of men. Beck Hanho opened a chat window. His nickname was White Tiger. White Tiger you guys this what is it? Chatter. Yiri Mountain Uncle. I'm hungry Sob Sob the Heaven and Earth Clan received a large-scale quest and is going to war. Orc is the best Heaven and Earth will fall to Croc the 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 I'm hungry sob sob but one person can't go against an army. Yiri Mountain it seems the legend of Crocta will end. White Tiger Crocta are they fighting? Passing Swallow they will hit Crocta and then start a species war. White Tiger wow. Passing Swallow no one can fight them I wonder if Crocta will be in the war. Dreaming of a new spring I saw him in a village. Beck Hanho's hands trembled. A massive army. There were also NPC knights. Even Crocta would be in a crisis. A great crisis. He jumped up. Heaven and Earth. These s. 
he threw the tablet and opened the door of the manager's office. The members of the gym looked at Beck Hanho. However, he left the gym without caring. Crocta. He was White Knight Andre Spray. Chapter, 163. Under Games, a broadcasting channel specialized for games, acquired a tip first. It was news that Elder Lord's best-selling War Maestro Rommel and the Heaven and Earth Clan were beginning their large-scale quest. The quest wasn't an ordinary raid. War content that couldn't be seen on a peaceful continent. This time, it wasn't a small, contained skirmish, but rather a vast, extensive war that made use of a great army. Recently, the Heaven and Earth Clan had formed a closer relationship with the Kingdom and it was reported that they were leading the Empire's army. It was a real war. Channel Under Games, which had grown quickly through Elder Lord, didn't want to miss this event. So they decided to postpone the PvP contest and organized a special program that relayed the quest progress in real time. They negotiated with the Heaven and Earth Clan and paid a large amount of royalties. Then they launched a new online channel filled with commentators aside from BJ Heaven and Earth. The name. TL seems to have taken the name from a Buddhist saying that includes Heaven and Earth. They just used words that looked great, but this childish name attracted people's attention. Then the broadcast started. It was a hardcore program that tracked the Heaven and Earth clan 24 hours a day in real time. The storytelling was already overflowing. They were the knights of the emperor who fought for the empire's revival, and those who opposed it were rebels. Towards the unrighteous, the empire knights and the Heaven and Earth clan would raise their swords. The Heaven and Earth Clan became the hottest topic. Aren't they just slaughtering weak people? There were some people who said it, but their opinions were ignored. Those were just human rights people. The ones being ed were NPCs. It was enough to create a Heaven and Earth mania. The goal is the occupation of Espada. Rommel explained. If necessary, wipe them out. Rommel truly is incredible. Look at that charisma. The NPCs can't even move their heads and are being conducted. That is the dignity of a general. The one who makes that formation is Rommel. He was such a person from the beginning. Choi Hansung was a professional gamer in the past. He was always an imposing friend. I always knew he would become big. The other leaders were riding beside Choi Hansung. Keynes chewed on his apple and laughed. Disgraceful S are trying to use tricks to ruin the empire. Cut off the bud here. So reconciliation is no longer a choice. What about those who resist? Don't be naive. We have already given them enough opportunities. This price is their own fault. Kuang. I understand. That is the vice master of the Heaven and Earth clan, Keynes. He was the leader of the now disappeared Thawing Balhi clan. If Rommel is the field commander of heaven and earth, Keynes is the brain. The Zhuge Liang of Elder Lord. Then isn't it General Rom and Keynes Liang? Kel Kel Kel. General Rom and Keynes Liang. Those nicknames are good. Ha ha ha. And Crocta. Keynes said while chewing on the apple. Let's show it well before he gets here. How many people will die because of him? Crocta. He is now rebelling against the Empire. He is an NPC who entertained people's eyes and ears, but isn't his opponent the Heaven and Earth Clan. It is regrettable. While it is difficult to make conclusions, an individual and an army are two different things. It is a fact that there is an objective difference in power. A fact. Perhaps Crocta's biography will end here I feel like that. It is too bad. What would it be like if Crocta was a human and joined heaven and earth? I have such regrets. The knights and infantry commanders nodded. They retreated. Now only Keynes and Rommel remained in the tent. They looked at each other. In the end, we've arrived here. Indeed. Let's make it cool. Now it is starting. Ho ho. Rommel and Keynes fist bumped each other. Heaven and earth. War. Kia. It is wonderful. Heaven and Earth, War. The symbol of the Heaven and Earth clan. Heaven and Earth is war, war is Heaven and Earth. 
I have confidence. It was a directed scene, but the viewers had already fallen into the characters and couldn't recognize it. After the slogan, the screen slowly faded out. It was a broadcast break. This is Elder Lord, the realism. It is a game that maximizes the realism. Kohahahat, anyway, there are difficulties. Why are you talking here, aren't you the narrator? Kuhuhu. Kuhahat, I'm sorry. I have a very fixed opinion. Hohat. So, friends, there are many things for you to see. I have to go to the bathroom. Then we will be having a short break. We will play highlights of the Heaven and Earth Clan so that viewers won't become bored until the broadcast starts again. See you in a while. The screen switched to a recorded broadcast. Rommel appeared. The Heaven and Earth members were moving in unison under his command. It was a quest where the Heaven and Earth Clan was proceeding with mass destruction. The well-trained soldiers systematically subdued the enemies. This type of warfare was why people loved Heaven and Earth. The commentary is too biased. Yun Bora complained as she watched the broadcast. Just watch. Krokta will break the Heaven and Earth Clan. Aren't there too many soldiers? Ban Taehoon replied. Hey. Didn't he conquer the North alone? Who is Krokta? We didn't see what happened in the North so we don't know. If Krokta can win against that army alone, he is a god, not an orc. Isn't Krokta a god? Are you a fool? Are you saying that to me? Yun Bora and Ban Taehoon started fighting. Iyu drank her Americano with a disinterested face before complaining, you talk about Elder Lord every time we meet. You can do it too. Ah, uh, didn't you die because of a rabbit? Death. They were waiting for Park Yungte. During the school holidays, he went abroad to volunteer and recently came back, so they were having a gathering. He was the only member who had spent the holiday elsewhere. That's right. Didn't both of you eat delicious food without me? Ban Taehoon asked. Ah. Uh, it was really good. I never knew kimchi and soybean paste could taste so good. Isn't it petty to go without me? Heh. You should protest to use appa. What is with the appa? Now he is an appa. Then Yun Bora asked you. By the way, is he okay? Yes. It was nothing. I'm glad. At this moment, Ban Taehoon interrupted. Hey, Yung Yu. You should be careful of Yun Bora. This girl is now aiming for your brother. Look at her eyes. Why? Are you jealous? Yuek. Don't make that sound. I will restrain you. Then Park Yungte appeared in the distance. He had gone to Africa so his face was tanned. He looked around and smiled after finding them, it has been a while. Oh Yungte. Did you come? He sat down next to Ban Taehoon. The two of them bumped fists, waved their fingers and bumped shoulders. Yo man. What's up man? Long time no see. Guten Tag. German for good day. Yun Bora shook her head as she watched them babbling. They hugged lightly and ended the greeting. Did your service go well? Yes. It was fun. He had gone to Africa to build houses for the poor. In other words, he was doing hard labor. His body was tanned and muscular, as if he was an athlete. Park Yungte talked about the things that happened, while the rest nodded with admiration. You really suffered. Good work. Park Yungte smiled brightly at Eu's compliment. Should we have a drink today? Hey, did you drink there? Or did you eat anything like African snake? I couldn't drink there. They got up and left the cafe. Heaven and Earth. The mounted knights moved first and broke through enemy lines. The enemy's formations were destroyed. The Heaven and Earth members followed behind. Two infantry battalions collided. The clan members shouted their slogan as they wielded their weapons. The rebels had fallen into chaos from the cavalry penetration and couldn't block their attacks. Like a dam breaking, the clan members moved through the formation. Their vision became blurry but they moved forward tenaciously, staring at the Empire's flag that was flapping far away. 
This is it. This is the power of the cavalry. The rebels tried to stop them with spears and barricades, but the imperial knights weren't easy. The heaven and earth members are also great. They sweep through the enemies like fallen leaves. Wasn't it not long ago that users didn't dare fight NPCs? That has changed. It isn't an exaggeration to say that it changed after the emergence of the Heaven and Earth clan. The scene filled up the broadcast screen. The rebels' formation was destroyed by the cavalry running around. Every time the knights charged, the rebels were trampled on. Then the infantry and Heaven and Earth members cleaned up the rest of the enemies. The cavalry overran the enemies and trampled on those still on the ground. There was the occasional bombardment from magicians. The rebels screamed as they were burned. The flames spread and bodies piled up. Amazing. The whole world is watching the battle of the Heaven and Earth clan. The number of viewers in the Undergames Overseas channel is enormous. All of this was being conducted by Rommel. Rommel waved his hand. He took control of the battlefield, and everything was under his vision. War Maestro Rommel. He can see the entire battlefield. The commentators were proud. Yun Borat drank her beer and asked, Is this a war? Eu watched the broadcast from next to Yun Bora and replied, Yes. Aren't the opponents just residents, not soldiers? Really? I guess their clothing is really shabby. The rebels were pushed by the empire in terms of numbers and equipment. Their appearance looked like men who had been farming for all their lives. They were ed in turn by the well-trained imperial army. It is too cruel. What's wrong with that? They are NPCs. Still. Yun Bora opened a chat window. There was also wonder and praise there. Dial fresh what is this war? It really defies my expectations. Simabukuro honey jam. What are your expectations? Do you expect anyone to go against the heaven and earth clan? How absurd. Paper cup duo this is the level of the heaven and earth clan. Toothbrush and perfume shout General Rom. General Rom. I'm hungry sobbed the duo of General Rom and Kane's Leon. Dune multiplex isn't the empire just massacring people. Is this cool? Don't admire airs. White keyboard Dune multiplex I am a person who s in the game and I can verify how fun it is. Lucas Graham the commentators are exaggerating the opponents are too weak. Seven Eggs I haven't watched it but I have a lot of complaints if the game is like reality, won't PTSD occur. Storage mistake I agree with the one above me. Ah, uh, I can't look. Yun Bora turned away from the screen. Park Yung Tae and Ban Tae seats were empty. That boy doesn't smoke yet he still follows. This was a chicken and beer pub. Ban Taehoon went out for a quick smoke and the non-smoker, Park Yung Tae followed. They stood side by side at the entrance of the store. Cheers. Eu and Yoon Bora made a toast. Eu, isn't your appa playing Elder Lord as well? Yes. He had been working harder lately. Will he be watching this broadcast? Appa. Eu started thinking. It was a broadcast of a battlefield where many people died. Furthermore, it was just a one-sided massacre. Eu shook her head. Won't he really hate this? Crocta stood in the devastated Demeteran. There was nothing left. The imperial troops poured the corpses into a pit and set them on fire. Now only the seared bones remained as small traces. A dandator was silent behind Crocta. He knew that the emperor had ordered Crocta's death. That's why he hurried to find Crocta. If Crocta died, he would never know the identity of that light. But Rommel had attacked Espada. He knew Crocta well. A smart guy. Crocta had come running as soon as he heard. But Demeteran had already been ruined. It seems like it hasn't been a long time since they passed. Alex said. The Imperial Army was heading for Espada after devastating Demeteran. They would destroy everything in their way. Crocta found a piece of cloth that was torn and burnt on the ground. It was a flag. It was hard to see but the words there is no emperor in the south were written on it. The resistance army would have swung it. Let's go. Crocta opened his mouth. 
you're going. A dandator asked. I need to hurry before they do this again. The he's an orc, yet still praiseworthy members nodded. A dandator scratched his head. He didn't know what he should do. He had become closer to Crocta after spending a few days together, but he couldn't go against his kingdom. You can go, a dandator, Crocta told him. Is it okay? This isn't your job, which is understandable. A dandator sighed and said, I'm thankful for those words. But I will tell you one thing, Crocta said as he turned to him. A dandator flinched as he saw the blazing anger in Crocta's eyes. If we meet on the battlefield, I won't hesitate to you. Chapter, 164 Crocta rode his horse. The he's an orc, yet still praiseworthy members followed him. They saw a blazing fire in the distance. The imperial army had taken over a city. The battle had already ended. The only thing left behind was their traces. Espada was an area with a big cluster of cities where people gathered. This place had collapsed. There were numerous troops surrounding the city. Crocta. He was noticed quickly because he ran aggressively. A scout blew the whistle first. The knights, who had been waiting, reversed their formation. They reacted to the sound of the whistle almost immediately. The information that Crocta appeared was quickly transmitted to the rear. The troops moved like they were a single creature. At its heart was Rommel. He was able to see Rommel beyond the knights. He was a good-looking elf, but wore heavy armor that typically didn't suit elves. He waved his hand and the knights started the assault. They were the blue dragon lancers beside him. The white lion knights and blue dragon lancers were the pillars of the empire. The knights raised their lances and started charging towards Crocta and the Heezen orc, yet still praiseworthy members. Crocta pulled out his greatsword. Yar Yarius this the so-called lance charging? Gilgamesh muttered habitually. His voice sounded the same but it was shaking slightly. Crocta shouted, everyone be prepared. The blue dragon troops were rushing towards them like a locomotive. Crocta raised the pressure around his body. The lances were coming like waves. Even if he blocked the knights, there was an army behind them. It was absurd when he thought about it. Only five people. Five people were facing an army. Stay alive. Crocta muttered. He didn't worry about such things. He only thought about defeating the enemies that came towards him. Face an opponent, smash them down and repeat over and over again. It would be a line that allowed him to reach Rommel. Bolter. His battle cry rang out. At that moment, all of the soldiers here felt a chill at Crocta's presence. He really had come. Come. The attack from the Blue Dragon Lancers was imminent. Just before the collision, Crocta jumped from his horse. The horse, that lost its master, collided with a spear and fell down. Crocta was on the ground and wielded his great sword. He faced multiple knights at the same time. Crocta landed in an empty gap and wielded his great sword at the lances and horses. He aimed at the horse. As the horse collapsed, the knight rolled over and was crushed by the steel armor. Like water hitting a stone, the knight split apart around Crocta. Blood splattered from the horses caught by Crocta. Come on, dance with me. Open the bloody banquet, my blades. Kukuk. Gilgamesh's voice was heard. Crocta's angle meant he couldn't see the he's an orc, yet still praiseworthy members. The knights focused on Crocta. Except for a group that dealt with the he's an orc, yet still praiseworthy members, the rest turned around and came back to Crocta. The assault began again. They held up their lances and shouted. For his majesty. 4. Crocta raised his greatsword. The enemies were nearing. The lance's charge was raised by the horse's acceleration and flew with tremendous power. It would pierce a body in one strike. Hot. The lances flew towards him. Crocta responded promptly and managed to survive. If he couldn't on the battlefield then he would die. Crocta dodged their attacks and broke the horse's legs. The horses with their legs broken fell to the ground and crushed the knights. This guy. A knight appeared in unusual clothing. Orc. Let me fight with you. 
It was a middle-aged man. It was the leader of the Blue Dragon Lancers. The knights opened the path for him once he appeared. His horse started running. The horse was different from the common ones. The size was much bigger and the skin underneath the armor was red. The ground shook every time the horse moved. Fast and furious. The leader became one with the horse as he charged towards Crocta. Die! Empire's enemy! Crocta could feel him falling into the realm of the pinnacle as he rode. The charge of the horse and the pinnacle, this was the leader of a troop of knights. He leaned into the space and rushed towards Crocta. Crocta also entered the world of the pinnacle. However, the compressed force of the lance flying towards Crocta was so strong that it seemed hard for him to endure. Crocta gulped. He tried to avoid it but the horse's charging speed exceeded their expectations. Indeed, this was the Empire. A Dandator wasn't the only powerhouse. Crocta surpassed the realm of the pinnacle. The landscape changed again. The hero realm. The transcendent power of causality was demonstrated. Crocta's great sword and the knight's lance crossed. Both bodies fell at the same time. Ugh. Cough. He fell from the horse while Crocta flew backward. Crocta hurriedly got up. It wasn't one sided, but the lance had hit him. That a dandator, there is another person beyond the pinnacle. It was different from his words. This knight had touched the edges of the hero realm, despite not recognizing it yet. Cough. Cough. The knight's side was split by the great sword and he coughed blood onto the ground. Behind Crocta, the horse that lost its master was running amok. The knights gathered around their leader. He glared at Crocta as he was carried away. Crocta grinned. Who, who? He restored his breathing. But this wasn't the end. It was starting now. The infantry troops were advancing towards Crocta. The knights continued to fill up their numbers. These boring guys. The knights set up their formation again and started running towards Crocta. Crocta placed the great sword on his shoulder. Of course, what else can I expect from the name Blue Dragon Lancers? The force was still sufficient. The moment they were going to assault from the front. The knights moved to the side and passed Crocta. Crocta looked around. There were members of his an orc, yet still praiseworthy who followed him. They were fighting the knights and not paying attention to this place. Scatter! Crocta shouted. They finally noticed the knights. However, the knight's assault was too fierce. The members were split into two groups. They avoided the attacks, but one member was eventually pieced by a lance. Kiak. The lance pierced the user's abdomen and he hung in the air. It was like the knight who ed the member was boasting of the spoils. The body hung high in the sky. Blood flowed down the lance. The sound of horseshoe subsided. Cough he coughed up blood and soon turned into white particles. Hmm. The knight muttered as he looked at the body. What? Someone who is cursed by the stars. At that moment, a blade penetrated the knight's heart. A sword came out of nowhere and pierced the steel armor. The knight grabbed his chest and looked back. Gilgamesh was staring at him with many swords floating around him. The price of touching my companion at his ruin. Low life. Kook. The knight with the lance fell to the ground. Then the knights flew towards Gilgamesh. Some knights fell from their horses and attacked with swords. Their weapons became tangled together. Once the knights showed their strength, the fan club members were in crisis. Crocta tried to save them but other knights blocked it. This was the advantage of numbers. Coming here without any fear. You will regret it. Orc. The knights laughed. Crocta wielded his great sword instead of answering. The body of the knight who just spoke flew through the air. Crocta wildly attacked the knights. The panicked knights kept gathering. Every time Crocta swung his great sword, dozens of knights died. Blood and flesh were scattered. However, the enemies kept on coming. It was foolish to deal with so many enemies in an open space. Quack. Crocta jumped over a knight. He broke through the encirclement and ran towards the other he's an orc, 
yet still praiseworthy members. The three remaining members had united and were desperately resisting. Where are you running Tokiok? A knight was hit by his great sword. Then Krokta stole his horse. The horse resisted as a stranger boarded, but Krokta calmed it down by stroking its neck. Krokta rode his horse. He roared again as he headed towards the Heezen Orc, yet still praiseworthy members. His roar rattled the eardrums of the knights. As they covered their ears, Krokta ran and called out to a member. Keep moving. A flat ground is a disadvantage. Gilgamesh nodded. He also stole a horse with Alex. They started running out of the knight's encirclement. The knights noticed and pursued fiercely. The enemy is too fast. Alex shouted. They were knights using lances. Their competency when handling a horse was naturally different. The knights clung tightly to them. Then the sword circling Gilgamesh turned and headed towards the knights. The knights were dumbfounded at the sudden interruption. Crocta raised his thumb. Gilgamesh grinned. However, they were still at the center of the crisis. Crocta changed the direction of his horse. He avoided the imperial forces and moved inside a gap. It was towards the inside of the city, where the sound of screaming and fighting could still be heard. He entered to see a gory sight. The ones who occupied the interior were mainly users, the Heaven and Earth clan members and some knights. They didn't want to incorporate the residents into the empire like before. They were slain immediately. How horrible. There was the sound of knights on horseback. Crocta directed his horse and entered the city completely. Crocta appeared. The Heaven and Earth clan responded promptly, as if the information was already transmitted. They didn't rush towards Crocta but maintained their distance on the streets. The clan members gradually gathered. There was a lot of them. Crocta's eyes quickly glanced around the surroundings. Most of the soldiers and residents had been ed, with only the elderly left. They were the first to lose their lives. There was the sound of fighting in the center, as if people were still resisting, but it didn't seem like it would last long. Wouldn't it be better to retreat? Alex asked. Crocta shook his head. At the same time, his momentum changed. He once again entered the hero realm. His senses entered a different perspective. The moment that Crocta confirmed the presence of troops around him, new infantrymen entered any gaps, directed by Rommel. At the same time, he realized the shaking of the members who entered with him. You can leave it is too dangerous. Crocta told them. They shook their heads. It isn't dangerous. We received the curse of the stars. We won't die. But Crocta. You can experience the concrete OD. Most of the people around them were the Heaven and Earth members. The clan members already identified that the enemies were users. Not Hat, no, it isn't. Alex's voice trailed off. Crocta had fought the thawing Balhi clan. He already knew about users. It was as he said. This was a battle involving the Heaven and Earth clan. If there were any users who opposed them, the Heaven and Earth would thoroughly trample them using the concrete OD to prevent another attack. The eyes of the Heaven and Earth seemed to be scanning the members' bodies. So be it, Alex muttered with a grin. Crocta responded in a grave tone, I can't protect you anymore. It's okay. I am determined. Their companionship would probably end here. No matter how this battle progressed, they would probably die or experience the concrete OD here. That battle was overwhelmingly unfavorable. It would actually be fortunate if they died. Fight with honor. The he's an orc, yet still praiseworthy members laughed. They came here because they admired Crocta. That choice wasn't wrong. Crocta was just like they saw in the videos. No, he was more than that. He wasn't a hero, but had a very human nature, so his past actions seemed even greater. They couldn't help laughing and crying in Crocta's presence. You must absolutely never die. It was okay for the users to die. Even if they received the concrete OD, they could still live in reality. But Crocta, this great warrior, wouldn't be able to revive if he died. He was an NPC. Everything would be over if he died. However, 
Krakta's eyes were unshaken. This was why they praised and honored Krakta. The era of heroes was over. But they met a true hero in Elder Lord. Krakta told them, don't regret it. They laughed. Chapter, 165 Inside the city, there were still those who were resisting. As long as we buy some time, reinforcements will come, said Gerd, the militia leader. However, he wasn't convinced as he spoke. The enemies hadn't used their knights yet. The horsemen were circling the city to prevent any fugitives, with only those cursed by the stars entering the city. They were having fun as they slaughtered the residents of the city. Can't we build up a lot of experience here? Yes, that is why we came here. I keep on receiving rewards for the achievements. Wow, this is rare grade. I barely get any rare grade rewards. Why can't I receive the flying heaven sword style? They chattered and laughed together. Gerd bit his lip. The ones cursed by the stars were hateful. They were all around him. Endure. We can endure. Of course, nobody believed those words. They were waiting for reinforcements but who would come? The Empire had a great army. It was a war to win if they just hid behind walls. Entering the city to save them was nothing more than a waste of troops. He repeated to himself, endure. But there was a disturbance in the distance. Gerd became tense. The knights might ventured. At that moment, he could see sewing flying over the building in front of him. It was the appearance of an enemy who had his body split apart. As soon as the red lump fell, it became white particles. W what? It continued. Behind the outer walls of the building, a fountain of blood appeared in the air. There was the sound of screams and bones breaking as the bodies continued to burst. The blood, flesh and internal organs were stuck to the ground. What the hell was going on at the smithy? Kayak. Stop. Monster. Once again, dozens of people flew through the air at the same time and fell down in the dust. Gerd and his companions flinched as they held their weapons. The fallen people twitched and died. Their bodies turned white. Who? Step, step. Footsteps could be heard. Gerd gulped and looked at the corner of the building. There was the shadow of a man of great size. The slaughterer's image was revealed. The first thing that stood out was the gigantic greatsword that reflected the sunlight. It was so big that he couldn't face it properly. An orc. He was burly and the battle scars were mixed together with the tattoos. Blood and flesh dripped down from his body. The vicious eyes turned to Gerd. Gerd shook. He knew who the orc was. The orc warrior widely known throughout the continent. The one who ed the crazy chieftain in the north. All gods had whispered his name. Northern Conqueror Krakta. He heard rumors that Krakta was going against the Empire. But. God. Showing up on this battlefield was reckless. Gerd never imagined his appearance. He knew the orc species, but he always thought of heroes as people with shining smiles and a dignified appearance. They were knights who wore armor. But he was mistaken. The orc called Krakta wasn't a knight. He was a monster. Knights were those who wore shining armor and rode on a white horse in fairy tales. Krakta was a warrior who slaughtered his enemies with his greatsword, scattering the flesh and blood of those who got in his way. If he wasn't Ed on the battlefield, he would wipe out all enemies. The eyes were filled with ing intent, making Gerd unable to face them at all. But. Bolter. At Krakta's roar, the enemies didn't dare come closer and fell back. Gerd formed a fist. Despite the horrible appearance, hope sprouted in his heart. He had prayed for a long time. He prayed every day that he could continue to live as a free man, for the march of the imperial forces to slow down and to help them win this battle. He prayed for all the beautiful things in this world. However, no one answered. It wasn't the benevolent goddess or a knight on a white horse who responded. It was a brutal orc warrior covered in the enemy's blood. A or who beheaded the enemies directly. Krakta, he came for them. Gerd shouted, Krakta has come. Gather your strength. 
the front lines became messy at Krokta's appearance. The enemies rarely came close to Krokta, giving the residents and militia time to reorganize the line of defense. Krokta. The he's an orc, yet still praiseworthy members were also present. They were very tired. In particular, Gilgamesh was barely holding on to his sword and couldn't exert any further strength. Meet over there. Yes. There are still people remaining. Krokta approached Gerd's group. They were busy raising the defenses. They held spears carved out of wood and cautiously watched for enemies from behind the barricade. I am Krokta. I came to help. Gerd responded to Krokta. Thank you. I've heard a lot of rumors about you. More troops will be coming soon. Rommel was committed to the growth of the clan members. But that changed after Krokta's appearance. Soon the knights and regular soldiers would appear. Considering the gap between numbers and level, it was close to a hopeless battle. Wait for the reinforcements. Reinforcements Gerd was skeptical about the reinforcements. He shouted about reinforcements to raise morale, but he didn't think they would come. Believe in them. Krokta stated. It was an intense gaze. They will come. It was hope that made people hold on, even if it was feeble. As long as there was hope, the possibilities could be doubled. A miracle could happen as long as it wasn't zero percent. I understand. Gerd nodded. Krokta scanned the area. It is tense. They had just joined but there was no time for proper introductions. It was the last defense line and the children and elderly were behind it. All of them were now visible. Krokta raised his greatsword. It was obviously the worst situation. He wanted to protect them, but it was a dangerous situation. However, if there was nothing to protect, there was no reason to fight. It was an irony he always experienced. Krokta opened his mouth. I have been through many battles. The formation of the enemies was changing. They had now completely retreated. It meant that reinforcements for the enemies were coming soon. The sound of horseshoes neared. There have been many more dangerous fights. This is nothing. Kokokol. It was his own OD of cheering them on. Gerd and the militia members laughed slightly at Krokta's words. So let's try our best. I understand. New enemies appeared. Both the White Lion Knights and Blue Dragon Lancers appeared. The regular army followed behind them. The Heaven and Earth Clan were still here, surrounding the area in several layers, in order to block any retreat. The number and quality of the other side were no match. Krokta cracked his knuckles. As he mentioned, he had experienced more dangerous battlefields. But it was the first time he had to defend people against so many enemies. At the very least, he fought with his friends who had the ability to resist the enemy. Even in the north, he had the dark elves who were good hunters and swordsmen. This place was different. They were at a disadvantage in terms of equipment and SS. Maybe everyone would die. Stay alive. He muttered. Gilgamesh spoke from behind him, is there a stage that finally suits me? The curtain call will be the screams of the enemies. Kukuk. His voice was dying but his personality was still constant. Krokta grinned. The enemies came to a stop. Knights, be prepared. The leader of the White Lion Knights in the rear cried out. It was the vice leader Betring, who had taken over for a dandator. It was an expression of intent to engage in close combat. They started walking on both feet. The militia members readied their arrows. However, none of them hit. They were avoided or blocked using swords and shields. It was truly the Empire's elite. For His Majesty. Betring shouted in an excited voice that didn't fit his age. Assault, White Lions. The knights started the assault. Krokta broke through the knights running at the forefront and shouted, Come at me, knight. Krokta's momentum pushed against the knights. You're better than expected, orc. It was Betrain who didn't back down from Krokta's threat. He met Krokta's great sword as the two swords hit each other. Now. Charge. As Betrain shouted, the knights plunged towards Krokta's left and right. Krokta tried to stop them, 
but Betrain's sword persistently pursued him. Crocta struck him in annoyance. Betrain continued to mark Crocta. He wasn't trying to Crocta, and didn't even intend for this to be a confrontation. He just stuck to Crocta so that Crocta couldn't go anywhere else. Crocta grit his teeth. An expert. This was annoying. Aak. The knights didn't hesitate. The residents died as the knight's swords pierced their hearts. It is shameful. Ho. Betring asked nervously as he attacked Crocta. A knight should be ashamed of this behavior. The ruined city. The dead or dying residents. The flag of the empire flying in the air. Shane Betring smiled bitterly. Old people like me don't worry about things like that. It was a familiar expression that he had seen in the north on Hammertree, a brave man who had been bent for many years of inertia while adrift in a world mixed with right and wrong. I understand, said Crocta before his figure disappeared. Then Crocta appeared right in front of Betring's nose with Ogre Slayer at his neck. An enormous pressure was aiming for his neck. He couldn't avoid or block it. Betring's head became blank. Kakang. Just before Ogre Slayer reached Betring, the sword was blocked. It was from the spear of a blue dragon member. Don't overdo it. Thank you for your help. Bluno. The two leaders of the Empire's knights stood in front of Crocta. They gulped. Even if they joined together, they couldn't beat Crocta. They could only buy some time. The orc in front of him was a monster. Come all at once. At the same time, Crocta's great sword aimed at both of them. Betring bounced back and rolled across the ground. Bluno avoided it then swung his spear. Crocta ducked and kicked Bluno's abdomen. Bluno collapsed. The great sword descended towards Betring. He blocked with his sword. The blade couldn't overcome the impact and was broken. Betring's face stiffened. Crocta raised his great sword again. Betring rolled across the ground. It was ugly behavior for a knight, but it allowed him to barely survive. Ah! Bluno attacked. It was a rapid stinging attack that made him one of the best knights. Crocta grabbed the spear. Crazy! Crocta started to break the spear. Bluno stumbled at the power placed on his spear. He gritted his teeth and tried to aim the spear again. Crocta struck his shin with a fist. Cough. Bluno flew back and crashed onto the ground. His shin was broken. He grabbed his leg and moaned. Betring looked at it and muttered. Truly a monster. His face was completely frightened. Crocta looked around. The knights were already slaughtering the residents. Crocta headed towards the knights, ignoring Betring and Bluno. However, it wasn't enough for him to block them alone. Countless people were dying. The Heaven and Earth members were pushing to the front like hyenas. Come again. Get those s. Cheeky s. Their goal was the he's an orc, yet still praiseworthy members. The garbage who follow the orc. Cookaqueek dogs are barking. What is he saying? In the middle of it, Crocta shook his head. The knights and residents, users and users, everything was mixed up and confusing. The debris of the destroyed buildings was scattered about. Now you see that the world is full of death. The system message seemed to be mocking him. Crocta jumped over a knight. Betring was chasing him from behind. Crocta wanted to go after the knight's ing the residents. Betring's blade cut his thigh. Crocta looked angrily at Betring, but he had already withdrawn. Meanwhile, residents were dying. Crocta gritted his teeth. The moment Betring retreated, weapons flew at Crocta from all sides. Crocta roared and swung his great sword. The knights flew back. Puk. Ugh. An arrow struck Crocta's shoulder. It was difficult to respond because there were so many people. Crocta used the power of a hero. It consumed a lot of stamina but it couldn't be helped. Crocta slaughtered the enemies with the power of causality. A fountain of blood. Nevertheless, the number of teammates was decreasing. Gerd. There was no answer. He had died a long time ago. The corpses were acculating. 
he couldn't save everyone. The consequences of death were overflowing in the city, and there was a limit to how much he could reverse. Suddenly, white particles were scattered. He looked back. The he's an orc, yet still praiseworthy members were dying. Alex's eyes met his as he turned into white particles. He nodded with a pale face. That was the last action. Their particles and those of the heaven and earth members, along with the dust, blurred his vision. Hell, this is a place that suits me. Come you, you dog-like s. Gilgamesh was the only one remaining and he had lost his concept. He could no longer manipulate the blades and wielded them directly. However, his weapons were quickly suppressed. Crocta tried to rescue him, but the knights kept blocking him. Several layers of infantry surrounded him. Damn it. Crocta raised his greatsword. He was about to use strength to break through the encirclement. I've caught this. Concrete OD. Tie him up. Rope. Kukukufkuk. Crocta ran in Gilgamesh's direction. A blade stuck in his back. Blood splattered but he ignored it and attacked those in front of him. He stepped on the enemies. Gilgamesh could be seen in the distance. Gilgamesh. Crocta broke through the enemies to try and save him, but he was blocked again. There was no end. He was surrounded by the enemy. There was even the bombardment from magicians. Fireballs flew at Crocta. Crocta ignored it all and threw his great sword. Ogre Slayer split apart Gilgamesh's body. Gilgamesh was split in half. With only his upper body left, he stared at Crocta. There was surprise in Gilgamesh's eyes before he laughed. Crocta chuckled slightly. Soon, Crocta's body was hit by a fireball. Cough. Crocta rolled on the ground. The flames burned his body. Crocta gritted his teeth. Blades flew in succession. Crocta raised his body and knocked them down with his fists. The enemies were ripped to pieces. Crocta straightened his waist and looked around. Kokokol. He laughed. Now Crocta was alone. The militia, the elderly people and the he's an orc, yet still praiseworthy members. They all died. He was left alone. He knew. He is alone. Everyone charge. From the beginning, he had a feeling it would be like this. Nevertheless, he had no choice but to struggle. Cock. 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 He looked up at the sky. Crows were crying out above his head. Oh yes or a disaster. It was said that crows were birds who lead the souls of the dead to the afterlife. How did the landscape look like in their eyes? He wondered if the souls of the dead were filling this land in white. Chapter, 166 Fire A barrage of arrows rained down from the sky as Crocta moved quickly to evade them. His body was worn out and a sigh emerged from his mouth. However, he couldn't stop. He raised the limits of his power and entered the realm of the pinnacle. But in a flash, he moved away from the pinnacle as the world's speed returned to normal. Damn it. His stamina was drained, as he had fought for too long. He couldn't reach the pinnacle anymore. Crocta tried to use the power again. His body gradually accelerated. His mind overwhelmed his body. The world slowed. Then his body twisted again. He turned around. An arrow was stuck in his calf. He didn't know when he had been hit. Betring and the knights were rushing towards Crocta. Crocta looked around. He didn't have a weapon. He used his bare hands to fight the fully armed knights. A collision between the two occurred. It couldn't be helped, even if it was Crocta. He avoided the weapons, but their bodies slammed into him and he flew back. Crocta fell to the ground. He rolled across angular rocks so his whole body was bloody. He felt lightheaded. How many achievement points will I get from ING him? Crocta raised his eyes. A heaven and earth member was approaching. Crocta spat out blood and tried to raise his body. Eh. The clan member suddenly stared at Crocta. This guy his forehead. Crocta could feel sewing hot flowing down from his forehead. Blood. There was a wound on his forehead. 
he felt his forehead. The red headband around it was half torn. Perhaps. Crocta stood up and swung his fist. The user's head exploded and he turned into white particles. Cook. He fell back down again from the recoil. Arrows pierced his calf and shoulder, the fire that burned his body and the wounds from the knight's weapons meant his body didn't function properly. As Crocta staggered, the knight's attacks flew towards him. Crocta collapsed and the kicking continued. If we capture this guy alive. His Majesty. Make an example of him. Their voices were heard above his head. Wait a minute. Sir Knights, please wait. The Heaven and Earth members were approaching. One of them reached out towards Crocta's forehead. Wait. Crocta blocked the hand and the kicks came flying again. Crocta fell down without any strength left. The moment they were about to completely rip off Crocta's headband. Piak. Blood poured onto Crocta's face. Crocta frowned and opened his eyes. The user's head was gone. Blood was flowing down from the neck. Kwang. The roar of a beast. It was somehow familiar. What's going on? What is that? The low frequency cry of a beast was heard. Crocta turned around. He fell to his knees. He gripped his weary head. The blood had blurred his vision. Gradually, his head became clear. He breathed deeply as some strength was restored to his broken body. He slowly got up. Crocta tore a dead soldier's clothing and used it to cover his ripped headband. Pant, pant. His hands were empty. A great sword was needed. Crocta looked around for Ogre Slayer. Suddenly, Ogre Slayer was pushed to his side. Thank you. Huge teeth were biting the blade of Ogre Slayer. Crocta unconsciously took it and looked at the one who gave it to him. The teeth were sharp enough to chew on an ogre's skin. The eyes of a fierce beast. The body covered in stripes was somehow familiar. Simba. Kwong. The first mission given by Lennox was the mutant wolf hunt. This was clearly the grown-up tiger Simba, who had been unable to fight the mutant wolf and his pack. Simba shook his head like he was pleased to see Crocta. Why are you here? Crocta raised his head. There was another familiar face. You. You have become stronger, Grung. The orc he met at Lennox's funeral, Mountain Smasher Kumarak who possessed a tremendous strength. There is no time. We have to get out. Grung. Kumarak grabbed Crocta and dragged him. The knights tried to stop them, but couldn't approach due to Simba. They started running. What are you doing? Follow. Betring shouted. The knights got on their horses again. Kwong. At that moment, Simba roared. The horses freaked out at Simba's roar. The knights struggled with the horses. You. Betring ran directly. The soldiers followed. Simba turned and ran towards Krokta and Kumarak. Surround them. The city was fully occupied. Soldiers appeared from many directions to block their path. Simba ran towards them, but the enemies resisted. Kumarak raised his axe. Then colorful flashes of light flew at the enemies. Run. Quickly dot. It was Tio. He was riding on a bone wyvern with Aner. A small number of people had come to save Crocta. Due to Tio's shooting, the enemies fell and Crocta and Kamark escaped the encirclement. The various minor enemies were dealt with by Simba. Every time the huge paws hit an enemy, the body was ripped to pieces. There is no time dot. Run away quickly. Tio shouted from above them. The condition of the bones isn't good dot. Run. The bone wyvern they were controlling now wasn't like Burrow in the north. It was small and couldn't carry many people. Eat. Tio changed general to a more advanced Vulcan mode and furiously fired. The knights used their swords and shields to block it. Some bullets bounced off the armor. Persistent dot. The soldiers kept on increasing. Rommel showed up in the rear. Under his command, the soldiers forgot their fear and pursued Krokta and Kumarak. After calming their horses, the knights attempted an encirclement. 
At this rate. Kumarak tightened his grip on his axe. Maybe they should fight. He glanced at Krokta. Kumarak read the answer in Krokta's eyes and nodded. Kumarak laughed. The previously immature orc was now a warrior shaking the continent. He fought like a warrior. They stopped at the same time. Krokta held Ogre Slayer. Kumarak waved his battle axe. Expressions that indicated they would fight. Pressure spread out from Krokta and Kumarak. The troops chasing them flinched. They were chasing but once their target stopped, they couldn't attack. In addition, the gnome was pointing a strange weapon at them from above. As they were stunned, Rommel came forward. Despite this turmoil, he was able to maintain a sober expression. He scanned Krokta and Kumarak. Then he looked at Tio and Aner on the wyvern. It looked as though he was searching all of them. Then he opened his mouth. Everybody. The soldiers raised their weapons. His order was conveyed, despite him not saying anything else. The atmosphere reversed. Their morale changed whenever Rommel was on the front lines. After Krokta and Kumarak's atmosphere changed, the soldiers lowered their posture and stared with resolute eyes. The air felt like it was about to explode. The fight was about to start again. All of a sudden, screams were heard from the soldiers in the rear. Rommel looked around. What? He shook his reins from confusion. The militia members were approaching them. They were all dead. Just corpses. Necromancer. They walked with their broken bodies. The bizarre sight terrified the soldiers. It was an instinctive fear towards death. It wasn't just the North that had a taboo against dealing with death. A keek noise was heard. Rommel looked back at Krokta. The flying wyvern landed on the ground. It couldn't maintain its body anymore. The gnome and dark elf jumped down while concentrating. A necromancer. Krokta, Kumarak. Two monsters. There was the gnome with the good artifact and the necromancer. Grung. A huge tiger that was staring at them. Rommel laughed. Krokta. Rommel had wondered about the orc who had an unfortunate relationship with Keynes. This battle was already beyond his expectations. It was the first time the battle hadn't flowed according to his will since he received the War Maestro class. His predictions and plans had fallen through. Thus, he declared. Withdraw. There was no need to fight anymore. Anyway, they would meet again. The Empire's army followed him in an orderly manner. It was a systematic movement that seemed impossible for the soldiers who were tired from the battle. Rommel once again glanced at Krokta. Krokta's eyes were clearly visible. Then Rommel turned his horse around. He left in a leisurely manner. Krokta sighed at the sight. Krokta, you would be dead if it wasn't for us. Kahahat. Tio laughed cheerfully as he spoke to Krokta. Krokta grinned. This was after the battle. Thanks to you. Tio hit Krokta's ass. Then he panicked as blood emerged. Krokta. You are an okay dot. There is a wound on your rear. His recovery was better than a troll's, but there were many wounds on his large body. Tio hit his back. Krokta groaned. This place. Many injuries dot. You're not okay. Tack tack. It hurts. You want die dot. Tio laughed again. As he walked beside his party, Krokta looked up at the sky. The crows hadn't left yet and were circling above him. They arrived at Catalu, the center of Espada. Espada was originally a place with a strong local color, and it didn't appreciate any interference from the kingdom. They paid taxes but rejected being ruled. Their pride was strong and they wouldn't acknowledge the empire. This is Catalu dot. Krokta frowned at the distant view of Catalu. HRMM. Tio scratched his head at Krokta's expression. They all felt it. Catalu was too open. Catalu had no outer walls. It might be easy to open, but it made Catalu vulnerable to invasions. Right now, they were setting up barricades and obstacles in preparation for a siege. However, it was a poor place to fight. 
this would be an easy defeat for the elite knights of the empire. Let's go inside and see. Dot. Don't look like that. Crocta is a wounded person, so you can't get stressed. Aner supported Crocta. Crocta nodded. Simba licked his cheek. Simba. It has been a while. You have grown bigger. He had earned the title one who respects the honor of tigers by building a friendship with Simba. It felt like he could feel Simba's pleasure. At that time, you were still young. Crocta thought Simba was big at the time, but a great bloodline ran through his veins. Even if Crocta wasn't there, Simba would have been able to destroy the mutant wolves after some time passed. This guy came to give sewing to you. Grung. Give me what? I will show you soon. He tapped the sack around Simba's neck. Crocta was confused. They arrived at Cataloo. The residents of Cataloo welcomed Crocta. Thank you Crocta. We are acquainted with your reputation. Tio and Aner were also very helpful to us. Catula's mayor and the leader of the resistance, Guardi shook hands with Crocta. The residents cheered for Crocta, who fought against the empire. It was at that moment. Chiang. His vision blurred. The world became black and white. Crocta looked around. His spirit escaped from his body. He was looking at his body. He watched himself shake hands with Guardi, with the cheering residents, Kumarak and his companions around him. His spirit kept rising. It was like he had been released. Crocta looked down on everything. He continued to rise upwards until everything became smaller. Now he was able to see all of Catalu. Then he felt sick with fear. Crocta. Hmm. Crocta regained his mind. Guardi was looking at him. Ah. What did he just see? Crocta touched his head. His mind was a mess of confusion. He didn't know what it was that he had just seen. Chapter 167 The commentators picked their words carefully. They realized it. Ha ha, Crocta is working hard he is resisting. There are also people in his fan club. Words were useless in the face of reality. This was a program which placed the Heaven and Earth clan as the heroes. However, the identity of the hero and the villains were becoming clearer to the public. It wasn't bad when the Heaven and Earth clan entered the city and massacred the people. In fact, it was an exciting victory. The strong resistance fell under Rommel's splendid commanding. Following Rommel's gestures, the conductors acted, and drums sounded through the battlefield. The troops then changed shape, as if they were one single unit. This was the greatness of the Heaven and Earth clan's war maestro. When Crocta appeared, the public's reaction was at the peak. It was a fight between a named NPC and users. The related media reported the news, and the ratings topped the record high for undergames. Crocta appeared with four allies. They were users whom nobody knew. In the end, they fought the Heaven and Earth clan. They persisted in their resistance. Crocta and his four allies broke through the Heaven and Earth clan and the Imperial army, entering the city. Then they joined the rebels and continued fighting fiercely. Anyone could see that it was an impossible battlefield. There was an overwhelming difference in numbers. However, Crocta was a warrior who didn't know how to give up. Every time he roared and swung his great sword, the expressions of the viewers changed. Crocta, how terrible. Those who are with him are the he's an orc, yet still praiseworthy fan club members are rebels. They are all enthusiastic users. The members of the Heaven and Earth clan, and the he's an orc, yet still praiseworthy fan club, they are playing in the game in their own ways. Crocta is fighting well. The Heaven and Earth clan members retreated, and the knights rushed forward. There was an overwhelming difference in numbers, and Crocta's giant mass was quickly covered in a wave of knights. Crocta was at the front, but the army passed him and headed for the rebels. As Crocta struggled to save them, he kept being obstructed. Still, he wielded his great sword. He fought against those ing the weak. Seeing those who ed and those who saved. The hearts of the viewers became heavy at the scene. Even the commentators fell silent. For a while, there were only the sounds of the battlefield and Crocta's roaring. 
the camera angle was focused on Crocta. The eyes of the world were also focused on Crocta. The stage of the Heaven and Earth clan was now the indomitable struggle of the Orc warrior. The Orc and Knights confronted each other. It is shameful. Crocta opened his mouth to say. The camera angle sank down, and the screen was now looking at the confrontation between Crocta and a knight. They looked like giants. The Empire's flag flew above their heads. The blazing sun which symbolized the Empire. The ruined city. Crocta's voice was clear, despite the noise of the battlefield. In the background, the blade of a soldier was piercing another resident. The last moments of the victim were caught on screen. Crocta spoke again, a knight should be ashamed of this behavior. The knight smiled bitterly, shame old people like me don't worry about things like that. However, his face did seem to carry an expression of shame. At that moment, everyone watching realized it. The reality of this fight. It wasn't a story made up by the game channel, the Heaven and Earth clan, and the commentators. This was the scene of NPCs who actually lived in the world of Elder Lord. Crocta explained why he entered the impossible battlefield. Then the struggle continued. Crocta overwhelmed the two knight leaders. However, this wasn't a fight to but to protect. Then he turned to save the resistance. He desperately wielded his great sword at those ing the residents. The battle leaned to one side as Crocta got an arrow stuck in his shoulder. The he's an orc, yet still praiseworthy members became white particles. Gerd. Crocta shouted the name of the dead. He was besieged again. The arrows, spears, swords, and fireballs were aimed at Crocta. He gritted his teeth and looked around. It was a crisis. Suddenly, someone was captured. I've caught this. Concrete OD. Tie him up. Rope. The Heaven and Earth members tried to use the concrete OD on a he's an orc, yet still praiseworthy member. It was an act which would never be considered honorable when revealed to the world. The silent commentators quickly opened their mouths. Ha ha, that the Heaven and Earth clan are decisive they are such a clan, yes. It is like this during a war. Maybe he will be released when the quest ends. Crocta reacted immediately. He ran towards the fan club member. A blade was stuck in his back, attacks flew from every direction, and fireballs were rushing towards him. However, nothing stopped him. Bolter. Crocta ignored it all and threw his greatsword. No. T this. The remaining member was mutilated by the greatsword. Crocta ed his companion before the concrete OD could be used. The last member of he's an orc, yet still praiseworthy turned into white particles. Ah. Crocta was hit by the fireballs. However, he got up and knocked down the enemies with his bare hands while gasping for air. The Imperial Army and Crocta stared at each other. The battlefield suddenly became quiet. Everyone watching the screen realized it. All of the others had died. Now, Crocta was alone. Kokokol. Crocta chuckled in a low voice. He raised his head. He straightened his back. He stared at the sky. In a world which was real to him, the warrior remained alone. What type of sky was he seeing? In a state where time seemed to have stopped, the viewers also stared at the sky in the screen. Crocta eventually returned alive. Another group had appeared to save him, and the Heaven and Earth clan stopped. It was fortunate for everyone. The viewers were relieved that Crocta's adventure wasn't over, while the broadcasters were delighted by the ratings. The Heaven and Earth clan had a chance to reform their image. In the meantime, a user raised Suyin in the Elder Lord community. Author Evening Games. Title must read Crocta might be a user. TXT. I am an Elder Lord pro who has been watching Crocta. I think that Crocta is a user. This is based on three reasons. Not long ago, sowing strange occurred during the battle where Crocta was in danger. Elder Lord's time zone is different from reality, making it hard when broadcasting. In other words, the videos shown are on fast forward. Under games cut out any unnecessary parts in order to make it in real time as much as possible. 
The reason why Undergames broadcast is much faster than the private broadcast of BJ Heaven and Earth is due to editing. I don't know about the people who only watched Undergames broadcast, but in the BJ Heaven and Earth's video, a member of the clan reached out towards Crocta's forehead in the middle of the danger zone. I asked the clan executives whom I personally know about what that member was doing. At the time, the clan member saw a sewing white between the torn parts of the headband. He didn't see it properly and failed to confirm it before dying. In retrospect, have we ever seen Crocta's forehead? He first appeared in Laney's video wearing a black bandana, and later on he wore the headband. NPCs can wear headbands, but it is a little serious. Additionally, everyone saw Crocta ing the he's an orc, yet still praiseworthy member before the concrete OD could be used. NPCs know about this OD, but it is strange that he would throw his body to save the person. It is understandable if Crocta is a user. If people think Crocta is a NPC, he doesn't have to worry about the concrete OD, and if he dies, he can survive. So, his actions are natural if he has multiple lives. Even when Crocta was fighting the thawing Balhi clan, he used the concrete OD against them. At that time, I thought of him as just a scary NPC, but it is natural behavior if Crocta is a user. First, let's assume that Crocta really is a user. His level must be very high. His achievement score wouldn't be a joke. He must be a ranker. When looking at the rankings, Choi Hansung is no. 1 in Elder Lord. The Who is no. 2. Mystery, a private ranker who doesn't disclose any information. I think that Crocta is mystery. It is common sense that being a ranker can turn you into a star, so why would the second ranked person remain private? Mystery is now level 142. It is much higher than Choi Hansung's level. Nobody knows who the level 142 monster is, but this is explained if Crocta is mystery. In other words, Crocta's forehead. Concrete OD. The mystery of the identity of the second ranked user in Elder Lord. I think that Crocta is a user for these three reasons. Of course, this evidence isn't sufficient. In fact, Crocta's actions don't make sense if he is a user. I never would have believed it if his headband hadn't been torn this time. He will soon go against the Heaven and Earth clan, and I hope it is properly revealed then. This post attracted people's attention. The comments became a war between those who thought it made sense and those who didn't. Conspiracies out now, there are even conspiracy theories for a game. Nod nod bang there is no physical evidence, and everything is substantial. Post it the pieces moderately fit together the lady selling bread in my yard always wears a bandana, is she a user too? A user hiding her forehead. China Road I am curious about Mystery's identity. Level 142 doesn't the description fit Crocta. Although I don't know why he would pretend to be a NPC there are no other obvious users who could be Mystery. Food Fighter shut up. Whether Crocta is a user or not, he will be punished by the Heaven and Earth clan. Lime Tree Mystery can't be an orc I hate orcs. I wish that Rommel would take care of him. Orc user Lime Tree shut your mouth. Lime Tree Heaven and Earth Lover The Orc Lovers will be going for you next. Orc Shenyangi I want to have a drink with Crocta if he really is a user. Look at Kuno 9 Crocta is a user. He is my Hyung Nim. Lime Tree Look at Kuno 9 Tell your next lie. View more. It became a flash fire that attracted people's attention. Meanwhile, the Heaven and Earth clan and the army prepared to march. Their goal was Cataloo in the center of Espada. Crocta would also be there. Now, the Heaven and Earth clan and the Empire were moving towards their ultimate goal. Crocta held the old helmet. It was a black and solid steel helmet, with cuts and scratches all over due to its long history. Lennox's helmet. The faint specks on the surface would be the blood of the Lennox enemy's Ed. Maybe the blood from when Lennox died still remained on it somewhere. Crocta couldn't bear to wear it and placed it on his knee. Tashiquil's note was concise. You will need this, great warrior. He had sent Lennox's helmet to Crocta through Simba. On the way, Simba had met Kumarak, and Kumarak because interested in it due to Tashiquil. 
However, Crocta didn't know why Tashaquil said this would be necessary. Crocta closed his eyes. Crocta. Eat dot. Come out. It'll be there soon. Crocta replied. However, his body didn't move from where he was sitting on the bed. He touched Lennox's helmet inside. He walked to the window and looked down at Catalu. They were busy preparing for the future battle. Everyone was collecting and moving wood to build walls and barricades. Their expressions weren't dark. There was hope. They saw a chance after Crocta, Kumarak, Tio, and Aner joined them. They believed they might be able to win. However, Crocta felt despair as he looked at their hopeful faces. He saw the tragedy before him. They would die. In the near future. Damn it. There was a strange phenomenon when he shook hands with Guardi, the leader of this place. Since then, his vision had changed. Grey God's eyes continued to be activated. He couldn't adjust it to his will, so he had to face the grim reality of their deaths. This. It was pointing to everyone's death. He heard the sound of laughter. It came from a child. The child laughing on the street would soon die. The smiling mother following the child, she would also die. The deaths of the soldiers arming themselves were scheduled as well. Everybody he saw would die in one day. Crocta wanted to turn his eyes away, but he couldn't. He had to face the passing procession of those whose deaths were already determined. Crocta. Why aren't you coming? Tio called out to him from the bottom of the building. By his side were Aner and Kumarak. Simba yawned. Go first. I will come soon. Crocta replied. Crocta watched his companions walk away with burning eyes. They were no exception. All of Catalu was going to die. There were no exceptions. Buildings, livestock, animals, soldiers, youths, children, seniors, women and men, they all had the same death number above their heads. He couldn't face such a horrible sight. Crocta closed his eyes. He would rather see the darkness behind his eyelids. Everyone who resisted had died. The tragedy would repeat in this place. The power of the imperial forces was overwhelming, and there was no mercy. This time, they would devote themselves to destroying Catalu. Crocta just wanted to turn away from it. If he closed his eyes, he didn't need to see any more deaths. How could he watch the cold deaths of those he valued through the numbers on top of their heads? He would rather turn away. Then Crocta suddenly felt the rough texture of the helmet under his fingertips. Lennox. This was what it meant. Lennox had taught him the laws of a warrior. As Crocta was about to fall into despair, Lennox's helmet returned him to reality. Tashiquil might have seen all of this. Crocta couldn't sit down like this. Somehow, he had to stand up. He wasn't just an orc. He was a fighter, a warrior. And a warrior didn't give in. Indomitable will. That was always the answer. Crocta opened his eyes. Suddenly, sowing white scattered. White ash fell all around him. It wasn't the room he had just been in. This was a white world covered in ash, where the stars were blurred. It was her. I missed you. The Grey God laughed brightly. Chapter 168 He looked down at his hands, human hands. Crocta had returned to being Ian. Ian raised his head. The space looked like it did before. The white ash which covered the world, the dark blue sky, and the white dwarfs floating in the sky. And her. What is happening? Ian asked. It was a weary voice. Why have you appeared again? That looks like a bad expression. Would you prefer this? Ian looked at her. All of these things were due to her. She had created Elder Lord and caused the massacre of countless people without feeling guilty. Now, even his companions would die. The Grey God's power, which he had received, revealed such disturbing deaths that he couldn't even open his eyes. She grinned. You are always eager, Crocta. Hurry up and stop the war. Why should I? This is your world. That's right. She waved her hand. 
Then the dark night sky and dim stars disappeared, revealing the landscape of the continent. Catalu appeared. The citizens were ready to fight, and everyone was busy. Then the view moved. The imperial army had reached the plains. Troops had been recruited, and the emperor sent additional knights. It was a huge army. Once they marched over, Catalu would disappear from this world. Just like the deaths he saw. Do you like the grey god's eyes? It is awful. The field of view moved to the sky. Once again, it was the sky over Catalu. The grey god's eyes view overlapped over the scenery of Catalu, and Ian jumped. The mark of death appeared again on all life in Catalu. There was nothing left. The enemies would advance tomorrow, and they would all die. Without knowing their fate, the citizens were desperately preparing for battle. Awful. She grabbed some ash from the ground and threw it into the air. I hope that they all die in this war because it is so awful. Ian closed his eyes. In the end, she wished for catalyst destruction. She, the Grey God, was still playing her game. What were her intentions, and what was her final goal? He couldn't figure it out. I don't know what your intentions are, but I can't tolerate the ing of those I can save. Hoo-hoo, really? She laughed. The landscape of the continent was erased and the black night and ashy world was brought back. There were dimly lit stars, and the wind scattered the white ash. The grey god's appearance changed slowly. The little girl transformed into an adult. After becoming an adult, her hair looked brilliant, like the sky at dawn. Then she opened her mouth. Child. She spoke to Ian in the voice of a god. A child who is afraid to see numerous deaths. The world changed. Everything was erased. There was no ash or the sky. It was just darkness. The two of them faced each other. She was the only thing which shone dimly in this pitch black darkness. Look. In front of Ian, the appearance of Catalu rose up again. It was the landscape of Catalu which had seen while shaking hands with Guardi. Everyone's deaths were reflected in his eyes. The whole city was covered in death. No one would survive. The countdown of their lives decreased and gradually rushed towards the tragedy. At that moment, he could see their deaths with a greater force. When he looked at laughing children, he saw their dead bodies. A praying soldier would end up beheaded. Instead of the scent of flowers, the scent of rotten flesh and internal organs flowed through the city. He saw burning ruins instead of a beautiful temple, and a dead look overlay smiling expressions. The lively city was ruined. He witnessed the end of everything in sight. Nausea rose up inside him. This is what I see. Ian wanted to close his eyes, but he couldn't. Catalyst tragedy poured onto him. It was an irreversible inevitability. They would die. Everyone would die. Inevitable death was surrounding them. He couldn't stop it with his strength. I always see death. Life is a process of convergence towards death. So, I want to save everyone. Ian gritted his teeth. This sounded somewhat plausible. As nobody could be saved, it was better to attach a legitimate reason to their deaths. Run away. Crocta looked at her. I care about you. Your job is done. Hurry and escape. If you run away, you will be safe. Your death doesn't belong to this place. It was a soft voice. She came up to Crocta and whispered in his ears. The sweet words teased at his mind. There is no need to always take the hard path. I don't blame you for sometimes being comfortable. Yes. Ian closed his eyes. He had always walked the hard path. For a long time, he had never been comfortable. So the hardships felt more comfortable for him. It isn't the time for you to die. Ian wanted to ask her more. He prepared to open his mouth. However, when he opened his eyes again Crocta was alone in his room. She had returned him from her grey world. I wish it was just a dream. He moved his eyes. Crocta looked out the window. The bird's death was still far away. The bird seemed free and easy. With their wings, a bird could go anywhere they wanted. 
There were no responsibilities they just followed the wind. He leaned against his greatsword. His face was vaguely reflected in it. He was Krokta, the orc warrior with green skin. There was no death above his head. He couldn't see his own death. However, the Grey God said that his death wasn't in this place. I don't blame you for sometimes being comfortable. Thus far, he had been carrying the burden of others. Krokta didn't need to suffer through all the deaths here. He had tried hard enough. Nobody would blame him for throwing in the towel in the face of such a hopeless fight. Be comfortable. Like others, he could just think of Elder Lord as a game. He could leave Catula and travel Elder Lord. He was a ranker, so he could live comfortably with his sister in real life. He would laugh with Han Yuri and Yusuyan while operating the cafe, attend EU's graduation, occasionally drink coffee with Ji Hei An and exercise with Beck Hanho. Then he might meet a lover who would be with him for the rest of his life. It was a life of old age that he had never imagined. He imagined scenes he had never allowed himself to before. He was an old man with his children and grandchildren around him. Kwong. Krokta heard a sudden sound and looked at its source. Diguru. A black steel helmet was rolling. It had a rough appearance which cleared away all the sweet thoughts. Krokta grabbed it. There were cuts and scratches all over due to its long history. He swept a hand over the helmet's rough surface. The battle scars remained. The memories of a warrior were present in every scar engraved on the helmet. Krokta, you didn't come to eat. Dot. After finishing his meal, Tio opened Krokta's door and cried out. At that moment, the wind blew and messed up his hair. Eh. There was no one in the room. The window was open, and the wind was blowing. He didn't see a big orc warrior sitting on the bed, wiping his great sword. HRMM. Tio stepped into the room and looked around. There was no sign of him. The backpack that Krokta normally carried was still leaning on the side of the bed. What dot? While eating the meal, he had wondered where the orc was. Surely Krokta wouldn't skip a meal. It couldn't be. This, did he find a hidden restaurant dot? He must found an incredibly delicious restaurant and hidden it from them. It was obvious that Krokta had gone to eat alone. They'll have to question him. Dot. Tio sat down on the bed. It was fluffy. He bounced up and down before suddenly looking at the window. A crow was sitting on the windowsill and staring at him. Its eyes were irreverent. Tio stared at it. The gnome and bird started a staring contest. Then the crow made a ridiculing sound and flew away from the window. What a bad guy. Dot. Tio rose from his spot. Anyway, there was no crocta. The screen opened and flashed. The screens which decorated the streets and buildings all suddenly changed channels. People on the streets were puzzled because they didn't know what was going on. The channel name appeared in the upper right corner of the screen. It was the Undergames channel. At that moment, the passers-by had a hunch about the contents. The commentators and hosts' faces soon appeared, and their expressions were stiff. It looked like they were in a hurry as they looked at the camera and opened their mouths. Breaking news. Krokta moved away from Catalu. The outline of Catalu was now far away. His chest tightened with every step he took towards the horizon. His death didn't belong to this place. The Grey God's words were correct. There was a path. Every step he took, the deaths he saw changed color. One step, another step, the fate of the world and its people distorted. He looked up at the sky. The crows couldn't be seen. This is your choice. Krokta looked in the direction of the voice. The grey god appeared as a translucent figure. He wasn't surprised. Krokta smiled and continued moving. Fool. Krokta placed the great sword on his shoulder. One sword, that was enough. He started humming. His task was beyond this horizon. His mind felt clearer than ever before. Krokta was a warrior, the best technician in battle. It was better for a said worker to do the job. Said workers were never nervous. With a calm mind, they would deal with the most important moments like it was an everyday routine. Krokta's mind cleared, 
causing the landscape to become sharp and crisp. Once in a while, the vivid view before him would blur. His body spontaneously entered the realm of the pinnacle. He took one step to reach the hero realm and then returned to the pinnacle with the next step. He was in top shape. The Grey God spoke again, go back now. Krokta opened his mouth and asked, is today still the day I want die? She didn't answer. Krokta walked towards his own death. If someone whose fate of not dying could die, it was possible for those fated to die to survive. The Grey God's eyes probably showed his scheduled death. His steps caused a stir in the fate of the world. You are stupid. The Grey God said. Her expression was one of anger. Yes. You were always like this. She waved her hand. Adults appeared in Crocta's field of view, a scene of the distant past. On a day when rain was pouring down, he had met a man and a woman. They looked down at Ian and grabbed his hand. He had been told to call them mother and father from then on. You were always looking at other people's feelings and sacrificing yourself for them. His adoptive parents seemed to be infertile, but they eventually conceived a child. Ian felt blessed about the attitude of his adoptive parents towards him. So, he gave all the joyful things to the baby and carried everything hard. Always sacrificing yourself. For your little sister, for the parents who neglected you. For your little sister whose parents died when she was young, you plunged into the battlefield and shed blood. The endless sound of shelling, the voices of the heirs, the sad days when he had to or when he had to send away his companions. You, despite fighting for your sister, went out to rescue your companions and sought the most dangerous missions. That is who you are, young Ian. Your conception was the cause of your mother's despair. Your birth was unwanted, but you persistently survived the drugs that she took while pregnant. In the end, you were abandoned at birth, and now you keep struggling to keep others alive. The Grey God blocked Crocta's way. Where do your instincts come from? They come from the selfish gene. In a world where you can't die, aren't you just a hypocrite who refuses to adapt to nature? How else do you explain your instincts to not stop in the face of death? Crocta went past her. His goal was under the hill. She whispered from behind Crocta, run away now. Crocta shook his head. The Grey God's face distorted. Okay. Look. You are just a hypocrite. At that moment, sewing flashed. Crocta's eyes narrowed at the glare. The Grey God became more blurred, and an unknown power flowed from her. Then the system messages popped up. Disabling the assimilation rate limiter. Your assimilation rate has risen. Your assimilation rate. Crocta dismissed the string of message windows. Beyond it, the Grey God was staring at him. Your assimilation rate is 100%. Full synchronization status. Your safety cannot be guaranteed. Danger. I am warning you. Danger. Chapter, 169. Now Crocta. The Grey God said. You are here. Elder Lord is a different world from Earth, but with my strength, I have torn the boundary and brought you here. She pushed her face against his. If you die here, you will die forever. Your little sister and your precious people will never see the person called Young Ian again. They will cry by your cold body. The fallen god, the grey god the creator of Elder Lord, whose identity was unknown. She had linked Young Ian's soul to this world. It led to his assimilation rate reaching 100%. At this point, Crocta and Ian, their deaths meant the same thing. If he died here, there was no place for his soul to return. He would die forever. Crocta's expression became dark. It was unknown if the look in his eyes was anger or sorrow. The Grey God asked, Are you scared? No regrets. You can change your mind right now. Kokokol. He laughed at her words. The Grey God fell silent. Crocta was laughing, and his deep laugh rang out about him. Grey God. Even though you said it yourself, you don't know what it really means. Crocta looked up at the sky. The blue expanse of Elder Lord stretched infinitely in front of him. Crocta didn't need to be told. 
he could feel at the moment his assimilation reached 100%. His body might be in the capsule, but thanks to the power of the Grey God, his soul was here. The wind against his skin, the smell of dirt coming from the ground. The heart pumping blood in his body, the pulse of the earth under his feet. The bright sun. The Grey God staring at him. He could truly feel it. Ian was now Crocta. An orc warrior who had been born a warrior, someone who had been taught by Lennox and proved his honor in many fights he was Northern Conqueror Crocta, no one else. As you said, I am Crocta. He raised his great sword. I am Lennox's student and Hoyt's friend, a warrior recognized by Tashiquil. I inherited the warrior's laws from Orcrox, saved Arnon, defended Cheswood, and saved Quance. Along with Sha Khan, I ed the behemoth and opened the north, ed the northern great chieftain, became the northern great chieftain, and now am the orc warrior who will destroy the empire. He stopped moving. The imperial army was camped under the hill. They would burn Catalu before tomorrow ended. Crocta raised his great sword. The sunlight reflected off it, causing a brilliant light to shine. The imperial army soon discovered him. The Grey God didn't say anything more. Crocta burst out laughing. It was the perfect feeling. The feeling of unity with the world embraced him. His body entered the realm of the pinnacle. The world slowed down as he felt the wings of the bird flying in the sky, as well as the winds shaking it. He stood in the midst of the reversing fate of the world. He now truly belonged to this world. A splendid line penetrating the world entered his eyes. Crocta equipped the helmet held at his side. The red headband around his forehead loosened and blew away in the wind, as Lennox's helmet was placed on his head. His heart beat wildly. At this moment, the fate of this world changed completely. The convergence of all deaths was reversed. Instead, there was only one scheduled death. Crocta's actions, which the world had never envisioned, took away the deaths floating on top of all their heads. Now, he couldn't see death. Death had lost its way. Look. Crocta saw the line which had been present in his battle against the Dandator, a vivid streak of indescribable color. It was shaking finely, urging Crocta on. The world was pushing at his back. Crocta stepped forward. He took two steps. Now, the troops of the Imperial Army were fully aware of Crocta's presence. Crocta descended the gently slope of the hill and headed towards them. He could see the face of someone in the distance. It was the BJ, who followed the Heaven and Earth clan. Crocta shifted his gaze. He saw Rommel. Rommel's face was stiff with a seemingly stunned expression. By his side was the person called Keynes, who was the leader of Thawing Balhi and the one who had Lennox. The guy next to him was probably Grom, now called Lewin. Then there were the Blue Dragon Lancers and White Lion Knights, as well as a Dandator, whom Crocta had split ways with. The sight of the whole army entered Crocta's eyes. Then Crocta chuckled in a low voice. He faced the entire army. The presence of that overwhelming number crushed his body, but he felt good. All the deaths had been lost and were now circling around Crocta. Maybe today, those deaths would bite at Crocta. However, it didn't matter. With his head covered by the old steel helmet, he was able to confront the enemies with the eyes of an orc warrior facing death, just like Lennox had done. Crocta puffed up his chest proudly in the face of his fate. Bolter. The Imperial Army arranged their camp. Then Rommel walked out. Rommel's and Crocta's gazes met. They stared into each other's eyes, and that alone allowed them to read each other's will. Crocta hadn't come to negotiate with Rommel, so they would do everything in their power to each other. This was a close to impossible war. Rommel simply couldn't understand Crocta. Rommel suddenly asked, Do you think you can stop it alone? Crocta smiled instead of answering. Rommel spoke again, Why are you blocking us? He would never be able to understand. It was just like how people who never had faith couldn't understand the gods. Since Rommel had never rebelled against injustice, he took unrighteousness for granted. They were so different that they were looking at each other from different grounds. However, Crocta wanted to ask him, why are you attacking them? Rommel's face stiffened. He glanced back at the location of the people filming this. 
The world was watching them. That. He hesitated. It was an obvious question, but he couldn't answer. What was the reason for raising an army to multiply the pain and tragedy in this world? At this moment, Krokta felt that not just Earth but the entire world of Elder Lord was watching them. The vanished grey god, the many gods of Elder Lord, the sky and the earth were watching them. Rommel opened his mouth. They are our enemies. Why? If you block us any further, then you will also become our enemy. Didn't you come to this place to betray their faith, and slaughter the innocents, just to gain money and equipment? That excuse was so crude that Crocta laughed. Human who does not know honor. I am an elf. Are you perhaps a user? However, Crocta raised his gaze. He wasn't looking at Rommel anymore. Instead, he was looking at the flag of the Empire and the army beneath it. Ian was currently Crocta, an orc warrior who understood this world. To him, this was an inevitable battlefield and one that needed to take place. However, the gods of this world wouldn't understand it. Not just Rommel but the Emperor and those on Earth who were fixed to the screen none of them would understand. He was a one-man army. It was a reckless fight. Why was he standing here? Why did he want to fight ahead of the scheduled destruction? They wondered why he was on this impossible battlefield. Then he would let them know. So, listen carefully. I am an orc, a warrior. Crocta was part of the orcs who kept traces of the forgotten god he was a warrior who vowed to prove that honor was more important than death. Lennox wasn't dead. The orc that the troops of the Imperial Army were looking at right now was Crocta, Lennox, Golda, Kinger and all the warriors they thought they had ed. However, none of them were dead. A warrior doesn't forsake faith. Hoyt had taught Crocta this. In this finite world where life and death flickered, they hoped that their lives weren't in vain and believed that life was meaningful. The faith that connected people couldn't be dismissed, and a warrior couldn't tolerate the tragedies. A warrior doesn't persecute the weak. Warriors didn't those who surrendered. The logic of power was just an excuse for the unrighteous. Those who persecuted the weak were submissive to those who were stronger, and this wasn't allowed for warriors. A warrior doesn't attack unarmed people. A person who had an enemy after they abandoned their weapon didn't have the right to fight. A warrior fought to protect. It was because they understood the weight of death, despite being warriors of death. A warrior doesn't yield to injustice. Everyone died. Submitting to unrighteousness to avoid dying was like insulting the journey from life to death. The warriors had to prove that death wasn't the end. They believed that they weren't just dust in the universe, so they went forward filled with faith, not the fear of death. A warrior doesn't shame the gods. He came in as a voice or a pair of eyes. Someone who always watched over the warriors. He was the only who always touched them so that their will wouldn't be broken and so that the lonely wouldn't be pushed down. They had to be wary so that his hand didn't leave them. A warrior pays back any favors or vengeance. Even if people forgot, a warrior always had to remember. They didn't forget any grace given to them. There was a price for everything, and retribution would come back. The net of the heavens was wide and didn't miss a sinner, so a warrior should never turn away from any helpers or enemies. A warrior protects the powerless. The world was harsh and sometimes unfair. People often called the world a product of chance. However, a warrior didn't agree with that and never gave up. The universe wasn't a coincidence, this world wasn't dust, and time and space were clearly meaningful. In order to prove it, warriors had to raise their weapons and protect those unjustly persecuted. The world wasn't just about life and death. A warrior believed there was sowing precious in between. The struggle to prevent injustice made them more than dust. So, the warriors swore. I swear to the gods, I will abide by these laws as a warrior. Crocta raised Ogre Slayer. This sword had always fought together with him. He didn't need a brilliant sword or a great artifact. He wanted this friend who never changed, whose handle always fit in his grip. Crocta already had it. Prove your honor. Now, the defense was over. No one would question why he stood here, why he was bothering to fight, and why he chose to raise the sword instead of running away. 
Of course, they didn't really know. He told them everything, but there were those who would never understand. So, it was now time for his sword. Crocta looked at them. The Imperial Army couldn't believe the sight before them. They were facing one enemy, but the huge force coming from him caused them to feel frightened. Fear rose as they gripped their weapons. Crocta smiled. It didn't matter what the enemy was. Strong or weak, it didn't matter now. His concern was the great sword in his hand and his own body. The sense of unity with the world heightened his mood. He was now Crocta, an elder lord was his reality. The weapons were raised before him, while the lost deaths showed up for their prey. All possibilities pointed again towards his death, but Crocta shook his head. Lennox's death had changed everything. Now that Crocta stood fully in the world of Elder Lord, he was able to understand why the orcs had laughed in the face of death on that day. The wind blew past. Crocta could hear the whispers of the old warriors. Their question was always the same. Are you alive? He hadn't known back then. There was no way he could have known. However, he had an answer now. The corners of his mouth rose. Crocta smiled. He let out a chuckle. Then he raised his head, puffed out his chest, and lifted his blade. Crocta declared towards Rommel and towards the army surrounding him. He declared to the world. Come, human. Chapter, 170 There was a pause after Crocta's words. He declared that he would face the imperial army alone. Rommel and the troops were all silent. The plane was silent. I see. After a moment, Rommel raised his hand as he turned his horse. It was an attack command. He tried to move back to his position. Crocta had no intention of letting him go. Crocta jumped forward. The two knights escorting Rommel hurriedly raised their swords. Kang! One knight's blade was broken. The horse jumped with fright as Crocta headed towards it. The knight held the reins tightly. Rommel rushed away. Crocta missed the opportunity. He grinned as he cut down the horse and knight. The battle was about to begin. The large army stretched out in front of him. They didn't move. He would go if they didn't come. Crocta started to run. Ogre Slayer cried out. It appeared to be excited about the upcoming feast. It was the same for Crocta. The soldiers were still hesitant about fighting. They would die if they didn't concentrate. Crocta jumped. His great sword collided with the formation of the Imperial Army. The great sword moved. Crocta crashed into the troops. Kwong. The soldiers fell at once. He stepped on them and struck the next row. As Crocta pushed into the Imperial Army, it grew. He was gradually surrounded. But he didn't care. This was the excitement of melee combat. He split the enemy apart with his great sword and caused a fountain of blood. An individual versus an army. There was an overwhelming number of adversaries as enemies surrounded him on all sides. But it was the army that was being sliced away. It wasn't enough to surround him on all sides. Crocta's horizontal slash split apart all the enemies in front of him. It was an explosive advance. Only this much. The entire army shook at his roar. Crocta took a step forward. The Imperial Army moved out of the way. Crocta laughed and raised his great sword. The enemies burst forward. The blades on every side didn't reach him. Now that his assimilation rate reached 100%, Crocta's senses were sharper than ever. He fought everything on the battlefield. He could feel the excitement. The feeling of the flesh of his enemies being torn, as well as the terrified swords shaking. Those looking to me. Crocta smiled as he saw Rommel's confused face. He stabbed a soldier's neck and grabbed his spear. Ogre Slayer spun around once, securing space for Crocta. The enemies collapsed. In that gap, the spear rushed towards Rommel. It tore through the air. Two soldiers and one knight were pierced. Nevertheless, the spear headed towards Rommel's heart without losing strength. Kakang. Crocta turned around without seeing the results. Rommel would live or die. 
he concentrated on the soldiers rushing towards him. At that moment, he crossed swords with a somehow familiar face. It was a face he had seen previously. He cut the person's throat, causing blood to splatter all over. His vision was blocked and he struck both soldiers at once. Their upper and lower bodies mixed together. He kicked them away. Then his greatsword aimed at those who had fallen back from the horrible sight. Their bodies were split apart and their guts flowed down. Rommel. He shouted the names of his enemies. Canes. Their faces were pale. Lewin. He knocked down the enemies around him. The terrified soldiers retreated. There was a lot of space around Crocta. There were no enemies at all in this area. His greatsword lowered as he lost his opponents. He looked at the dead bodies at his feet. Limbs and flesh were scattered. Crocta laughed. The soldiers were terrified. The enemy's fear was his friend. The blood and flesh covered Crocta shouted. Bet ring. The people in the distance were surprised. The flag of the White Lion Knights was fluttering. Why didn't they come? The soldiers in front of them were in such a poor state, so why didn't the knights appear yet? Bluno. Then he called out the name of the Blue Dragon Lancer's leader. If they wouldn't come then he would directly go to them. Crocta wielded his great sword as he barged forward. The soldiers around him were crushed. They were cut, split apart and stabbed. These actions were repeated and he steadily opened the way. The troops filled up. Once again, they were cut, split apart and stabbed. A Dandator. A Dandator's face was visible near Rommel. Rommel's side was bleeding. It had hit. It was probably a Dandator who broke the spear. Crocta saw that a Dandator's pupils were enlarged. A Dandator's eyelids fluttered as sweat fell down and his lips trembled. Crocta laughed again. His senses even picked up the wildly beating heartbeat. He had said it. Don't meet him on the battlefield. Crocta shouted again. Come. The earth shook. Rommel gritted his teeth and gave the signal. The command shifted. Arrows poured out towards Crocta. Crocta grabbed a soldier and used him as a shield. His body was pierced. However, all the soldiers around him were sacrificed. The blood of the dead soldier flowed down towards Crocta. Bodies filled with arrows, riddled with holes like a beehive, were scattered around him. Their allies abandoned them. Kokokol. Only this much, Rommel. Crocta hurled the body. He smiled at Rommel. The soldiers witnessed the sacrifice of their companions and couldn't approach. Crocta raised his great sword and wandered forward. The soldiers moved back. The enemies retreated. The gap between him and the Imperial Army was getting closer. The crowd soon reached the limitations of this space. The soldiers, who were unable to retreat anymore, crouched and raised their weapons. After a moment, there was a new call sign from the commander. The flags of the knights started to move from their formation. It was a cavalry assault. The sound of horseshoes started to quicken. It was the soldiers who reacted first. They ran away so they wouldn't be hurt from the assault. The knights' flags were gradually getting closer. Crocta followed behind the soldiers. The formation became a mess. He entered deeply through the barriers. Once again, he stood in the middle of soldiers. The charging knights didn't stop. The commander didn't order a retreat. They literally trampled the soldiers to get at Crocta. There were terrible screams. Crocta lowered his posture and cut a horse's ankles. The horse fell down on the soldiers. The knight's charge was a disaster for their allies. I thought you were on the same side. Crocta laughed at them. They flocked to their own destruction. They were only fighting against one enemy. The troops assumed that the person would be wiped out by the army. The confused imperial troops used every means of attack without knowing how to stop Crocta. Arrows flew while the cavalry charged. However, it was the soldiers who were consumed, not Crocta. Rommel shouted. It was uncommon for Rommel to raise his voice. General soldiers get out of the way. The knights are committed to stopping Crocta. Knights charge. 
Crocta didn't just wait for them. He persistently pursued the fleeing soldiers. The soldiers, who couldn't choose between retreating or their own army, were overwhelmed and ed. It was like jumping into a flock of sheep. His dignified appearance rose far above them. The blades of the knights crept towards Crocta through the gap caused by infantry soldiers dying. After a battle of attrition, they finally reached Crocta. Die, monster! A knight boldly yelled. Crocta admired it and gave him Ogre Slayer as the prize. The greatsword tore his mouth and half his face. The upper jaw was separated from the lower jaw. Then Crocta kicked the body, stopping the knights behind him. He swung the great sword from left to right. It hit the bodies of the knights who were tangled up together. A fountain of blood. Duck. A head that soared into the sky fell and bounced off Crocta's helmet. The face of the one who called Crocta a monster was stiff. He hadn't wanted this ending. Crocta stepped on his face. It was the same for Crocta. The Imperial Army finally separated the soldiers from Crocta. The knights surrounded him. They were different from regular soldiers. The elites of the empire, led by Blunel, Betring, and a Dandator surrounded him. Tension filled him. Crocta felt his enemies enter the realm of the pinnacle. Night after night after night, while the soldiers surrounded him. There was no place to escape. He was isolated. He finally stood in a coliseum. A cruel stage where he would die if he didn't. Crocta's body accelerated. The realm of the pinnacle. This moment felt like an eternity. At some point, Crocta was the one who moved first. It was a subtle moment that the knights didn't realize. The greatsword flew towards them. It was a dandator who stopped him. He confronted Crocta. He overcame the pressure of Ogre Slayer and countered Crocta. The other knights recognized their movements only after several blows had been exchanged. They tried to find a gap, only for a dandator to be punched in the face. A few teeth flew away. In the meantime, the knight's blades flooded towards Crocta. They couldn't be avoided. At that moment, he transcended to the realm of a hero. He was supposed to be cut, but the swords hit their masters instead. The knight's armor was crushed as they were thrown back. But. A trickle of blood flowed down Crocta's cheek. Crocta turned to the knight at his side. It was the leader of the Blue Dragon Lancers, Bluno. As if he felt it, the knight's spear had reached into the realm of a hero. He overcame Crocta's control of causality and hit Crocta. He was better than expected. Crocta aimed Ogre Slayer at Bluno. He panicked and twisted his body. However, he couldn't escape and his forehead was torn. His life was saved by a whisker. At the same time, a Dandator and Betring approached Crocta. The knights united. The attacks of the knights surrounded him from all four sides. Crocta countered the threat with the power of the hero, but the strength of the knights, including Adadanter, was also incredible. Some of the blades that he couldn't stop cut at Crocta. Crocta tightened his grip on his greatsword. Many knights were torn apart as blood flowed down Crocta's body. The vacancy of the dead knights was filled with other knights. He kept ing and ing. This was what he wanted. Crocta grinned and his spirit cleared. His body reaccelerated. At that moment, he struck a knight who lost concentration. The knight couldn't respond to the rapid attack and the helmet belonging to the dead rolled across the ground. Crocta looked around and laughed, kulkulkul. The knights retreated, spreading out carefully as they watched him. Crocta licked his lips. The absurd difference in numbers and the limits of an individual started to be revealed. At that moment, a dandator suddenly raised his head. Betring and the other knights looked somewhere else. A long shadow was covering them. Crocta also looked back. From the hill, someone on a horse was coming down. He whistled at the sight in front of his eyes and said with a grin in not too late. Chapter, 171 Hey Rodriguez, my man. Oh, hey Bob. What's up, man? It's been a while. What brings you here? Rodriguez welcomed Bob who came after a long time. He opened the barrier protecting the counter and came out. 
the two of them shook hands and bumped shoulders. I need sewing urgently. Can you get it? Of course. The customer is the king, bro. Someone who is a friend and customer is an emperor, and you fit both criteria. Reynolds. Reynolds. Rodriguez raised his eyebrows. While he was a famous money exchanger, the things he dealt in were a bit special. Rodriguez exchanged currency and items between Elder Lord and the real world. Users who struggled in Elder Lord could use their assets in reality and those in need of items would also come to Rodriguez. Therefore, he was quite familiar with Elder Lord. Reynolds wasn't someone's name, but the name of a city that he had heard often as of late. It was the gateway city to the south in Elder Lord. Rodriguez pointed to Bob and said, Hey, champ. I can guess. Hmm. Are you looking for a scroll? Oh, shush. Bro. How'd you know? Are you a mind reader? Psychokinesis. CIA. Bob's shoulders trembled. Rodriguez chuckled and replied to Bob, The correct answer is CIA. What? Really? Shouldn't this be a secret? That you're a secret agent? Have you been tracking me? Noob, not that CIA. I'm talking about cash indicates answer. I see the truth when people spend money and I dig it out. For example, don't you think about putting on another accent? Of course, I think that every time I go to the clubs. The women must be thinking the opposite. They are impressed by things like that. Don't be fooled by the push and pull strategy, bro. Rodriguez opened his phone. He was connected with the branches in other regions, sharing quotes and transactions. He touched his phone a few times and the screen changed, displaying an item that had started to experience a recent surge in transactions. Look, you're not the only one. Everybody is looking for a scroll. Oh me god. Do you see the price? It is no joke. There isn't much left in the inventory. So, tell me. What's going on? Why is everybody suddenly looking for this scroll? Is it a fad like the 300 BPM these days? Um. Bob closed his eyes. Rodriguez prompted him. Hey, bro. If you let me know, it'll give you a Reynolds scroll. It will be at the lowest price. It is the same as the FA releasing Cristiano Ronaldo. He was also in his prime. Okay. I understand. I understand. Bob whispered sewing into Rodriguez's ears. Rodriguez stroked his chin and looked at Bob's face seriously before nodding. Then he hit Bob's back. Hey, my man. Find Jackie in Reynolds Square. Let me ask you sewing. Are you going on your own? I'm going with my friends. Okay. The password is the same, so let me know if you have any problems. Bob nodded. He reached out a hand after telling Rodriguez that the connection was urgent. Rodriguez grabbed his hand. The two of them exchanged a macho greeting again. Thanks, Rodriguez. This is nothing. I'll cheer you on, Bob. I'll see you again. Bob waved and left the store. Rodriguez went behind the counter again. He made his living off Elder Lord but he didn't pay much attention to the gameplay. To him, Elder Lord was a business. But after seeing Bob, he suddenly wanted to play Elder Lord again. He turned on the television. The hot topic was being talked about. The Heaven and Earth clan was fighting one NPC. It was strange that a confrontation between an NPC and users would be a hot topic, and it was also interesting that people defended the NPC and blamed the users. Coming and going there will be no trade with the South for a while. There wouldn't be a lot of people coming and going from the south due to the devastation. The orc in the hot topic resisted to the end and escaped with the help of his allies. The next battleground was going to be Catalu. A.S. a merchant, he calculated the impact of the conflict between the two sides and its consequences. No matter how he thought about it, the Imperial Army would win. The relevant communities and industry insights all predicted the Imperial Army's victory. Some people were already lining up there. Um. He remembered Bob's face. It was rare that he had such an enthusiastic friend. 
In addition, Bob bought the haste scroll that hadn't been selling much lately. It wasn't just that. Sewing was moving. Is it an adventure? As Rodriguez was thinking, the television screen suddenly changed. The screen was reporting breaking news. Rodriguez's eyes widened as he saw the contents. It was news that the NPC Crocta had appeared alone in front of the Imperial Army. The Undergame's chat room was in turmoil. As the broadcast resumed after the breaking news, people thought that it was just before the capture of Catalu, and the Heaven and Earth clan would face Crocta again. But the video shown on the screen was quite different from what they imagined. The imposing sight of the Imperial Army was still the same. Rommel was the commander. He was showing the dignity of a commander under the flag of the Empire. However, the opponent was different. They weren't facing an army or a group of people. There was no resistance group prepared for death. Just one orc. The steel helmet covered his face. However, he had fearsome tattoos on his body, a steel belt resembling a demon's face and a giant greatsword. It was clearly Crocta. They were skeptical at first. Why the hell did he come alone? Perhaps he had come for negotiations. Or maybe Crocta came to beg for his life. In the end, even he surrendered to the overpowering might. However, he came to fight. He recited the warrior's laws and lifted his great sword. The moment he said come to the army. Everyone watching the screen. They all realized. He was real. A real warrior defending his beliefs in life. He couldn't be stopped with fear or threats. He wasn't afraid of even death. He stood in front of the great army with just his great sword. There was no clearer message than this. Those supporting the Heaven and Earth clan and those who suspected Crocta, they could no longer mock him. It was because of what was occurring right before their eyes. Dwarf shoot at his bolter from today on. Bolter. Humans are the best he is a really crazy guy. I acknowledge that today is about Bolter. Sadder than yesterday Hyung Nim Hyung Nim must win. Bolter. Crocta Hyung Nim, Bolter. Today's lunch high in my 30 years of life the tears that didn't come even when I was in the army today I am crying Bolter. Chongsong Mountain Lim Chong Yung Cr Az Guy. When I was young, I fought alone against 17 people. Kai Ah. Bolter. Lantern Smash the Empire, Crocta. Bolter. Fire Eagle will Crocta Hyung Nim die. What are other people doing? Hip Hop Eagle Ha I am very ashamed of my actions in the past this is real swag swag is over, I will now say Bolter. Rock Star Account please refrain from doing that. Returning Orc user my chest is hot with excitement. Orcs are too big. Sunchong Group's youngest Crocta you are not a servant you are the master of your life. Yoksim Ronaldo I will dedicate my ceremony to Crocta Hyung Nim when I kick a goal tomorrow. The battle began. It was hard to believe this was the power of an individual. He barged into the soldiers alone and ed them all. Fountains of blood and corpses filled the screen. He ed several people every time he moved. This was the power of the Northern Conqueror. He was like a blender grinding down the enemies. Due to his brutal actions, a mosaic flashed over parts of the screen. Rommel was upset. He always commanded battles calmly, so this was the first time seeing his surprised expression. He raised his hands. Arrows flew. Crocta survived but the soldiers surrounding him were ed by the arrows. ING one's own side. Accusations started flooding in. Rommel dog SING his own allies how pathetic. Positive affirms positive when did I start truly seeing this guy my eyes have been broadened. Analyst this isn't like Rommel. He seems at a loss. He will soon regain his spirit. In the end, the difference between numbers is too big. Mint toothpaste the poor soldier's crocta is laughing. Sound summoner crocta is smart. Keep digging in. Barbarian Yorick that guy looks like me hu hu hu. Buddha Walker there are still so many opponents for Crocta to overcome have strength, Bolter. Snake face I don't know how this battle will turn out. The battle continued. Rommel's mistake continued. He tried to crush Crocta with the knight's assault, but the soldiers ended up wounded or ed. 
Rommel's command, which didn't care for the well-being of the infantry, was in contrast with Crocta, who came to protect people. The people cheering for Crocta grew. However, the difference in numbers they were worried about started to show. After all these attempts, Rommel separated Crocta from the soldiers and surrounded him with knights. Knights weren't easy to slaughter like the soldiers. They were elite combatants in full armor, and many were advanced fighters. Furthermore, there was a dandator who Crocta once dueled with. At the time, Crocta had managed to win. However, it was much more difficult on a battlefield where he was surrounded. Blades flashed inside the encirclement. Crocta ed several knights. His SS were brilliant. But in the end, his wounds gradually increased. The attacks flying from every direction ate away at Crocta's body. Everyone thought it was over. At this moment, sewing happened. A long shadow DD over them. The camera angle slowly moved. On the hill, a knight was descending with the sun behind him. Both Crocta and the knights forgot their battle and looked at him. The chat window once again became busy as his identity was confirmed. Mountaineer Hunter why is this crazy guy here? You are a legend I can only laugh. Come spring he really came to Crocta he is crazy. Toothpaste cap there currently in the middle of battle, so why did he show up here? Post it did this crazy guy come to join them? Empire strikes back this guy is crazy right? Is he siding with the Imperial Army? Crocta's fan ah, this guy is ing me. I will attack if he s Crocta. Nightfall id like to go and beat him up. Sword mania I want to rip his clothes. Sage bolter let's watch carefully we don't know. I'm not too late. His words discouraged Crocta. The man who appeared here, the one who declared that he would Crocta. White Knight Andre. He rode a white horse and wore shining armor. I always keep what I say. Crocta. Andre pointed his sword at Crocta. The stage is chaotic. He smiled at Rommel. Do you mind? Rommel knew his identity so he gave an order to his subordinate. The Heaven and Earth clan hurriedly wrote a message. The whisper was sent to White Knight Andre. He listened to the Heaven and Earth clan's proposal. The white knight nodded as he gazed into the air. Rommel and Andres gaze met as they nodded towards each other. The unspoken agreement was finished. Go, Crocta. The white horse started running. Chapter, 172 Andre and his white horse ran down the hill. Rommel gave a direct command. The soldiers supporting the knight's encirclement split to the right and left. They split apart to open the way for him. Then the next layer was divided. The layered encirclement divided like Moses' miracle. Andres' unstoppable charge streaked past the soldiers. Now the final encirclement formed by the knights was at hand. Andres' horse gradually accelerated until it was like a meteor. The knights opened the way. Now there was only a single circle left. Beyond it was Crocta. There were no brakes on a charging horse. He only headed forward and the knights moved out of his way. He bent his body further. As the horseshoes hit the ground, he entered the world beyond. The world compressed and the space was thrust aside. He penetrated straight towards his goal. The lance was already aiming straight at the enemy's heart. Crocta's body appeared in front of him. Andre grinned. His mouth curved as he anticipated the collision that would soon occur. Adrenaline reached its peak and his arms tingled as they welcomed the collision. His body was pushing towards a thrilling impact. Crocta's body became a blur. But Andre didn't stop. Kwong. 1. Kwa Kwong. 2. Kwa 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 Kwong. He struck more than three people. The bodies of the knights caught in his first clash flew to the side. His charge continued without any breaks. He crushed the knights and infantry. The knights and soldiers' ranks were broken. Andre explosively pushed through towards the rear of the army. The shattering assault of one person. The imperial army was breached. There were only dead bodies left in his wake. The encirclement around Crocta was cut off. Andre's final target was Rommel, who was commanding the army in the rear. 
Andres Whitehorse accelerated. Their faces were confused. Andre tightened his grip on his lance. Quang. One person turned into white particles. It wasn't Rommel. His charge missed. Canes and the Heaven and Earth members beside Rommel used magic and their bodies to protect him. Andre looked around. Rommel and his entourage escaped into the army. He gradually slowed down. Too bad. It wasn't enough to Rommel. He turned his horse around and looked at his work. The Imperial Army was still struggling to recover. Smoke seemed to drift up from the ground in the wake of his charge. Andre raised his lance and celebrated, Quahahat. He met Crocta's eyes. Brat, your face is surprised, muttered Andre as he lowered his lance. He was already aware that Crocta was his disciple, young Ian. It had been a long time since the character, Crocta, started to be famous. It was in the first duel video against the user hunters that Beck Hanho was able to find Ian's old habit in Crocta. The Index Finger Ian didn't even know it himself. After returning to South Korea, Ian would always twitch his index finger whenever he entered the confrontation phase of a spar. Maybe he saw the image of a trigger. Either way, it was a habit gained from the battlefield. Crocta moved his index finger slightly in the video, twitching it whenever he wielded his greatsword. His body was bigger, and his face was heinous, but his stance and moves were distinctive and the same. How could he not know? Beck Hanho had taught his student ever since Ian was a child, after all. He knew all of Ian's moves. Beck Hanho was convinced that Crocta was Ian after seeing the orc's attitude. The testimony from Ian's little sister, Biu, which stated that he was playing Elder Lord, added to this. Therefore, he pretended not to know and tried to cause a dispute with his disciple in the game however, the situation became like this. Unfortunately, he missed. The scale of this battle was suitable for Beck Hanho's disciple. Now, let's go back. The white horse started running again. This horse wasn't just a horse. This white horse was Andre's greatest treasure. It didn't matter even if the legendary red hair appeared at the end of a quest. This was a horse with dragon's blood. Let's go, back. Andre started to circle the Imperial Army's formation, trying to cut them from the sides. The soldiers were terrified. They had already experienced this with Crocta, so fear took over. Inside was Crocta. Outside was Andre. The Empire's army fell into confusion at the hands of only two enemies. Andre got into the proper position and started to charge again. Crocta also raised his greatsword. The hammer flew towards the anvil. Crocta laughed. He had been conscious that White Knight Andre was Beck Hanho, but his teacher already knew that Crocta was Ian. The mentor and disciple met in the game during a one sided battle, but the world wouldn't know this. Crocta raised his greatsword. The Imperial forces were recovering from what Andre had done. Still, there were too many enemies. However, the burden had divided by half. This was enough. Andre started charging again. Crocta wielded the greatsword in response to Andre. The new blood transformed the stagnant battlefield. The imperial troops were dying. Blood fell to the ground. The knights were pushed back by Crocta's fierce attacks. However, Rommel was said. He had lost his composure from Andre's sudden attack but he immediately resumed command and tightened the circle of knights. Then he created formations on the outside to keep Andre in check. It was solid on the inside and outside. Andre couldn't repeat his exciting dash across the entire army like he did before. The soldiers were easy but he needed to be careful of the knights on horses. A struggle of life and death followed. Crocta had to deal with Adandator, Betring, and Bluno at the same time. The three of them stabbed at Crocta's gaps. Crocta moved back and forth between the pinnacle and hero realms to deal with the enemies. He was expanding his limits by the extreme crossing back and forth of realms. He used the pinnacle in a necessary moment to defeat the enemies. Then he manipulated causality to reverse a dangerous moment. The enemies continued to suffer damage because they couldn't resist Crocta's greatsword. A dandator gritted his teeth. The wounds Crocta dealt caused blood to flow from his mouth. 
he spat out some of the teeth that hadn't fallen yet. A strong fighting desire filled him. I will deal with Crocta. Stop the other one. His pronunciation was ruined but the knights nodded calmly. A dandator immediately reached the hero realm. He pulled out all his strength. The tentacles that violated the laws of the world stretched out from him. That energy shot towards Crocta. Crocta sensed it and his face hardened. A dandator's power burst forward. Crocta smiled while grasping his greatsword. Do you like soup? Won't you have to eat it for the rest of your life? U.S. A dandator plunged forward. Crocta also entered the hero realm. Both swords hit each other. At the same time, the strands of causality wove together. Offense and offense, both sides were offset. It was a chaotic fight where it was difficult to tell where things were reversed. Crocta didn't lose his concentration and persistently pursued a dandator with his greatsword. A dandator's leg was hit. He lost his balance and fell. However, the other knights immediately attacked Crocta from behind. Crocta ignored them and his greatsword descended. A dandator tried to avoid it but his greatsword was quick. Crocta's shoulders and thighs would be hit, while he would pierce a dandator's heart. However, causality reversed. Their powers tweaked their attacks. Instead of his shoulders and thighs, his back was cut. Ogre Slayer stabbed a dandator's shoulder instead of his heart. Ugh. Aak. A dandator struggled. Crocta received some damage, but the wound he inflicted meant that a dandator was out of the battle. He was satisfied at this and stepped back. The knights picked up a dandator. Crocta turned and looked for Betring and Bluno. They couldn't be seen. He hurriedly turned his head. They were heading away from Crocta towards Andre. Andre's assault was fearsome but it would be tough if he went against both of them. The repeated assaults meant that he and his horse were injured all over. Now he was tired. It was hard to maintain the same explosive assault. In the near future, Andre would be caught up in the Imperial Army and the situation would worsen again. Crocta raised his greatsword and tried to break through the knights. However, the encirclement was solid. Using the power of transcendence, four or five knights were beheaded in unison. Their heads flew through the air. Despite the fearsome sight, the knights remained calm. Crocta looked up and saw Rommel watching the battlefield from far away. This was the amazing ability of the War Maestro class. His strength bound this army together. Thanks to Rommel's power, the knights forgot their fear and countered Crocta. Kokokol. He knew. It was impossible to deal with these troops alone. But it didn't matter. He held his great sword. The enemies stepped back. Crocta grinned. Did you hear what I said? He remembered the face of the Grey God, who was watching him. His assimilation rate was now 100%, so dying in Elder Lord would be the same as dying on Earth. Despite the grim, desperate situation, Crocta still felt joy. He was just doing what he had to, with the world pushing at his back. Come. The knights rushed in an organized manner. Crocta broke them down one by one. Death and death mixed together. Crocta yelled towards his enemies. Bolter. He was a warrior and survival wasn't enough. He recalled the ceremony on the day he received the name Crocta. Honor. As a glorious warrior, he would use the blade of honor against death. Come. The enemies burst forward. Crocta's body was wounded. The blades of the enemies were stabbed in his thighs and back. He cut their necks in return. He pulled the weapons out of his body. Blood poured from the split skin. He didn't care. He could see Andre surrounded by knights. The horse had already disappeared. It was dead or gone. He was struggling against Betring and Bluno. Andre met Crocta's eyes. Hey, kid. He remembered the first time he met Beck Hanho. Are you fighting? At the time, Beck Hanho was young. He asked Ian point blank, while Ian thought he was a neighborhood gangster. It was a memory now. However, there was no point thinking about old enemies. He was Crocta. An orc and warrior. Andre. 
Crocta called his name loudly. Andre looked at him. He was on the brink of being pushed back by Betring. Crocta yelled with a smile. Ugly. Andre's eyes widened at the words then he started laughing. He found some strength and counterattacked. Their swords met. Betring retreated. You're good. Andre responded by kicking Betring. Crocta started laughing. He ed and ed, as more enemies kept coming. He pushed forward but the situation didn't change much. There seemed to be no end. His great sword dragged on the ground as he moved forward. Now was the time to think. He was in the midst of reminiscing about his sister, the balance of his account in Café Reason when. A strange sound was heard from far away. Crocta and the troops looked around and saw a man. It didn't matter if that was his true movement speed or if he used a speed enhancement spell was still taking to the air like a madman. Crocta gulped as he saw the man. The man's voice gradually grew closer. Egu. I beg your pardon. I was proud of my body in the old days, although you probably can't guess or imagine it. Kukakakot. When you go to hell, will you let the beautiful demon take hold of you? Huhuhu, isn't this a basic masterpiece for a hero? No. You really are. What a series of surprises. Listen to my shoulders shaking. Shake shake. How long are you going to make my shoulders dance? Kukukukukukuk. Chapter, 173. He laughed with his eyes closed. Everyone was staring at him. The man coughed. Cough. Kook. There are people eavesdropping. Then he straightened and spoke to the army in front of him. Do you know? He spread open his arms. At that moment, a dark aura exuded from his body. His eyes were wicked. The darkness started to cover up his normal appearance. The scent of a man becomes deeper and deeper over time. The one who controlled the body started to assert himself. The great evil that was invited encroached at the body. His eyes became like a beast. His gait started to flow strangely. He stood in front of the imperial forces. He smiled, my contractor says that people are like wine. A soldier who met the man's eyes dropped his weapon. His strength fell. He could feel it instinctively. This was an existence he absolutely couldn't contend with. A black curtain fell over his eyelids. His vision blurred. In that case, I. The sense of space inverted. The soldier didn't notice he was being pulled down. All his senses were locked in the darkness. The man's voice entered his ears. I am the vintage wine, the demon Demogorgon. All of a sudden, the dead rose. Ta knew that it was the work of iron, the person who once helped him. He had already been overtaken by the demon and attacked the soldiers with bizarre laughter. The imperial army became confused as the dead rose again. However, that power didn't help much. The magicians exerted their efforts to control the situation. Dispel undead were used to break down the undead. Demogorgon's power was so strong that while the undead weren't completely eliminated, they were noticeably weakened. Furthermore, there was a bigger problem. The products are too finely chopped. The corpses of those ed by Crocta and Andre weren't intact. They were so broken that they couldn't be raised again. Demogorgon shouted, ignorant orc. Kolko Kolko, I'm sorry. The Imperial Army soon regained their morale and hit Demogorgon. His figure was surrounded by the Imperial Army. An angry Demogorgon started to the soldiers by hand. Demogorgon swung his fists and scattered the darkness, but no matter how strong the demon was, it was hard for him to exert all his abilities. He also entered an uphill battle. Caught. Bring it on, humans. Kiak. U.S. Andre also bellowed, I am the White Knight of Justice, Andre. Die. Crocta resumed the fight. He laughed as his blade struck the enemies. This was originally a body that should have fallen before such a huge number. But now, two assistants appeared. Both of them were equal to one hundred warriors, like Crocta. Rommel's face distorted. Rommel. Crocta called out to him. Only this much. 
Crocta stepped forward. A sound similar to an explosion occurred. A terrifying aura rose from him as he swung his great sword at the knights. The knights had become accustomed to Crocta's swordsmanship so it wasn't as easy as before. Crocta was also tired and refrained from explosive attacks like before. The wounds on his body caused him pain. The battlefield was still disadvantageous. A dandator was in the rear. Demogorgon was on the defensive due to the difference in numbers. Crocta could feel how reckless this fight was. He raised his strength and stared at Rommel. The best way to win against so many enemies was to the leader. Furthermore, Rommel was the key since he controlled the imperial army with the power of a war maestro. His loss would be greater than any other commander. Crocta wielded Ogre Slayer as he figured out how to approach Rommel. However, Rommel calmly directed the troops. He built an effective formation to deal with Crocta, Andre, and Iron. Andre was blocked by Betring and Blunel, while Iron was handled by the magicians. Crocta was surrounded by the knights. As Crocta stepped forward, the vanguard stepped back. The minor attacks consumed his stamina. Crocta's mouth twitched. He wasn't an easy guy. In addition, Andre was about to collapse. Betring, Bluno, and some soldiers continued to press at Andre. Andre didn't have the same combat power as Crocta or Demogorgon. He had more power than ordinary users because of his practical abilities, but he couldn't go beyond the limits of a user. Crocta looked up at the sky. Crows were flying. Betring's attack hit Andre's wrist, causing his opponent's sword to miss. Subsequently, Bluno struck. Andre barely managed to avoid it. Andre breathed heavily as he lost his sword and looked around. A bloody face. He glanced at Rommel and then back at the entire battlefield. Maybe all of this would be broadcasted. He had appeared in a wonderful manner, so he needed to fight nicely until the end. He was White Knight Andre. Cowardly and stupid guys. Andre cried out. Bluno laughed and said, Are you going to speak nonsense like the orc? Those who will die soon always speak the loudest. Bluno's voice was rough. He received a shock from Crocta's declaration. He had great pride in being a knight of the kingdom. He believed that he was in the right. However, he lost all confidence in front of the orc Crocta. He saw Crocta, who confronted the army alone with just faith, and compared him to the imperial army. Rather, Crocta seemed like the real knight. Moreover, he laughed as he trampled on them. It was as if he was denying all injustices. Bluno nodded. He rushed towards Andre along with the soldiers. The weary Andre revealed a gap. Bluno's attack didn't miss Andre. Andre tried to avoid it using acrobatic movements, but the stab wound was still deep. He fell to his knees. Now, say it again. What were you saying? Andre tried to speak but Bluno kicked his stab wound. Andre fell down. Again. Cowardly and stupid s. Bluno paused. The name of a knight is wasted on you, trash. Bluno slowly turned around. Andre wasn't in a position to speak right now. It wasn't him. The voice was coming from behind. Bluno and the knights discovered four people behind them. An unknown group. They stood shoulder to shoulder with their arms posed. Bluno's face distorted as the unidentified people emerged. It was already the third time. Who are you? Who? The man standing on the far left spoke. You asked who we are. Then the woman standing next to him spoke, well give you an answer. The next man answered, knights who have lost your chivalry, let our names wash away that dirt on your chest. The man on the far right lifted his shining sword, we are the mighty people of justice. F4. They were the best role players who teamed up with Crocta, Iron, and the Orc Users Brotherhood at Chesswood. The F4 had appeared again. Bob, who had the role of a warrior, raised his shining sword as he watched the soldiers in front of him. He had been waiting for this. They traveled the world of Elder Lord after Chesswood, but couldn't feel the thrill of that time again. This was the real stage they wanted. He wanted to get a haste scroll and join quickly, but he wasn't sure. 
so he tried to observe the situation. Crockta didn't disappoint him. He wasn't a role player like them. He was a real warrior. Bob was thrilled as he saw what Crockta said on the screen. That wasn't all. He could feel that the whole world was thrilled by Crockta's words. A warrior doesn't forsake faith. When did he see those fighting for faith? A warrior doesn't persecute the weak. Who would risk their life for the weak? A warrior doesn't attack unarmed people. It was a world where people would stab each other in the back if they saw a gap. A warrior doesn't yield to injustice. Life was a process of being accustomed to injustice. A warrior doesn't shame the gods. He looked godly as he spoke. A warrior pays back any favor or disservice. Was that really an orc over there? A warrior protects the powerless. He really put his life on the line for this. As a warrior, Bob was ashamed of himself. This orc wasn't a user with an extra life like them if he died, then it was the end. Nevertheless, he faced the great army alone without any hesitation. Yet they were worried about being hurt, despite being users. Bob immediately called his friends to come here. They tore the haste scroll and rode horses to this place. In the end, they were able to arrive in time. They discovered Crocta and two men facing countless enemies. Now it was time for F4 to make their mark here. Knights, listen carefully. It might not be as strong as Crocta's, but they had their own beliefs. Bob wielded the shining knife. My sword X Geiger is in pain. Joseph, standing beside him, hit his back. Cough. He grabbed Bob's head. Then he whispered. Hey, this will be shown all around the world. Don't do it. This is the main point. Let's just go to fight. Bluno looked at them and shouted, What are you doing? The situation continued to twist and more strange guys appeared, so Bluno became angry. Bob responded by effortlessly moving the sword. Anyway, we are the mighty people who came to help Crocta. We will protect Espada's freedom from the Empire. In the name of justice. Bluno was outraged. Crocta, the White Knight and the unknown necromancer, these three were obviously powerful. But it was unacceptable for this group to ridicule them. I will you. Him. Bluno started running towards the F4. The fireballs, created by the magician Joseph, flew towards them. The blades crossed. Demogorgon was angry. It was difficult to use his power because there were no proper corpses, and this physical body was limited. It was like ants were crawling on his body, but his limbs were tied up so he couldn't squash them. Trivial humans. Demogorgon gathered the darkness and turned it towards the knights. Their bodies were broken. The voice of his contractor rang in his head. Demogorgon. Fighting. You are also manly when punching. The movement of your center of gravity is excellent. Kukakak. Well. This was true. He was well versed in war tactics. Demogorgon felt better as his contractor praised it from the objective of a third party. Huhuhu, humans you can't win against me. The Imperial Army calmly circled around Demogorgon, despite his force. They were well trained soldiers. He determined that the man in the distance was commanding all of this. A great guy for a human. He controlled the soldiers like they were his own limbs. Demogorgon had gone through many fights in hell so he had a dim foreboding. It would become difficult to fight. If reinforcements came. At that moment. A dust cloud could be seen from far away. Reinforcements. He stopped fighting and turned his head at the thought of more enemies being added to the Imperial Army. A crowd was coming. They were a unit of humans. It was lacking compared to the Imperial Army, but it was still quite a large number. They stood before the Imperial forces. They formed a systematic formation against the Imperial Army. Then they slowly approached. Three people stood at the forefront. One of them pointed to Rommel and the army before saying. Hey, people from the Empire. The man spread open his arms. Whatever evil you have done, I know that you aren't really bad guys. The man pulled out a coin. He threw it towards them and said. 
Now is the time of rehabilitation. It was the rehabilitation brothers. Rehabilitation. Kiang. The rehabilitation brothers shouted. Demogorgon burst out laughing. They are funny humans. Kukakakakat. Rommel frowned as he witnessed the battle. The situation continued to be reversed. Crocta, Andre, and Iron weren't easy to stop, and more strange people kept appearing. Rommel. The situation. It is still okay. Crocta is tired. In the end, we. There was still room. Over there. A member of heaven and earth shouted. Rommel and Keynes hurriedly turned their heads. On the other side of the rehabilitation brothers, a group with red headbands appeared. They were all holding blades and looked like bandits. Yes, that was the crazy red headbands group. The number of variables kept increasing. Rommel frowned. Yes, it was still okay. It would be hard but they could still win. Apart from Crocta alone, there was Andre, Iron, F4, the Rehabilitation Brothers and the Red Headbands. The power had increased tremendously but the Empire still had the advantage. Except for Crocta, Andre, and Iron, the rest weren't that strong and there were still many Imperial troops. Regular users couldn't match up against well-trained ones. But the bad news kept flying. A member of the Heaven and Earth clan came running up to him. Rommel. The he's an orc, yet still praiseworthy members are coming. Those dog like s Rommel cursed. They weren't a proper clan or social club, they were just a fan club. It was like disregarding the entire Heaven and Earth clan. The formations broke. The strange guys surrounded the knights around Crocta. He watched the battlefield with the power of the war maestro. It was still okay. Keynes opened his mouth, Rommel. If we. No. We still have the advantage. The knights are still going strong. It is good that we can take care of them all at once. Do 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 do. The ground started to shake. The eyes of both the Imperial forces and Crocta's forces focused on one side. Who was going to appear next? A black group was running like crazy towards them. The distance narrowed. Do 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 do. Chapter, 174. Their appearance became clear. Fierce eyes. Burly shoulders. Enormous pressure coming from them. A crazy speed. What is that? This. The eyes of the former thawing Balhi members shook as they remembered Chesswood. They saw lunatics called Iron and the F4 there, but they weren't the most fearful ones. The cult of Elder Lord, the ones who were proud of walking on a path no one else took. Those who weren't human, who enjoyed suffering and adversity. The Orc Users Brotherhood. What? Do 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 do. The Orc Users Brotherhood made a wedge formation and rushed towards the Imperial forces. There were the Rehabilitation Brothers, he's an Orc, yet still praiseworthy and Mountain of Sabres, Forest of Swords but they gradually established their own formations. However, the Orc Users Brotherhood was different. They plunged into the Imperial Army without hesitation, with their speed doubled by haste magic. They roared, Kawa! Bolter! Bolter! We are the Orc Users! Orc Users! The First Collision! Kwa 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 Kwan! As the leading orcs and imperial troops hit each other, soldiers flew back from the collision. It was due to the fearsome power of the orcs' assault. They broke the outskirts of the imperial army and poured forward like a wave. The entire imperial army was pushed back. The orc in the lead shook his staff. We are. Orc. Users. Users. Breathing as one. They stampeded into the imperial troops. The outer layer was hard while the inner layer was soft, so once they broke down the outer perimeter, they could knock down the insides. Charge. Some of the orcs in the lead were so talented that they even overwhelmed the knights. A new wave started to emerge on the stagnant battlefield. Maguchwi furiously wielded his frost staff. A knight attacked but his sword was thrown back. Maguchwi didn't miss this gap, kicking the knight's abdomen before waving his staff. 
lightning emerged from the staff and struck the knight's body, turning it into black ash. A fearsome magician who was just as reliable as a warrior. Kawakta. Yes. Mukat. Bolter. The two orcs he called approached him. There were only three of them, but their shoulders were so wide it was like several adult men were placed side by side. Kawa. They once again assaulted the enemy. The orc warriors who lined up with him trampled over the empire like a bulldozer. Along the way, they picked up more orcs. Die humans. Kuak. Careless knights were destroyed by lightning strikes. One person was observing the battlefield. He had been determined to die however, he wasn't the only one. Unexpected allies had arrived. Crocta was thrilled to see the orc user's brotherhood. He was hyped up. Maguchwi raised his staff. Bull. The orc users simultaneously lifted their weapons. Tar. The orc users roared simultaneously. Blood burst from the imperial troops in close proximity to them. Once the orc users joined, the whole atmosphere of the battlefield reversed. The imperial army shrank back from their excited fighting and their morale fell. The orc users cried out along with Maguchwi, come along. Go to the end. Ma brother. You're going too deep. Short form for Maguchwi. It doesn't matter. We have to go there. Maguchwi pointed to the center of the battlefield. The orc user who warned him of the danger nodded and said, then we have to go. Ma brother's words are true, so it can't be helped. Let's give it a try. Kohahaha. Let's go. Maguchwi was pointing towards where Krokta was surrounded by knights. Every time Krokta's greatsword flashed, the knights would fall. The appearance of a true orc warrior. Let's fight shoulder to shoulder with Croc brother. The symbol of the orcs who mass-produced many orc users, the hero Krokta. They were given a chance to fight with him. Maguchwi lifted his staff again. Brothers. The orc users responded at once. Ah. Uh, are you ready to die? Ready to. Let's go. Bolter. Bolter. The orcs ran at the enemies again. They got caught up in the Imperial Army. The brute force orc users pushed at the Imperial Army with their momentum. It was the moment when the unique tastes of the orc users were known all over the world. Every time Bolter was called out, a soldier would die. Lightning flashed from Maguchwi's staff. Now the situation was reversed. The Imperial Army became weak. Crocta grinned. At first, he confronted the army alone. But not anymore. Crocta, Andre, Iron, F4, Rehabilitation Brothers, Mountain of Sabres, Forest of Swords, he's an orc, yet still praiseworthy in the orc user's brotherhood. Everyone showed up. It was the moment he was rewarded for the path he walked. All of those affected directly or indirectly had gathered to fight against the Imperial Army. They were all users who sincerely enjoyed Elder Lord. The Imperial Army still had the advantage in numbers, but they gradually lose their morale and were pushed back. It was the anti-Empire Army that was dominating. Hook, hook. Crocta breathed out wearily. As the fighting continued, the two sides became tangled together in an uncontrollable melee. Crocta slashed at the enemies without any rest. Once reinforcements arrived, the attention of the enemies was dispersed, creating a chance for Crocta. The number of people he ed today had already gone over three digits. He cut and stabbed, decreasing the number of enemies every time. The knights and soldiers couldn't survive under his blade. Bolter. He shouted again and wielded Ogre Slayer. The enemies fell down. And beyond that. There were friends instead of enemies. The orc users Brotherhood and Maguchwi. They rushed through the enemies and met each other. It was the first time meeting since Cheswood, but they felt familiar to each other, like well-known friends. There was no need to say thank you or ask for anything in return. Brothers. They exchanged glances and their fists met. It was enough. This was the middle of the battlefield and there were still a lot of people to. Crocta turned his eyes towards Rommel. His goal was three people. Rommel, 
Keynes and the traitor Grom, no Lewin. They were together. They were devastated by how the fight had gone beyond predictions and lost their concentration in battle. Brother. Crocta said to Maguchwi. He grinned and nodded. Crocta and Maguchwi. The strongest warrior and shaman among the orc users. They headed for the Heaven and Earth clan together. An aura emerged from Maguchwi's staff and their appearances became blurred. They approached the boundary around Rommel carefully. Now it was time to end this unfortunate relationship. A sufficient distance was secured. The Heaven and Earth members were escorting Rommel and Keynes, but they were just like sheep in Crocta's eyes. In going. Be careful. Maguchwi's magic flowed towards Crocta. It was the first time in ages that he felt the magic of an orc shaman. His whole body was filled with vitality as energy boiled up. It felt like he could anyone in front of him. His tattoos burned as Crocta pushed towards the enemy. Lennox's revenge. This fighting spirit was carried on in Ogre Slayer. He plunged towards them and yelled. Bolter. They were shocked at Crocta's sudden appearance. However, his sword was faster than them. Crocta's great sword tore at them. White particles scattered like snow. Kwajijik. Lightning rippled on Ogre Slayer's blade. It was Maguchwi's magic. The enemy resisted, but those who blocked his sword were shocked by lightning and weren't able to last long. They turned into white particles. Rommel and Keynes turned to try and flee. Crocta didn't miss them. Where are you going? He ran like crazy and reached out his hand. He managed to grab a horse. Ugh. His shoulders felt like they would pop from the force of the horse running. But he used all his strength and pulled the horse to a stop. The horse jumped because it was terrified of Crocta. Ramil. Crocta shouted and stabbed his sword into the horse's side. Hi Hing. The horse fell down. Rommel, who was riding the horse, rolled around on the ground. Crocta crossed the horse and approached Rommel. Stop. Protect Rommel. The Heaven and Earth members rushed towards Crocta. Crocta grabbed Rommel's neck while wielded his greatsword at the same time. The clan members were blown away in a burst of blood. The rest of them didn't dare attack. I finally caught you. War Maestro Rommel was in his hands. Rommel was looking at him with calm eyes, despite being caught. How do you feel? Rommel chuckled slightly, you're ugly. This. Crocta laughed. Then he punched Rommel's face. Rommel's face was destroyed. His teeth fell out and his nose was broken. He fell forward and couldn't breathe properly. Then Crocta threw him towards Maguchwi. Maguchwi wielded his staff. Magic power emerged and began to capture Rommel's body. It was a temporary concrete OD using magic. Crocta nodded and started to chase Keynes and Lewin. They abandoned Rommel and were leaving the battlefield with the Heaven and Earth members. Crocta ran like crazy. His thighs swelled as he accelerated. Qua 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 qua. The ground shook and dust rose up as he ran. Keenis. Crocta's mad rush caused the terrified horses to run faster. Don't forget the orcs. Crocta kicked off the ground and jumped forward. He entered the pinnacle and accelerated his body to the extreme. He could see the shocked canes looking at him. He gradually grew closer. Crocta stretched out and grabbed his body. Crazy. Crocta fell from the sky and captured canes. Crocta tilted his body and they tangled together. Then they rolled across the ground. The horse's hooves trampled on both of them. Cough. Canes coughed up blood. His body wasn't in a normal state due to being trampled on by the horse. Kuhik. The moment he opened his eyes, he saw the grim face of an orc staring at him. His whole body was bloody but he was watching Keynes with burning eyes. He smiled, do you remember Lennox? Crocta grabbed Keynes neck and lifted him. As soon as Keynes was caught, the Heaven and Earth clan stopped from confusion. Both of their leaders had been captured. You Gaisuf. Keynes tried to speak but Crocta blocked his mouth. Then he hit Kane's stomach with his fist. 
Keynes was stunned and became silent. Now it was Lewin's turn. Lewin was shaking among the heaven and earth members. The appearance of Grom was superimposed over him. He tried to become a warrior under Lennox and the Orc warriors. He was terrified and timid, but believed he could become a great warrior. But he betrayed them. The great warriors died. He had to pay the price. Lewin knew at the moment Crocta called out his name. At that moment. Kwong. A huge impact hit Crocta's body. The sky and the ground were reversed. Crocta tried to calculate the situation but his head was in shock as he struck the ground. The earth and sky rotated a few times. His body rolled across the ground. He tried to get up but his body wouldn't move. Maguchwi was running. Crocta raised his eyes. Through his blurred vision, he could see the heaven and earth members carrying canes away. Those s. Relax, brother. It is dangerous. Maguchwi used healing magic. But it wasn't enough to recover from the shock. It was a huge shock. Crocta gritted his teeth. However, he couldn't move his body. It felt like his whole body was broken. Reinforcements came. There seems to be a great magician. As Maguchwi said, the flag of the Imperial Army was visible on the horizon. They had already rescued Kane's group, and turned away like they had no intention of intervening in the remaining battle. The Empire's reinforcements went away. Crocta barely managed to raise his body. The battle was their victory. The Imperial troops surrendered their weapons. His allies were giving victory cheers. Crocta was happy but he wasn't satisfied. He formed fists. He couldn't miss them. He had barely caught them. But the magic shock was still shooting through his body. It made fighting any further difficult. Rommel? There. Rommel was looking at him silently while still bound by Maguchwi's magic. His handsome face was a mess. He pointed his fingers towards his mouth. It was a sign to release the magic around his mouth. Maguchwi looked at Crocta. He shrugged. He can escape if he bites his tongue. Do you still want to listen? Maguchwi asked. Please. Anyway, those guys had escaped. Rommel wasn't his true enemy. Crocta looked at Rommel. His treatment would vary depending on his words. No, Crocta would ensure that Rommel never returned to Elder Lord forever. But Rommel's first words were unexpected, he'll help you with your revenge. I will help you end those people. He immediately made a tempting offer to Crocta. Truly a smart guy. Crocta asked again, how? Rommel gave a slightly different answer to what Crocta expected. Completely. Chapter, 175. The battle ended with the resistance's victory. The Empire failed to win the South, which caused the region to be divided into different areas the Empire's territory and the Free Cities coalition, including Espada. The Emperor remained silent. The incident triggered a huge storm in the real world. The fight between Crocta and the Imperial Army became a hot topic, with the ratings record being broken every day. The videos were replayed during the day and night as they replaced Yuvit's top hits. In the meantime, Laney, the famous Yuvitzer, released a new video from secretly tracking Crocta. This time, it was a record of his struggles in the South. Laney's name was once again stamped onto the minds of the people. Thanks to her, people found out the specific details of what happened. These were the contents. After conquering the north, Crocta returned to the continent and headed south. He fought bandits and accidentally met a knight of Alast. Vigo's earnest persuasion moved his heart and Crocta's group headed to Alast. As a city known for its liveliness, Alast gave him a warm welcome. Crocta became friends with the bright and cheerful Alast people, accepting the request to duel the empire. Crocta fought against the genius of the Empire, a Dandator, and eventually won. Alast maintained its independence. Crocta became Alasta's savior and there was a feast to rejoice in the victory. He left Alast with blessings and farewells. It seemed like a happy ending. However, the news exploded. After they left for the resort town, the Empire broke its promise and destroyed Alast. It was a tragedy. 
Crocta was saddened. The empire wanted the entire south to submit, not just the last. They invaded cities and captured the people, making them soldiers or serfs for the empire. The entire south moaned. Crocta stood up for Alastair's revenge, facing the wicked empire and his own enemies, the Heaven and Earth clan. The slaughter began. He was constantly wielding his sword to save villages, residents, and cities, but he couldn't do enough alone. In the end, most of the south was incorporated into the empire. Crocta left to join Espada's resistance. A frantic struggle followed. Along the way, Crocta fought alone until he lost all his comrades. His attempts, while ignoring the risk to his own life, moved the hearts of the viewers. The viewers only watched the heavily edited videos of the Heaven and Earth clan, but through Laney, they were able to see the war from Crocta's viewpoint. Then there was a video of Crocta's final battle. Laney didn't illuminate Crocta alone from the viewpoint of the army. Rather, she should the overwhelming number of troops that Crocta faced from his side. It was a great army that no one dared face alone. In front of them, Crocta emphasized his beliefs and raised the great sword. It was an incomprehensible sight and no one could imagine victory. But he wasn't alone. The work he did, the path he took, his accomplishments had turned people into his allies. First of all, Andre appeared. They thought he would attack Crocta, but he broke through the imperial army. People were enthusiastic. It was followed by the wine maniac Iron and the role-playing group, F4. Then there were those reborn again due to Crocta, the Rehabilitation Brothers. After that was Kenzo and the Mountain of Sabres, Forest of Swords group, wearing red headbands. In addition, Crocta's fan club he's an orc, yet still praiseworthy. Finally, the orc user's brotherhood appeared, like a scene from a movie. The battle became skewed and they eventually won. If Crocta only emphasized the Marxist beliefs, he would have been scattered as a handful of ashes in this battle. But he practiced his own faith and the reckless fight resulted in his victory. Once the edited video that showed Crocta's struggle was released, his fan club number soared. Now there was no one who didn't know Crocta's name. Crocta wasn't an already dead hero or a media star. He was a living hero who personally proved his path to other people. They all praised Crocta. Opinions differed on how the situation would change in the future. The Elder Lord community was hotter than ever. The Imperial Army retreated and Rommel was captured. When looking back on Crocta's actions, Rommel had probably received the concrete OD. Without Rommel, the Heaven and Earth clan couldn't exert the same power. The users looked forward to what the Empire and Heaven and Earth clan would do in the future. But the situation went in an unexpected direction. Ah, Crocta. It is Teo. Kaya, so cute. Can I have a signature? NPCs don't know about signatures, fool. Crocta looks really scary. The users started to flock to Espada. The number of users in the south was reduced after the empire started their military domination, but as Crocta's popularity peaked, more and more people came to see him. It is embarrassing. Because of my popularity I'm sorry. Kahahat. Tio laughed in a pleased manner. As Crocta's tracks were followed, the cute gnome Tio and beautiful dark elf Aner were noticed. Inside Crocta's fan club community, he's an orc, yet still praiseworthy, there was a small part set aside for Tio and Aner. Every time they moved, the user's attention was focused on them. I would be several times more popular if my performance was shown. I missed the opportunity because Crocta acted alone. Kokokol. I'm sorry. The residents of Catalu were initially confused as they suddenly received the news that Crocta repelled the Imperial Army, then they cheered. Tio and Aner were a bit upset about him leaving silently, but the result was good and everyone was rejoicing. The Empire showed no reaction yet. Due to this, the people of Catalu weren't completely satisfied. It was an uneasy peace. Still, the mood of the city was much brighter than before. Tio waved his hand towards the female fans. Is that guy doing well? Dot? It is enough that he feels bad. HRMM. I'm curious. Dot. They were heading to the prison facility in Catalyst Militia Barak. There was a person in custody who had decided to help them. 
Crocta. You've come. I am alive. Thank you. It is an honor. After finishing the war with the Empire, Crocta received the respect of the Catalu militia. He fought directly on the front lines, so the residence or towards Crocta increased by several times. He is having lunch. Do you want to see him? Of course. Crocta headed to the prison in the basement. Rommel was there. He was sitting at a table inside the prison and eating lunch. He was imprisoned but it was just a gimmick. He wasn't even wearing shackles. Officially, he had received the concrete OD in Catalyst Prison. And unofficially. You were right. Rommel nodded. He tried to negotiate with Crocta by telling him how to end Keynes and Lewin. It was all true. When he said completely, it wasn't a bluff. Keynes and Lewin were completely finished. Crocta touched his chin and said skeptically, I don't know about those who have been cursed by the stars but. First of all, he kept up the pretense. Pretending to be an NPC was getting harder. However, Crocta's name was so well known then it would be annoying if he exposed himself. Tio and Aner, as well as his teacher Andre, were the only ones who knew he was cursed by the stars. Crocta continued speaking, according to Edgar, they have disappeared from the abyss of stars. He confirmed it with Rabina. They also picked up the circumstances you described. It is all true. As your friends from the Rehabilitation Brothers said, they will disappear forever from this world. Edgar. The head of the Heaven and Earth branch in my yard. He was originally part of the Rehabilitation Brothers and joined Heaven and Earth after breaking up with Rabina. A man who decided to accept Crocta as his brother after drinking together in my yard. He knew Crocta's identity and betrayed him, but Crocta didn't hate him. He ended the connection by ING himself and warned Crocta to watch out for the Heaven and Earth clan. At that time, he refused to make any excuses to Crocta. We have strict rules in the Abyss of Stars. They have committed a serious crime. Rommel explained. Crocta had heard about the Elder Lord doping from Ji Heian. The Heaven and Earth clan was doing it. They put drugs into people, turning them semi-comatose and then connected them to Elder Lord through illegally modified capsules. The victims were injected with nutrients and forced to play Elder Lord. They were able to maintain a high rate of assimilation due to the effect of the drugs. Because they couldn't terminate their connection, they worked endlessly in Elder Lord. The Heaven and Earth clan made them subservient in such a way. Then the clan grew quickly due to the high assimilation rate of the clan members. Keynes and Lewin did this secretly so Rommel hadn't known about it. However, Rommel had guessed and was convinced about the situation by Edgar not long ago. This was their weakness, Rommel explained. Crocta heard about their atrocities and evaluated them again. They weren't clever game players. They were real garbage. Rommel misunderstood the strange expression Crocta was making and added. You don't have to be disappointed about them being eliminated so easily. The punishment from the abyss of stars is more painful than anything you can do to them. I see. They will lose everything. Rommel said while calmly drinking his tea. It was like he said. It was the punishment from reality, not Elder Lord. They would be put in prison and have their assets confiscated. Putting your old colleagues in hell, you aren't a normal human being. Hu hu hu. Rommel laughed. When Crocta asked about why Rommel changed his mind, he replied. Just, I don't want to be hurt. Rommel wasn't playing Elder Lord due to the money paid to him, unlike the others in the Heaven and Earth clan. Rommel the War Maestro, he enjoyed playing Elder Lord itself. He was in the Heaven and Earth clan because it guaranteed him the position of commander, not because of anything else. Keynes and Lewin weren't worth more than that to him. It isn't normal. I heard that a lot. But Rommel grinned. Looking back now, I think I was secretly angered by what they were doing. I am also an ordinary human. They have sinned, so they should pay the price. Maybe this cold-looking guy had sobered up when he was hit by Crocta's punch. The moment that Crocta was going to leave the prison Rommel called out. Crocta. What is it? You have a lot of friends. Warriors, necromancer and several humans. There are a lot. 
So. So. Rommel hesitated for a moment and sighed. Then he opened his mouth again. Can I also be your friend? Krokta's expression became strange. He didn't have any good feelings towards Rommel, as Rommel had destroyed Alast and harassed the South. However, Rommel was an ordinary user who didn't know this world was another dimension. For him, ING people was just part of the gameplay. He just played as a villain. Krokta's mind became complicated. Krokta asked, why are you saying this all of a sudden? I just admire you. Rommel raised his teacup to his mouth again. However, he realized that he already drank all the tea and put down the cup. I was once an enemy but I would like to continue to know you. PFF. This sounds like a love confession. Tio interrupted from where he stood. It is funny but just nonsense. You only cooperated for a short time, yet you want to be friends with Krokta after ING innocent people? Hell no. His words were decisive. Rommel nodded. He knew that he was an unforgivable villain from the NPC's point of view. Tio added, if you want to be friends with Krokta, you should show it in your behavior. Behavior. People are evaluated by their actions. You can never be close friends with Krokta using meaningless words. If you really have a change of heart, you need to prove it. Krokta nodded in agreement. Tio's words represented his heart. It is like Tio said. Look, I can tell Krokta's heart without needing any words. This degree is needed to be his friend. Tio raised his shoulders. Rommel laughed. I see. I understand. See you next time. Krokta and Tio left the prison. Rommel decided to stay here until the Heaven and Earth clan were destroyed. It would be a while. Krokta and Tio left the prison. Their work was completed. This time, it seemed like they could travel leisurely. There were voices. It was definitely her. She showed up. Death is back. I'll find her. I will find and stop her. Do whatever it takes. It wasn't an error. Was she alive? We need to stop her. For the sake of the world. What does she want? The destruction of the world. How do we stop it? I can hardly see her. It is Suyas. Is it really her? That guy, the orc who conquered the north. It is him. It is obvious. Is he related? I understand. Orc. The orcs. She is going to use the orcs. This time, the orcs. It still isn't certain. Orcs don't believe in anyone. We can't jump to conclusions. They are orcs. The only thing they believe in is the forgotten god. No one protects them, so she probably reached out. Really, the orcs. Orcs. Orc. The orcs. They are people we can't manage anyway. It doesn't matter even if they disappear. No one will trust those cheeky brats. The orcs. The orcs and Krokta. Cheeky brats. The voices expressed their opinions. No. Get rid of them, get rid of her. Protect the world. Our world. For the world. That day. A divine message was sent down again. Every god whispered the same thing. Chapter, 176. Ian stretched. The sea stretched out before him. He was currently on a beach in Kongwandu, facing the East Sea. Ian had been stuck in his house all day playing Elder Lord, so his body was a bit stiff. Had gone on a solo trip in order to rejuvenate himself, and had picked this place because he missed the sea. Just looking at the blue sea made him feel better. He stretched his body and took in the fresh air. The sunshine was also pleasant. You have to tilt your upper body. You shouldn't bow. Don't touch the board. On one side of the beach, a surf class was in session. Brightly dressed men and women were repeatedly lying down and standing up on the surfboard. It seemed moderately amusing. Surfing Ian should learn at once. He had never learned any sports apart from martial arts. Turning his gaze away, Ian saw surfers splashing in the water. 
most of them weren't able to stand properly, but they didn't get tired, and some managed to slip nicely towards the beach. I don't like the rash guards. Ian turned his head as he unexpectedly heard a voice. A man was standing there. He wore glasses, and his hair was strangely gray. However, he didn't seem old. In fact, he was in his mid-thirties. As he stared into the sun, the man spoke with furrowed brows, it is annoying. People should go into the sea with bare skin. That is real. But the clothing companies make all these things, and they cover up their body unnecessarily. Youth is just a fleeting moment. Don't you think so? The man looked at Ian. It was the first time they'd met. Ian started laughing. That's right. This might be the attraction of traveling. He had accidentally met an interesting person. The man nodded. Take your clothes off. The sun should see you. Then the person in question took off his coat, revealing a body without any obvious fat. He was wearing aloha shorts. He walked forward with clear eyes. You. Ha. Huh. Do you know how to surf? I don't know. Indeed, you look like you don't know how. Ian's eyebrows twitched. He looked like he didn't know how. What did that mean? Ian had never failed at any exercise. Even when he played with a ball during his childhood, his natural athleticism meant he could easily get the ball past his peers. It was like Cristiano Ronaldo with a soccer ball, Stephen Curry with a basketball, and Roger Federer with a tennis ball. They were different. Although it was true that Ian didn't know anything about surfing, it was unacceptable to be seen as a desk-bound person. The man didn't sense Ian's anger as he spoke casually, then do you want to learn from me? Ian made a questioning sound and laughed. You can surf. Didn't I say it? This friend, you should learn how to look at people. The man dd his jacket around his neck. Follow me. It'll teach you one on one. This opportunity isn't common. Ian was interested in surfing, as well as this person. The man left the white sand with Ian and headed to the surf store across the road. There was a man with a suntan body and a reggae hairstyle sitting on a rocking chair. He raised his sunglasses to his head and waved. The eyes behind the sunglasses were unexpectedly innocent. Hey, Hyung Nim. You look good. Ha, I was active until dawn. I'm teaching him how to surf, so please give me a few things. I understand. Jinchul. Get me one set of equipment. One set. Yes. An answer called out from inside. Then a charming young man appeared. He greeted Ian with blurry eyes as if he had also been awake until dawn. Ah, uh, hello. It must be your first time. Yes. Do you want separate clothing or rash guards? If not, there is this suit. Your height is similar to me, so the size should be. Ian received a full body suit which appeared to be used for scuba diving. Then when Ian tried to pay for the rental, he was rejected. This is fine. Hyung Nim's guests always receive it for free. Ian looked at the man outside the store and the store owner. The man outside was looking at the sea with his hands behind his back. He asked, what is that person like? Hyung Nim. I have no idea. The young man laughed. He is just close to the boss. Shouldn't you know? We met for the first time today. Really? How strange. Well, it is like this. You can change inside. Ian put on the equipment, received a big surfboard, and exited the store. Ian's board was thick and felt like a sponge, while the man's was nice and waxy. This surfing equipment sucks. It isn't good. That isn't the main part. Surfing is. It's cool. The man said before looking at Ian. Ian jumped with surprise. The man now had blue makeup on his face which drew across his cheekbones and nose. It was like seeing the battle makeup barbarians wore in movies. What is it? Do you want some? The man handed the tube to Ian. It was sunscreen. Unlike other clear sunscreens, this one had a vivid color. Just put it on your nose. It is expensive, so I am saving it. Surfers seem to pursue their own beauty, 
so Ian tried it as well. Thus, they headed towards the sandy white beach. We can only surf in this area, so be careful. A separate surfing area was designated on the beach. They headed there. In addition to them, there were other people receiving surfing lessons. Most of the people on the surfboards weren't able to ride the waves properly and hung on like sea. I am harsh, so you should be prepared. Unlike his harsh words, the man was a really shabby teacher. He just said that Ian had to move his arms on the board and get up. Then he demonstrated once or twice before immediately pushing Ian into the sea. Ian couldn't even practice and had to try it out on the waves. Of course, that was enough. Ian did well with his natural athleticism. He waited for the waves before gently getting up at the right time. Then he balanced himself. Lon was satisfied. He was like Ronaldo with a soccer ball, Curry with a basketball, and Federer with a tennis ball. Now, he took on the board like Phelps with swimming. Well done. The man spoke. Ian replied, You are really good. The man was spooly riding the waves. His hair barely got wet, unlike most of the people who couldn't ride or balance. Kayak. During a moment of waiting, a woman slipped on her surfboard and slid towards Ian. Her board hit Ian's back. And he was pushed by it. Ian and the woman tangled together, and the two of them fell below the surface of the water. They struggled for a moment before reaching the surface. The woman with wet hair apologized to Ian. Wah! I'm sorry. Are you okay? I'm so sorry. Ian touched his back. It was fortunate that the woman's board was for beginners. So, this was why they used a sponge-like material. If it were the board, which the man teaching Ian had, that hit him, his flesh would have been torn. Ian smiled as he touched his back. I'm fine. Please be careful. Ah, the woman was speechless at Ian's gentle reaction. Then she grabbed Ian's arm as he moved away. Are you sure you're okay? That would have hurt. What can I do? It's okay. I'm really sorry. Ian shrugged, saying that it was okay. Then the woman grabbed her board and said. Please tell me if you get any problems later on. I will. If you need a number. No. It's really fine. Have fun surfing. Ah, uh, yes. You too. The woman bowed and pushed her board towards the other side of the beach. You didn't notice. Ian flinched. The man had approached. You surprised me, Ian said. No. You noticed. What are you talking about? Look. The man shouted, Hey, you over there. Come here. What are you doing just hitting someone? The woman turned around in surprise at his shout. She looked at Ian and then at the man. The man beckoned and she returned. Girl, you were wrong. You shouldn't hit people with your board. Isn't that right? That's right. I'm sorry. You are a very dangerous girl. So, give me your phone number. I need a phone number to contact you if there are any problems later. Ah, uh, yes. Yes. Then my number. She gave her number. Then he spoke to Ian, tell me your number as well. Why? Do you really not know? Quickly. That. Give your number to the other person so they will know it is you. Ian gave his number. The man repeated it a few times for the woman to remember. Girl, you do remember it? Yes. I remember. That's great. Did you come here for a few days to play? Is it a vacation? Yes, I leave the day after tomorrow. This boy as well. The man winked. The woman laughed. Then he'll be going. Have fun. Yes, I'm sorry. Have fun. The woman smiled and pushed away on her board. The woman's group were watching her anxiously, and she waved. Ian laughed and asked, What are you doing now? This is youth. Eat a lot, pray a lot, and love a lot. But my situation. You don't have a girlfriend? Then it's okay. He tapped Ian's shoulders. Let's get out. I did a lot. 
I'm thirsty. I'll buy you a beer. The man spoke informally to Ian, but Ian didn't feel any anger towards this unknown man. Understood. Ian smiled and followed him. They put their equipment away and found a homemade beer store not far from the beach. There were surfboards and equipment displayed inside the beer store. Surfing was famous at this beach, so it had a lot of influence. The man ordered beer and fries for himself. The screen in the store was showing Elder Lord. There was an uproar. The man leaned back in his chair and pointed to the screen. The headline was Shocking Heaven and Earth Clan. It was a coverage about the Heaven and Earth Clan's crime. It is a scary world. Drugs to put people into a game world. Yes. Their actions have eventually come back to them. Ian told the Rehabilitation Brothers the information he received from Rommel. Then Edgar's former lover, Rabina, reported it to the police, and the prosecution started working with the Rehabilitation Brothers. The sleeping room was formerly a workshop. There, they were able to find countless people who had disappeared, and Edgar was also rescued. They had started voluntarily for money. However, they testified that they hadn't been able to quit even if they wanted to as they were subjected to intimidation. Kane's Choi Sun Gil, who planned all of this, and his right-hand man, Lu and Kim Hyunchul, were arrested. Public opinion turned against them. The Heaven and Earth clan turned from South Korea's pride to their disgrace. The overseas community was also shocked at this situation, and it was a rude awakening for some people. What happened to Rommel? I don't think it will be hard to check if he participated or not. He was the commander. Right? That's correct. The war maestro. How was it? Is he like the rumors say? He was definitely great. Ian stopped talking. He looked at the man. The man smiled at him quietly. He looked to be in his mid-thirties, and the glasses gave him an intelligent air. The man's black eyes seemed to pierce through Ian. What did you say? The man chuckled. Ian leaned back in his chair. His mind felt like a mess as he opened his mouth, you. It has arrived. Please enjoy. At that moment, the employee served the beer, and the conversation between Ian and the man was suddenly halted. The employee put a beer down in front of both of them. There were cold water droplets on the surface of the bottle, and Ian touched it with his fingers. Then the employee went away. Ian sipped the beer. It was cool, and he felt his mind calm down. The man also drank his beer. Then he asked Ian, how was Rommel, Crocta? Chapter 177. This man who was he? A chill ran down Ian's neck. However, while looking at the man's carefree face, Ian decided to drink beer instead of pursuing it. Ian said, he was a great commander. The man nodded. Yes, he is a decent friend. He would have been the best if it wasn't for you. I'm not sure. He and I are different. To say who is better. You're the best. The man laughed. There was a cheering sound from the next table. Tanned men and women gathered while enjoying the music. Isn't the atmosphere good? That's right. The man picked up some fries and put them in his mouth. Anyway, you are the best. Ian looked around. It didn't feel like a Suya situation. He drank the beer and pretended to be unconcerned. That reminds me, how much is a surfboard? If it is fun, I should buy one. Ian threw out some meaningless words while thinking of a few possibilities in his mind. First of all, the man might be related to the heaven and earth. He might have appeared for Cain's revenge. However, that didn't fit. No one knew Ian would come here. Additionally, this guy seemed to have already been here for a long time. Maybe he was an acquaintance of Ji Hae Yun. The game publisher might have finally figured out Crocta's identity through the Elder Lord system and informed him. The man stared at Ian. How clever. But I don't like this. Just ask, who am I? Not doing what the opponent expects. Did you learn that in the Middle East? Ian knocked at the table with his fingertips. The feeling of being caught was always unpleasant. Ian detected danger, so he tried to break the rhythm of the opponent. To do so, 
he always ignored what the enemy expected. If they expected an attack, stay in place. If they expected a defense, strike forward. He didn't want to give a reaction that the opponent expected. How did you know? However, this time, there wasn't enough information. So, Ian just asked him. Who are you? Look, this is how easy it is. The man smiled and drank his beer. The two people had a light toast and looked at each other while drinking their beer. Eat the snack as well. Otherwise, I am the only one eating. He ordered more beer and ate the fries again. Your presence was truly unexpected. I never expected it. What do you mean? In talking about Elder Lord. I didn't expect a person like you. At that moment, Ian realized who this person was. Ian's quiet eyes stared at the man, who looked different from the photo. The man was tanned, and his hair and eyebrows were strangely white. He had muscles, unlike his skinny appearance back then. The changes were so diverse that he never imagined it would be the face from that photo. Yu Jae Han. Correct. The man closed his eyes and smiled. It was the man who made Elder Lord, the man who developed the core system, Albino. Ian's face stiffened. Ian had wanted to meet this man, but he couldn't figure out what to say now. Did you Jehan know about the Grey God or that Elder Lord was another world? It felt like his soul was rising from his body, and he was losing his sense of reality. Maybe everything he went through was just a dream, and Elder Lord was actually just a game. You already know. Have you been searching for me all over the place? Yu Jehan asked. Maybe I should have checked here. Yes, I suppose. Then Yu Jehan suddenly said, That woman likes you a lot. Multiple faces entered Ian's eyes, then they were erased. However, Yu Jehan noticed his expression and laughed. Who are you thinking of? Are there many people like that around you? No. There was also that girl earlier. How sinful. The new beer was a little different. Yu Jehan nodded as he drank. For Krokta. The two clinked their cups together. As Ian placed his cup to his mouth and sipped, Yu Jehan suddenly asked, I heard you met Albino. Ian's throat spasmed when he heard that, but he managed to calm down. Drink slowly. Don't choke. Cough, cough. Albino. The white woman, the grey god. Yu Jehan already knew about the grey god. Ian put the beer down and calmed himself. This was the man who made Elder Lord. It was obvious that he was related to the matter. Yu Jehan was a physicist. Did he link the two worlds by joining forces with the Grey God and using an unknown theory? If so, why did he make Elder Lord? What was the real purpose of the Grey God? Ian said, I met her. I also heard that Elder Lord is another world. Yu Jehan nodded. I guess so. What is Elder Lord? Why did you make it, and what is the Grey God's purpose? If I tell you one thing. You should tell me. I see. Yu Jehan looked upwards. He seemed to be thinking of sewing. Your name is Yung Yian. Yes. Have you ever looked up at the night sky? He reached out. It is dark in Korea, but there are numerous stars in the sky. Have you ever looked up at the sky from the desert? I have. How was it? Beautiful. It wasn't scary. He smiled faintly at Ian. Isn't it scary to imagine the vast universe that stretches between the stars and us? I haven't thought of that so far. All of them will cool down in the end. Yu Jehan seemed to be touching on the idea of the abyss, which had been conveyed by the Grey God and the Demon Belt. Entropy can't be reversed. Forever. This also went along with Gordon's story. The sun, the stars, and the many galaxies in the universe will eventually cool down. What does that have to do with Elder Lord? Albino was thinking about this before me. So, she found me and told me there was a way out. Then I helped her make Elder Lord. Maybe it was a good choice, he added on, muttering. Ian looked at Yu Jehan and realized this genius was different from ordinary people. Did you create it in order to prevent the destruction of the universe? Sewing like that. 
Yu Jiehan was afraid of a future that wouldn't happen in this life but in later generations. The idea overflowed in his head, and he couldn't think of anything else. How can she prevent the destruction? I don't know. You just believed her and created Elder Lord. She is a god. I could only believe it after meeting her. She used incomprehensible powers. But it is bigger than I thought. People think it is just a game and are ing others. Don't you feel guilty? Yu Jaehan looked at Ian with calm eyes. They seemed emotionless. They are people who will die anyway. That doesn't mean they need to be ed. Everyone dies. They will live for less than 100 years. So, why does it matter? It is up to here. I've told you enough. Can you stop Elder Lord? What was Albino's purpose? Didn't I tell you? It is up to here. The rest you can figure out yourself. Yu Jaehan's expression was firm. Ian struggled with two options leave now or try to make him say more. Maybe Ian could even use some force. I understand. The latter was the more interesting choice, but he was no longer Raven. There were many questions he wanted to ask, but he decided to just nod. Well, I suppose it doesn't matter. I am thinking about doing it in moderation now. Are you thinking about stopping Elder Lord? I think I will soon. Ian recalled when he had been crocked at and received a 100% assimilation rate. In that moment, he really had been crocked at, and his mindset had been that of an orc warrior. He had no fear. For him, even dying was an honor. Had been willing to stand alone on the battlefield despite the risk of death. At the time, he didn't worry about his surroundings. The most important thing was the battlefield. However, that wasn't the case. Eu was still young, and he was her guardian. Cafe Reason was also his responsibility. He couldn't consider only himself when it came to his death. When he disconnected and returned to being Ian, he regretted the thoughts and actions he had made when being Crocta. If he continued with Elder Lord, that would keep happening in the future. He needed to refrain from that, for Eu's sake. In the end, the Empire had been blocked. There was no need to get entangled with dangerous beings or the Grey God. I hope it can be like that. By the way, you're here. But Elder Saga Corporation has been looking for you. They are bad at their jobs. Albino has also been helping. Have you been here the whole time? Yes. I just came to empty my head, but it was fun. The sea and the people. Ji Hei Eon, the heir of the Myongsong group, was sure that Yu Jaehan wasn't in Korea. However, he was at a beach resort in Kangwondu, and his body looked better than before. Ian started laughing. How did you know I would be here? It's a coincidence. I was also surprised. Do scientists believe in coincidence? You never know. The more I dig, the more amazing the world is. I believe in coincidences. It was difficult to believe. However, Yu Jaehan seemed to have stayed here for a while. The people from the surf store knew him well. It was a purely impromptu idea that Ian had decided to go here, so it was a coincidence they met. Ian decided to be convinced. Yu Jaehan rose from his seat. Let's go. Where to? This is a vacation. Go out and enjoy it. They left the store. It was summer, so the days were long. There was still a dim light coming from the sky. Call that girl. Girl. The girl who hit you during the day. I don't want to. I don't even remember her number. I do. Yu Jaehan grabbed his phone. Ian stopped smiling as Yu Jaehan entered the number and hit the call button. What are you doing? A follow up. It is okay. By the way, do you really remember it? At the time, the woman had only said her number once. On the contrary, Ian had repeated his number several times. I have a high IQ. I remember everything. Good for you. It is. A man shouldn't be shy. Otherwise, how will you be popular? That isn't the problem. Suddenly, Ian's phone rang. It was a familiar number. Yu Jaehan laughed. Women are more active in this world. 
Yu Jae-hun lay on the hammock and stared at the sea as he waited for Ian to return to his accommodations. The lights from ships shone on the horizon as the sea breeze blew. Yu Jae-hun shook his body on the hammock and felt the rhythm. He closed his eyes and whispered. Did you send him? There was no answer. Yu Jae-hun asked again, Albino, did you send him? It's a coincidence. He opened his eyes. There was a fuzzy shape by his side. He decided to come by himself. You helped him make that decision. Using your power, you can project any image into his imagination. No. I haven't seen you in a while. The white, fuzzy shape revolved around him and said, It will be soon. So soon. It will be soon thanks to Ian. He doesn't know anything, but he is helping you. It is an inevitable flow. Yu Jae-han got up from the hammock and stared up at the sky. There weren't many stars at the beach. Still, he could imagine the vast landscape beyond it. Keep your promise. He demanded. I think you are insane. I am a genius. Ian appeared in the distance. Yu Jae-han waved towards the distant Ian, and a blurry cloud hid behind Yu Jae-han. Her image disappeared within a short time. He could feel her disappearing and muttered, geniuses are never sane. Then Yu Jae-han's eyes narrowed. Ian neared him, but Ian wasn't coming alone. A woman was with him. Is this youth? Chapter, 178 The woman Ian brought was of a similar age to Yu Jae-han. Yu Jae-han subtly looked her up and down. He felt like sewing was wrong. This is it. Is it this person? She asked. Yu Jae-han looked at Ian and laughed, what is this? What about it? Eat a lot, pray a lot, and love a lot. Ian laughed. I found someone for Dr. Nim. No, why didn't you ask me? I didn't intend for it originally. Ian grinned and spoke to the woman, Nuna, he is handsome, intelligent, and a good surfer. I can't see that. His mind is very good. He is a Mensa member. Oh, my God. Really? His mind does seem nice. Yu Jae-han instantly shook his head, Mensa is just a mega society. It is a group that anyone can enter. Mensa? Ha ha ha. How about it? He is clever. Ian laughed. She replied, I came here, but I still don't believe it. Will you take responsibility? Why are you already like this? Talk together for a little bit more. However, I will take responsibility. This person is gentle inside and out. He is a genius who remembers everything. Isn't he great? Ian moved her to sit beside you Jehan. The woman shrugged like she was still unsure if she was interested, but she started talking to you Jehan. She was the guest staying in the room next door to Ian at the hotel. They had encountered each other outside their rooms and started chatting. As she was a similar age to Yu Jae-han and bored being by herself, he said he would introduce her to a nice man. The woman followed because deep down she was interested in Ian, but a genius had his own charm. Have fun. Ian slipped away. The wall broke down slowly, and Yu Jae-han and the woman laughed as they exchanged a few words. Ian grinned. He had wondered about what type of person the genius Yu Jae-han was, but he seemed more free and easy than Ian had thought. Ian had thought about letting Ji hae know, but it was better to hide his available resources. What should I do? Ian walked alone on the beach at night. It was night, so the atmosphere was cool. Exotic bars were lit up along every street, and the food trucks parked in the streets sold a variety of food. Ian bought an American-style chili hot dog. He also received a cup of beer. It was delicious. The beer was a domestic brand, but it wasn't bad. He walked around the beach with food in his hands and sometimes saw youths who had bought firecrackers. Here and there, people were laughing. There were young people busking, playing musical instruments, singing and dancing. Somehow, it all seemed distant. It felt like a type of world which he couldn't join. Ian was a similar age to them, but he was more accustomed to pointing a muzzle at an enemy's head than playing music or having other talents. You should enjoy life Ian's boss had said this when Ian was discharged. 
How had Ian looked at that time? However, now he enjoyed it enough. Was there anything as joyful as being Crocta? At that moment, Ian recoiled. A face he had seen many times belonged to a person sitting at a barbecue party on the beach. This was a face that shouldn't be here. It was a person with green skin, rough eyes, a heinous face, and a red headband. See Crocta. The person was Crocta. Ian froze in confusion, but when he looked closely, he saw that Crocta wasn't the only one. There were various faces next to him, such as the popular Pokemon, Pikachu. They were masks to be pulled down over the head. People laughed as they moved. Ian couldn't help laughing. When did these products come out? I should be paid royalties. He muttered as he kept staring. The people were laughing as meat cooked on the open-air barbecue grill. Then suddenly, someone waved at Ian. The face was familiar. It was the woman who hit Ian during the day. He couldn't ignore her due to her intense gaze. What are you doing alone? Nothing. Well he looked down at the hot dog and beer in his hands. I am walking alone. Ah, so you came to the beach. It must be lonely. Is your body okay? It's okay. Her face was already red from the alcohol. The people sitting with her wondered who he was. When she told them that Ian was the person she hit during the day, they welcomed him with strange eyes. It seemed like they had already talked about Ian. On the other hand, the men were looking at Ian with appraising eyes. The man wearing the crocta mask took it off. He was a young man. He asked, Do you know this person? Kind of. I'm sorry, but only our guests are able to attend. The amount is fixed. It seemed to be a barbecue party for people staying at a guest house. Ian had no intention of attending, so he shook his head. He was injured because of me, so can't it be allowed just this once? It is okay for one person. Please, Appa. I was really looking forward to seeing him. The young man was troubled because he couldn't ignore a bunch of girls. I understand. Please have a drink. As the young man working at the guest house soon realized the atmosphere, he quickly handed Ian a drink. Ian tried to refuse. However, the idea of enjoying life suddenly flashed through his mind again. Sometimes, it wasn't so bad to participate in things like this. Ian received a cup. The people were from all over the country. The young man wearing the mask had come because the boss had asked for his help. Meanwhile, the rest were office workers, university students, and young men just about to go to military service. Ian asked, where did you get that mask? I bought it on the internet. Do you know about Crocta? I know. I'm a fan. Everybody was drunk, and their intentions could be seen in their eyes. There were people hitting on those they liked. The guesthouse employee was interested in the woman called Jun, and Jun was interested in Ian. Ian smiled wryly as he was sandwiched between the two of them. I think I should go now. Where? I'm tired, so I'm going to sleep. Are you going to sleep already? As Ian left, the man felt sorry as well as glad, so he didn't try to stop it. It can't be helped if you are tired. Ian said thanks and rose from his seat after finishing his drink. Anyway, everyone was so drunk that they wouldn't remember him. He walked around for a while after leaving the beach. In fact, he wanted to be left alone. This time alone was needed. Ian looked at the distant lights in the sea and thought about Elder Lord and Yujehan. He asked himself why these things happened. It was almost like someone had given Ian a mission. Strange things would keep happening to him in the world of Elder Lord. Yujehan Ian went on a trip, met Yujehan, and heard about Elder Lord. Elder Lord seemed to be born from some strange idea about reversing entropy, and the Grey God seemed to be yearning for it. He felt the sea breeze one more time before deciding to return to his hotel. Ian witnessed a Suya sight. The guesthouse members at the barbecue party were either still partying or had returned separately to sleep. However, the man who wore the crocta mask was supporting the woman called Jun and heading somewhere else. She seemed drunk and dazed, while the man was leading her somewhere. It was in the direction where the bright lights of a motel flashed. Ah, really? Ian bit his lips. 
Where were her friends? He didn't know, but they seemed swept up by the atmosphere and didn't pay attention to her. The man's hand was busy moving in the direction of her waist. Ian went up to them. Excuse me. The man looked angrily at Ian. Jun hadn't recovered yet and was leaning weakly against the man. She occasionally muttered nonsense. Ian spoke softly, just take her back to the guesthouse. The man looked around for a moment and saw it was just them. Then the man's face distorted as he replied angrily, what is it? Are you her boyfriend? He had dropped all honorifics. Ian smiled bitterly. You shouldn't take advantage of a drunk person. It is fine if you listen to my proposal. Don't interfere in my business. Why are you meddling? The man placed Jun on the ground and approached Ian. He had a good physical appearance, and he was tall, so he looked down at Ian. Why did you have to meddle in my business? Ian thought about it. The man's words Ian wasn't a good person to meddle in other people's business. When he looked back at his past, he would shrug rather than meddle with other people's problems. However, he couldn't just walk on by now. So, listen well. What? Maybe if you hadn't used that mask Ian muttered. Crocta is exactly why I. Ian stretched out his hand at a speed was so fast that the man couldn't respond. The man's balance was disturbed. Kung. And he fell on his back. Ack. Ian shook his hand. You can't pass. The man held his back and rolled around on the ground. Ian had done it gently, but the man seemed to be shocked. Ian ignored him and went to the woman called Jun. Are you okay? Can you stand? She was sitting down and dozing off. Ian sighed inwardly. He had to call the police or find one of her friends. You in the meantime, the man stood up and ran forward with a red face. Ian said, just lie down. I'm going to you. He rushed towards Ian. It was a posture which showed he had some training. Powerful punching and kicking followed. If the opponent were an ordinary person, he wouldn't be able to resist the attack of this trained person. However, the opponent was Ian. The man collapsed after being hit in the solar plexus, and Ian kicked his side. The man couldn't breathe and curled up. Ian kicked the man's belly one more time. Don't ever wear Crocta's mask again, or I will you. Ian looked down at the man as he warned. Suddenly, he saw the woman's friends in the distance. They were looking for her. Ian waved his hand. Boss Nim. Ha. Huh. Did you enjoy your trip? Han Yori asked as she watched Ian. I did. Really? She narrowed her eyes. You haven't let go of your phone since you returned. Ian hesitated. Then he started typing on his phone again. It's not like that. HRMM. Han Yori stared at Ian from where she was wiping the tables. Ian hurried to finish the message and pressed the send button. Since traveling to Kongwandu, the number of people in his messenger had increased by two. There was the woman called Jun, whom Ian had rescued. To be exact, she was Han Jun. Why was he in contact with her? She seemed to have a crush on Ian after he rescued her from the dangerous situation. A new message appeared. It is quiet. Aren't you playing Elder Lord today? Yu Jae-han. The other new person was Yu Jae-han. The genius scientist and creator of Elder Lord whom the Myongsong group was chasing. Yu Jae-han had become close friends with Ian. Ian couldn't help smiling as he remembered Yu Jae-han's unique tone. You should watch the broadcast. I'm looking forward to it. More messages were exchanged. Ian rested for a while, and now he was returning to Elder Lord to meet Tio and Aina. Han Yori frowned as she saw Ian smiling at his phone. Annoying. Ian's eyes widened at the irritation which he rarely saw from Han Yori. Han Yori shrugged. What? Don't bother me for the rest of the day. Then she went to wipe the other tables. Ian scratched his head as he gazed at her. Chapter, 179 Sewing is wrong. Yes, we can't stay still. Gather the magicians. What about you? My job has ended. Let us begin as soon as possible. 
Time is running out. Right. Catalu had changed during Crocta's absence. The preparations for war had disappeared, and it seemed to revive into a lively city. Crocta walked through the bustling market with Tio, then he found a store and slowed down. It was a vegetable store. Old memories suddenly popped into his head. At one time, he had sold vegetables. He had helped Stella sell vegetables in a nail. That man, he is fairly good. He can sell a fireplace to people in the desert. Dot. The vegetable seller was brilliant at dealing with customers. He stopped the guests, formed an affinity with them, and sold them a handful of vegetables. As Crocta and Tio were admiring his SS, there was a sudden commotion. Look, I don't eat vegetables. A man stood in front of the vegetable store, playing with the vegetables while laughing. We aren't herbivores. Do you think eating vegetables can make you strong? The man raised his arms and showed off his biceps. The muscles of his right arm bulged out. You can become strong like me by eating meat. The demonstration of his body stopped the crowd. The burly man shrugged and laughed at the vegetable seller. Look, Mr. Vegetable Seller, are you going to collapse right now? You are as skinny as a dried anchovy. Eating vegetables have weakened you. Meat is good, but you need to eat a balanced meal for nutrition. Balanced, balanced. I am tired of hearing this. I grew up hearing that I would be taller if I eat bean sprouts and stronger if I eat spinach. But then I was incredibly weak. Everything is a lie. As he screamed, a few customers turned away from the vegetable store. The vegetable seller's expression turned grouchy. You should talk about this somewhere else. Eat meat. Chicken breast. Pork sirloin. Pork tenderloin. Pork forelock. Beef if you are rich. That is how our muscles develop. He took off his top and posed again. The man had good muscles. That amazing. Oh my, oh my, look. The men in the market were amazed by the muscles, while the women covered their eyes and peeked through their fingers. The man smiled and shouted, If you want to be like me, come to Arnold's butchery. It was an explicit publicity stunt. Crocta realized sewing. This person was almost certainly employed by Arnold's butchery. The man deceived people with his good muscles. Why else would he discuss here while showing off his chest, triceps, and biceps? The customers at the vegetable store turned away one by one. Then they asked the man, where is Arnold's butchery? Ha <laughs> ha. Arnold's butcher store can be found on the right side if you turn left at that corner. There is a discount for the pork tenderloin today. The atmosphere was already in his favor. People decided that today's dinner menu was going to be meat. The vegetable seller's head drooped down. It is sophistry without vegetables people can't live. However, his voice didn't reach the people. Crocta looked at him and closed his eyes. Obviously, meat and proteins were important. However, the value of vegetables couldn't be discounted. Proteins were important, but the vitamins, antioxidants, and anti-cancer compounds as well as various minerals and phytochemicals were essential for the bodhis health. Crocta opened his eyes and stepped forward. The people were surprised at the sudden emergence of an orc warrior. The muscular man posing flinched as well. Who didn't know of Crocta, the true hero who saved Catalu? Crocta looked at the muscular man with sunken eyes. The man winced and hopelessly maintained his pose. The muscular man looked like a dwarf once Crocta stood next to him. He awkwardly smiled at Crocta. Ha ha ha, it is Crocta. Your body is also good. Crocta eats a lot of meat right? Ha <laughs> ha. Take a look at these muscles. You must eat three chicken breasts every meal. Kelko Kel. Crocta as well. Crocta didn't answer. A person's beliefs weren't shown through words but actions. Crocta spoke to the vegetable seller, hey. The vegetable seller stuttered with confusion, why yes? The spinach, how much is it? Crocta grinned. I would like to buy some. Spinach. It was rated as one of the top ten superfoods in the world. He might have a rough green body, but he was devoted to eating spinach since it had various beneficial properties. 
Crocta declared that he would buy it all. The marketplace became noisy. Then Crocta said, Hey, inflatable muscles. The man's face turned blue. Inflatable muscles was an unbearable insult to him. Look. Crocta gave strength to his arm. And it swelled greatly. This is the ultimate compression muscle. Cries of admiration emerged from the crowd. If the compressed muscles were so big, what were the decompressed muscles like? The man wanted to protest that Crocta's muscles were inflated, but the atmosphere was also on Crocta's side. No, Crocta's compressed muscles were bigger than the man's. Crocta stated, meat is definitely important. However, you aren't a real muscle man if you don't know the value of vegetables. T that. Tell me, what did you eat this morning? That. The man didn't answer. Crocta demanded harshly. Tell me. Your body doesn't lie. What did you eat this morning? The man gulped at Crocta's push. Crocta stared at him. Confronted with the gazes of Crocta and the crowd staring at him, the silent man was forced to open his mouth. He gritted his teeth and replied, Of course, it is chicken breast. And? Crocta looked down at him and asked, What else did you eat? The man lowered his head. Then he spoke in a small voice, Boiled sweet potato. The people were shocked, but Crocta didn't stop there. Quack. What else did you eat? Cabbage salad with tomatoes and blackberries. Sweet potatoes, cabbages, tomatoes, and blackberries. He didn't hate vegetables. As a man who loved physical beauty, he knew the importance of a balanced diet. He used his body to be hired by Arnold's butchery, deceiving people for publicity in preaching false beliefs. However, before Crocta's questioning and doubts, he had to tell the truth. That's right. Say it again. Do vegetables not matter? Vegetables. Crocta urged him on, aren't they really important? The man decided to admit defeat. He couldn't fool himself any longer. They are important. He finally revealed his heart. Vegetables they were important. The man's head drooped down. It was a declaration of defeat. Clap. 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 The people watching the spectacle started to clap and chant Crocta's name. Crocta had preserved the honor of vegetables. The man looked down with shame. He was embarrassed about deceiving himself for money. Since this happened, he wouldn't be paid by Arnold anymore. The man had become someone who didn't have money nor honor. He fell into shame. Suddenly, a thick hand grabbed his shoulder. It was Crocta. Crocta spoke with a merciful face, hey. It was a joke. You have very nice muscles. The man looked at Crocta with quivering eyes. Crocta's expression was warm as he genuinely admired the man's body. I previously called you inflatable muscles. I said I didn't need vegetables. Crocta showed off his tough biceps and said, next time, let's lift weights together. The man received Crocta's recognition. Crocta recognized the time and effort had put into building his muscles. The man was filled with great emotions, and he touched his nose, shrugging in a show of bravado. My training is harsh. It is hell training. Right. That is natural. You must overcome hard times. The man was overwhelmed. They weren't just comforting words because Crocta truly understood. Crocta reached out his hand, and the man responded. The two men embraced. The two muscular men forgave each other's mistakes. Then people flocked to the vegetable store. The vegetable store was recognized by Crocta. Having a healthy body which could live a long time was people's dream. The people who saw such a future bought the vegetables from this store. Like this, the vegetable store became well known because of Crocta. The muscle man restored his courage and spoke to Tio, who was standing quietly beside Crocta. Tio as well. You should buy some vegetables. How can you accompany Crocta with a body like that? Kelkokel. Kokokel, Kokokel. Crocta laughed together with the man. Tio frowned. What did you say? Dot? You should gain some muscles. Kelkokel. That's right. Kokokokel. 
Kelko Kel. The two muscular men laughed at Tio, while Tio's eyebrows twitched. His gnome's pride couldn't allow this. Tio jumped forward. Achoo. He spun like a spinning top and kicked. They were lightning fast strikes aimed at Crocta's and the man's jaws. Crocta barely escaped, but the man failed and was hit in the jaw. It was only a light hit, but the man swayed and sat down. The man couldn't easily recover from the damage and sat for a while. Ah. Look, inflatable muscles. Dot. This is the truly ultimate compression muscle. Dot. Tio took off his top. And his upper body was revealed. His body contained tight muscles, with no signs of fat anywhere. It was reminiscent of Bruce Lee. While wearing clothes, he looked like a child, but once they were thrown off, dense and compact muscles were revealed. It was a perfect and slim figure that wasn't lacking in anything. This. Beautiful. People admired him. The vegetable seller also clapped. Watching Tio, I am reminded of a gnome that I knew before. What dot? There was another wonderful gnome dot. That's right. The gnome loved eating spinach when he stayed in Catalu. His body was as dazzling as Tio's. The vegetable seller's gaze became distant. His name was Heder. A cool gnome. Heder. Crocta and Tio's eyes widened. Heder. It was Tio's father, whom they were looking for. They got a clue about Heder at the vegetable store. Crocta's popularity meant there were fans and followers tracking his every move. The movements were often ordinary, but Crocta didn't avoid or tell them off. This was the reason why. You came because you want a nice body. Yes. Beck Hanho was troubled as the number of people joining his gym increased. More members was a good thing. However, most of them said strange things during the first consultation. Beck Hanho looked at the form submitted by the applicants and sighed. Yes, I would like the same ultimate muscles as Tio. That's right. There is someone who wants muscles like Crocta. Yes. I want to become stronger like Crocta. The three men sitting side by side looked at Beck Hanho with firm eyes. The remaining silent person suddenly said, I want to be like the butcher shop meat man. I don't have unrealistic goals like them. The man who interfered with the vegetable seller's business was known on the internet as the butcher shop meat man. His meat praising character was surprisingly popular, and there were those who started exercising with the goal of being like him. The new muscular craze. Crocta's popularity led to trends in reality. Beck Hanho hit his forehead with his pen. He thought for a moment before opening his mouth. HRMM what about a body like Andres? Andre? They shook their heads in unison. Aish. What is Andre? He is too strange. Crocta is the trend. Andre, yuck. Beck Hanho nodded. Right. Today, let's start straight away. Change your clothes. Huh. We were going to start tomorrow. I have an appointment. Shut up. He who lives for tomorrow won't be able to defeat his enemies today. Take it off right now. Beck Hanho's eyes blazed passionately. He'll make those bodies through hell training. Chapter, 180. Thanks to Crocta, the vegetable seller finished early and invited them inside the store. They were seated to have a meal. The vegetable seller told them to wait and left for a while. Then he soon returned carrying a large pot. It was vegetable stew. The flavor of the broth was abundant. There was some meat included, but it was mainly made of vegetables. Crocta and Tio originally enjoyed meat, but their spoons moved quickly due to the delicious taste of the vegetables. By the way, why is he sitting here? Hum hum, you shouldn't hold grudges. A man who interferes in business is shameless. Dot. It is a thing of the past. Kelko Kel. The man who promoted the Arnold's butchery was also with them. The vegetable seller just laughed at their argument and replied, Vegetables are from the ground, from Mother Nature. A mother doesn't discriminate against her children. His warm words caused the gaze in Crocta's and Tio's eyes to grow colder. The muscular man had actually tried to harass such a good person. 
The macho man scratched his head and avoided their gazes. The vegetable seller didn't care and gave him plenty of vegetable soup. At any rate, I am surprised that Tio is Heather's son. This is a faded relationship. When did you see my father? Dot? It was a year ago. It has been a long time. Dot. Heather was looking for sewing. That's right. Dot. Tio nodded. Heather had an explorer's temperament and always sought new things. It wasn't strange that he was pursuing interesting things. However, from Quants to the north, the north to the south, and then somewhere else, what was keeping him so busy? What was it? Dot? I don't know the details, but it seemed to be a relic of the gods. The gods. When talking about the gods, things like the Grey God and the World Tree popped into Crocta's mind. They were powerful existences with divine power. Crocta had first met the Grey God in the Temple of the Fallen Gods. It could be inferred that it was possible to meet a god in a place associated with them. Then was Heder looking for some ruins to meet the gods. He came periodically to buy vegetables. He was good at self-management. He came periodically. Dot. It means he stayed here for a while. That's right. He stayed for a few months. Where did he go? Dot. Maybe the temple. Temple. Catalu has a temple. Dot. Yes. It is more like a memorial than a temple, but. The muscular man spoke from the side, that's correct. It is a temple but not a temple. A temple but not a temple. Dot. Yes, it's a memorial place. The muscular man and the vegetable seller were natives of Catalu, so they both knew the place. Crocta and Tio exchanged glances and nodded. Are you leaving straight away? No. No. Dot. Crocta and Tio replied at the same time. If it is possible, I would like one more bowl. I will eat before going. Dot. This is delicious. Crocta and Tio arrived at the temple the vegetable seller had described. It was a small building on the outskirts of the city. Although this was their first time seeing it, it felt familiar to Crocta. The building's appearance was similar to the temple of the fallen god. Crocta felt that this was somehow associated with the grey god. Why is that guy here? Dot? Tio said. Aner was standing there. The tan skin made it obvious that he was the dark elf, Aner. There was no doubt that he was moving back and forth. He now had the dark energy of a necromancer around his body. Hey, Aner. What are you doing? Dot? Eh. Aner found them and waved happily. What are you doing here? Didn't you go to the market? Sewing happened. Dot. What about you? Aner had definitely declared that he would rest all day at the inn. What, did you make a promise to meet a beautiful woman? Dot? Ha ha ha. No. I just felt sewing from here. Aner pointed to the temple. The lights were off, and it was completely dark inside. A familiar aura I feel sewing like that. Ho Tio touched his chin. It seems like a very unpleasant place. Dot. They approached the temple and opened the door. It was dark, but as soon as they entered, the lights came on as if it sensed their movements. There was a long corridor. Is anyone here? Crocta called out. His voice echoed down the hallway. He heard there was someone managing this hallway, so where were they? Suddenly, they reached the end of the corridor. There was one more door. Crocta hesitated, but Tio opened the door without hesitation. Kikik. The door opened and there was a woman sitting down. No dot. What a surprise. The woman didn't move from the noise. It was only the rear view, but she showed a holy appearance. The inner murals surrounding her created a strange atmosphere, somewhat like the one in the Temple of the Fallen God. They made a lot of noise on their way in, but the woman was still in her own world, completely motionless. Crocta's group stood in the doorway and watched her for a while. After some time, the woman started to slowly rise. Ack. At that moment, the woman stumbled. It seemed that she had been sitting for a long time. She frowned and twisted on the ground, groaning. Crocta withdrew his previous assessment. She wasn't a sacred being, just a person. The woman finally got up. Phew, I thought I was going to die. 
Then she spoke to Krokta's party, Welcome. I'm sorry for the delay. You must been waiting for a long time. Krokta greeted her. No. We didn't want to interfere in your praying. Huh? Praying? She asked. You weren't praying. Then you were just sitting there. Oh, I was doing yoga and got a cramp. She clapped and the interior lit up a bit more. This. Isn't it amazing? A friend of mine made it. Tio was convinced that her friend was Heather as this was magic engineering. Oh, my. She saw Tio and suddenly covered her mouth. It was an expression of enlightenment. Perhaps. That's right. Dot. Tio nodded. I am Heather's son, Tio. Unbelievable she looked down at Tio with admiration. You look very similar. Do you know my father? Dot? Of course. You have the same rude way of talking. What dot? Haha, <laughs> I'm just joking. Krokta explained on behalf of the shocked Tio. We are looking for Heather. Do you know anything about him? He had to leave please follow me. She guided them somewhere. It was a small sitting room. The woman brought out some tea. She nodded after they explained their purpose for coming here. The woman did indeed know about Heather. He's a curious person and was investigating a god who is no longer in this world. The fallen god. Gosh, you already know. That's right. That is what she is called. Krokta gulped at the words. Strangely, the grey god was mentioned again here. Since Krokta's assimilation reached 100, the grey god no longer talked to him, and he didn't receive any system messages. What did the grey god really want, and what was Heather looking for? Then is this the temple of the fallen god? Krokta asked. She shook her head. No. The temple of the fallen god no longer exists. They are all in ruins. There was a temple in the north, but she didn't know about it. Additionally, this place isn't strictly a temple. Then? It is a memorial place. For what? And you? I her answer was unexpected. I am Eliza, a follower of the Goddess of Mercy. The Goddess of Mercy? Eliza smiled. I came here following the Goddess of Mercy's will, in order to remember a species that has now disappeared from the continent. A species that has disappeared from the continent. Tio was confused. He didn't seem to know. A very long time ago, there was a species that followed the fallen god before she fell. They had a strong and mysterious power that was different from other species. Mysterious power? Yes, I don't know exactly, but it is said that the other species were afraid because of the unknown power. Then the fallen god suddenly went crazy and was captivated by the strange idea of destroying the world. Eliza sighed. The species kept following her, despite her desire to destroy the world, and all the gods and species united to stop the fallen god. The orcs, humans, dwarves, elves, and gnomes confronted them. It is the first time I've heard this story. Dot. It is a story that the records have erased. Anyway, the power of the other gods combined, and she crashed, becoming a fallen god. The grey god was the god who had fallen. Krokta asked, that species? Unfortunately, they suffered the same fate as the fallen god. They all died. Some are said to be alive, but I don't know if this is true or not. Suddenly, Krokta's waist started itching. Krokta lowered his head and saw that the steel belt at his waist seemed to be shaking strangely. The goddess of mercy was saddened by the fate of the species that followed the fallen god and made a memorial for them. This is the place. It is a sad but interesting story. But there is a positive aspect in that all the species join together. The species will work together when there is a crisis. Krokta fell into deep thought as he listened to the story. The fallen god was clearly the grey god. That meant the creation of Elder Lord was an extension of that ambition. She still wanted to destroy the world. Krokta, who had met her in person, had difficulty thinking about her as such a dangerous being. He hadn't gotten any bad feelings from her. So, what was her reason for wanting such an ending? Tio asked, so, where did my father go? 
he received information that the trail of the fallen god is in the west. Tack tack tack. Suddenly, the footsteps were heard coming from outside. I will leave you with those words please excuse me. Come in. The door opened, and a man looked at Eliza. He was holding an envelope in his hand. Eliza. There is a letter. It seems to be urgent. Thank you. Eliza accepted it. Then the man bowed and left the temple. He seemed to be the mailman. This please wait a moment. She checked the outside of the envelope, immediately tore it open, and then checked the contents. Her eyes gradually widened. She frowned like she couldn't understand it. Her eyes shook as she read it again a few times. Eliza looked at Crocta with an intense gaze. Crocta. What happened? She bit her lips and spoke again. Um and Tio. What dot? The dark elf as well. I am Aner. Yes, Aner. Eliza continued, Heather told me he was going to Geharad, which is to the northwest of Catalu. You should go quickly. Geharad? Yes. He said he would stay there for a while, so you should rush in order to not miss him. Then it is better to go quickly. Tio looked at Crocta and Aner. We are accompanying you. There is no need to ask. They nodded at each other. As they were companions, it was natural for them to accompany Tio. Tio raised a fist. Good dot. Let's start straight away. Now. Indeed dot. Catalu is safe, so we don't have to wait any longer dot. But I wanted to take a break. You can do it tomorrow dot. Live today. Tio declared. So, Crocta, Tio, and Aner headed for Geharad. After thanking Eliza, they hastily escaped the Templeno, the memorial place for the disappeared species. Eliza sighed as they left. Did she do the right thing? She looked at the letter again. A divine message had come down to the temple. The contents were hostile towards the orcs and Crocta's party. There were several things which didn't seem usual for the Goddess of Mercy. As a follower of the Goddess of Mercy, she shouldn't have let them go. She should have tricked them into going to a dangerous place or drugged them. Instead, she sent them to a safe place. Geharad was a harsh place, but it was also isolated from other species and temples. If the contents of the message were true, Geharad was the best place for them. It was a hard choice for her. However, Crocta was the hero who saved Catalu, and Tio he was Heder's son. Eliza closed her eyes as she thought of Heder. He was a gnome who always laughed cheerfully and had helped Eliza, a novice who had been sent to the outside world alone. His optimistic attitude had left a big impression on her. The facilities inside the temple had also been provided by Heder. Ha Eliza sighed. Her chest felt heavy at the thought of disobeying the goddess. Heder's son, Tio, was following him. Tio might resent Heder, but today, Heder had saved his party. If it wasn't for Heder, she might deceive them. She looked at the letter again. This was written. Make the orcs a forgotten species. It wasn't like the goddess of mercy. If a divine message had come down, that meant sowing was happening. The kingdom had become an empire, and the goddess of mercy passed on a strange message. Everything was becoming strange. Eliza prayed for the world. Chapter 181. Crocta informed Guardi, the leader of Catalu, and quietly escaped the city. It was to get rid of the fans and users following them. It is like going back to the beginning. Hoo, I think so as well. Crocta headed north to find the Temple of the Fallen God, while Tio wanted to find his father. It was the beginning of destiny. Head met Aner there, fought the great chieftain, and eventually conquered the north. Next was the south. Head met in a last night there and learned about the empire's ambitions. Then he rescued the city from an army. They had been through many things. Now, they were heading on a new path. Their goal was the west. It contained the magnificent Orcrox and Basque, as well as the mountain cities of the Orcs. There were a wide variety of Orcs present in unknown territory on the continent. Beyond that was Geharad. Geharad was the ancient word for last fire. The last fire, 
Is it an incredibly hot place? TSK. Think about it. It would be sewing figurative. What do you think when you hear last fire? Heat. Not that. Um, passion. A place where passionate people live. They walked for a long time after leaving Catalu. After heading northeast from Catalu, a great forest appeared. From there, it was a long march to Geharad. I see it. There was a small village at the entrance of the forest. It was commonly known as the resting area. Be careful. I heard rumors that the prices are expensive. It's okay. Crocta is rich. Indeed, there is a saying that a friend's money is our money. It is the first time I've heard that. The great forest was a rough place. However, there were adventures, treasures, and magic hidden throughout. There was also a city like Geharad, where mysterious species lived. That's why adventurers who wanted to enter the forest stayed at this village for a while. They could gain equipment, information, and companions from the village. The Great Forest was a tough place, so it was advantageous to have as many people as possible. There were adventurers shaking placards at the entrance of the village. Recruiting people to explore Darun and Dungeon. Looking for people to hunt trolls. Looking for an adventurer to accompany me to Siru Academy. Looking for people with courage. They were all gathering people. Many showed interest in Crocta's party. There was a dignified orc warrior, a gnome with a mysterious artifact, and an unknown hooded person, who gave off dark energy. They seemed strong and full. The adventurers waved their placards towards the party with eager eyes. Everyone was preparing to enter the forest for various purposes. Crocta's party didn't respond and headed straight into the village. There were inns, restaurants, and equipment stores all over. Houses for residential purposes were rare. In other words, most of the villagers were wanderers. We will stay the day and head off tomorrow. Good dot. They didn't need another party member, so they headed straight to an inn. It cost a lot to stay for just one day. Then at that moment, a man holding a placard was staring at them from the entrance to the inn. A bearded dwarf. He looked at Tio, who was a similar height to him, and then at Aner and Crocta. Then he moved his placard closer. Geharad. There was only a brief description of his destination. He was already confident they were going to the same place after hearing the conversation that went on within Crocta's group. However, his shabby appearance didn't fit that of a dwarf. Tio and Aner shook their heads, while Crocta avoided eye contact. They ignored him and tried to enter the inn. Then the dwarf opened his mouth to say, Going to Geharad will be useless. Crocta's party stopped walking. The dwarf said, The one you are looking for isn't there. Crocta looked at the dwarf. He seemed to already know the purpose of Crocta's group. Perhaps he knew about Heder. Crocta asked, What are you talking about? Do you know Heder? Heder? The dwarf was confused. It is the first time I've heard that name. I don't know who he is, but he won't be enough. The momentary conversation paused. What was the dwarf talking about? Crocta's group looked at each other. Sewing was strange. Crocta spoke again, you said that you know why we are going to Geharad. Of course. What do you think the reason is? Um. The dwarf seemed to have noticed sewing was strange as he pointed to Crocta. Aren't you going to fix that? What are you talking about? Fix. You are heading to Geharad without knowing anything. The dwarf sighed. Foolish warrior. What are you saying? Please explain. Tio tugged at Crocta and Aner's sleeves. Ignore him. Dot. He is just a weird dwarf, a crazy dwarf. My mind is fine, known with an undignified expression. What dot? Crazy dwarf. Aner gently stopped Tio. The dwarf sighed, you really don't know anything. Warrior. Listen carefully. He pointed to Ogre Slayer on Crocta's back. Your weapon is on the brink of breaking. Crocta's eyes widened. Then he reflexively grabbed the handle of Ogre Slayer. It felt heavy in his hands. That dwarf said that Ogre Slayer was on the verge of breaking down. 
There was a problem with the work of the Golden Anvil clan. Crocta couldn't believe it. You are a great warrior. I can feel it. You might become stronger through many battlefields, but the sword has continued to be damaged. He had a point. Ever since Crocta received this as a gift from Thompson in a nail, he hadn't changed weapons even once. In the meantime, he had dealt with countless monsters and enemies. A conventional weapon would have already been destroyed. However, Crocta had always taken care of Ogre Slayer and brought it to blacksmiths. Yet a shabby dwarf was saying this to him out of nowhere, so he couldn't accept it. I entrusted it to a blacksmith every time a fight ended. Yes, you left it to a blacksmith. That is the problem. How come? An ordinary blacksmith can't handle Ogre Slayer. Crocta's eyes widened. This dwarf knew that the great sword was named Ogre Slayer. Who are you? Crocta held Ogre Slayer. The dwarf nodded fearlessly at the blade which Crocta held. There was a faint smile on his face. I am a craftsman of the Golden Anvil Clan, Sekiro. He was a member of the Golden Anvil Clan. However, this wasn't the end. I am the one who created Ogre Slayer, the Slayer Maker. Your Majesty. This divine message is strange. Duke Christian said. He was the one who had caused the Emperor to become close to the Heaven and Earth Clan. He was also the one with the greatest power in the Empire, maybe even more than the Emperor. The kingdom could become an empire due to Duke Christian manipulating it from behind. After the Heaven and Earth Clan disappeared, Duke Christian rarely left his estate. However, he came to a canter after hearing news about the divine message. Please think carefully. I followed your cautious words and lost most of the troops. A canter said sarcastically. However, Christian wasn't agitated. It was your majesty's choice to strike Crocta. Are you really saying that? Isn't it? Christian shot back. Emperor Acanter the only person able to question him was Duke Christian. Acanter's lips twisted as he smiled, yes, let's say that. I believe you understand my point. So, I should refuse the temples. The empire isn't a place ruled by the gods. It is only your majesty who can decide on war. You speak well. I have always been loyal. Please listen to me, your majesty. So, what is wrong with this? I don't know about matters regarding the gods. But this is an opportunity to get rid of Crocta who insulted the empire, as well as the dirty orcs. Does the duke think otherwise? Christian closed his eyes. Of course, it was a tempting offer. In addition to the empire, all the species on the continent, including the elves and dwarves, had received this divine message. If they joined together, they could destroy the orcs without much damage. If Crocta was Ed, the Empire's fallen honor would be rebuilt. However, they needed to be careful. Mogsalin was at the fight on the plains. I heard he was watching from a distance. Mogsalin was the magician who had stopped Crocta and saved Keynes. He was the genius who was the most powerful magician in the Empire, and Duke Christian's most beloved follower. He can borrow the power of the gods. Therefore, he has a great deal of knowledge about the gods. A magician who can borrow the power of the gods. He has the ability to interact with them. Anyway, he felt sowing at that time and learned that the gods were watching Crocta. Mogsalan had sensed a power that shouldn't be present in Crocta. That is why the gods are trying to Crocta and the orcs. What is that power? The power of the fallen god. It is the first time I've heard of it. It is dangerous. We must be cautious as long as the power of the fallen god is involved. She is the worst being who drove the world to the brink of destruction. Christian gazed at Acanter with serious eyes. Acanter sighed. Christian was the real power of the empire. Simultaneously, he was his mother's brother, or in other words, his uncle. His strength was manipulation, but sometimes he gave sincere advice. Then shouldn't we do sowing before the situation worsens? We will have no obligation to. Isn't the world in danger because of Crocta and the orcs? Your majesty is still pure. Christian laughed. Acanter's face distorted. It doesn't matter if it is dangerous. 
the orcs live in the northwest of the continent. The elves, dwarves, and gnomes will receive the damage first. Then when the time comes, the gods will come out in person. They leave troublesome things to the mortals, but once the damage is too large, they will use their power. A canter nodded. The gods it seems like a distant story. They are insignificant. They are merely mighty beings who call themselves gods and follow their own desires. So, you're saying we don't need to exhaust our strength and should just watch. If nothing happens, it is good. If the other species are damaged, it is beneficial to us. That's right. Christian looked at a canter with gentle eyes. Keep this in mind. There is no joint responsibility in this world. A battle is divided between the loser and the winner. In this case, there is no loss from not participating. I understand. A canter nodded. Once Christian thought the emperor was convinced, he bowed and left the room. Now that a canter was alone, he rubbed his chin. Christian's words made sense. However, it was clear that Christian had failed to grasp the power of the gods. The gods weren't so convenient to deal with. A canter muttered, I wish it was that easy. Chapter, 182 Crocta wondered why a member of the Golden Anvil clan would be standing here like this, but he didn't dare ask. Tio released his frustration as he asked, Then why are you begging here? I'm not begging, you gnome son of A. Do you want to experience my fist? Two short people with a similar height growled at each other. Zakiro was bigger than the gnome, but Tio didn't budge one bit. Zakiro stared at Tio before looking towards Crocta and saying, At any rate, Warrior, if you continue to use Ogre Slayer like this, it will break one day. Since it seems like you have been using it for a long time, it is good to get a new weapon, which is fine. Crocta looked at Ogre Slayer. It was a weapon that fit his hands. The shape, the center of gravity, the familiar pressure in his hands, everything about Ogre Slayer was the best. But no matter how close it was to him, it was unavoidable if its retirement time was approaching. He was willing to let it go. Crocta nodded and said, Thank you. I will get a new weapon. New wine should be put in a new bottle. I'm envious. Dot. My general is so strong that I can't change it. Crocta's group congratulated him. To them, equipment was disposable. Everyone received new and better equipment as time passed. Crocta's heart pounded as he anticipated the new weapon. Hoo-hoo, let's design a better weapon this time. As they tried to enter the inn with bright faces. Zakiro hurriedly blocked them again as he said, No, warrior. That weapon, don't you have any affection for it? How can you just throw Ogre Slayer away? A sword is just a sword, what are you talking about? It is reasonable to let it go when the time comes. You shouldn't be like this. Ogre Slayer will be sad. I'm not a pampered person who personifies tools, Zakiro. Crocta puffed up his chest and proclaimed, Zakiro, keep this in mind. A weapon is a weapon, people are people. Don't give too much meaning to lifeless things. It is a fleeting impression. A warrior doesn't blame the tool or use it as an excuse. It was a hard mindset of practical materialism. Only those who are weak care about such meaningless superstitions. Crocta didn't believe in superstitions. When he was a soldier, he saw many people giving meaning to minor things. They would tremble in fear, saying someone was cursed. This fear was a self-fulfilling prophecy, leading many people to a tragedy. So he didn't believe in such things. A sword was a sword. He only believed in himself during battle. Like these a warrior with no romance. Don't worry. Many of those romantic warriors have already died at my hands, and they met their weapon friends in the afterlife. Cough. Sekiro dropped his head. My sword is in the hands of such a heartless orc. Kulko, didn't you hear it from Thompson? At the time, Thompson had a deal with the Golden Anvil clan. Sekiro might be Thompson's friend. I make weapons but I don't care who uses them. It is my philosophy. Then you didn't know who I was. Sekiro looked at Kraka and laughed. An orc warrior is holding my weapon, that is all I know. I am called the Slayer Maker. 
There are many warriors who want my sword. I can't afford to remember them one by one. He appeared to have his own pride as a craftsman. Crocta nodded, I see. It had nothing to do with him. Anyway, it was good to meet you. Then in going. Wait. Why do you keep blocking me? Now Sekiro was very close to the inn's door as he blocked them. Anyway, this is the relationship between us so I will accompany you to Geharad. We don't need company. Warrior, are you thinking of making your own weapon? Sekiro looked at him with sad eyes. I didn't know you were so cold-blooded to have no affection for your weapon. I made the weapon for you and Thompson without any consideration. I heard it was in return for saving your life. So. Instead of the production cost. The debt will be cleared if you accompany me to Geharad. Sekiro was trying to get to Geharad at all cost. Krokta looked at Tio and Aner in turn. Tio's face was saying absolutely not while Aner had no thoughts. Do you know the way to Geharad? Sekiro asked. There is a map. A map isn't enough when trying to get through the great forest. You guys don't know anything about Geharad. Do you know why Geharad is called Geharad? I know. It means the last fire. What is the last fire? I don't know. Look. You don't know anything. I will guide you. HRMM. Krokta nodded. He heard there was only one road but due to the danger zones in the forest, it could be hard to find another city. Krokta replied, I understand. Then tomorrow, meet here. Cough, I should stay here with you today. The value of your weapon. Thus, Krokta was accompanied by Zakiro, the craftsman of the Golden Anvil clan who made his sword. They left early. The route to Geharad required going through several rough areas. The first thing they encountered were goblins. Goblins. Um. Krokta and Teo had goblins friends so they looked uncomfortable. The goblins didn't know who their opponent was and were mocking Krokta with their typical sneering faces. One of them showed his ass and laughed. Krokta held down his rising anger and said, Hey, goblin friends. The goblins understood the language to a certain extent, so they listened to Krokta's voice. We don't want to fight, so can't you just let us go? The goblins looked at each other. They discussed sewing and nodded. They started talking. Kayak kayak. Kayak. One goblin stepped forward. It was the one who laughed at them and shook his ass. He bowed like he was apologizing for his rudeness. Krokta laughed, hoo hoo. It is okay, goblin friend. You are trying to make a living. The goblin put his hand in his pocket. Was he planning to give an apology gift? Krokta watched him. The goblin pulled out sewing from his pocket. He pushed it towards Krokta. It was nothing other than his own middle finger. Against his expectations, it wasn't a gift but an insult. Krokta's face stiffened while the goblin's laugh became louder. Kayak kayak kayak. Kayak. Kiak kiak. Kayak. Kia kia kayak. Kayak. The goblins laughed and pointed towards Krokta. Then they looked around with hateful expressions. Krokta decided to forget about friendship with the goblins. Ogre Slayer shook. Kayak. The goblins felt a breeze pass by their cheeks. Patter. Then a hot liquid was splattered on their bodies. The goblins, who were pointing at each other and laughing at Krokta, turned their heads with blank faces. A goblin's head and body had been split apart. It was his blood that had splattered. The goblins stepped back in surprise. The confused goblins started to swing their shabby weapons towards Krokta. But the opponent was Krokta. He dealt with an army of the Empire's elite knights alone, so the goblins couldn't hit him. Every time the great sword moved, a goblin would fall to the ground. The surroundings soon became filled with blood. An overwhelming slaughter. Ho! Sekiro watched from behind and nodded. The warrior was stronger than he thought. He wasn't aware of a warrior's SS since he made weapons all day long in the Golden Anvil clan's workshop, but this orc warrior clearly had a great talent. Ogre Slayer danced playfully in his hands. Not bad. 
It was a strange feeling. His sword was showing its worth in the hands of a great warrior. His only goal when hammering metal was the finished weapon. He never thought about what his weapons would be used for once they left his possession. He thought that other craftsmen who were strict about the owners were stupid. But now he could understand to a certain extent. How sad would it be if his sword was in the hands of a fool? Beautiful. Now Crocta had taken care of most of the goblins. The one remaining goblin trembled as he sat down and bowed to Crocta. Then he bumped his head against the ground, asking for forgiveness. Kayakyak. The goblin left his forehead on the ground as he begged for mercy. The great sword descended above his head. The goblin's head was cut off. That stinger in your mouth won't work. The goblin's head had a small pipe in it, its favorite stinger. These goblins Kyo is much better dot. He is someone who transcended beyond the limits of his species. Tio shook his head as he remembered Kyo, the goblin who used spatio-temporal storm arrows at Gashantamur's lair. Then Krokta spoke to the stupefied dwarf, Zakiro. Let's keep going. Ha. Huh. Um. Zakiro regained his mind. Aner prayed for the dead. An unknown power flowed from his hands. It was the power of the necromancer to scatter the spirits of the dead. Enter Nirvana. Zakiro looked at Aner while moving after Krokta. He thought Aner was a magician or elementalist, but he was a necromancer. It was a class that he didn't often see. A powerful warrior and a necromancer. What are you going dot? Keep going. And a noisy gnome. It was a strange combination. After repelling the goblins, they soon came across new enemies. This time it was a troll encounter, with three trolls drooling as they surrounded the group. Should I show my SS this time? Tio grinned while placing General on his shoulder. It was the appearance of a small gnome walking towards three trolls. Sekiro glanced at Krokta, Warrior, is it okay? That gnome. Watch. Koko. Once the fight started, Tio fired General indiscriminately. Zakiro thought it was a rifle made of magic engineering, but its shape changed and it emitted a lot of energy. The trolls couldn't get close and were hit by the bullets. That is an artifact. It is said to be a dragon's legacy. Indeed. General was a dragon slayer weapon. The artifact that grew with the user was now exercising the power of its name. Now that Tio's strength had increased further, the magic bullets could penetrate the troll's thick skin. Aak. Cool. They tried to repair the injured areas, but General was currently in the form of Vulcan. The trolls ended up riddled with bullets. Sekiro revised his assessment of Krokta's group. They weren't adventurers but real powerhouses. This thought reached its climax when the party met a group of ogres. Ogres are easy opponents. The territory of the ogres was often called the Tomb of Adventurers. They were monstrous and challenging opponents. Adventurers either escaped or die. However, Krokta easily took care of such huge monsters. As the name suggested, he slaughtered the ogres with Ogre Slayer. The ogres screamed but the result was the same. The forest turned red every time he wielded it. Krokta moved beautifully in the heavy rain of blood, dancing with his sword. It was an organic swordsmanship that combined attack and defense. Not long after that, all the ogres died. Krokta grinned at Sekiro, how is it, my SS? Sekiro nodded. Amazing. Really. When he first got the blueprints for a really big sword, he wondered if the owner could even deal with an ogre. He made the sword anyway. But he changing his mind after meeting the owner of Ogre Slayer. He was wrong. Ogres weren't a match for this warrior. I did well to follow. He formed a fist. He wanted to pound on iron right now. Chapter, 183 It had been several days since Krokta's party entered the great forest with Sekiro. The road was long and the terrain steep. If Sekiro hadn't been with them, they would have gotten lost several times. There were obstacles scattered all over the map. This is your cue, Aner. Scary I don't want to look. You are the scariest person here. Raise your bones. Understood. 
Aina used his necromancy to defeat the monsters. In the Great Forest, they fought monsters several times a day. As a result of such hardships, they were able to find a huge wall standing in the lush forest. It was the Black Barrier which was the symbol of Geharad. They stood at the entrance. Orc, Dark Elf, Gnome, and Dwarf. How strange! The guards' eyes widened at the appearance of such unique group. The guards themselves were a mixture of humans and dwarves. Yes, so what did you come for? To look for a poor pilgrimage. Sekiro interrupted Tio. We came to worship the last fire. Ho, oh, I see. The dwarf guards nodded. Are you a blacksmith? Yes. Do you intend to enter the last forge? If it is possible. Good luck. He chuckled. Crocta, Tio, and Aner, who didn't know what the last fire or last forge was, just stood in the rear. Good luck. You can enter. The passage was clear. Just like the walls, Geharad's buildings were made of black soil. The entire city looked like it was covered in coal. The scale of the city wasn't that big. After all, it would be difficult to maintain a large city in the Great Forest. Most of the inhabitants were dwarves and humans, while other species were occasionally seen. However, a large building at the center of the city stood out. That is the resting place of the last fire. What is the last fire? Dot? Coming to Geharad without even knowing Zakiro laughed. The last fire literally means a fire that will remain until the end of the world. What is the longest lasting fire in the world? The world's longest lasting fire. Tio thought about it. He rolled his eyes as he tried to think of the answer. Let's see. Over there. Sekiro pointed to the sky. The sun that illuminated the world. Tio's face brightened as he squinted at it. The sun dot. That's right. Strictly speaking, the sun god. It is the first time I've heard of the sun god dot. He was originally a great god, but now he is said to be in a deep sleep. I don't know the situation of the gods, but the sun is still burning, so he hasn't completely disappeared. Geharad's last fire was a remnant of the sun god, and the large building at the center of Geharad was the temple of the sun. Originally, the gods revealed their existence by helping out or passing on divine messages. However, the sun god didn't do that. It was said that the sun god had fallen into a long sleep. Then what is the last forge? Sekiro grinned at Crocta's question. It is literally the last forge. If the sun is the longest fire in the world, then the last forge is the place that will hold it. There is a forge like that. That's right. Most people come to Geharad for that purpose. In the place where the last fire is gathered, I want to borrow the best heat to create a masterpiece. It is the holy place of the blacksmiths. So, that's why you tried to come here. Crocta's group came to find Tio's father, but Sekiro had such a situation. Well, I have now arrived. Thank you for helping me get here. Sekiro said goodbye to them. He only accompanied them here, so it was now time to separate. Crocta nodded and extended his fist. Sekiro smiled and bumped his fist against Crocta's. It was the first time he had used an orc gesture, but it didn't feel bad. Bolter. I am alive. Um. He also said goodbye to Tio and Aina. Then just before he moved away, Sekiro asked Crocta. Warrior. I heard your name is Crocta. He had learned this fact while accompanying them here. The name of the orc, who he had thought was just a said warrior, was actually Crocta. Sekiro confirmed again, the northern conqueror, Crocta. Crocta grinned. Correct. I am northern conqueror Crocta. Sekiro nodded. That's right. It was an honor. Then he turned away. Sekiro headed straight to the temple of the sun god, the place where the last fire was kept. In the black temple, a sharp spire stood out that pointed towards the sun. Northern conqueror Crocta is using my sword. It wasn't a bad feeling. Crocta's reputation was great enough that Sekiro had heard it even back when he didn't leave his clan smithy. Crocta wasn't just strong. He also maintained the faith. Not only had he performed various activities on the continent, 
he had also punished the crazy chieftain and blocked the ambition of the empire. Moreover, it had been done with Sekiro's sword, Ogre Slayer. It felt wonderful. However, that wasn't the only reason why Krokta's name was engraved in his mind. Krokta would be in crisis in the near future. They were enemies who couldn't be compared to the opponents Krokta had faced previously. The Fickle Gods Despite all the work Krokta had done, the gods had sent a divine message pointing to Krokta's death. It said to destroy Krokta and his orc kin. The dwarves in Zakiro's hometown hurried. It was a divine message which involved the fate of the entire continent. As long as the gods targeted Krokta, a harsh future would follow. To overcome such hardships, the sword ogre slayer wasn't appropriate. The ending was obvious. Zakiro worried about it for a moment before shrugging it off. I don't care. He was a blacksmith, and his mission was to create a weapon. Sekiro was merely a craftsman aiming to complete the best work. It was none of his business, even if the warrior who held his sword would eventually die because of the gods. Sekiro stood in front of the temple and blocked everything out. Let's see it once, the last fire. The only thing important to him now was the last forge. After separating from Sekiro, Krokta's party explored the city for traces of Heder. They asked if anyone knew a gnome called Heder, but there were no answers. Some people remembered small gnomes but didn't know much about them. In the end, the sun set. That's it for today. Krokta stated. He was hungry and tired. We should go to the Temple of the Sun God as our final destination today. There might be a clue there. I think so as well. Okay. Let's go quickly. They headed to the black building at the center of Geharad. As Sekiro said, all visitors to Geharad were aiming for the Temple of the Sun God and the Last Fire. Therefore, it was like a bustling tourist destination. Hot air blew out as they entered. Heat dot. Ah, I guess it is the Temple of the Sun God. Are you okay dot? Isn't a necromancer weak to light? The sun isn't hurting you. No. The temple contained a place for worship, and at the center, there was an altar which looked like a huge furnace. The heat was flowing from there. Worshippers bowed their heads towards it and prayed. There were various species present. There were warriors like Krokta, magicians, and ordinary people who didn't know how to fight. They all prayed to the last fire in the altar at the center of the temple. Isn't it wonderful? A voice rang out. A dwarf in white clothing was standing beside them. He smiled gently and said. The sun god has been gone for a long time. He can only be found in the history books. The last fire is the only thing left from him. But people still haven't forgotten the sun god, so they come here and pray. Why? He was a priest here. Crocta replied, well is it because of the last forge? Your answer isn't wrong. But my own answer. The priest pointed to the ceiling of the temple. It is the sun god. What do you mean? The sun is the highest existence that cares for all things. Without the sun's light and heat, this world wouldn't last more than a day. It creates the seasons, helps buds grow and shines light so we can see the world. Thanks to that, the sun's grace isn't forgotten. It was a plausible answer. Isn't the fact that we live on this earth the gift of the sun god? People feel this instinctively. It makes a lot of sense that there is a reason. Krokta had modern knowledge, so he nodded in acknowledgement. The presence of the sun was the most basic premise for life. After that, the priest gave further explanations. Inside the altar was a piece of the sun god, and it contained a powerful heat that could melt anything. The last forge, which was beyond the worship room, used this heat in its furnace. The forge could only be used by selected craftsmen, and this was determined by the peace of the sun god in the altar. After his explanation, Krokta opened his mouth, I appreciate the valuable teachings. It is nothing. It is my job. There is one thing I would like to ask. Have you ever met a gnome traveler called Heder? Heder am not sure of the name, but there was a strange gnome. I don't know if he is Heder or not. He looks like this friend. Krokta gestured to Tio. The priest raised his eyebrows as he saw Tio. 
Ho oh, it seems like he is. What did that man come for? He kept asking me about the sun god. He was interested in the ancient myths. I recall that he asked about why the sun god disappeared. They shared some more stories about the gnome called Heder. Tio's father had come here to look through the records earnestly. As they talked it was soon time to close the temple. If you come back tomorrow, I will give you more information. There might be some records in the journal. Thank you. It is nothing. I am grateful that you came here without forgetting the sun god. They exited the temple. It was a clear night. Krakta suddenly looked up at the sky. The sun god. Did he look different from the many different suns glowing in the sky? Krakta had heard that there were more galaxies in the universe than the grains of sand on earth. If so, who created that infinite possibility? Perhaps one of those distant stars was the earth he lived on. Then at that moment. His vision suddenly dimmed. It was the same feeling Head had when the Grey God's eyes were used. The faded deaths in the world entered his vision. Numerous white stars were scattered in the black night sky. The white stars dimmed and became part of the black curtain. Only the darkness of the night sky remained. This was a black world where all the stars had died. The end of the stars. He didn't want to see such a sight. Krakta shook his head. Then he turned off the grey god's eyes. It wasn't well controlled, but if he focused his mind, he could gradually escape that feeling. Soon enough, he was able to leave the power of the grey god's eyes. Krakta sighed. Was he tired, or was the silent grey god doing sewing again? Krakta. Look over here. Dot. Tio said. Krakta rubbed his eyes and raised his head. Then his body immediately tensed. There was a group of people holding weapons. All of them had hidden their identities behind hoods. The man at the forefront declared, The gods have ordered your death. I will punish you according to the divine message. Don't blame me. The influence of the divine message began to take effect. Chapter 184 I didn't know that Slayer Maker would come here. Rastad, the old dwarf guarding the last forge, laughed while stroking his long beard. Is Salardo of the Golden Anvil clan doing well? He is hitting the iron like before. Salardo allowed you to come here. Sekiro smiled, that's right. I came on my own. I see. Any young blacksmith will come here at least once. And the Slayer Maker is qualified enough. You're overpraising me. I've seen the wizard slayer that you created. Kong. Kong. Rastad looked at the place where the sound came from. In one corner, a dwarf was hammering on iron. The heated piece of iron was struck by the hammer and slowly changed shape. Then the hammering sped up. It is a quick and fast sword. A big weapon isn't needed to a magician. That's right. It was excellent. Who is using the sword now? I don't know. You truly resemble Salardo. Rastad smiled bitterly. Wizard Slayer is now in the hands of a lunatic who hates magicians. Numerous innocent magicians have died at his hand. Is that so? Sekiro shrugged. It has nothing to do with me. You truly are Solardo's clan member. Rastad laughed out loud. Yes, Slayer Maker. What monster will you make at the last forge here? This time, will it be an ogre slayer? I already created that. Huh, I see. It is a weapon against ogres, but the owner will surely suffer. Sekiro shrugged at Rastad's words. Head met the orc warrior who used ogre slayer and seen him an ogre easily. The great sword was too big, but when it entered the orc's hands, it felt like it had been made for him. Sekiro smiled, since you've completed Ogre Slayer, is it now a Dragon Slayer? Dragon Slayer. Dragons were an invisible and forgotten species. At one time, they flew over mountains and valleys regularly, but now people never saw them. Some said that they were all dead, while others said they were hidden somewhere. However, one thing was certain, which was that the dragons wouldn't regain their former glory. My sword would lose if I make such a thing. Indeed, it is impossible to use a sword to fight against a dragon. 
then what about a second version of Ogre Slayer? There is trouble with ogres in this area. I'm not sure. Sekiro's face darkened. I will think about it. He had left the Golden Anvil clan because of this. Sekiro surpassed the level of young craftsman. At a young age, he had already become a top blacksmith, and his Slayer series were masterpieces which everyone wanted. Many warriors and knights had asked him to make weapons for them. However, now, he didn't have a blueprint for the next piece. He didn't have an image which made him want to work the metal enthusiastically. In the old days, the true face hidden in the iron had been visible. But there was nothing now. He had broken several attempts and beat the iron only to melt it again. So, his slump had become prolonged. You are young. Rastad tapped his shoulder. Don't be in a rush. Stay and think slowly. You can stay in the blacksmith's quarters. Thank you. This is the last forge, a place where you can beat iron as long as the sun shines. Ha ha ha. I guess I should look at that person. Rastad approached the blacksmith who was hammering the iron. The blacksmith was a dwarf younger than Zakiro. He didn't have the SS, but he had a passion for hammering iron. Zakiro watched them for a while before leaving the last forge. The dwarf who was the sun god's priest saw him and bowed. Zakiro greeted him politely as well. By the time he left the temple of the sun god, it was dark. Geharad was quiet. There were occasional raucous sounds from the pubs, but most of the buildings had turned off their lights. It was a land of the temple of the sun god. They slept early and looked forward to the sunrise, rather than staying up at night. At that moment. Chang. Sekiro heard a noise. He turned around. As a blacksmith, it was a sound which was impossible for him not to know. It was the sound of weapons hitting each other. A battle was occurring somewhere, and the sound of the metal was strangely familiar. He had heard that sound many times over the past few days. It was the sound of Ogre Slayer smashing monsters. Crocta was fighting. Sekiro started running. The sound was coming from a corner of Geharad, where people rarely went. It was dark, but he ran using the light of the moon and the sound. As Sekiro approached, iron flashed in the darkness. A group of people was surrounding Crocta and a man. The two of them were exchanging blows. Sekiro moved closer and saw Tio and Aner, who spotted him and waved. He stood next to them. What is this? Strange guys picked a fight with us. Tio explained, they said we would be punished according to a divine message strange guys. Sekiro knew about the divine message. All the gods wanted Krokta and the orcs to die. These people were probably fanatical followers of the gods. To them, the commands of the gods were absolute. Indeed, the group of hooded men holding weapons was watching Krokta and the man fight, as if it was a sacred ceremony. Great dot. Being able to fight against Krokta Tio muttered. However, Sekiro couldn't tell. His vision had adapted to the darkness to some extent, but their swords were moving too quickly for him to see. Every time a light flashed, someone received damage and stepped back. Krokta, the person who conquered the north and obstructed the empire he had ed the crazy chieftain in the north and defeated the empire's genius, a dandator. However, a nameless fanatic was matching him in the fight. The two chose to catch their breath for a moment. Krokta stared at the man, and Suyans about the opponent filled his eyes. It was an expression which showed the fight wasn't going according to his will. Sekiro followed Krokta's gaze towards the opponent. The hood was torn, so the opponent's face was revealed. It was a middle-aged man. He looked at Krokta with a calm expression. Then he declared, you can't resist the power of the gods. Accept your fate, Krokta. It was at this moment that Sekiro realized sewing. There was a faint light coming from the man's sword. Magic swords were able to exert such power. However, Sekiro saw that it wasn't a magic sword. God Soldier. Krokta's opponent wasn't a warrior who was good at the sword. However, he had the power of a god itself. A god's power was coming down to the man through that sword. It wasn't the god's full power as there were constraints about using divine power against mortals. However, 
This was enough to aim at Crocta's neck. The man wielded his sword again. A light flashed. Kang! Crocta blocked the sword with Ogre Slayer. Then he stepped back. Ugh! In the name of the gods! Ka Kang! Sekiro could see it. Crocta's sword, Ogre Slayer, was shaking. Sekiro was a blacksmith, a master who heard the voice of the iron and the sword. Just like how a warrior saw the paths through the opponent's gap in order to them, Sekiro had an eye for seeing through metals and weapons. In his eyes, Ogre Slayer looked like a boxer who barely blocked the punch. It had won many fights but hadn't healed properly, causing the wounds to accumulate. Its broken bones set wrong, and its wounds filled with pus. A punch to the head caused damage which would make the hands shake. However, nevertheless, Ogre Slayer still looked straight at the opponent. This was a fight, and the opponent was still in the ring. A fighter who wouldn't collapse when weak that was Ogre Slayer. And Zekiro was the father who had made Ogre Slayer. Bolter. Crocta's roar shook Geharad. And Crocta's speed increased. The man stepped back from Crocta's power. An unknown swordsmanship was being used with Sekiro's sword as Ogre Slayer implemented an unknown power. The man's sword bounced off, and Ogre Slayer aimed towards the gap. However, it was blocked. This was the god's power. Opportunities were equally given to both sides. The enemy's attack flew when Crocta's blow was deflected towards the ground. The sword had a white haze around it. Then Crocta raised Ogre Slayer. Kang! At that moment, Sekiro thought that Ogre Slayer would break. However, it managed to hold on. Crocta blocked the attack and kicked the man's elbow. The sword was momentarily lowered. Then Crocta turned and swung his great sword at the man. It seemed like this fight was over. However, the man's sword swung around in the air, as if a thread was tied to it. Then it moved into a position to stop Crocta's sword. The man grabbed his sword and inserted strength into his legs. Kwang! Once again, the two swords collided. The man was pushed back. It was a power struggle. The dim light from the man's sword enlarged to cover his body, and his eyes shone white. The god's power was encroaching on his body. His sword became faster. It aimed at Crocta from every direction. Thanks to the gods, the man's attacks were swift and powerful. However, Crocta's Ogre Slayer defended against all attacks. It endured, and the reaction was marvelous. Crocta was really one with the sword. Is that really my sword? Sekiro muttered. It was beautiful swordsmanship. However, it wasn't beautiful due to smooth movements or gentle curves but because the sword and owner were one. All types of movements were completed with the big great sword. Sekiro couldn't tell if Crocta was leading the sword, or if the sword was leading him. The sword was connected to Crocta, and they moved as one. Then Crocta hit his opponent's abdomen. Cough. Crocta immediately swung the great sword at his opponent. The enemy's sword flew through the air. It rolled across the ground and stopped at Sekiro's feet. The dim light faded, and it became dark. The god left. Sekiro picked up the sword. It wasn't a bad sword, but it wasn't superb craftsmanship. It was just a fairly decent sword. He raised his head and looked at Crocta and the man. Crocta's great sword was pointed at the man's neck. The man slowly opened his eyes. He saw Crocta and the sword pointed at his neck. He didn't know what to do. Tell me about the divine message. Crocta demanded. The man mumbled sewing. Sekiro felt sewing strange while watching the scene. The man wasn't a great warrior he was just a fanatic. His sword wasn't exceptional it was just a decent sword. He was like a grain of sand compared to Crocta, a orc with a proper sword. However, when the man used the power of the gods, he could fight against the northern conqueror. This was the power of the gods. Crocta won now, but he would eventually fall. All the gods wanted his death. What if this power was used on a stronger person with a better sword? Crocta and Ogre Slayer the beautiful dance of the two would end soon. It was inevitable. After all, it wasn't an ogre they were facing. 
The gods no matter how good Ogre Slayer was, it couldn't a god. However. I want to keep watching. As long as the sun still blazed, the last forge wouldn't turn off. Likewise, Sekiro hoped that the beautiful combination of Krokta and Ogre Slayer wouldn't end. The sword he made was more than a sword, and the harmony with its owner was a miracle he wanted to last forever. Sekiro wanted to do it. This is also destiny. A warrior had to fight. For a warrior to survive, he must without dying and in order to, he needed a weapon that could. Chapter, 185. Tell me about the divine message. Krokta asked the man. The man didn't want to talk, but he opened his mouth the moment Ogre Slayer approached his neck. God wants your death. God? Why? I don't know. I am just following the will of God. God has commanded you to die. I borrowed his power and came to you according to his words. That is all. Which God? The elder God of the mountain, where you will reap all the blood you sowed. Krokta was confused. He had heard of the elder God of the mountain. It was a small religion spread over the mountain areas of the continent. Those who lived in the mountains mainly followed it, but in comparison to its rustic image, the religion had a cruel doctrine. However, why did the elder god of the mountain suddenly want to him? While Krokta was thinking, the man continued speaking. Accept your fate. Other people will come. There are others. You really don't know anything. That isn't all. All the gods on this continent have commanded your death. Even the goddess of mercy desires your death. Krokta's expression distorted. Why? We can't know the minds of the gods. You must have done sowing bad to incur the wrath of the gods. Repent, Krokta. An eye for an eye, blood for blood. I don't understand that reasoning. Krokta raised his greatsword. The man shouted, I have failed today, but in the end, the gods will find you. In the end. Kuhik. Krokta kicked the man's belly. The man curled up on the ground. Krokta looked down at the man, and laughed. You are too noisy. I just want to find out the situation. Ugh. The man sprawled out on the ground. The orcs will not survive the wrath of the gods. What did you say? Krokta lowered his posture and stared at the man. The orcs. Yes. The gods desire not just your death but the death of all the orcs. You will perish. Krokta raised his gaze and stared at the group of hooded men, followers of the elder god of the mountain. They flinched from his us gaze. They couldn't even think about raising their weapons as they stepped back. Krokta growled, is that true? They couldn't open their mouths, causing Krokta to grab the neck of the collapsed man, who was shouting about the will of the gods. Then at that moment, the man couldn't breathe. Kiak. Ku. Answer me. Do the gods really want to the orcs as well as me? Is that the divine message of your god? Krokta got up. The man struggled. He was breathless and clutching at Krokta's wrist. Looking at the man's pained appearance, the other followers and cried out. Why yes. The words are correct. So, let go of him quickly. All the orcs. Yes, the god said so. To make the orcs a forgotten species. Krokta nodded. Then he threw the man. The man flew towards the other followers, causing the group to fall and roll across the ground. In the turmoil, some of the hoods fell off. They were all ordinary humans, ordinary people who looked after the fields or hunted in the mountains. Krokta muttered, Why do the gods want the death of me and all the orcs? What was going on? The followers edged away helplessly. Krokta noticed them, but he then said with a sigh. Get lost. It was like giving permission. They ran away hastily as soon as Krokta's words ended. Only the man's weapon remained on the ground. Krokta grabbed it. It was an ordinary sword. However, when the light of divine power surrounded it, the sword emitted a force which was hard for Krokta to deal with. Beings with this power were aiming at the orcs not just one orc but all of them. This is definitely a headache. Why couldn't they leave him in peace? 
it wasn't possible for him to stay still after hearing that the gods were aiming at all the orcs. Why are the gods doing this? Did you speak ill of the gods? Tio asked after watching the scene. Crocta shrugged, I don't know. It would be really unfair even if I did. That is true. There is always a mountain after crossing a mountain. Great chieftain, empire, and now the gods will everything be okay? Aner looked at Crocta with trembling eyes. It can't be helped, even if it isn't okay. Then shouldn't you head quickly to the other orcs? They are aiming at the orcs. Indeed. Dot. Quickly. I can find my father later, so let's fight with Crocta's friends. Dot. Against those gods. Um. Crocta thought about it. If orcs were the target, then Orcrox and Basque village came to mind. There was also the land of the orcs in the north. However, those who borrowed the power of the gods couldn't invade it. Perhaps the gods' followers were already moving. In that case, even one more person would help. Yes, Crocta muttered. Then someone interrupted. Stay a little longer. It was Sekiro. Sekiro. There is no one crazy enough to fight all the orcs immediately after the gods have sent the divine message. The present era isn't a time where the gods can run rampant like before. So, there is no need to worry. No, there is no need to hurry. Even if things will happen, there is still time. The followers have to look at their own interests and circumstances. They will gather the forces slowly. Sekiro wasn't looking at Crocta while talking. Crocta followed Zakiro's glance and confirmed what he was watching. It was Ogre Slayer in Crocta's hands. You need to be prepared if you really want to fight the gods. Prepared? Zakiro raised his gaze towards Crocta. Crocta shrank back from the look in Zakiro's eyes. There were flames blazing in Zakiro's eyes, and they weren't of a small fire. It was a furnace that could melt iron. I am going to fix Ogre Slayer. Ha 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 ha. Someone was laughing. So, you tried to us? You? Really? She tugged at the hair of the human she had captured. She was sitting on top of a tower of human bodies. The man at the very top wasn't dead yet. He shivered and begged for forgiveness. Please stop. Stop. She pulled the hair with more strength. The man's neck was pulled back, and he couldn't talk anymore. She pushed her face against his. Say it again, again. If you won and we lost, would you stop if we told you to stop? Kiyuk. Where is your confidence from earlier? Ha. Huh. She grabbed the axe at her waist. It wasn't big and looked more like a throwing axe. She raised the axe to the man's eyes. Say it again. Please. I might forgive you. Tell me again what you said when you first saw us. Forgive. She looked annoyed, if you say it, I will forgive you. She pierced the man's eyes with the axe. Blood flowed from it. The man shrieked. Now, tell me before it becomes more painful. What did you say when you first found us? Heek, kuhik first, first. Yes. The first thing. I in the name of the gods. And. K. Crocta and the orcs, K. Wrong. She wielded the axe again. The man's nose was split. The man screamed, and blood burst out. She started humming, What did you say? Kiyuk. The dirty and rodent like orcs mutilate their bodies and hang them at the gates. She hummed and swung her axe again. Every time her arm moved, blood splattered on the man's face. More and more, the appearance of a person was becoming less visible. Did you say? Plea please. Then I will take your life. She rose from her spot. Then she grabbed the man's neck and pushed him down. The man rolled down the pile of bodies and fell to the bottom. Her followers, who were continuing the massacre, asked her, Captain. What should we do now? They want to us, so we can't let them live. Kokokol, good. They wielded their weapons, and terrible screams were heard. Suddenly, she saw a man crawling on the ground in order to run away. She threw her axe. It was aimed accurately at the man. 
the axe tore through the air and split apart his head. Brain matter flowed down. Those who want to live. She smiled. It is over, Captain Anya. You did well. She was an orc warrior known as the Mad Slaughterer, notorious for being a crazy berserker. The Mad Slaughterer Anya she had declared revenge on the noble who ed Lennox, torturing him and ing his followers. That was the berserker Anya. Anya laughed as the slaughter finished and muttered. Kohuhut. That Krokta, he has become a big man. Anya remembered when she first saw Krokta. She had come to Orcrox for Lennox's funeral and seen the apprentice warrior who had been the last one to speak with Lennox. His behavior was awkward but the willpower burning in his eyes seemed like sowing head inherited from Lennox. Conquering the north, thwarting the empire, and now fighting the gods. Anya's eyes shone. His SS. She laughed again. Then at that moment. The air near her distorted. Anya frowned, what, all of a sudden. The figure of an orc slowly appeared. He looked at Anya with his translucent body, and his shape gradually became clear. He was a bald male orc without a single stitch of clothing, while necklaces made of all types of animal bones and skulls were hanging around his neck. Additionally, a strangely bent staff was held in his hand. It was the shaman who pursued the abyss, abyss seeker Wallachy. Lennox and Krokta Koholholho. Shut up. I thought you had a strange taste you also liked the young Koholholho. You really make me feel bad. How long have you been here? I don't know. Koholho. Anya grabbed another axe from her waist. However, it couldn't touch Wallachy and passed straight through his body. It is no use. Koholho. Witchcraft is really nasty. Anya licked her lips and placed the axe back on her waist. Anya's subordinates finished their work and greeted Wallachy. Wallachy. It is great to see you after so long. Koholho. I am alive. Bolter. I heard the news. Krokta is doing sewing fun. Kokoko. There will be a festival again. Kuhahat. Fight, fight. They laughed while shouting. Indeed, they were the berserkers who followed Anya. Anya smiled at them before asking Wallachy, are you going? To Orcrox. A divine message had been passed against the entire orc species. They always wandered around the continent, but since this had happened, they needed to return to Orcrox. Just like when all the great orcs on the continent had returned home for Lennox's funeral. Of course. Kuhoho. Wallachy smiled. Anya nodded. Zankus. He will go after finishing a hunt Kuhu. What is he hunting? That abnormal. Her followers shouted, we're done. Yes. Then let's go. After completing the massacre, Anya's group started to head towards Orcrox, and next to Anya was the translucent shaman shaking his staff. It had been a while since Lennox had died. In the meantime, the north had opened, and the kingdom had become an empire. An immature apprentice warrior had become a great warrior and now, the gods wanted to the orcs. The legendary powerhouses of the orcs began to gather again. Chapter 186 A blacksmith's blood flowed through the dwarves of the Golden Anvil clan. Sekiro had been born as the most talented one among them. The clan's chief craftsman, Salardo had told him. If you are a true Golden Anvil craftsman, you can see the finished product before you melt it. Sekiro believed he had understood those words. He always had a blueprint. The moment he wanted to make sewing, he was clear about how it would be completed. All the masterpieces he had already created were once in his head. However, Sekiro realized that wasn't the case. He hadn't seen it properly. Sekiro had used his intuition to complete it, but he hadn't really seen it. Now I see. Sekiro muttered as he saw the weapon which filled his mind. He could see what it would be like, what type of power it had, and how it could be created. Additionally, he could see what it would cost. Sekiro wanted to move his body. Right now, an unknown inspiration was filling him and moving through his entire body. He wanted to start working soon. You came. Sekiro. Yes. 
Sekiro's body trembled. Rastad, the blacksmith who maintained the last forge, saw Sekiro's face, and his eyes widened. He studied Sekiro and laughed. That has arrived. What is it? The thing that comes to a great blacksmith once in their lives. Rastad looked around the last forge. There was nothing special except for the fact that it was in the temple where the last fire was kept. Come along. Sekiro followed Rastad. There was a door in the forge. Rastad opened it to reveal stairs. Then they went down to another smithy. Dust had accumulated since it hadn't been used for a long time, but the facility itself was good to use right now. Use this place. This place. It is literally the last forge. The outside area is just an assortment of things. Sekiro looked around the interior. It was the first time he'd seen it, but it felt familiar somehow. The inspiration in his head and the familiar feeling of this forge tangled together. So, what will you create? Will you use iron? It will come soon. As Sekiro spoke, there was a small noise from above. They waited for a bit, and someone came down the stairs. It was Krokta. He greeted them with a huge sword on his shoulders. Sekiro. You were here. Ah, uh, someone else. I am Krokta, a warrior. I am Rastad. I am the blacksmith who maintains the last forge. It is a pleasure. I am alive. It has been a long time since I've heard an orc greeting. The two of them shook hands, then Krokta looked around the forge. Will you fix my sword here? Sekiro smiled. That's right. You can be expectant. Well Krokta looked at Sekiro and Rastad. He scratched his head and put down Ogre Slayer. At any rate, thank you. Please take care of it. Don't worry. I have to talk to the priest. Krokta's hands moved awkwardly without Ogre Slayer as he climbed the stairs. Sekiro's and Rastad's eyes turned to Ogre Slayer. It was an excellent greatsword. Except for the fact that it was breaking down. This sword? That's right. Ha <laughs> ha that warrior, he is Krokta. Now I understand why your eyes are like that. Excellent warriors always inspired blacksmiths. The Golden Anvil clan might have a philosophy of not caring about the users of their weapons, it was exciting to make a weapon for a warrior like Krokta. Maybe this is the arrangement of the sun god. Rastad muttered. Sekiro was silently moving Ogre Slayer. He had begun working. Rastad watched quietly. The genius of the Golden Anvil clan, the Slayer Maker who had created many masterpieces at a young age what would his ability be like? At that moment, the forge became hot. Ah! Rastad could feel it clearly. The Temple of the Sun was welcoming Sekiro. The last fire, which hadn't reacted to blacksmiths for a long time, started to heat up the forge. Rastad was in awe. Finally, a blacksmith has appeared to match the last forge. This was the true last fire which Rastad had experienced a few times during his youth but could no longer use. It was the last fire in the Temple of the Sun God. In combination with the last forge. A great sword was reborn again. Krokta, Tio, and Aenor went to have tea with the priest. While Ogre Slayer was being repaired, they wanted to find out as much as possible about Heder. You are looking for Heder. The priest took out some papers from the temple's archives. Things like the temple's entrance register and access records remained. He did a lot of research on the sun god in the temple. The inquisitive gnome asked me many things. Why the sun god disappeared, the substances of the gods. Why did the sun god disappear? Tio asked. The priest laughed. Humans can't accurately know the story of the gods. The reason he fell into a deep sleep is probably due to a problem when fighting the gods in the past. The gods fought. That's right. The reason was never revealed, but there are records about a dispute among the gods. In the aftermath, one god died, one god fell, and one god went to sleep. Krokta's eyes widened. In the aftermath, one god had died, one god had fallen, and one god had gone to sleep. The grey god was the one who had fallen. Krokta asked, what gods are they? The priest laughed. 
Ha ha. You are only asking hard questions. Please remember, this is just a story and it isn't definite. I will warn you in advance. It's okay. Of course, the sun god is the one who fell asleep. The grey god is the one who fell. No one can remember what she was the god of, or what power she had. The grey god the one who linked Elder Lord to Earth and seemed to be plotting sowing. When she fell, one god had died and one had gone to sleep. There was a relationship between the grey god and the sun god. The journey to find Heather was becoming increasingly connected to the answers Krokta wanted to find. Krokta asked again, then the dead god. Ah. He was like a father and mother to the sun god. He is the priest paused for a moment before replying, the stars. There are many stars in the sky. Yu Jehan muttered. He was sitting on the beach and looking up at the sky. It was night, but young people were still gathered on the white sand. They occasionally threw stones at the surface of the sea and squashed beer cans. Try to imagine it. A voice suddenly said. Yu Jehan turned his head. A woman was sitting beside him. Her skin and hair were exceptionally white. It was a unique appearance, but thanks to the darkness and the hat covering her head, no one in the vicinity noticed. She was the grey god. The sight of the stars disappearing from the sky. Awful. I always have to see it. Yu Jehan smiled. How awful. After coming to this world I don't want to see that type of thing still, seeing the stars of earth relieve some of the despair. Do you want a beer or sewing to drink? It is okay. It isn't uncommon for you to drink or eat. You spoke to young Ian. Ian asked me about you. She scooped up the sand with her hand. Yu Jehan asked, is the plan going well? Somewhat. What is your influence? The achievement points keep rising. It is thanks to Krokta, Rommel, and Keynes. The rankers are much better than I thought. Yes Yu Jehan smiled. They have no idea what they are doing. Yes, that is better. Do you know? When Krokta came alone, I got angry and raised his assimilation rate to the limit. At that time, I ended up giving a little bit of my power to Krokta. So, I was worried the gods noticed I had sowing to do with Krokta and told people to wipe out Krokta and the orcs. The grey god chattered on, and Yu Jehan listened to her words. If they move in the correct manner, Krokta won't be able to stay still once this is over, I can really accomplish my plan. Now is the real beginning. Yes, it seems like it. So the grey god got up. When the time comes, please thank young Ian for me. Yu Jehan looked at the sea and replied, until then. If he is still alive, I will. Yes. Well, even so. He will be alive. Otherwise, I will be sorry. Really? Really? Yu Jehan smiled and nodded. The Grey God added, All right, Gordon wanted to say hello to you. Is he doing well? He is. Gordon is also a great person. Suddenly, there were fireworks on the beach. The long curves of light rose into the sky. The Grey God spread open her arms and gazed at the embers in the night sky. Pretty. After Rastad left, Sekiro pulled sewing out. It was a small lump of golden metal. When Sekiro gained the title of Slayer Maker and rose to the rank of a craftsman, Salardo of the Golden Anvil clan had given it to him. You can only use it once. Keep this in mind. If you aren't ready, it will be used in vain. You will have consumed it uselessly. The craftsmen who used it correctly are recorded in the history of the Golden Anvil clan. Most people used it in vain, but those who used it correctly made the best weapons in history. It was a piece of golden metal given to the craftsmen of the clan. This was why Zakiro's clan was called the Golden Anvil. That was a piece of a golden anvil. The clan split had apart the anvil, which was said to have been given to them by a god, and gave the pieces to their craftsmen. The pieces would gradually disappear over time. Fortunately, Zakiro had been able to receive a piece at a young age. He sensed that now was the right time to use it. So, Sekiro grabbed it. It melted and disappeared into Ogre Slayer's melted form. 
the color of the molten iron became even redder. However, the piece of the anvil didn't melt completely. Sekiro started to furiously work the bellow, and the temperature started rising gradually. Sweat flowed down Sekiro's face, and it felt like the bones in his body were melting. His hands worked faster. Then, after a moment, a tremendous heat hit him. He stepped back like he had been pushed, and he stared blankly at the sight in front of Hima fire. The furnace was literally ablaze. Sekiro watched it. There was sewing shining in the furnace. It was a red crystal and it was dazzling, like a ball of flames. Sekiro knew what it was. The last flame. This was it. The last fire should be at the altar above, but now it was down in the forge. The fire added to the heat which was melting Ogre Slayer. The Fergino, the entire temple started to heat up. The temperature rose. It was unexpected. Above him, there was the sound of people urgently rushing out of the temple. Shouts could also be heard. Sekiro gritted his teeth and withstood the heat. The last flame this was a crystal left behind by the sun god. It melted the piece of the golden anvil as well as Ogre Slayer. Sekiro laughed. Despite the heat covering his entire body, he burst out laughing. His intuition, close to a prophetic ability, wasn't wrong after all. He had seen this scene already. He had known it would be here. The world was pushing at his back. The sun, the hottest flames which could melt anything no one would be able to endure it. Not even the gods. Sekiro made a fist as he glanced at the molten iron. This sword would be his best masterpiece, and it would be the best work in the history of the Golden Anvil clan. The purpose of the sword was simple. God er. The sword which was born with the flames of the sun. It could even a god. Chapter, 187. Geharad was in turmoil. The Temple of the Sun God, which could be called the reason for Geharad's existence, was on fire. Everybody evacuate. What is going on? Fire, fire. The first place to react was the worship room. The fire started at the altar that contained the last fire and started to spread throughout the temple. The worshippers shouted and ran away, along with the guards of the temple. The terrified blacksmiths also left the forge. It was the same for the priest and Croctus group in the archives. They rushed outside as the temple became hotter. What is this? Oh my god! The sun god! Come this way! Those who evacuated to the outskirts stared at the temple with devastation. Crocta gazed at the temple. It seemed like the entire building was on fire. Nevertheless, the temple itself didn't combust. The whole temple felt like a melting fire pit but nothing was destroyed. Even the flags flying from the temple maintained their intact appearance. It maintained its intact appearance despite being surrounded by a red flame. The priest muttered, the sun will burn his enemy and wrap itself around his children. To those who don't believe in him, he is the plague of hell. People looked at him. This is the power of the sun god. His flame is said to burn the enemies, while not harming those who weren't enemies. Ah! Is the sun god waking up? This is obviously his power. Perhaps finally. The huge temple was burning while maintaining its appearance. It was an unbelievable sight that couldn't be understood unless the power of a god were involved. People started to talk about the resurrection of the sun god. Then someone said, no, that isn't the case. Rastad? It was Rastad. There was an unknown expression on his face. It was both jubilant and bittersweet. That isn't the resurrection of the sun god. Ha! Huh. It is the last forge. Everyone staring blankly at him. Only the priest nodded like he understood, I understand. It is the last forge. What do you mean? Wasn't the last forge the place where we were? One blacksmith asked Rastad. Rastad shook his head. That is just a room next to the worship room. The true last forge is somewhere else, and it isn't a place we can use whenever we want. It is a legendary forge that appears when the last fire burns. Now there was a clear smile on his face. There are three conditions necessary to truly use the last forge. It will appear when the world needs the last forge, 
when a worthy craftsman puts the iron into the furnace and. He looked at Crocta, who flinched. Rastad smiled so widely that his canine teeth were revealed. When a warrior who deserves a weapon made in the last forge is met. The last forge will only appear then. Rastad finished speaking and fell silent. It was a sight that he might never see again in his life. At that moment. It started to rain. Chike. Steam appeared as the fire around the temple and the rain met. The entire temple was covered in steam, making it not visible anymore. Consecutive scenes that were hard to believe appeared. Then they heard the sound of iron being hit. Kang. The sound became bigger. There was the blazing temple, pouring rain and hammering sound that rang out all over Geharad. After the divine message was received, public opinion wandered for a while but it gradually moved towards a conclusion. All temples followed the will of their gods and designated Krakta as an enemy to be destroyed. I never thought the day would come when all gods would whisper the same words. A man wearing steel armor said. Duke Christian of the Empire looked at him. It is a chance I never thought would come in my life. I am going. The man standing in front of him was one of Christian's subordinates. He was an important talent, a person that Christian didn't spare any support for and was placed right below him. The strongest magician Mogsalin was one of his representatives. It was the same for the man in front of him, a paladin chosen by the god of war. Using the god of war's blessing, Aklan wiped out all enemies in front of him. He welcomed this divine message more than anyone else. He wanted to get rid of Krokta and the orcs as soon as possible. His determined eyes proved this. HRM, I see. Christian thought about it. The deeply religious elves and dwarves were already preparing to march. It was a divine message so volunteer troops gathered together. Those who knew how to fight, the soldiers and those who wanted to win gathered together. It wasn't just due to the divine message but also the ambition to distinguish themselves in a great cause. Those who wanted to know themselves and acquire honor lined up. The goal was Orcrox in the land of the Orcs. The man standing here, Aklan, was a person filled with both honor and faith in his God. If that is your will, I can't stop you. Duke Christian replied. He spoke negatively to the Emperor about this fight, but he also thought it was important. However, he didn't want to follow the trend. He was the person throwing the fire, not the one who caught on fire. And Aklan was the best person to set fire to. He believed in the god of war. That was the reason for Aklan's existence. This fanaticism would spread to people like a disease. A dandator wants to accompany me. A dandator? Yes. A dandator had been injured in the battle against Krakta. Was it due to vengeance? Or maybe Aklan's madness had moved him? Okay. It didn't matter. A dandator was a person close to the emperor. He didn't have a large relationship with Christian. Please understand, I can't send the regular armies and knights. It is because it is the emperor, not the gods, that is at the top of the empire. Christian explained. I know. But that doesn't mean you can't recruit volunteers. Gather people from the temple of the war god. Try whatever you can. I will speak to the emperor. If the soldiers want to go, they will be able to. Thank you. Aklan bowed deeply. I will return to pay back all your grace. Don't worry about that. Bring back victory. That is enough. Yes. Then please go. Aklan rose, bowed once more to Christian and turned around. Christian watched him leave and thought. Please spread this war so that everyone will become wounded, and there is no clear winner. The orcs will truly cease to exist. Then the balance of the continent will fall. Create a shocking and exciting upheaval. Christian smiled. What do you think? Then a man standing next to Duke Christian revealed himself. The robed man was the great magician, Mogsalin. The orcs will disappear from the continent. Aren't there monsters among the orcs? They are monsters, but their opponents are gods. All the gods are hostile to the orcs. Who can survive? Indeed. It can't be helped, even if the fallen god is behind them. According to Mogsalin, 
the power of the fallen god was felt strongly from Crocta when he fought the empire, making the gods take this action. I'm glad you are here. Mogsalan had touched the pinnacle and was linked to the gods. He overheard the stories of the gods and told Christian. Without Mogsalan, he wouldn't have known all of this. Mogsalan smiled and bowed at Christian's praise. But what will happen if that Crocta wins? He has succeeded in doing things that seem impossible. He is an orc, but I admire him. No matter how great the gods are, I can't help feeling uneasy. This time, even he's unable to do anything. He might be the best fighter who defeated a Dandator, but the gods aren't existences that can be ed with swords. Those who can't be ed by swords how reliable. Christian laughed. People all over the continent were following the divine message. This was a great opportunity for those like Christian. The rain didn't stop falling in Geharad. Nevertheless, the flames around the temple didn't go out. People tried to approach the temple but couldn't enter due to the heat. An extraordinary event was going on. In addition, the banging sound continued to ring through Geharad. Sekiro, is he alive? We can still hear the sound. Has he eaten dot? What a great guy, dot. If I was him, I would die from hunger. Oh. According to the priest and Rastad, Sekiro was currently making a weapon with the last fire. A type of divine power had descended. However, Krakta, Tio, and Aner focused on eating as the crazy blacksmith hammered on the iron. The interior was very hot so Sekiro might already be burned. Fortunately, the knocking sound continued but it was unknown if he was perfectly safe. This was a problem that continued all day. By the way, my father said he was going north. That's right, said the priest as he drank his beer. Due to the burning temple, the priest lost his home and stayed with Crocta's group at the inn for a while. There was no rule against priests drinking alcohol. The excited priest drank the beer. He maintained good manners but he was still a dwarf. I remember him saying it in passing. He is seeking a person who knows the myths in the north. My dad really is a wanderer. Dot. They pursued him from the north to the south, then the west and now they were heading north again. It was traveling all around the continent. But this time, the north Tio looked at Crocta and asked, Want the land of the orcs appear? Dot. Indeed, Crocta nodded in agreement. If they headed north from Geharad, Orcrox and Basque village would appear. Their destination was there, as if someone was intentionally leading them. It has been a really long time since I've returned home. The place where everything began, Orcrox. Crocta was filled with a burning desire to go back there. By the way, when will Sekiro finish the sword? I'm looking forward to it. Me too. Dot. Crocta is great, isn't this like a divine sword? Do you think it might be a legendary sword? They looked at Crocta. All of this was happening due to Crocta's ogre slayer. What type of weapon would be created? Crocta scratched his head and said, Ah well. He wasn't sure. He expected a great weapon, but it became somewhat burdensome due to the burning temple, steam and knocking sound. At that moment, a dwarf sitting in the next chair asked, Hey, can you hear that sound anymore? The sound of iron being hammered had stopped. It was quiet. Everyone got up in excitement. Perhaps. This. Let's go. Dot. The group left the inn. It was still raining. In the rain, the temple lost the fire and steam, gradually returning to its original appearance. The flames around the temple that surprised Geharad faded. Crocta's group ran towards the temple. As they approached, they saw a man appear at the door of the temple. It was Sekiro. His body was covered in soot but his eyes were shining. He found Crocta and started to walk over, his steps filled with exhaustion. He was holding a great sword in his hand. Crocta approached and faced him. Good work. Sekiro stopped, looked up at Crocta, and laughed. Words weren't necessary. Sekiro, a blacksmith of the Golden Anvil clan, a genius who received the title of Slayer Maker at a young age. He handed over the weapon that he poured everything into. Crocta realized at the moment he received the new sword. This wasn't a normal greatsword. He knew it. 
It was more than a weapon. The standards that he knew about swords were all broken, and he felt like he could cause a miracle just holding this sword. The perfect gift for a warrior. Crocta wielded it before looking at Sekiro with a shiver. How should he show his appreciation to the blacksmith who created this? Sekiro. Crocta opened his mouth. His mouth opened and closed. Crocta was speechless as he suppressed his emotions. Geez, sewing like this. Chapter, 188. Crocta gripped his newly acquired sword. Sekiro called it New Slayer. A sword that could a god. Crocta didn't think this was an exaggeration. He felt like he really could a god with this sword. The shape was similar to the previous sword. Ogre Slayer was a huge greatsword that seemed too big to be a sword. However, the feeling in his hand was different from before. The weight was familiar to Ogre Slayer, but an unknown heat was coming from it. The blade was dark but every time he swung it, there was an unknown gold glow and a red energy rose from it. He wanted to swing it. Crocta. The arrangements are ready. Dot. Of course, he would soon have a chance to wield it. Crocta's group decided to leave Geharad immediately after obtaining New Slayer. The road to Heder was in the north and the orcs were also in danger from the divine message. Tio had shouted while carrying the luggage. You're going now. Thank you for the support. Sekiro said while watching Crocta. Crocta nodded at him. Zakiro was unbelievably healthy despite striking iron for so long. His body was a little weak, but it would recover when replenished with the right nutrition. Rather, he said he felt stronger than before. Crocta asked, when are you going to leave? I will stay here a few months to watch the SS of the blacksmith. Then I will decide if I want to go back to the clan or explore the world. Zakiro was calmer after making new slayer. It felt like his weapons could reach a new level. You should stop by Orcrox if you have time. It is full of warriors you can make weapons for. He'll think about it. Sekiro laughed. He no longer thought about the weapon and user as separate. Crocta placed New Slayer on his back and went to Tio. Tio handed the backpack to Crocta. It was heavy. Tethys? Maybe it is because of the last forge, but these things were really cheap. Dot. He opened it to see various types of steel products such as a pot, a set of small knives, and other various materials. You should take advantage of the special treatment when possible. Dot. I see. A trip wasn't possible with just a sword. Various tools were needed. Aner also carried a backpack. His face was grouchy. Crocta laughed. Then shall we go? Crocta's group said goodbye to Zakiro. Zakiro. Next time, make me a nice one as well. Dot. You already have General. I can daydream. Dot. After parting from Zakiro, they stopped by the temple to say farewell to the priest. The priests prayed for them to receive the blessing of the sun god. In particular, he made a meaningful remark as he watched Crocta carry new slayer. The power of the sun will burn away all unclean things, be careful of being corrupted so that you don't get burned by it. Crocta nodded. They left Geharad. Aklan recruited an army for this expedition. The target was Crocta and the orcs, the objects of the gods' anger. The reaction was explosive. Aklan promised to distribute the benefits of the orc conquest mission fairly to the volunteers. Numerous nobles who believed in the gods supported them. Regular people gathered under the flag of the god. Whether it was due to faith in the god of war or Aklan's fanaticism, the number of volunteers for the expedition continued to soar. It wasn't just Aklan and the war god. All priests on the continent were embarking on their own expeditions. The number of people participating was incredible. It was an unexpected response for the emperor and Crocta. The expeditions tried to attract all those who believed in the gods. The envoy has arrived. Guardi, the mayor of Catalu and leader of the Free Cities Alliance, was no exception. Guardi looked at the envoy from the Empire with a fierce expression. He had nothing to say to the Empire. Mayor Catalu, now is the time to put down the weapons. What are you talking about? You know that there is a divine message. All gods are saying the same thing. Guardi knew it. 
Espada also had temples, and the divine message was the same everywhere. You were once enemies with the Empire, but that was the work of humans. Now it is time to join together for a bigger task. It is the gods' work. The expeditions are aiming at Crocta and the orcs. Together, let's stop them. Guardi looked grim. Then he looked around. When the Empire's envoy arrived, he had gathered the high-ranking bureaucrats responsible for managing Catalu, as well as representatives of the citizens. All of them had a similar expression. You mean wipe out Crocta and his species? That's right. We should do it together. Yes. Guardi sneered. If this is true then he apologized. I'm sorry but I'm really busy. I thought it was sewing big because you came from the Empire. Ha ha ha, the people from the Empire have bad heads. They are trying to say sewing like this to us. Ha ha ha. Guardi and the other representatives of Catalu burst out laughing. The face of the envoy became red. Are you saying that you want participate in the expedition? Oh, now you understand. You are a little slow. Guardi burst out laughing. The envoy formed a fist. After this expedition, all those who don't take part will be enemies. This isn't our work, but a mission from the gods. Aren't you afraid of the wrath of the gods? Gods? Guardi laughed. What did the gods do when your empire invaded us? Once again, humans. It wasn't your gods who saved us, but Crocta. Crocta is our benefactor and his friends were our saviors. Do you understand what I'm saying? You want participate, I understand, replied the envoy through his thin lips. Catalyst defense chief, listening quietly next to Guardi, said with a smile, the gods can do the work of the gods themselves. We will take care of our own work. Isn't that right? Emperor's dogs. The envoy glared at him. He suppressed his emotions and bowed to Guardi. Your will, I understand it. I will tell the emperor and the gods. In detail. Uh, yes. Tell the emperor to be careful when walking at night. After hearing the emperor being mocked like he was a neighborhood thief, the envoy couldn't take it anymore and quickly left. Before he left through the door, he turned and said to them. The expedition will depart soon. Volunteers will keep joining until we reach Orcrox. Think carefully about what will happen to you once the expedition is over. Then he left the room. Guardi shrugged. The Imperial people, you are all insane. Good luck. They headed north through the Great Forest. The terrain was harsh and monsters kept appearing to interfere with their course. But Crocta was eager to have opponents to test his new weapon against. Right now, his opponent was a drake. It was reminiscent to the drakes he met in the north. The drake, that resembled a dragon, watched Crocta. But before it could bear its sharp teeth, the shimmering golden sword struck its body. Kayak. The drake screamed and stepped back. However, Crocta didn't stop as he kept wielding his great sword. Blood and flesh scattered. The drake swung its paws. Kakang. The claws and blade met, causing sparks to fly. However, the drake couldn't resist because it had already been damaged by the great sword. The drake withdrew. Crocta jumped and sliced at the drake's head. It in two with one stroke of the sword. The drake's head split apart and it died instantly. Hoo-hoo, good. What is good dot? It has already been many times. Crocta was glad about testing out his new weapon, but the rest of the group were tired of all the creatures appearing. In accordance with the reputation of the Great Forest, many creatures emerged to annoy them. It can't be helped. We are deep inside the forest. The map showed the best path, but the long distance to their goal was apparent. Therefore, they chose to go straight through. Now they were already too far to go back. Uh, based on these circumstances, an ogre wizard will soon appear. Ogre wizard. A rare ogre that could use magic, they hardly ever appeared. Just like the goblin shaman, they played a key role in their clan. But since it was an ogre, the risk far exceeded the goblins. The presence of an ogre wizard meant that an enormous number of ogres were present. Don't worry. I will never be cut with new slayer. 
Crocta laughed as he admired at New Slayer. Suddenly, the flesh and blood covering New Slayer started to burn and dissipate. This was one of the strange functions of New Slayer, who had the power of the last fire. Crocta smiled at the sight of the cleaned blade. Ah, hot. Crocta was surprised and threw the sword. I forgot, hot hot hot. Didn't you say that warriors shouldn't treat their weapons like lovers? New Slayer seemed desolate from its place in the ground. Crocta coughed as he calmed down. He carefully checked the temperature of the blade and picked it up again. HRMM. My mistake. How many times has it been? Dot? The third time today. Monsters have appeared three times. Crocta dropped his head. Tio complained, anyway aware is a city. A gnome doesn't like this type of living style. Dot. Tio gathered some twigs. It was preparation to start a fire. Really I want to go to a beautiful city like Quants where you turn the faucet and water comes out. He complained while his body prepared to start cooking. They would camp here today. Drake meat is tasteless but we have to eat it. Tio used a dagger from Geharad to dismantle the drake. He didn't need to disassemble all of it, so only a part of the belly was cut. I have to use ES. He used the ES gathered from the various cities they visited. Tio's cooking S was the best he had the two-stage charm, consisting of a handsome face and good cooking SS. Crocta and Aner nodded as they watched him work. I'm glad Tio is here. The moment that Aner said this, sewing blocked their view. It filled their vision for a moment before disappearing. Eh. The body of the fallen drake had also vanished. Crocta's party stared at the place where the drake had been with wide eyes. Where did the massive drake corpse go? Fortunately, the slice of drake meat was still in Tio's hands. What was that? Bird Crocta continued, it was an enormous bird. Crocta saw it, the huge bird that had descended before flying off with the drake's body. The bird had a dark colored body and its wings seemed to slightly change color with every flap. A beautiful bird. The whole body was shining, the beak aimed at the targets were sharp and the eyes were bright blue. The size was big enough to be a drake. It was incredibly fast. It appeared, grabbed the drake and disappeared in the blink of an eye. The speed was so rapid that it instantly caused confusion on the ground. Enormous bird. There are many uncharted areas in the great forest, so it isn't strange for an unknown monster to appear. Tio explained. He continued to cook calmly. The bird, I didn't see it. How big is the bird? Bigger than a drake. What does it look like? Well a dark blue Kalura beautiful bird. I want to see it. What is its name? The Thunderbird. How do you know? I have been tracking it. At that moment, a flash went through Aner's head. He thought the voice was Crocta at first, but it wasn't. Crocta was already pointing New Slayer in the direction of the voice. Aner slowly turned his head. A huge shadow covered his body. It wasn't a human. It has been a while. New bee. Do I still look like a new bee? Koko Koko, you've become slightly bigger. It was an orc with a huge bow. Crocta placed the sword on his back again and said, This is the first time since then. Are you alive? Of course. I heard your news as well. I am alive. He extended his fist. The two fists touched. Bolter. It has been a while. Zankus. The hunter who shot the sun, Zankus.